will stay where you are. You will not move. We have some preparations to make. And then... Then something very odd happened. Half of Dr. Marlowe came alive. His right side first. His right eye lighting up while his left eye stayed dead. His right hand twitching while his left hand remained stiff. Half of him came alive. Only half. Theater 5 presents Terror from Beyond. What's that? Did someone... Remember! Try and remember! Sir, you will not remember. Do you understand? When we are gone, it will be gone. As if it had never happened. And you will not remember. But you've got to remember, John! You've got to! The whole future of mankind, of life on Earth, depends on it. You've got to. I sat up in bed, listening. The surf was pounding at the foot of the cliff. But that was all. Had I really heard something or just imagined it? I didn't know. All I knew was I was in a cold sweat... But that wasn't surprising after what had happened. The deaths and... Deaths? But they'd been accidents. Maybe if I went back over it from the beginning... That's right, John! Start back at the beginning! Then maybe you'll remember! And you've got to! You've got to! When was the beginning? When I arrived at the base, I suppose... Went to the administration building for that first briefing session with Dr. Marlowe and Roy. Oh, it's good to see you again, John. It's good to see you, Doctor. Great to have you aboard, John. Did you mind our doing this? Pulling strings to have you assigned up here for a while? Are you kidding? You said it was something interesting. We think it is. As interesting and important as any space work that's being done anywhere today. I know. We'll be putting a man on the moon in a few years, but... If we're to go on from there, one of the things we should know is what we're likely to find. In other words, whether there's intelligent life anywhere in the solar system. Mm -hmm. That's why I hated leaving the old project. You haven't. (laughs) This is still part of the old project. Uh, Remember what our problem was on Van Gogh? Of course. A radio telescope can pick up any message from out there that might be beamed at us, but it's sometimes very difficult to tell precisely where it's coming from. Exactly. Well, we're using a technique here that'll take care of that. A light beam, rather than radio waves. You mean a laser? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, we discussed that. We've already hit the moon with a beam no bigger than a pencil, but suppose you do establish a contact, how do you get your feedback, your response? Well, we believe we've solved that problem, uh, theoretically at least. But we needed an electronic specialist to work on it with us. That's why we requested you. When do we start? Right away. Uh, By the way, you're sharing a cottage with Roy. Now, why don't you go on down there with him? Drop your luggage, we'll get to work. The work. I remember that. Weeks of it. Finally, the big night. The night of our first test. It was clear and cool. The ocean still, not thundering, but whispering at the base of the cliffs as if it were waiting... All the stars sharp and clear like signposts on the road to the infinite. Dr. Marlowe at the computer, Roy and I at the center console. T minus two. Check. By the way, Doctor, I meant to ask you before, what made you pick Damus as our first target? Well, it was a few weeks after you left the project. We got a message from there. No. Well, there was some question about it, John. First, as to whether it was really was a coherent message, and second, as to whether it was from Damus. The British got a fix on it, too. And it was on the hydrogen wavelength, the one we always said anyone out there would use. 
That's true. And even though we never got another one, I thought it was worth exploring further. Of course. But that's fantastic. Yes, it's an exciting prospect. But it's also a rather frightening one. Why do you say that? We're reaching out, John. We're getting close to the secret of matter. The origin of life. The mystery of the universe. Sometimes I become a little afraid. Afraid that we may stumble onto something that's too much, too big for us. T-minus ten seconds. Check. Power on. Give me a reading, John. Vector nine. Eighteen point two and steady. Time. How long to contact? Three minutes, 28 seconds. We sat there tensely, watching our instruments on the clock. Then... There it is, the feedback. We've done it. The trick now will be to maintain contact. Oh, wait a minute. What's that? It sounds like a pattern. Listen. Even numbers. Now odd numbers. Great Scott, do you think we've got something? Follow it. Follow it. Start with an even series. We started following the pattern, and we got nothing. We kept at it all night, most of the next day. Still nothing. Wait. The next night, it's starting to come back to me now. I remember. I remember. It was the sound of the generators that woke me. It was about two in the morning. I padded out along the duck boards to the control building. The lights were on. I went in. And there was Dr. Marlowe. He was sitting at the control panel, and he was strange. His eyes were open, but he didn't seem to see me. Dr. Marlowe? Dr. Marlowe, what is it? What are you doing? Dr. Marlowe! Then, something very odd happened. Half of him came alive. His right side first. His right eye lighting up while his left eye stayed dead. His right hand twitched while his left one remained stiff. And then... What? Oh, oh hello, John. Is uh, anything the matter, Doctor? No. Why should anything... Hey... What am I doing here? Doctor, have you ever walked in your sleep before? Oh, not that I know of. Of course, I haven't been sleeping too well lately. Rather disturbing dreams, but... John, did you change this beam frequency? No, Doctor. You must have done it in your sleep. Shall I switch it back? No. Cut the power, but leave it. I'd like to look at it again in the morning. Do some thinking about it. Somehow, neither of us mentioned it the next day. We just went on with our work, collecting data, trying for another contact, if it had been a contact. And that night, yes, it was that night that we discovered what it meant. The generators woke me again. I looked at my watch. It was almost three o'clock, and for some reason, I was terrified. The door of Roy's room was open. As I went by, I saw that his bed was empty. Then I was walking along the duck boards to the control building. The lights were on again. I looked in through the window. Dr. Marlowe was at the panel as he'd been the night before with that same dead look on his face. And Roy was standing in front of him, talking to him. I could hear him through the window. Dr. Marlowe. Dr. Marlowe, what is it? Is anything wrong? He's asleep. Walking in his sleep. Better get John. He started toward the door. Then, apparently deciding he'd better not leave the generators on, he turned and went toward the master switch. And as he did, Dr. Marlowe moved. His face still dead, expressionless. He got up, took a heavy wrench, and followed Roy. Then, just as Roy put out a hand to throw the switch, he hit him. I saw Roy's body crumple to the floor. I stood there frozen, unable to move. Dr. Marlowe looked down at him for a moment with no sign of emotion on his face. 
Then, like a zombie, he went over to the workbench again, picked up an odd assortment of tools, and returned to Roy's body. He bent over him, looking at him as if he were a laboratory specimen. And as I realized what he was going to do, my paralysis left me. I shouted and started for the door, but just before I reached it, I tripped, hit my head, and that was the last I knew. not sure how long I was out, but when I came to, I was lying in front of the door and a dark shape was bending over me. John, what happened? Keep away from me. Don't touch me. I saw what you did in there. And where? When? Just now, in the control room, to Roy. What do you mean? I just came up here from my cottage. I had a bad dream, came out to get some air, and I found you lying here. But I tell you, I saw you and... And what? I, I must have imagined it, dreamed it, because... I thought I saw you kill him. We looked everywhere, but there was no sign of Roy. Then we hurried back to the control building and searched it again. He's not here either, John. No. Must be in my mind. Of course, if it had really happened, there'd be something, if not his body, at least his blood. Where, John? Where would it be? Right here in front of the master switch. But there's nothing. No. No. Except that the floor is wet. Looks as if it's been scrubbed. Hey, you're right. John, did you change the beam frequency this way? No, Doctor. You must have done it just the way you did last night. Last night? You mean something happened last night, too? You don't remember? No, no. Tell me what you thought you saw happen tonight, whether you believe it or not. Well, you were sitting at the control panel with your eyes open, but as if you were asleep. Yes, The generators were on, and the beam frequency was set the way it is now. Roy was speaking to you, but you didn't answer him. Then when he started to cut the power, you picked up a wrench and hit him. I hit Roy? But that's not the worst of it. After that, you picked up some tools and bent over him as if... Well, as as if he were a laboratory animal. Telling you about it now, I know the whole thing's mad. It's impossible. I wonder... You mean it could have happened some way? Without your knowing it? In the old project. And in this one. We've been listening for messages from out of space. Trying to determine whether intelligent life exists anywhere in our galaxy. John, if it did exist, what form would it take? Well, it wouldn't necessarily look like us with two arms and legs. Exactly. And suppose it existed in a totally different form. In the form of electrical energy. Electrical energy? Why not? Isn't that the way the brain functions? Giving off electromagnetic waves? And what do we know about Deimos? Suppose... Suppose living beings existed there. In the form of complex electrical charges. And a channel were suddenly opened between it and the Earth. Our laser beam. Mm. You mean they could travel down and take hold of someone? You I'm then... speculating, John. Of course, even if it's true, we don't know if these entities are malevolent, dangerous or not. When they killed, made you kill Roy? Because he was going to shut off the transmitter, cut off contact with their base. As for the rest, well, they'd be very interested in the human body, particularly the brain. They'd want to examine it, study it. Do you realize what you're saying, suggesting, Doctor? Intelligences from outer space, another world... The taking over of a man's body by forces that we... Yes, John, I know what I'm saying. And while I'm only hypothesizing, I don't really believe it's possible. Do you own a gun? Yes. So happens I do. Well, start carrying it. And if you notice me doing anything strange, don't hesitate. Shoot. And shoot to kill. I didn't go back to sleep that night, and I was convinced that I would never sleep again, because it would be then that it would be easiest for them to... No, no, I can't think about it. I won't, even now. I felt a little better in the morning. I went over to have another talk with Dr. Marlowe, but he wasn't at his cottage. He wasn't anywhere on the base, and no one seemed to know where he was. 
Then I called Colonel Gately at headquarters. No one there knew anything about Dr. Marlowe or Roy. But by that time, something had happened to me. It had all become blurred, like an old nightmare that you know was frightening, but whose details you can't remember. About a week later, the colonel called me and asked me to meet him at the police station in the town nearby. You knew Swanson pretty well, didn't you, Parker? Yes, of course. Some fishermen found a body in their nets this morning. We'd like you to look at it. Oh? All right. Brace yourself. Here. Good Lord. I... I can't be certain, but... I'm fairly sure it's Roy. How did he die? We'll have to wait for the coroner's report, but my guess is that he fell off the cliff. And Dr. Marlowe? Nothing new on him yet, but if they were together, his body may turn up soon, too. He was a better prophet than he knew, because Dr. Marlowe came back that very night. I'd taken something to make me sleep. It was the only way I could sleep, but the sound of the generators woke me. I took my gun, went to the control building. The lights were on. I opened the door... And there was Dr. Marlowe. He was standing near the console, his face thin and drawn, and his eyes blank. And when he spoke, his voice was hardly human, as if someone was speaking through him. It is unfortunate that you awakened, Parker, and even more unfortunate that you came in here. What do you mean, Doctor? Where have you been, and why are you talking so strangely? We have been looking over your planet, studying it and its life. Particularly, you so-called humans. We have found it very interesting. And now, we are ready to go. Go? Go where? Wait. You said we. Dr. Marlowe, have they... You will stay where you are. You will not move. We have some preparations to make. And then... Her voice, that horrible voice, broke off. And Dr. Marlowe swayed as if he were about to fall. I grabbed him, held on to him. And then his eyes changed, came alive. And when he spoke again, it was with his own voice. John, John, for heaven's sake, help me. They got me. They took me that night. Took me all over the country, looking, examining, studying. They picked my brain, John. And now they're going to take me with them. Take you? Back to where they come from. Not my body. They're not interested in that. But the essential me. And in heaven's name, shoot, John. Shoot me! And now, we are ready. Look here. At his eyes. Look closely. Yes. Like that. As your friend told you, we are taking him with us. But you will not remember what has happened. You will remember nothing. Do you understand? Because someday, we may come back. I stood there, frozen, holding Marlowe. Suddenly, he broke my grip, pushed me away. Walking stiffly and mechanically, he went to the door, opened it, and went out along the duck boards to the edge of the cliff. Then, without hesitating, he stepped over the edge and disappeared. Now do you remember, John? It's all true! They exist! And they've got me here! Not only that, but they may return to Earth again for others! John, they're coming back now. They're coming. Do something. When I woke up about a half hour ago, I found this all written out on the pad I keep next to my bed. I remember some of what I'd written. But other parts, like Roy's murder and Dr. Marlowe's death, I don't recall at all. Either I'm mad, completely mad, or... No. No, I can't think about that. In any case, if I showed this to anyone, the world would think I was mad. 
There's only one thing to do. Tear it up. Every last page of it. Every last page of it. Every last page of it. Theater 5 has presented Terror from Beyond, written by Robert Newman and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Robert Dryden, Ralph Camargo, and Gilbert Mack. Audio engineers Marty Folia and Bill Sandreuter. Sound technicians Ed Blaney and M.C. Brock. Original music composed by Alexander Vlastatsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. This is Fred Foy speaking. I can see them. I can see them now. Faces like gargoyles. And hands and feet. Claws. They have claws. They're ugly and hideous. They can see us, too. We find you earth people equally repulsive, but we are more tolerant. Theater 5 presents First Encounter. What does he think we've been trying? Take it easy, Joe. Try again. Margaret, anything on your board? No systems check. We're transmitting play, I'm sure of it. Okay, okay. Orion 1 to Space Central. I hope you hear this one. Orion 1 in moon orbit. Repeat, in moon orbit. All systems A-OK. Over. Should be at checkpoint Z. Ready for landing. Space Central to Orion 1. Come in, Orion 1. Mm, Rack it up biggest moment in history, and they've blown a tube in their receiver. Well, the folks on Earth will have to get their news late, on the playback from our tape. Yeah, at least it's working. Clay, I just got a strange reading from the nose sensor. Temperature suddenly shot up 400 degrees, and then it dropped. Are you sure? The drop is normal. We're over the dark side of the moon now, but... That's just it, Clay. The jump in temperature took place as we crossed the temperate zone between the light and dark sides of the moon. It could mean sudden friction. Yes, caused by an atmosphere circling the temperate zone of the moon. Oh, it seems impossible. Joe, fire the retro rockets. I'm going on manual control. We're holding at one half mile per second. Well, that'll keep us from burning up if it is atmosphere. Air on the moon? Well, that could mean the possibility of life. Altitude 53 miles, nose temperature now constant at 280 degrees. Good. Good enough to boil us alive. Nothing clear on the TV monitor. More retro, Joe. Just a little. Velocity slowing, altitude 30 miles. Look at that monitor. Mountains. The Cordilleras. All systems, final check. Space suits first. Suits fine. Cabin pressure okay. Stern landing gear extended. Starting vertical ascent. Periscope swung to stern. Seems clear below. Ascent slowing. Free fall starting. 37 miles. 32 26. Counter blast. Hey, man. Me too. Okay. Let's get out of these harnesses and put on our weighted boots. If there's atmosphere, there may be wind. Yes, and with a lesser gravity on the moon, a slight breeze would blow us for miles. Clay, take a look at this gauge. There's oxygen out there, all right. Mm hmm. But we don't know how much or what else is in the atmosphere until we test it. Till we do, we keep our spacesuits sealed. All right, everybody. Suit up and into the airlock. All right, Joe. Let's open the hatch and lower the ladder. All right. Well, 
Now, this man's first close-up view of the moon. Joe, climb down and stack the equipment as Margaret and I lower it. And be sure to stake it down. <clears throat> okay, here I go. Captain Joseph Gregson, first Earth man on the moon. Clay is still calm as cream. What will it take to excite you? Oh, not much, Marge. Just the look on the faces of my kids and my wife when we get back. Sorry, Clay. Oh, this oxygen tank, it seems to weigh less than nothing. Your sample kit, aerated spray paint, Geiger counter. I'm bringing the tape recorder, Clay. The president's dedication. We therefore dedicate this expedition to all the peoples of Earth and pray that this beginning on virgin territory, unsoiled by man's tragic history, shall give birth to a new understanding among our nations. I, Major Clayton Brown, as commander of Orion One, have been instructed to express my own feelings at this moment. We are looking at Earth. We can see it turning, see the sun shining on continents. Other continents are in the shadows of night. Yet as Earth turns, I... I realize that each part of the world, each nation, will get equal shares of the sun's light. Maybe that's what God intended. <clears throat> All right, let's get to work. Well, it is a plant, and it is green. Photosynthesis is taking place. That means the atmosphere has carbon dioxide and water vapor. And I found no evidence of toxicity, Clay. Okay. Stand by with a respirator while I take off my helmet. Right. Well, if this isn't air, it's a good substitute. Come on. <sighs> Let's get up to the crest of this small crater and get our bearings. Right. Hmm, there's rock erosion, but it's hardly more than sand. Slight radioactivity. Not enough to be dangerous. It's coming from these rocks. Now, I'll take a sample. You two go on ahead. Looks like a level plane down there. Too level to be natural. Hey, Clay, quick. The oxygen tank floated off. I started to chase it, but it just disappeared. I told you to be careful. The slightest there wind. There wasn't any wind. Clay, I feel something. I can't explain it, but it's like someone watching me. The tank was lying right here. I turned my back to get the ore sample. And then I saw it floating over this way. Look. Are those marks on the sand? They look like tiny claw marks. Marge, go to the ship. Joe and I... Now, look, that's an order. All right. But take off those weighted boots. If you see something, you'll have an advantage. Good thinking. We'll join you in a minute or two. Whose idea was it to send a woman on this expedition? Oh, hurry up with those boots. Margaret's at the ship. Now, let's see if there's a trail of these marks. There. Right over... Clay. The tracks. I, I see them moving. The sand's being kicked aside. Whatever it is, it's invisible. <laughs> Clay, she's gone. That sound. Some sort of vehicle. Look. These parallel marks leading down toward the plane. Let's go. Wait. Those spray cans of paint. Maybe if we spray, we'll be able to see what we're fighting. The vehicle tracks. Did they, did they peter out here near the rocks? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. But the claw tracks go on. Whatever made them disappeared, too. That ledge... It looks like an entrance to a cave. Yeah. It's a tight squeeze. <laughs> Made it. Steps. Well, but these walls glow. If you feel anything, start spraying. Yeah. A door. It's lever. It's stuck. Let's pull together. Come on. There we go. All right. Where do we go from here? There must be a hundred doors. No. This one, quick. No, this room's empty. Marge, where are you? Glass partition. Look, she's strapped to that table. That instrument. It's moving right toward her eyes. i got to smash this thing. Wait, something's grabbed me. I, I can't see. Spray, grab I'm being carried, but I can't see water. Who?
incredible. I can't see them or hear their voices. Are they here now? Why have they placed me in this room? And where are the others? All right! You don't have to shoot! Joe! You can only see them. Joe! Well, we're alive. Where's Marge? I don't know. They put me on a table, too. But they were gentle. If we could only see them. I did see part of a face when I sprayed the paint. Like no human on earth. Hideous. I don't get it, Clay. How could an invisible race evolve? Well, I'm sure they're not invisible to each other. Oh? Apparently, their coloration is beyond our visible spectrum. Perhaps there's an entire range of colors which we can't perceive, but they're perfectly visible to a looning. Maybe that's why they examined our eyes so carefully. And we don't hear any voices. Could their sounds be pitched above our audible range? Maybe. March. Joe, Clay, I... Oh, why did you follow me? Just because I'm a woman? Now, none of us will get... March. If Joe had been carried off, we'd have tried to rescue him. Sure, the success of the expedition is important, but we're still human. So man or woman, let's stay human if we can. What... What are we going to do? Take it easy, honey. We don't know yet. That wall, look. It's changing. I can see through it. Yes, it's becoming transparent. It looks like some kind of a throne room. It's strange light. I can see them. Them. Faces like gargoyles. And hands and feet. Claws. They sure aren't pretty. But they're humanoid. And apparently very advanced. Once they determined that they were invisible to us, they devised that light so we could see them. They're all looking in our direction. Well, go on. Take a good look. Easy, Joe. What? What's that sound? Earth people, do not fear. The voice... Where did it come from? It didn't seem to come from anywhere except from inside my own head. Telepathy. Yes, we have created a telepathic field in which communication is total. You may either speak or think. All is understood. I am Bar, ruler of the moon. You will not be harmed, rest assured. <laughs> we find you equally repulsive, but we are more tolerant. We, we are the first Earthmen to land on the moon. We have come in peace. In peace, you are welcome. Well, why did you grab us? We sent a delegation to greet you, but we found you could neither see nor hear us. It was decided then to examine you for your deficiencies. Your eyes have a very limited range, and you are incapable of hearing any but the obvious sounds. The woman still fears harm. Forgive me. Will you permit us to return to Earth? You will remain in peace. Wait a minute. You can't mean... The decision has been made. No other expedition will be permitted to land on the moon. Their radio will be silenced as yours was silenced. Their ships will be destroyed. You shall be the only earthlings permitted to dwell on the moon. Why did you spare us? Curiosity. Major Brown, we cannot permit Earth to conquer the moon. But we had no idea the moon was inhabited. There's no need for conquest. We could live together, sharing. Share? Live in harmony? We have studied our mother planet for centuries... There has been far more war than peace. At this very moment on Earth, men are dying for no better reason than greed. We dedicated this expedition to peace between nations. Earth's peoples must learn to live on Earth before expanding to new worlds. Years ago, when men on Earth had not yet evolved, the moon was fully inhabited. An atmosphere covered our entire surface as the moon revolved on its axis at a greater speed. We were many nations then, all highly advanced. But our scientific progress outdistanced our ethical progress. Several nations vied to be the first to explore Earth. You had harnessed nuclear energy? It harnessed us. We are descendants of the few survivors of the last war on the moon. Our atmosphere was all but destroyed in the nuclear holocaust. The moon's rotation slowed so that one side is always exposed to the burning sun and the other to perennial darkness. Only a narrow zone between the two supports life. Thus, we are now one nation, one civilization... Dedicated to eternal peace. But let us take back this knowledge to Earth. Let us convince our nations. Earth must know its own purification. Out of its ashes shall come men who will remember and tell each succeeding generation. Then perhaps thousands of years hence, Earth men will be ready to explore other worlds in peace. We're ready now. Listen, a hundred expeditions will follow us. Oh, sure, you'll destroy some of them, but some will get through. Then you'll wish you, you had... You threaten. You, supposedly a man of peace... How will the others treat the inhabitants of the moon? They will attempt to enslave us. You shall remain on the moon for the rest of your lives. Well, I don't know what 
this food is, but it'll never replace steak. Well, we're going to have a long time getting used to it. Maybe not. <laughs> Look, Clay, I'm afraid to think anything. They can't read our minds unless one of those machines is turned on, and we can hear the hum. Are you sure? Positive. I had a telepathic conversation with one of their scientists. I was careful to keep out any thoughts about escape. Clay, do you have a plan? The loonings are so convinced of their superiority that they don't believe we'll attempt to escape. You know the ship is just as we left it. Look, Clay, I know they've given us total freedom, but don't sell them short. I'll bet they've got a ray or something that they'll blast us apart with before we can hit escape velocity. The loonings have no such weapons. How do you know? Until now, they had no need for any. Remember, they're one nation. Oh, they have the knowledge, all right. If more expeditions start coming, I don't doubt they'll work out a defense system. What puzzles me is, with all their knowledge and scientific ability, why hadn't they explored Earth? They did, with radar telescopes and interceptor radio waves. You mean they picked up our television broadcasts? Oh, what a mixed-up picture of our civilization they must have gotten. I'm afraid they accumulated a very accurate picture of nations at war. That's why they don't want anything to do with us. Clay, I, I don't want to live out my life on the moon. I second that motion. Even if they've got weapons we don't know about. Okay. Now, let's go up to the surface. We walk on a sand path so we'll be able to spot any moving footprints. And if you should hear the hum from a telepathic machine, put your mind on any subject but escape. Well, there she is. Old Orion 1. I wonder if there's a guard on board. Let's find out. It doesn't seem possible that we're not being watched. Pull up the ladder and close the hatch, Joe. Ah, it's too easy. They're going to blow us up. I know. Start checking systems. Cabin pressure up. Oxygen okay. Attach harnesses. Ready to fire engines. Ready. Fire. State Central to Orion 1. You're entering radio beam range. Are you ready to hook into beam? Over. Orion 1, delighted to accept the invitation. You boys take over now. You're entering the ionosphere. Radio blank out due at any moment. Happy landing. Well, all we can do now is relax. You worried, Clay? Yes. Well, after we report to the president, he'll take over from there. That sound. Earthmen, it is now the time to make our presence known to you. They're right here on the ship. You'll let us escape. It was the wish of our ruler that you transport us to Earth. But we would have been glad to. There was no need to stow away. Our ruler is wise. He reasoned that if you knew of our mission, you would destroy your ship and yourselves. You are now controlled by radio beams from Earth. You can do nothing to prevent our landing with you. What are you going to do? We shall live among you, undetected by your inferior vision. Our mission is to bring peace to the nations of the Earth. Peace? And why the subterfuge? I think I know. The loonings believe that peace on Earth can be attained only the way they achieved peace on the moon. Through nuclear war. Yes. We will help you achieve peace. We can do it without war. We shall see, Earthman. We shall see. Will you wait? Will you give us a chance to tell the world? Is there much time? There is time, but very little time. Theater 5 has presented First Encounter, written by Leonard Stad and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Jackson Beck, Tony Darnay, William Mason, Brett Morrison, and Robert Dryden. Audio engineer, Neil Pulse. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlasdotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production. I couldn't believe it. The big iron gate was open. I walked to it and stood there. Stood on the edge of two worlds. The one behind me was the only one I really knew. But the world beyond the gate was the world of other people. If I entered it, what would he do? What would be my punishment? 
You'll hear my story as you listen to The Captive Spirits on Theater 5. daughter back, Mr. Prescott. I don't care how many men you have to hire or how much it costs. I want her back. Ah, uh, Mr. Bishop, you say her name is Caroline. That's right. And, uh, what about this photograph? Uh, it's a perfect likeness. When was this picture taken? Uh, a few months ago. Uh-huh. The Bishop, how old is your daughter? I don't see what that has to do with it. Well, I mean, if she's still a minor, then legally... Legally? What does the law know about these things? Besides, you're a private investigator, aren't you? Well, I'm afraid you may have the wrong idea of how private investigators, Mr. Bishop. We don't work against the law. Well, I'm not asking you to break any laws, Mr. Prescott. My daughter is missing. I simply want you to find her and bring her back to me. Well, did she leave this house of her own accord, or did she run away with some guy? No, no. Carolyn doesn't know any man. She could have met a young man at school. No, or... she has never gone to school. It was her mother's wish that she be educated here at home. I see. Uh, that uh, oil painting on the wall... Oh, that's Carolyn's mother, my wife. She's a very beautiful woman. Yes, she passed away when Carolyn was only seven. Oh. Mr. Bishop, how long has your daughter been missing? Uh, I noticed that she was gone about seven this morning. It's only five hours ago, not very long. She might have... Now, now, Mr. Prescott, I would hardly have asked you to drive here from the city if I weren't quite sure that my daughter is missing. She took a suitcase and some clothing with her. Have you uh, considered the possibility of kidnapping? No, I'm sure she wasn't kidnapped. Oh, then in your opinion, she ran away. Yes. You seem quite definite about that. Mr. Prescott, this isn't the first... Oh. Oh, it's happened before. Yes. How often? I... I fail to see why all these questions are necessary. Mr. Bishop, if I'm to look for your daughter, it certainly won't do any harm to learn all I can. But while you're asking these questions, heaven knows what may be happening to her. Why didn't you bring the police into this? Because I'd like to avoid gossip and publicity. Also, I I want this to be handled discreetly. I've always shunned notoriety of any kind. As for Caroline, she's lived a very sheltered life, a very happy, peaceful life. Oh, did you notice the garden as you drove past? I, yeah, I was quite impressed by it. It's Caroline's garden. Mr. Prescott, tell me, could a garden that beautiful be tended by an unhappy girl? Now, look, Mr. Bishop, I didn't say I thought she was unhappy. No, but but you suggested it. At least you gave me that impression. Well, I didn't mean to. I'm just trying to find out all I can about your daughter. All you need to know is that she's missing and that I want her back desperately. Mr. Bishop, if I find your daughter and she refuses to come back, I'd have to let it go at that. I couldn't force her to do something against her wishes. Well, why didn't you tell me this when I spoke to you on the phone? Because you told me that your little girl was missing. I assume she was a child. Well, perhaps if I were to offer you a sizable bonus... Oh, no, would... no. Mr. Prescott, what are your conditions? Well, if I find your daughter, I'll tell her that you're most anxious to have her back. And if she says she won't return? I'll contact you and give you all the information I have. Including the address where she's staying? If I have that information, yeah. <laughs> But understand this, Mr. Bishop. Yes? The moment she tells me she doesn't want to return to you, that's when I drop the case. Now, if those conditions aren't satisfactory... You leave me no alternative. Too much time has been lost already. All right, Mr. Prescott, I accept your conditions. But for the love of heaven, get moving. Tickets. Tickets, please. Miss? Hmm? Oh, I beg your pardon. Ticket, please. Oh, yes. Uh, well, the young lady's looking for her ticket conductor. Here's mine. There you are, sir. Thank you. Miss? I, uh... Is something wrong? Oh, I don't have a ticket. Did you lose it? No. Well, if it's any help, conductor, I saw the young lady board the train at the last stop. Yes, that was Baysville. Where are you going, miss? To the city. I'll have to collect your fare. Let's see, Baysville to the city, that'll be two seventy-five. Oh, mm-hmm. Two dollars and seventy-five cents, please. Oh, yes, I, I, uh, I have some money. Oh, silver dollars, huh? Here you are. I'll have to give you some change. A quarter. Here you are. Thank you. Tickets. Tickets, please. <clears throat> I did that myself once. Oh, 
Yes. Were you speaking to me? Yes, I uh, said I did that myself once. Oh. Got on the train without a ticket, I mean. I forgot about the ticket. Yes, you uh, seemed to be in quite a hurry when you boarded the train. I uh, couldn't help noticing I was looking through the window. Uh, my name's Jeff Tanner, by the way. Oh, I'm uh, Caroline Bishop. I'm happy to know you. So you're going to the city? Yes. Oh, so am I. Oh, do you live in the city? Oh, I was born and raised there. Oh, please tell me about it. Haven't you ever been there? No, but I've heard my... I've heard my people talk about it. And I've always wanted to go to the city. It must be very exciting. Sometimes. I guess it's like most big cities. Just don't expect too much, and maybe you won't be disappointed. Hmm. Uh, incidentally, I uh, know it's not my business, but... Uh, yes? Those silver dollars in your purse. Oh. You don't uh, often see silver dollars in this part of the country. You must have 50 of them. 63. That is, there were 63 before I paid my fare. I've been saving them. My thought... I received a dollar each week for tending the garden. <laughs> well, I know of easier ways to get rich. Well, it was just that... No, it... I know. Look, uh... You mustn't pay too much attention to what I say. I'm always making something out of nothing. That's my business. Your business? I'm a journalist. Oh. Uh, some people are kind enough to call me a political expert. My. As a matter of fact, I've just been to the state capitol. Huh? I'm doing a series of articles on the Senate. Your work must be very exciting. Oh, every now and then. But for the most part, it's a pretty boring business. Uh, Caroline, now... I'm going to ask a question that's absolutely none of my business. But, uh, will you be staying with friends or relatives in the city? No. So then you've made a reservation at a hotel? Well, no. I haven't made any plans. Well, I'm glad I asked. You see, this is the convention season, and every room in the better-known hotels has been booked. And some of the hotels that have available rooms, well... Well, they're not the kind of places I'd recommend to a girl like you, believe me. Well, what can I do? If you'll let me, I'd like to help. Oh, you are being very kind to me. And I'm grateful. The fact is, I know a manager of a very nice little hotel that's only a short distance from the train station. I'm sure you're going to like it. It's a beautiful room. Thank you so much. Well, not at all. I uh, guess you're tired, huh? Well, yes, I am. Well, then I'll leave you in just a moment. But uh, I was wondering... Uh, yes? You see, as an employed journalist, I have a certain amount of influence in this town. I, uh, just enough influence to get two tickets for the musical comedy at the Majestic Theater. It's uh, sold out for almost a year in advance. Oh, well, anyway, I was thinking uh, after you rest, maybe you'd like to see it with me. Oh, I... Of course, uh, if you'd rather not, I'll understand. Oh, no. No, Jeff, I I'd, I'd love to go. Well, fine. And uh, maybe, if you like, we could have dinner before the show. That'd be very nice. Oh, great. Uh, pick you up at seven? All right. Have a good rest, Caroline. Glad you enjoyed the show. Oh, I didn't think it was possible to laugh so much. I didn't think laughter could sound so wonderful. <laughs> My, it's been a perfect evening. Dinner and the show, and, and now this lovely little place. You know something? Tonight, for the first time in my life, I really like this city. Oh, Jeff. No, I mean, I really like it. I, I even like the people. Oh. <laughs> Carolyn... Well, I don't know how long you're going to stay here, but please, don't leave without giving me fair warning, huh? Jeff. How long are you staying? Please, don't let's talk about that. But it's very important to me. I, I mean that. Let's just think of now. Oh, Jeff. What is it? 
Carolyn, what's wrong? Jack. Jack. He's trembling. That, that man near the door. Well, what about him? He's staring at me. Oh, Jeff, I'm afraid. Do you know that man? No. Well, then why should you be afraid of him? I don't know. I... Jeff, he's coming this way. <laughs> It's all right, Caroline. Now, look, there's no need to get excited about this. No one's going to get excited, not if you just move along and mind your own business. I only want to have a few words with a young lady. Who are you, and exactly what do you want? Now, make it quick. All right, I was hired by this girl's father. Jeff, to... please, take me out of here. No, I'm out of his bishop. Don't touch me. I only want... My arm! Let go of her. As soon as I've said my piece... Jeff! I said let go of her. Now, look here, young man. All right, you... Come on, Caroline, let's get out of here. <laughs> no, it's all right, Caroline. It's all right. You're safe now. <laughs> that man. My father sent him. Oh, Jeff, I don't want to go back. Don't let them take me back, please. Now, you don't have to go anywhere you don't want to go. But you don't know my father. He never gives up. I was a prisoner in that big house. There were always walls around me. And then... And someone made a mistake. And the gate was left open. I didn't dare believe it. I thought that if I looked again, the gate would be locked. I packed some things and took the money I saved. And I went back to the gate and it was still open. Oh. You can't imagine how it felt to be able to leave that place. Caroline... Why did your father do this to you? He didn't want me to see the outside world. I remember once he said the world was cruel and so were the people in it. He said his duty was to protect me from the world. Well, no normal man acts like that. He isn't an ordinary man, Jeff. He always gets what he wants. No, not this time. Oh. Oh, you're so good to me. Because I care for you. Oh, Jeff. Why do you turn away? Caroline, what is it? I'm afraid. Afraid of my love? Of my father. You just don't know him. Well, now, look. He's a man. Not some kind of untouchable god. Just a man. Now, all we have to do is go to the police. No, and... you said you'd look after me. I will. Well, then take me away. Jeff, take me someplace where my father will never find me. Caroline, that won't solve anything. All I want is peace, can't you see? Don't you understand? I'm trying to. You don't know how it was. No one can know how it was. Now, darling, trust me. Believe me when I say that I won't let anything happen to you. I love you. Then take me away, Jeff. If you don't, I'll go by myself. I'm sorry, Jeff, but I mean it. Try to understand. I don't want to lose you, but I'm so afraid. There's something that you're keeping from me. I don't know what you mean. Why are you so terribly afraid of your father? I told you he kept me a prisoner. Look, it has to go a lot deeper than that. Please don't ask me any more questions. I've got to. Now, darling, I want to help you, but I can't fight something unless I know what I'm fighting against. Now, if you've done something wrong, tell me. No. I, I don't care what it is, I'll stand by you. I haven't done anything, except to run away. Why? What did you run away from? Please don't ask me now. Please not now, Jeff. Then you will tell me? Yes. I promise that you'll know everything. When? Soon. The young man, thank you for coming to see me. Uh, what's your name, please? Didn't your private detective tell you? He's no longer working for me. He said you refused my offer of a thousand dollars. That's right. Oh, the young idealist, eh? You can't be reached with money, or perhaps I haven't gone high enough. 
You're an old man, Mr. Bishop, so I'll forget you said that. Tell me something, Mr. Uh, uh, you know, a man as tough and as brave as you are shouldn't be afraid to give me his name. It's Jeffrey Tanner. All right, Mr. Tanner, let's not waste any more time. Exactly what do you want, or should I say how much? I came here expecting to dislike you, Mr. Bishop. I haven't been disappointed. Where is my daughter? Now, that's something I'm not prepared to tell you. How much money do you want, Mr. Tanner? Don't, don't bother bothering with me. Just tell me how much. I think you really believe I came here to get some money from you. There's nothing else for me to believe. Well, have you considered the possibility that I might be in love with Caroline? In love? Or have you gone so sour on the world that you don't believe such a thing could happen? No. How did you meet my daughter? If you must know, we met on a train. When? Yesterday. When did you see her last? About eight hours ago. How, how was she? Fine. Except for one thing. She's terrified of you. What did you do to her? No. She's not afraid of me. I'm certainly not going to take your word. Oh, I, I don't doubt that she told you that she was afraid of me. I don't even doubt that she believes it. What's that supposed to you, mean? You don't know. I don't know what. What are you trying to say? You are in love with her. Heaven help you. Look, what is this? My, my boy, look. Look, look. look at that oil painting on the wall. All right. So it's Carolyn. No, it's her mother. Carolyn was only a child when that painting was done. My wife was a beautiful woman. But two years after she sat for that painting, you wouldn't have known her. She was an old woman. An old woman who cringed in corners. Mr. Bishop, you probably have some reason for telling me all this. I do, believe me. You see, Carolyn's mother died in a, in a mental institution. What? When Carolyn was six years old, she began to show the same symptoms. No. Oh, no, I won't believe it. You're lying. Look, I spoke with her for hours. She was intelligent. Her, her reactions were completely normal. I know. That's what makes it so cruel. Every now and then she has periods of clarity. Sometimes they last for as long as two days, but never longer. She always reverts, always becomes a child again. Now, it isn't true. I'm sorry. I won't let it be true. There's nothing that can be done about it. Well, there are doctors. Oh, I've had her examined by the best specialists in the world. There's no hope. My boy, look, look, look at me. You call me an old man. I, I'm only 45. Look into my eyes. How much suffering do you see there? You've loved her since yesterday. I've loved her for almost half my life. Caroline. You must believe me. But she said she was afraid of you. No, no, she, she doesn't really know what she's afraid of. But I, I do. I know what happens each time she... Reverts back. I've seen it so many times. If she's in a strange place, she knows nothing but, but stark terror, Mr. Tanner. Oh, you can't let that happen. Not if you love her. Caroline, dear, this gentleman has come to see you. Oh. Hello, Caroline. Good morning, sir. Do you like my garden? Yes, it's very lovely. I'd give you a flower, but when you cut them, they die. I'm sure you wouldn't want that to happen. No, no I wouldn't. You can pick out a favorite, and I'll keep it for you. Um, would you like to walk with me through the garden? I'm sorry. I really must be going. Goodbye, Caroline. Goodbye, sir. Oh, my. It's so strange. Mm, what is, darling? That gentleman's face, I remember it. Almost as if I saw him in a dream. Yes, darling. You saw him in a dream. Presented The Captive Spirit, written by Don Herring and directed by Warren Somerville. 
In the cast, Paul McGrath, Joan Loring, Ian Martin, Stan Watt, and Yafet Kato. Audio engineer, Marty Folia. Sound technician, Terry Ross. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. has been an ABC radio... Human speech is the music of civilized man, and it is the sentimental memory of men who once were civilized. Theater 5 presents The Talkers. Civilized man. And 
It is the sentimental memory of men who once were civilized. Men in their various prisons yearn to talk to one another. Even in the underground caves of a radioactive land, they will crawl like listless alligators. Just to talk together and to pretend they are men again. Men who are human and social and articulate. new ones. Uh, look, look, you see that cloud up there? Yeah. Way above the mine shaft across from us. Uh, I see. <laughs> I see. Look, they're different from the old ones. They're like big crickets, don't you think? Ah. Uh, these are bigger. They're more like flying grasshoppers. Clag, I saw them last time I looked out. Just listen. Uh. They're noisier, too. Lots of them. <laughs> Boy, there's lots of them. Oh, Frank, I think it's a good sign. I, I really do. There's nothing growing, of course, not even a weed, but even so, they must be living on something. <laughs> must be. That stands to reason, all right. Got to live on something. It's getting bigger, too. Mm. I used to think they lived on one another. Like the fish in the sea, you know. The big fish eats the little fish, and the bigger fish eats the big fish. Right. What did the little fish eat? Huh? Little fish? Well, there's an answer for that. But I forgot it. Clag. Clag, look at them now. Uh, look. They cover the whole countryside. And they're not eating each other. Hey, hey, look at those over there. <laughs> when we first came out, you remember, there was only the dust and nothing in the air at all. How come the dust doesn't bother them? I don't know. I used to think they were like us. You know, like we come out here and sit when the dust isn't near the shaft's opening. I thought they would fly to some clear patch of clean air. But that new bunch there is right in the middle of some dust. Marco, Marco, you see that? Yes, yes, yes. I, I see that. Frank, I told you about that the last time we came out here to talk. I like to talk. Oh, oh I, I really do. <laughs> yeah, really. You, you can't talk down there. And in the dark and all. You're right. You just can't talk down in the dark. That's all there is to it. You know, we tried it month after month. No, it only makes sense out here. Out here where we can see each other's faces. You can't talk down there. No. It's too dark. We found ourselves mumbling and groping for words. Yes. Oh, it takes some night just to talk. We can talk out here. All right. Yeah. Mm. Uh -huh. <laughs> Clegg, you remember I told you about the flies and the DDT? How they made this new poisonous chemical years ago just to kill off the flies and uh -huh. how the flies developed their own immunity to it and instead of being killed, they got bigger and fatter from it? I remember <laughs> you telling me about the flies and the... Uh, D, 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 yes. Good. Good. Now, what else did I tell you? Marco, I don't really remember. I, I was just talking. It's all right, Clagg. It doesn't matter. Uh, Listen to me. I, I figured then 
that the insects, for some reason, were the only form of life that had developed some immunity to radioactive dust on the surface. Huh? And today, when I watched these new bigger bugs, I, I was sure of it. It's like a fly. And the DDT. Only it's not, no. No, 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 no. I, I didn't really think it was. Clag, I, Clag, will you listen to me? Huh? Uh, I think I've figured out what's happening. We're all underground because of the dust, however many of us there are left. The dust keeps us off the surface. But these billions and billions of insects get bigger and more plentiful as time goes on. It's... Clag, can't you see what I mean? No. Honest, Merker, I can't see. Where are all the bugs coming from? Huh? How, how come they don't die? Don't you they... understand? The radioactive dust is coming to life right before our eyes, Clag. Uh, now that is where the bugs are coming but from. But where are all the bugs coming from? They are coming from the dust. The dust is turning into bugs. Now, now, pay attention. Instead of a cloud of dust, we're getting a cloud of insects. That's what's happening. Some new cycle of life is happening. Oh. Oh. Uh, no wonder they're so good. No, 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 no. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Look, I don't mind you catching them, but I've told you before, wait, wait until you get down below. Now you wait, or I won't talk to you anymore. I mean it, I won't talk to you. All right. I'll wait. I'll wait. I sure like to talk. I, I really do. I do. Oh, Michael, Michael, please, please. Don't worry, Michael. I'll wait. I'll wait. I really will. I really will. But you forgot again. No. I wouldn't miss the chance. I, I, I like to talk. I only forget what I forget. No, Clag. No. Now, now save it. Keep it until later. Now, you promised me you would. They're getting bigger and bigger. I know, I know. Oh, look how much bigger the clouds are. That is less dust, too. It's happening, isn't it? What's happening? Well, what you said about the dust starting new life and, and, and turning into bugs. Yes. Yes, I really think so. There's no way of proving it, but it certainly looks that way. But it... Oh, I'm sorry, Michael. I, I, I won't do it again. I... Glad I don't mind anymore. Just as long as I'm not watching. Now, if you want to talk with me, you'd better wait like you promised. Uh, I, I love to talk. I... Let's talk about the old days. <laughs> the old days. Oh, yes, it was funny in the old days. I don't even know how long ago it was. Ah, Probably many years. Oh, many years. Oh, many years. Here we sit on the edge of a hole in the ground, worse than animals, really. You know, in the old days, I changed my clothes two and three times a day. Mm-hmm. I changed everything. Underwear, shirt, socks, everything. Oh. Now all I've got are my sores. Now, yours seem to be healing, Clag. Are you having less trouble? No, I'm talking all day. 
All day. All day. I'd have a martini or two at the bar before lunch. Could you believe it? There were 20 barmen in town who knew exactly how I liked my martini. Very dry, whisper of a twist, once around the rim, and a certain kind of anchovy oil. Yes, I didn't even have to order. Just smile and nod as I went on with the conversation. <laughs> Isn't that absurd? Won't you think of it? And here we are, years later, surrounded by bugs. Bugs. Of all things. Huge crickets and giant grasshoppers taking over what's left of the world. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Clag, mm. come here. Come here, closer. Oh. You see this? What's that? That's a piece of glass. That's what it is. Just a fragment of glass. Look, look, you can see through it. Eh. I don't think it's window glass. Hey, 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 hey. That's glass. That's what it is. That's glass. That's glass. glass. I think it's from a tumbler or a cocktail glass. You, you see how thin it is? Now, it's just a tiny fragment of glass. But it reminds me of the old world where men looked through windows and drank from delicate, transparent containers. That's glass. That's glass, all right. <laughs> Clegg, we decided once that we... Knew where this place was, didn't we? Mm -hmm. And didn't we figure out that this was West Virginia? Now, I, I think we guessed this was West Virginia. Now, didn't we find some bills of lading or something marked West Virginia, didn't we? West Virginia. West Virginia. West Virginia, Charleston, or Boston, or wherever you could drink with the help of a little glass. Yes, indeed. My martinis came surrounded by glass like this. <laughs> And all that's left is a sliver of glass not really adequate to cut your throat with. Martinis <laughs> and stark shirts. And lie and laugh and try to swindle each other. Ah, uh, yes, the old days were funny, all right. We were so busy changing suits and ordering martinis and trying to pull off a sophisticated swindle that we didn't even hear the bomb go off. <laughs> well, we live like kings. You know, if you think of it right, sheets and talcum powder, deodorants, air conditioning. And now we lie on our faces for hours in the dark of a mine shaft, alone, afraid to breathe too deeply. <laughs> the underground seepage keeping our wounds from healing. That'll do a little bit better, Clag. Must be the trips up here to the outside. Clag, Clag. <laughs> it sure doesn't do much for your speech patterns, listening to those bugs. And gorging yourself with those blasted insects don't help your conversation either. Better. Clag, what did we used to talk about over the martinis? What did we talk about over the martinis? I, I think we lied mostly, setting up some swindle or other. You know, all our sores were on the inside then, covered up with the talcum and the linen and the deodorants and the fancy tailoring. You know, Clagg, if I in the old days could have seen myself sitting here now, right now, I mean, not knowing that this was me, but just seeing me... Do you know what I would have done? <laughs> I would have screamed. That's a fact. I never could have visualized a living being in this condition. Look at me, man, hair. Scabrous flesh. Foul smelling. Flag. You should see yourself in this light. You don't look like a man any longer. Really, Clag. Your arms are leathery, skinny. They look more like sticks. And I swear they even bend the wrong way. Clag. Clag, your head, your eyes. I told you not to take so many. Clag, talk to me. Talk, man, talk. Clag. Please try to say one human word. You're gone, Clag. You won't talk to me anymore. 
You've lost the power of human speech, just as I've forgotten how to scream. I'm trying to scream, but I can't scream any more than Clag can talk. Oh, Lord, please hear me screaming. I really scream. Human speech is the music of civilized man, and it is the sentimental memory of men who once were civilized. Presented The Talkers, written by Burr McCloskey and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Donald Buca and Robert Dryden. Audio engineers, Marty Folia and Neil Pulse. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Original music by Alexander Vlas Dutsenko. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. has been an ABC Radio Network. Why does the wind keep blowing? Why does the wind keep blowing? The wind stings my eyes. I stood at the gate all day. And as people from the other towns passed by, I asked them if their skies at home were dark. No, they said. The weather has been fine. The sky has been full of stars. Why do you ask? How could I tell them why I asked? Could I say, there's nothing but this lonely wind? Could I say, we have no stars? Theater 5 presents The Noon Star. It was St. Augustine who said, Thou hast forgiven me those sins which I have done, and those sins which only by thy grace I have not done. But I say to each of you in this church, the sins you have not done are the secret sins, the sins of inclination, the sins of it might have been. God. Yes? That's not what St. Augustine meant. What? He meant the sin was forgiven, not that it had to be paid for. Cast out the secret sin, I say. Cast out that which inclineth. And may God have mercy on you, each and all. <clears throat> Must I speak to him, God? You're my wife, Elspeth. You've got to learn to live here. Oh, it's a fine sermon, Reverend. Thank you, Mr. We need hard thoughts to shape our minds on. It was a forceful sermon, Reverend. Thank you. Oh, I like that word, Mrs. Hanson. Your wife's got a head on her, Garth, even if she's not from uh, hereabouts. Father? Yes, what is it, boy? Uh, may I meet Jonathan out front? Silas, this is Sunday. This is not a day for games and laughing. Remember that. Center your mind. Yes, sir. Will I see you at the council meeting, Samuel? You will. There are stringent matters, Garth. 
Oh, he's one of the few, that man. No nonsense with Samuel Cole. No, not even for the children. Hmm? Uh, what my wife means, Mrs. Brokeen, is that she admires the sobriety of our town. The order of it. <laughs> What's all that noise? What's going on there? Look at all those children in the square. What, what's uh-huh. going on out there? Who's making all that noise? They're gathered around that red-haired boy. Do you know him, God? No, maybe the others do. What does this mean? What's going on out there? Silas, come here. Yes, sir. What is the meaning of that laughter? Who, who is that boy? Oh, I don't know, Father. He says he can see the stars. Right now, in the middle of the day, he can see the stars. <laughs> That's what he says. <laughs> oh, come up here, boy. Come here, at once. That boy's a stranger. What's he doing here? Uh, yes, sir. Now, what's this nonsense about? Nonsense, sir. About seeing stars? Uh, they're up there, sir. Don't be impudent, boy. Oh, oh, no, sir. I only meant that all I have to do is look. I don't know why, but I can see them. <laughs> see? There's our tourists. Orion, Polaris over there. And that's Sirius, the dog star. I like the dog star. Why do you like it? Oh, I don't know. It follows me. <laughs> you mean you really see them now? It's unnatural, Reverend. It's devil's work. It's wrong. Wrong. Boy, I don't know you. I don't know your family. You're disturbing the Sabbath here. Now you go home, wherever you live. I'd uh, really like to, sir, but... Yes, I don't know where I live. I I thought maybe it was here. Does anybody know me? Do I live here? But I never heard such, well, such loneliness. When he asked me if anyone knew him, I, I thought I'd cry. It must be some lapse of memory. But where will he go? What will become of him? I don't know. We discussed it at the council meeting, but there doesn't seem to be any answer. Meantime, the boy is drifting, eating when someone feeds him. Let's take him in, Garth. Care for him. I'm not sure we ought to. But he needs us. Samuel has called a special meeting of the council outside the courthouse at noon tomorrow. He had a map of the stars drawn. We're going to test the boy. If he points to the part of the sky shown on the map, then... Then what? Well, at least we'll know that he does see the stars... Or that he doesn't. Which will be better? Or worse? Oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Anson. Oh, Mrs. Prokeen, have you seen my husband? I'm still inside. The whole council studying the Reverend's map before they put him to the test. Did you see that, Jonathan? He does magic, too. Look at him. I'll teach you how, Silas. Anybody can make a handkerchief disappear. Look at him teaching those children all manner of black art. Parents, too, laughing at him like this was some carnival. The boy didn't ask for it, you know. It's unnatural the way he's made them forget their sins. Hey, here they come, Jonathan. Here comes the council. Oh, bring him over here, Simon. Hey! I'm, I'm coming. I've been waiting. Stand here with me, Garth. Follow the map while I question him. Yeah, they will be quiet among us, please. Oh, boy. Yes, sir? Now we'll see what possesses that boy. You have made the claim, boy, that you see the stars in daylight, that you know each one by name and its exact location in the sky? Yes, sir. That is uh, unusual. I have known ever since I can remember, sir, but I don't recall having to learn. And about seeing them in the daylight, well, I thought everybody could until not long ago. It's so easy if you put your eye to it. (laughs) Silence, please. Silence among us. This is a moral inquiry. I ask you now, boy, to point out the location of the star Antares. Over there, sir, on the northern horizon in the constellation of Scorpius. Six stars down from the left eye of the scorpion. Correct. Correct. Silence, please, silence. I remind you, this is a grave matter. Now, boy, the star Pollux. Pollux is there. 83 degrees south of Antares in the constellation Gemini. That is correct. And the star Sirius? Oh, that's my dog star, sir. In Canis Major, down there near the southern horizon. You can almost hear him bark if you listen. (laughs) And uh, Vega? Well, there's Vega in the Lyra group. And there's Beta Centauri and Deneb and Akernar out there. See? Well, that's amazing. And and over over in the west there, that's Regulus. Prokeon out there, up there. Capella on the wagon wheel. There's the Cygnus group, see? Well, you never hear a thing like that. 
There's Orion and Regal and Aldebaran. <laughs> order, 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 please. That, that will be enough. Oh, oh but, but, sir, I've only named the first magnitudes. There are billions of smaller ones out there all asking to be named. And... What? <laughs> order. Order, please. <laughs> And I say to each of you in this congregation that the levity displayed on that occasion was an offense against heaven. We have among us a young being of a most unsettling nature. A boy who sees what we cannot see. A boy with power to make us behave unseemly. Is that a matter for levity? Or rather, I say to you, it is a matter for apprehension. Who is this boy without a name, without a home? Why can God, he what see? What in the world is he Stop. doing? Samuel has been laughed at. He doesn't right. like that. But he's inciting oh, yes, these people is, against this child. What is this boy? And I send you back to your homes today to search out the answer. The meaning of this thing that has come to us. Look into your deeds. As you go home now, ask yourselves why he has come among us. And may God have mercy on you, each and all. <laughs> It's disgraceful, God. Do you hear what they're saying? It's convenient to have something to blame sins on. Did you hear what he said, Jonathan? He must be some kind of devil or something. Listen to the words of your father, boy. The reverend's a man of truth. Yes, Mrs. Proke. A man of vision. Come on, Jonathan, let's go. A man of poison. Quiet, Elspeth. They'll hear. But what is the council afraid of, Garth? Does the Reverend hate the boy because he's happy? I think Samuel is jealous. Of that boy? Of his power. To see the stars? No, to make people realize that there are things to Jonathan, see. Jonathan, Abel, that strange boy, he's over there. Things he doesn't want them to see? Things he doesn't dare let them see. Differences, Elspeth. If our people understand a difference, then Samuel's sameness is gone. Samuel is gone. Is that why you wouldn't take the boy in? Were you afraid of differences? Simon, Simon, let's get him. Get that strange one. If we take him in, we're lost here. If we don't take him in, we're lost everywhere. Evil, Jonathan, all of you boys. He's over there. Get him. Silas, Silas, what are you doing? What's that? Simon, don't let him run away. The boys are after him. Hold off, though. You've got to stop them. Hurry. Simon, don't hit that boy. Do you hear me? Oh, Jonathan! Simon! Stop throwing those things! Get him! Don't let him get away. After him, Simon! Go on, run away, you little cowards. But I know who you are. And I know who did this thing. Oh, you poor boy. Are you badly hurt? My my eye. I can't see, Oliver. Come along. We'll take you home. I say to you in this parish that those who seek to divide us, those who seek to destroy us by clasping the venom unto them, they alone shall be poisoned. Let it be known that we shall not only cast out the evil, but the keepers of evil. This well may be a test of our eternal vigilance against the forces of darkness that creep into our midst in strange shapes and guises. Let it be the duty of each of us to cast out evil and those who shelter sinfulness. Can you see who it is, Garth? Mrs. Prokeen. Don't let her in. You're worried. Aren't you? This is my home, Elspeth. I'll shelter anyone I choose, whether they like it or not. Yes. You still got him here? I have, and he'll stay as long as I care to keep him. It's for your own good, I'm telling you, Garth Hanson. We know about that boy now. Folks don't want unnatural things here. What's unnatural about him? The fact that he knows how to laugh? Well, you know what's unnatural. Seeing stars in daytime. Or daring to say that you do. What's that? You hate him because he's different, don't you? Because what he is makes you uncomfortable. You hate his challenge, Don't you? My advice to you is to get him out of this house so we can get him out of this town. 
People are getting tired, you being this high-handed. Good night, Mrs. Prokeen. They're goading each other on. This can be very dangerous, Elspeth. We've got to do something right now. But what? We can't put him out. We can't even let him go, not with people feeling this way. Tonight, later, when it's dark, we've got to take him away. Where? Into the next town, wherever they haven't heard of him. We've got to have him keep this star thing secret. Are we leaving our home, Garth? Has it ever been that to you? It has to you. It isn't now. It's too much to do for him. No. I don't think so. Yes, I was very gratified to announce last Sabbath that the threat has been removed. There is no further cause to fear the child has been cast from among us. We will return to our accustomed virtues of order, reason, industry, sobriety. Let us give thanks. Is it really true, Reverend? You say they left with the boy? In the middle of the night, like thieves, they took him off. But wasn't that what the council wanted? Yes, Mrs. Stoner. The Ansons have sacrificed themselves to free us of an evil thing. Is that what they did, Reverend? We shall all sleep securely tonight, owing a debt to Garth Anson and firm in our knowledge of righteousness. <laughs> It's awful dark tonight. Father? Uh, yes, boy? Why didn't you punish me for what I did to that boy? The boy is gone. We will speak of it no more. Look at the sky. There's not a star anywhere. Oh, the wind. The wind stings my eyes. Funny, the way it came up so sudden a week ago. Have you noticed the sky? Uh, notice how? It isn't a cloudy sky. The moon's bright enough. But where are the stars? There's not a single star. Silas? Yes, sir. Oh, stay close, boy. Mm. Stay here by me. It's dark. Oh, oh, where are you? Here. Take take my hand. Why does it just keep blowing? The whole week now. Well, never mind. It will pass. The other boys are scared. They say if the sky is clear, there ought to be stars. They say maybe that boy Enough, could... enough, Silas. Oh, hold my hand, Father. I'm used to the dark now. I'll take you where the others are gathered. Follow us, uh, Mrs. Brookeen. Uh, oh. uh, take my other hand. Yes, here, here. Oh, what are we going to do, Reverend? Why does the wind keep blowing? It hurts my eyes. I stood at the gate all day and asked the people from the other towns if their skies at home were dark. No, they said... The weather's been fine. The sky has been filled with stars. Why do you ask? How could I tell them why, I asked? Could I say we have no stars? Could I say there's nothing but this lonely wind? Oh, you're our pastor, Samuel. Tell us where the stars have gone. Where are they, Reverend? Where are the stars? I am not God, Mrs. Sona. How can I say where they are? You have no right to ask. <laughs> It isn't the dark I mind so much. It's that stinging in my eyes. I'm old. We're all old tonight. Father? Yes, what is it, Silas? Look. Look at the moon. Uh, yes. No, don't be frightened, boy. But it's growing smaller. It's fading. The moon is fading away. It's getting smaller and smaller. Father? Father? Pray. We are gathered here, Almighty, to beseech the return of the stars. We are lost without the stars. The moon grows small and pale, like a dull coin in the black sky. Return us to the light. What's everybody waiting for, Father? Why do they just stand here in the square? Uh, they're hoping. Oh, we've got to find them, Reverend. We've got to find Garth and his wife and that boy. We must get them back. We must bring the boy back to us. If we can, if we can. He'll come back if we find him. Call a meeting. Send out the town. Send everyone to find them. Look, if all of us search, yes. if we all look everywhere. Oh, speak to them, Reverend. Uh, speak to them now. Send them out to find yes, them. Yes, yes. 
My, my people, I, I ask you to listen. The boy must be brought back among us. We must search for him in every town around us. How far must we walk? Oh, it's, it's huh? just uh, across this ridge. Oh, it's dark. Oh, the wind stings my eyes. I, I'll, I'll just stay here. No, no, help her up, Silas. We can't leave her here. Oh, I'm old. It's too far to climb. Oh, come. You've been on the ridge road before. Yeah. Uh, we'll yeah. soon be at the top. Yeah. Come now. Oh, come. Oh, oh, wait. Oh, hold up the lantern, what? Silas. What's the matter? The road here. Oh. It's overgrown as though we wandered off. We haven't. It's, it's solid underfoot. What are these vines? What are these trees and weeds? The road is blocked. It ends here in the tree. Oh, how can oh. I? I was on it a week ago. Father, look. Look down below. Where? It's gone. It's gone. The town is gone. The town is gone. The town is gone. The moon. What? Look at the moon. It's getting so small. It's drifting faster. Faster. It's like a drop of dew out there. It's going. It's going. It's going. Where is it? Where is it? Where, where is the moon? Where are the stars? There's Vega in the Lyra group, and there's Beta Centauri and Deneb. Out there is Regulus and Procyon. Theater 5 has presented The Noon Stars, written by Richard McCracken and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Paul McGrath, Alice Yerman, Cecil Roy, Tom McDermott, Lorraine McMartin, Evelyn Juster, and Bryna Rayburn. Audio engineer, Neil Pulse. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastatsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production. The house was something out of a nightmare. The girl, something out of a dream. The house was old and strangely ugly. The house was something out of a nightmare. The girl, something out of a dream. The house was old and strangely ugly. The girl was young and strangely beautiful. <laughs> Theater 5 presents The Nameless Day. Another day of rain. Why is it that when it rains, I'm reminded of a thing? Not distinctly, never in detail, 
Not even where or how or when it happened. But I'm sure it was some time ago. Yes, it must have been because I've been in this asylum many years. How different things might have been had I never met them. It was Canada, Quebec. I was ill. As I rode past Laval Prison, things suddenly blurred before my eyes. I got off my bicycle and stumbled into the guardhouse. Yes, I think that's what it was. I had fallen on a bench, weak with fever. Monsieur. Monsieur. Huh? This guardhouse is not an hotel, monsieur. It is not permitted to sleep here. Oh, I... I was suddenly dizzy. You are drunk? No. Excuse me, monsieur. It was then I saw them for the first time. Suzanne, austere, straight, and solemn. And Lorette, gentle, tender, hauntingly beautiful. It was not until later that I realized, or thought I did, that I saw the man standing behind them, his beard fouled and matted, his face impassively brutal, full of madness. Was he there? I saw him later, I think. He must have been there if any of this is true. Do I understand that you are ill, monsieur? A, a low fever, madame. I've had it for several days. Then you need rest and food. Dorette and I have little to offer, but we should like to help you. Well, that's kind of you, but... Do not deny us, monsieur. My sister and I could not forgive ourselves. Well, since you put it that way, thank you. I have since wondered, although they tell me I shouldn't, whether the man with the beard was there. It isn't clear. It wasn't then. But I could almost swear he drove that cab. Lorette had not taken her eyes off me once. They were very beautiful. They were almost violet, her eyes. And she turned them shyly away each time I turned to look at her. Lorette, that's your name? Yes. You haven't asked mine. We do not inquire too deeply. Perhaps it comes of being so much alone. You will tell us if you wish. I'm David Nielsen. I'm... I'm grateful for your kindness. Yes. Hey, dear, here we are. Lorette, you will take Mr. Nielsen to the house while I pay the bill. Huh? Oh, wait, Susan. Please. Come with me, Mr. Nielsen. Uh, David. David. I followed her across a courtyard, fenced in by a high stone wall. She moved so gracefully. If she had not, I might have paid more attention to Suzanne. But even so, I think I remember hearing Suzanne say... Driver? Where, oui, madame? Take this. When the work is finished, you will have the rest. Ben, oui, madame. À quelle heure? You will come at three. You shiver, monsieur. Is it again the fever? Yes, I... I think the rain brings it on. Oh, come. It will be warmer in the house. Suzanne will be up at once with something to eat. It is somewhat difficult with the kitchen downstairs. Ah, here. But we have always preferred this room. It is more comfortable. Do you like it? Oh, yes. It looks very comfortable. Do you... You and your sister live here alone? Yes. It is many years now. Our parents died when I was quite young. Well, it seems so... so remote, with no other houses. Are you never afraid to be here alone? Afraid? <laughs> Suzanne is afraid of nothing. But we are quite safe here. The wall around the house is very high. Uh, you see? Uh, is, is that gate the only entrance? Ah, uh, yes. Suzanne keeps it always locked. <sighs> Do you mind if I ask a question? No, monsieur. Why do you look at me that way? You have since we met. I do not know. Never before have I wished... Wished what? Yes, Lorette. 
Wished what? Oh, that we... Uh, that we had more to offer you, monsieur. I have brought quite sufficient. And the wine is chilled. Do sit down, monsieur. Thank you. Later, we shall make a bed for you here on the couch. It is quite comfortable. I don't know how to thank you. Drink the wine, monsieur. It is most nourishing. And very good. Monsieur, I... The wine is very strong. That with your feet. The wine is precisely what you need, Florette. You must find it lonely here. So far from everyone. No, we do not mind. And our nearest neighbor would supply little comfort. Why? It is a surgical college, monsieur. Please, do not talk about it, Suzanne. My sister is easily disturbed. She seems to believe the, the quite lurid stories one hears about the place. Eh bien, we must make the bed, Laurette. I will get the comforter. Yes, Suzanne. As she went about the room preparing the couch for me, I could think of nothing but the softness of her eyes, the ethereal grace of her movements. I was captivated. Laurette, is she always so, so overbearing? She is very strong-willed, but she is... All I had ever had. No friends? We do not go much among people. But you should. You have a right to enjoy life. Oh, oh I should love that. But it is not possible, David. There is so much you do not know. So much I, I could not tell you. I won't ask. But don't stay here and wither. But I have stayed... And I have withered. That is the way it was. That is the way it must be. Was? What is past. Does that not condition what is in the future? Oh, if you had come sooner. If only you had asked me long ago. Long ago? Please, listen. You must leave at once. You must leave. I have brought you a comforter, monsieur. We rise early. If you should hear us, do not let it disturb you, eh? Nothing could disturb me tonight. So then, perhaps Monsieur Nielsen is well enough and wishes to leave? Do you propose that he walk to the city at this hour? <laughs> ah, we are keeping him from sleep. Good night, Monsieur. Good night. Sleep well, Laurette. You must forgive her. My sister's recovering from a severe illness. Until morning. You will understand, of course, that all this was filtered through fever. I was not well, and some of what I report may not be true. But it is true as I remembered it then and now. As for what happened next, I have, I believe, a total recall. No doubt because I was horrified. I lay on the couch, fully clothed, thinking of what had happened. A kind of anxiety nagged at me. I got up, faced the room. I stopped before an old print hanging on the wall. It was curiously revolting. An aged lithograph of a lynching. The victim strung from the hayloft beam of a grain and feed store. The singular thing about it was that the figure in the picture had been quartered. The arms and legs made separate from the torso by four slim lines. I moved to another print. This one of highwaymen brutally dismembering the driver of a stage. I turned it to the wall. I lay down on the couch, telling myself that more than half of this was fever. Another chill went through me. I reached for the quilt, a patchwork of flame, and caught a corner of it. It was stiff. I looked. It was stained. It was blood, dry and old. But blood. I flung it aside. Yes? David, open the door, please. What is it? You must go, David. Leave, now. Why? Can't you tell me why? No, the gate is locked, but you must get out somewhere. Go, please. Go where? <gasps> I must apologize, monsieur. She has had an emotional disturbance. I regret if she has alarmed you. Go to your room, Lorette. No! 
you see. It is quite severe. Oh, David, leave now. We will see you in the morning, monsieur. Why did I stay? Was I mad even then? Or had I fallen in love with her? Have you ever been ill enough to wonder where yesterday has gone or where tomorrow belongs? I think it was immediately after she closed the door, but I can't say for sure. I started back toward the couch. A board beneath my foot moved loosely. I tried to pry it up. It would lift and then slide back, but I got it at last. I put my hand into the opening and felt something there. An old wooden box, unlocked. I had to know about these people. There were papers, old and yellowed. Rings, about five of them. And three watches. I snapped open the back of one of them and read the inscription. You will not believe it, but the watch was mine. David Nielsen, 1910. It was inscribed to me ten years before I was born. How? Was this delirium? Where was time? Where was I? I snapped it shut, cold with fear. I knew I must get out now. I pulled at the door. It was locked. I searched for a key. There was none. She had locked it on the other side. Lorette! Lorette! Where was she? Suddenly I remembered... You will come at three, she had said. I ran to the window. And there he was. The creature with the foul and matted beard. In his hand, he had a length of rope. His carriage outside the gate was not a carriage now. It was a hearse. Suzanne was crossing the courtyard to him. Through the gray drizzle of rain, I saw them look up to my window. Then they moved toward the house. I tore the sheet from the couch and ripped it into four long parts. In spite of the cold and the dampness, my shirt was now drenched with sweat. With my fear, the fever was returning. It all seemed less and less real. Yet I knew I had seen them. I knew I must get out before they arrived at the top of the stairs. I had tied the pieces of the sheet together. The couch was in the window. I lashed the end of the sheet to its leg. When the window was open, I threw out the rope of the sheet and then looked down. They were coming up the stairs. I took hold of the sheet and climbed over the ledge of the window. With the fever beating in my temples, I began letting myself down. Being a stranger, I returned by instinct to the outer walls of the prison. I must have run for miles. My lungs ached. My head felt separate from my body. I fell a few yards from the guardhouse. I dragged myself the rest of the way. I think I must have collapsed just inside the door. Monsieur. Monsieur. Uh. This guardhouse is not an hotel, monsieur. It is not permitted to sleep here. I know. You told me that last night. Last night? When you said I must leave. It is not permitted to waste time near the prison. Come. No, wait. You must let me in. There's something I've got to report. Do you remember the two women I left with last night? Two women? You heard them. They offered me a place to stay. Is it the prison you wish, monsieur? Or perhaps the madhouse? What? I do not remember two women. I have never put eyes on you before. But you have. Last night, they stood not right... Not last th- night, not any time. It, it, it's not possible. Do you mean to say you've never... No, no, even with a fever, it couldn't have been just... Well, in the name of heaven, will you listen to me? You, you don't seem to understand. I've got to report two murderers. Monsieur, if you make a joke, you will have more than you ask of the prison. Come, we see the police judge. Uh, 
Why do you Americans come to Canada to go insane, huh? Now then, Mr. Neeson, I do not know quite how to deal with you. I have tried to listen to your story with an open mind, but you will forgive me, I find it somewhat difficult not to say bizarre. Then why don't you send someone to find the house, find them? One moment, Timothy. You have never been in Quebec before? Never. You have never read anything about our surgical college? Oh, never. Monsieur, you have described to me two women. You have also described the interior of their house most accurately. I, too, have a description. You will look at this, uh, these photographs, please. <laughs> ah. These are the two women? Yes. But, but the younger one had nothing to do with it. One moment, please, one moment. That is the interior of the house? Yes. Uh, I'm at a loss what to do with you, monsieur. Look, I'm not well. I have a fever. That I... is what I suspect, monsieur. What do you mean? These two women, they have been dead for 20 years. Dead? And the house they lived in has been leveled to the ground, along with the surgical college. What? A number of people became uh, inflamed. Things were sad. The house of the women was burned. Now, come here, come here. Come here. Look. Twenty years ago, through this window here, I saw those women hanged. They tell me it was the fever, that none of it could have happened. I try to agree, but I have this watch inscribed to me, David Nielsen, 1910, ten years before I was born. Where did I get it? How? When? Theater 5 has presented The Nameless Day, written by Richard McCracken and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, George Petrie, Connie Lemke, Evelyn Juster, Guy Sorrell, and Ivor Francis. Audio engineer, Marty Folia. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlasdotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network. Theater 5 presents Lorna is a Strange Child. Okay, okay. I'm trying to teach an English literature class here, so let's keep the noise down to a dull roar. Uh, that's a little better. Now, let's get back to those 19th century British poets. And that'll be enough of that. Oh, hello. Good morning, sir. Yes. May I help you? Are you a new student? 
I... Yes, uh, I'm a new student. Oh. May I see your card, please? My card? Oh, your schedule of studies. Don't you have one? Oh, no, sir. Oh. Well, you see, every new student must register with Mr. Greeley, the principal, and get a schedule. Oh, no, I couldn't do that. Oh, really, Miss, uh... Oh, Miss... my name is Lorna. Lorna what? Well, that's not important. All right, now, quiet. Well, uh, Lorna, I'm Mr. Gregory. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Gregory. I, I I shouldn't have come here. I'm not like the others. Hey, 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 take it easy. Hey, come back here. I'll tell you what, Lorna. Why don't you sit in on class, and then at the end of the period, I'll have one of the other girls take you down to Mr. Greeley's office. Oh, yes, I'd like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, okay, now. Now, to return to those poets... <laughs> Think. Think. Now, surely one of you... Look. We all feel emotions. Hate, elation, fear, joy. Well, good poetry is nothing more than emotions put into words. Now, sometimes the words are silly and sometimes they're sublime. Now, all I want you to do is choose one poetic phrase which illustrates an emotion that you've once felt. May I, Mr. Gregory? Why, yes. Go ahead, Lorna. Well, my soul hath been alone on a wide, wide sea. So lonely it was that God himself scarce seemed there to be. That's, that's by Coleridge. And why did you choose that, Lorna? Because, because that's the way it's always been with me. That's why I had to come out today. I, I had to, no matter what the consequences are. You wanted to see me, Ed? Yes, Mr. Greeley. It's about that new girl. Oh, what new girl? Well, I sent her down to register with you after the third period this morning. Uh, Lorna somebody. Well, nobody registered today. Well, but she must have. A beautiful, dark-haired girl, about 16, very shy and sensitive. What are you talking about? Well, I... <sighs> Nothing, Mr. Greeley. I must have made a mistake. Oh, Anne. Anne. Oh, gee, Mr. Gregory, I'm rushing for the last bus home. Look, look didn't you take Lorna to Mr. Greeley's office as I asked you? Lorna? Oh, yes, what a creep. We got to her door and she started getting very nervous. She wouldn't go in. But what happened to her? Oh, I... She hung around all day. She's in your homeroom now. Gee, Mr. Gregory, that bus... All right, all right, sure, Anne, go ahead. Good night, Mr. Gregory. Good night. Lorna? Why are you sitting back there alone? And why didn't you register today, Lorna? I... I couldn't. I was afraid. Oh, we have to know more about you, Lorna. First, uh, where do you live? Out. In the country. <laughs> Lorna, this is a rural school district. It takes in almost a hundred square miles. Everything's out in the country. Do you live on a farm? No. In a, in a house. Way, way off the main road. In the back hills. You, you wouldn't know where it is. Well, maybe I would. I do a lot of hunting. Well, I live with my mother and father. and the, You see, they don't know I'm here. They'd be very angry if they did. Why? Because they... You know something? I walked all the way here this morning. Walked? Well, why didn't you take the school bus? One of them must pass near your home. I didn't know what a bus was. What? Well, you see, I've never been allowed out of the house until today. My family says I'm a strange child. Ever since I can remember, I've heard them say... Lorna is a strange child. Oh, they've been very good to me. I, I can have anything I want. And they've taught me themselves. They're both brilliant. And I'm very proud of them. I... 
I love them very much. But, oh, I don't know. I, I was so lonely that, well, this morning I slipped out while they were sleeping. You see, it, it wasn't so bad when I was little. There was mother and father, and sometimes one of their associates would drop by. And father would bring me pets to play with and keep me company. Small animals, you know. But they never lived long. And then I'd be alone again. But it wasn't bad, really. But now, now I've grown up. And there's so much, so very much inside of me. And I want to meet other people. I have to meet other people, girls and boys my own age. You know? Lorna, I'd like to meet your family. No. Oh, no. It, it was a mistake to come here. My mother and father are right. I, I am strange. I don't belong well, now, here. wait a minute. Where are you going? Home. Are you going to walk? No, no. I, I'll, I'll ride on the bus. Well, the last bus is gone. Gone? Oh, it can't be. I've got to be home by 6.32. Why, that exact time. Oh, honey, I've got to go, please. All right, all right, all right. I'll drive you. No, then. no, you can't. Oh, Lorna, don't be silly. Would you promise not to ask any more questions? Would you promise to let me off at the gate and, and not try to meet my parents? <sighs> all right, Lorna. It's a promise. <laughs> Well, I'll say this is a back road, if you can call it a road. Oh, my father likes it this way. No one ever uses it except us. I see. Uh, you want the radio on again? Oh, no, thank you. Well, I thought a teenager couldn't live without rock and roll. Oh, I don't hear much music, except when my mother and father play. My father plays the violin beautifully, and my mother accompanies him on the piano. Oh, oh, there, up ahead. You see, those are the gates to my house. Those? They look as if they haven't been open in years. Where's the house? Back there. Where? You promised not to ask questions. Well, I know, but I... Oh, it's almost time. 6.32. I've got to get back. Well, thank you for the ride. And good night. But, Lorna. I'll be... Huh. 6.30. Hope she makes it. There, you see, it's funny. So believe it or not, literature can be interesting. Now, poetry isn't all just dry words, and once you get used to the different... Oh, Lorna. Oh, no, not again. Now, quiet, everybody, please. Well, I'm glad to see you again, Lorna. Do you have your schedule today? No. No, I don't. Oh, she's Lorna! Gregory, look, she's covered with scratches and bruises, and, and she's so pale. Here, Mike, Bill, help me take her down to the infirmary. Sure, Mr. We'd better call the police. Well, can't we hold off until she regains consciousness? Now, the girl is obviously on the verge of a collapse. The police might frighten her. Now, who on earth is this child? Excuse me. Oh, yes, Mrs. Parker. What? She What? I see. Yes, Mrs. Parker, I realize it wasn't your fault. The school nurse? Bad business, Ed. The girl came to while Mrs. Parker was calling the doctor. She ran out of the building and disappeared. Now, who is that child, anyway? I don't know, Mr. Greeley. But I'm certainly going to find out. And I guess it's something I have to do alone. <laughs> Who's that? Who's that? 
It's me, Mr. Gregory. Lorna! Lorna, what are you doing in there in the brush? I saw you coming from the house. I sneaked around from the back to warn you. Now you just tell me what this is all about. Please, what are you doing here at this time of day? Oh, I came as soon as I could. I had a play rehearsal after school. But you shouldn't be here. You promised. Oh, please, get away from here. Look, I'm going to bang this knocker no, until please. someone answers or this old house falls no, down. No, you've got to go. Get away before it's too late. Please. Lorna? How do you do? Father... Father, you mustn't see him. Are you Lorna's father? Yes. And you would be Mr. Gregory, the teacher. Lorna's told me all about you. Run. Run, Mr. Gregory, please. Lorna, you must excuse my daughter, Mr. Gregory. Do we have a visitor, my dear? Oh, yes, darling. Lorna's friend, Mr. Gregory. Leave him alone, both of you. You've got to run away, Mr. Gregory, please. There, 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 child. <laughs> Calm yourself. I'm... Sorry, Mother. My poor, poor baby. Well, I'm sorry if Lorna has caused you any trouble, Mr. Gregory. Yes, I hope she hasn't terrified you with those terrible stories she makes up about herself. You see, Lorna is a strange child, and it's not safe for her to go out into the world. She becomes upset. It's not safe. It's just not safe, is it, my baby? You know, last night, when she came home, she locked herself in her room and inflicted those awful bruises on herself. Lorna, is this true? Yes. But why? Because I, I'm bad sometimes. I'm not like the others, and I don't want to be like the others. So, sometimes I can't help it. I, I have to punish myself. <laughs> oh. oh, my child, my poor, poor baby. Uh, thank you for your concern, Mr. Gregory. But as you can see, our Lorna needs special care. Care that we can provide. Good evening, sir. Uh, uh, wait. Uh, maybe this is none of my business, but I am concerned about Lorna. Maybe I can help. Help? Help you to help her. If you don't mind, I'd really like to talk about this. No. No, please. Hush, child. No, hush. Please. Well, you are persistent, Mr. Gregory. Well, very well, since it is your request, won't you step inside? No. 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 That's a lovely old house. Well, thank you. We like it. It must be an antique lover's delight. Well, these are the original furnishings. We, well, that is, this house goes back to before the Revolutionary War. You must excuse the candles and the oil lamps. You see, they haven't gotten around to running power lines out this far. Yes, it certainly is secluded. It suits our needs perfectly. You see, my wife and I are both scholars, and we love our research. That is why we isolate ourselves and see so little of the outside world. But Lorna... Is... Lorna has been educated far better than most children her age. Over there, do you see that library? She has complete access to it, and she knows how to use it. Well, sir, a child needs more than an education. She needs companionship, friends of her own. Lorna wouldn't be able to cope with such things. Perhaps someday she will change and there will be a darker future for her. Darker? Oh, <laughs> did I say darker? <laughs> I meant, of course, brighter. We still have hope for her, but until such a time comes, she needs quiet, seclusion. Oh, but surely something can be done now in psychiatric care and guidance. Perhaps Mr. Gregory would like to stay for supper. We can discuss Lorna's problem. Oh, that's a splendid idea. Would you care to? Well, uh, well thank you. I'd be delighted. Now, uh, the dining room's right ahead. I, uh, I hope you don't mind eating by firelight. There's still a chill in the air. Oh, no, not at all. Oh, what a beautiful old fireplace. What is it, Mr. Gregory? Uh, those, uh portraits over the mantel. The man and woman in colonial dress. They look just like you both. <laughs> Our ancestors. They built the house over 200 years ago. Don't tell me George Washington slept here. No, no, he didn't. I'm quite certain that this is one place that George Washington didn't sleep. Huh? Uh, where's Lorna? She's having dinner in her room. She's too upset to join us. Please, uh, sit down. Uh, thank you. 
There's uh, only one place set. We don't dine until much later. You must forgive us, Mr. Gregory. We do keep strange hours. Please, Mr. Gregory, have some more. Oh, no, thank you. It was delicious, but it's getting late. And I think we ought to talk about Lorna. Ah, yes. I'd almost forgotten. Oh, would you care for some Madeira? I guarantee it's the prize of my cellar. No. I beg your pardon, dear? I'm, I'm sure Mr. Gregory doesn't drink. No, on the contrary. Even a school teacher can appreciate good wine. Uh, thank you. But... Darling, pour the wine. There we are. To uh, Lorna, Mr. Gregory. To Lorna. Mm, that is good. Now, the first thing I noticed about your daughter was... Is something wrong? Aren't you drinking? Oh, I know I'm, I'm not, am I? Why aren't you drinking? Why don't you answer me? The wine. There was something in it. I've been drugged. I can hardly move. Yes, Mr. Gregory. The wine is drugged. Got to get out. I can't move. There, now. He's about ready, wouldn't you say? We shouldn't. He's a friend of Lorna's. Well, since when has that made a difference? Yes, I know, but the others were only small animals. Well, just remember, he asked for it. Oh. oh, besides, he is right here. And look, the weather has turned foul. I certainly don't relish going out tonight. Do you? What do you want with me? Will you loosen his collar, dear, or shall I? Oh, I'll take care of it, darling. Huh. There we are. What oh, lovely tie, Mr. Gregory. Your hands are so cold. Yes, yes, I... I... Cold. I guess my hands are cold. An unfortunate aspect of our condition. Condition? Well, surely you've guessed by now. Let me see, how, how can I explain it? If you haven't guessed, I'm afraid you're in for a bit of a shock. Oh, darling... What is that awkward word those sensational fiction writers use to describe our kind? <laughs> the undead. You're, you're... Yes, the undead. That is what your kind call us. Now, my dear... I'm truly sorry, Mr. Gregory... But if you remember, I tried to prevent your getting involved with Lorna, and consequently with us. Now, even though we love Lorna very much, we realize she is strange. To our way of thinking, very strange. You see, she is human. <laughs> Theater 5 has presented Lorna is a Strange Child, written by Romeo Muller, directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Rosemary Rice, Stan Watt, Abby Lewis, Maurice Tarplin, John Seymour, and Dulcie Jordan. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlasdotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Mr. Lee Bowman. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. That's Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking.
This has been an ABC Radio Network production. Theater 5 presents Five Strangers. central portions of the country. The extremely foggy conditions are expected to extend at least into the mid-morning hours. All flights to and from this airport have been canceled until further notice. I repeat, well, this all cursed flights fog. canceled Look at it out there. Notice. Just look at Thank it. Thank you. I beg your pardon. Are you speaking to me? Uh, oh, uh, no. Uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's this rotten weather. Mm. I've been here at the airport for nine hours waiting for it to lift. Yes, I saw you when I arrived. Look, uh, haven't I seen or met you somewhere before? And of course, <laughs> Baines Cosmetics. You're Deborah Baines. That's right. Yes, I remember now about the newspaper story. It uh, concerns your new line in cosmetics, right? Well, it's a little more than that. You see, I've been negotiating with another leading cosmetics firm for, um... Well, I really shouldn't be discussing it. Oh, I understand perfectly. But it uh, it must be pretty important. Oh, it's extremely important. In fact, a great deal depends upon my arriving in Chicago before 9.30 in the morning. Well, that makes two of us, Miss Baines. My deadline is 10 o'clock. After that, things are sure to get pretty sticky. If this fog doesn't lift soon, I don't like our chances. Oh, now, can't we do anything about it? I'm afraid not. Uh, uh, by the way, my name is Monroe. Stephen Monroe. Oh, not Stephen Monroe Enterprises. <laughs> well, now it's my turn to be impressed. I've heard quite a lot about you, Mr. Monroe. Uh, don't you believe more than half of it? <laughs> Which half? Well, the half I hope they believe. They? Yeah, the two over there on the bench. The old man and the, um, the lady. <laughs> Did you say lady? Yes. She does seem a bit overpainted, doesn't she? With Baines Cosmetics, I trust. <laughs> People like them are very important to us, Miss Baines. They buy your cosmetics and my, um... Schemes? I prefer to say, buy my dreams. Oh, come now. Shouldn't you say pipe dreams? Now, I don't mean that in a nasty way, Mr. Monroe, but you must admit that most of the companies you float have a way of suddenly going bankrupt. True, but on the other hand, you must also admit that everything I do is completely legitimate. Ah, tricky, but legitimate. We both have to skirt corners a little bit, don't we, Miss Baines? Do we? As an example, let's take your deal with Antoine Laboratory Products. Since the consummation of that deal, Antoine's stock has gone down to precisely nothing, but Bain's stock has doubled in value. I salute you on that one. Thank you. And I imagine that if you keep your appointment in Chicago, Bain's stock will soon show another raise. Well, I'm not in business to lose money. No, nor I. You know, when you think about it, we're very much alike. I think I'll accept that as a compliment, Mr. Monroe. (laughs) I'm pleased that you do. However, I wonder what the public, represented by those two people over there, I wonder what they'd think if they knew the truth about us. Ah, there's the rub. I'm quite sure we won't let them learn. Ah, you're so right. The way I see it, Miss Baines, there are two kinds of people in this world. Mm -hmm. The winners and the losers. Our two friends over there are the losers. Well, yet you must admit they have a certain amount of determination. Why do you say that? Well, there are only the four of us left in here in the waiting room. And a few hours ago, there were scores of people. I wonder where it is that they're so anxious to go. And why? You know, one thing is certain. What's that? They're not together. I haven't seen them speak to each other yet. Oh, but they will, Mr. Monroe. The losers of this world need company. They have a kind of herd instinct that ultimately brings them together. (laughs) 
Yes, waiting. It, uh, it is not so nice, yeah? <laughs> I can think of better things to do. Oh, no doubt. Let me see. Uh, I have been here now for more than three hours. Mm, beautiful looking watch. Oh, thank you. You know, at one time, people took great pride in owning pocket watches like this. Entirely handmade, carefully and lovingly made. Yeah, but now, when everybody's life is actually old by time, people buy watches that come out of machines like Frankfurters. No, <laughs> oh, many of the watches are very, very good, but uh, it is not the same. Are you a watchmaker? Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah, ever since I am a young man in Europe. Uh, but now I am an American citizen for 35 years. Yeah, 35 years. But I do not lose the way of speaking or even sometimes of thinking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if you must excuse me. I introduce myself. I am Felix Kram. And I'm Sally. Sally Dowd. It is a pleasure to meet you, Sally. I hope you do not mind my talking to you like this. No, not in the least. Talk away, Mr. Cram. <laughs> uh, good. Helps to pass away the time, yeah? Oh, yes. <laughs> ah, time. Time has been my whole life. Uh, that is why I wish to fly to Chicago. There's a watchmaker's convention tomorrow. There are not many of us left to keep the old ways, but we do our best. Yeah, I'm sure you do. How nice of you to say that. How very nice. Uh, but now we talk about you, yeah? Oh, well, there isn't very much to talk about, Mr. Cram. What? No, no, that I do not believe. No, no. You are a most pretty woman, a nice person. We all have something to say, loved ones to think about, to tell others about. Nope, you're drawing a blank this time. Blank? Loved ones to talk about. They're not in stock at the moment. You have no family? That's right. Oh, I'm sorry. I did not mean no, no, to... No, no, it's, it's all right. Uh, don't let it keep you from taking out your photographs. Huh? <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> oh, just a guess, Mr. Graham. Well, I would like to show you one photograph. Here. This... This oh. is a picture of my family. Yeah, it's a very nice family, Mr. Cram. We get together a few times a year. This photograph was taken during the last family gathering at Christmas time. Uh, Sally? Yes? Yeah? You look so tired. I was born tired. It is not of my business, but where are you going? Well, I'm trying to go to Chicago. You have work there? Well, I... No, 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 do not answer. I am an inquisitive old man who asks far too many questions. I'll tell you something, Mr. Cram. You know, it's a nice change to have someone interested enough in me to, to ask questions. I am sure that many people are interested in you. Yeah, but for the wrong reasons. You see, Mr. Cram... I'm what you might call a, an entertainer. You, you, you sing? Well, I, I dance, you might say. Oh, that must be very exciting, that kind of life. Have you been on TV, Sally? <laughs> I don't do that kind of dancing. Oh, oh, oh. oh, the fog seems thicker, if anything. I have never seen such a fog. It's like smoke from a fire. If I had known about this fog, I'd have taken a train this afternoon. Yeah, well, it's too late for that now. There must be some way to get there. Yeah, if I don't arrive in Chicago by 9.30 in the morning, I stand to lose a fortune. What about me? I've planned this move for months. I'd have been there yesterday if it hadn't been for a sudden business deal. Ladies and gentlemen, listen. The latest weather report predicts widespread fog conditions to prevail over the eastern and central portions of the country for at least the next seven hours. Oh. oh. High winds are expected to reach the Chicago area by mid morning. These winds from the west will undoubtedly disperse the fog, and Chicago. 
Chicago May flight morning. from the airport will end... But it might just as well be next October September. The weather report could be wrong. Well, let's face it, Miss Baines, we've had it. Well, I am not going to give up. Neither am I. And all we can do is sit and wait and hope for a miracle. I'd give almost anything to get to Chicago. How much is that in cash, lady? What? I said, how much is that in cash? I don't see how my business concerns you. Well, the point is it could. You see, I represent Toger's Independent Air Service. Maybe you've heard our motto. We fly anywhere. If the price is right. I've never heard of your company, Toger. Well, usually we carry only freight. Do you have an aircraft available for a flight to Chicago? That's why I'm here, Monroe. Oh, you know me, eh? Of you. How do you get a clearance in this fog? I don't need a clearance. I operate from a field about ten miles from here. And you'd be willing to fly even in this weather? Well, if you don't mind flying in a DC-3. Are you a qualified pilot? (laughs) Now, look, I was listening to you two. I know how badly you want to get to Chicago. All right, I can fly you there. The rest now is entirely up to you. How much do you want for the trip, Mr. Tover? Well, a few minutes ago, you said you'd give almost anything. I'd still like to know how much that amounts to in cash. Well, I'm willing to give you $500. Uh, right now, I'm bartering with the lady, Monroe. I'm sorry, but $500 is not enough. Make it 1000 you got a deal. I have no choice. I'll pay you the $1,000. Fine. I'll have you in Chicago before nine in the morning. Well, how about me? Well, how about you? Well, I'll throw in $500. I'll tell you what, Monroe. You just wave that 500 bucks in the air and see if it'll fly you to Chicago. Now, see here. As far as I'm concerned, Monroe, you can walk. All right. All right, Toger. $1,000. Now you can fly. Um, pardon me? Yeah? I'd like to get to Chicago, too, but $1,000... Uh... How much do you have? You'd laugh if I told you. Is it more than 50? Yes. Well, that's my price, 50. What? You're charging her only $50? Ah, uh, that's the tourist rate. You're first class, but don't get me wrong, Monroe. When I say first class, I'm talking about the rate. Uh, by the way, uh, I collect my fares in advance. I don't like your attitude, Toger. Now, well, there's nothing at all that I like about you. Now, just pick up your luggage and shut up before I change my mind about taking you. Mr. Toger, what about my friend here, Mr. Cram? He'd like to come along, too. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have room for me, too, Mr. Toger? Do you have $50? Yes. Then let's go. <laughs> What is it? Uh, do you mind if I come forward? No, come on. Matter of fact, I can use the company. Yeah, sit down. Oh, right there. Be thanks. my co-pilot. Uh, there's uh, coffee in that thermos. Help yourself. You can finish it. Oh, thanks. Mmm. <clears throat> Hot coffee. Yeah. Hey, uh, you must be cold in that thin outfit you're wearing. Well, it's not the cold as much as it was the company back there. Oh? Yeah, Mr. Cram went to sleep. I was left with the other two. The con man and the cosmetics lady, huh? Oh, I knew about Deborah Baines, of course. She's always in the papers. But he's new to me. Uh, He isn't to me. My father invested money in one of Monroe's companies. Company folded. It was a setup from start to finish. My father had one major failing. Yeah? He trusted people. And you don't. (laughs) Well, you noticed that I collected my fares before we took off. What I noticed mostly was how you enjoyed taking Monroe's money. Yeah, yeah. It was exactly $1,000 that my father invested in his company. Yeah, but you charged Deborah Baines $1,000, too. Well, that was for associating with Monroe. Oh. (laughs) Soupy out there, isn't it? Couldn't get any soupier. How are we doing? Better than I expected. Hey, uh, you must be pretty anxious to get to Chicago to fly through this stuff in an old DC-3. Oh, I've got a job waiting for me. Oh? At the Paradise Club. Oh. Ah, 
you've heard of it. Yeah, yeah, I've been there. What kind of a job? Dancer. Uh huh. <laughs> Maybe I should have said strip teaser. Well, that's dancing. <laughs> you must be joking. There are worse ways to make a living. Yeah, I know. Believe me, I know. Say, uh, that old fella back there. Oh, Mr. Cram? Yeah. He likes you. I mean, in a nice kind of a way. And I figure he's a pretty good judge of character. <laughs> well, it's a new line. Funny thing is, I, I think I mean it. Hey, you're making a pass at me. Of course. A serious pass. As a matter of fact, I'm going to watch your debut at the Paradox. And I promise you, not once will I ask what a nice girl like you was doing in a place like that. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Toger, it's cold back there. You have any blankets? No. Or well, shouldn't this plane be heated? Well, cargo doesn't need heating. What's in that thermos bottle? Well, there was some coffee, Mr. Monroe, but I finished it. Where are we, Toger? 9,000 feet above the ground, halfway to Chicago. Now, why don't you just go back where you belong? Well, she's here, isn't she? At my invitation. I wonder why. Well, listen, you stink. It's man. all right, Mr. Toger. I don't mind. I grew up on talk like that. Runs off my back like water off a duck. Hey, what's what's that? Huh? Well, it's just the uh, starboard engine. I'll have to feather the prop. Don't worry, one engine will do the job. Hey, that engine's on fire. It's burning. What? Listen, both of you, get back with the others. Lie down on the floor. Brace yourselves against something. I'm taking her down. Mr. Cram, are, uh, are you all right? Uh, yes, Sally, I, I think so. Miss Baines, Monroe? We're still in one piece, Toga. No thanks to you. All right. Mr. Toga, over there. Yeah, yeah, That's I see it. A light. All right, everybody. All right. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Hello. Hello, anybody in there? For heaven's sake, try the door. It's yeah, freezing on. cold. All right. Yeah. Oh. What, a, what a strange place. It's absolutely bare. Empty. Just the door and one window. Mr. Cram, hmm? are, are you sure you're all right? Yes. Just a little tired, maybe. Well, wh why don't you sit down and rest, huh? No, my dear... I think I will stand here by the window with Mr. Toga. Uh, stay with us, Sally. All right. Here. Hold my hand. Yes. Oh, a touching sight. Well, enjoy yourself while you can, Toga, because you're in real trouble. That aeroplane of yours should have been condemned. We were fools to let you talk us into that flight. I didn't have to talk you into anything. You practically begged to come aboard. I don't think a judge and jury will be concerned about that. You mark my words, Toger. You're in real Mr. trouble. Mr. Monroe, I'm frightened. Now, there's nothing to be afraid of, Miss Baines. All we have to do is wait for a search party to find us. But the light... The light? What are you talking about? This room. It's illuminated. Well, of course it is. But there's no lamp or bulb. Where's where's the light coming from? Well, uh, and uh, there's also the crash, Monroe. We plowed straight into that mountain. Now, just look at us. No injuries. Our clothing isn't even soiled. We were spared by a miracle, Toger, but it'll take more than a miracle to keep you out of jail when I'm finished with you. Right now, Monroe, you're the least of my worries. Have a look out there. Eh? Yeah, there. Right through the window. You can see the flames, can't you? Well, it, there are men out there. Yeah. Well, we're, we're safe. Oh, look again. Go on, Monroe. Look. They seem to be carrying something from the wreckage. Five stretchers. One for each of us. I'm scared. So am I. Hold on tight. Well, what does this mean? It means we're dead. 
You fool. We're dead. We're dead. Yeah. And the question now is, what happens next? Presented Five Strangers, written by Don Herring, produced and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Augusta Dabney, Court Benson, Evelyn Juster, Robert Dryden, and William Redfield. Audio engineer, Neil Pulse. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlasdotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Ted Bell. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. That's Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production. Theater 5 presents Nightmare at 26,000. Some poop just shot up the cockpit. Huh? Wait, wait, here's the stewardess. Hey, miss. I'm sorry, Sergeant. I made it up forward. Well, didn't you hear that? No, I, I didn't hear anything. Well, they wouldn't admit it if both wings fell off. Hey, Fred, that old lady across the aisle is trying to get your attention. Huh? Uh, uh, yes, ma'am? Oh, excuse me for bothering you, but I noticed by your uniform that you're in the air corps. Do you know what's happened? You see, this is my very first flight. If it'll flight. make you feel any better, lady, I'll try and find out what's going on. Oh, thank you. Hold it, Fred. Here comes the other stewardess. Please, everyone, remain in your seats. Please, everyone. Wait a minute, miss. What happened? Nothing happened, Sergeant. Supper will be served shortly. Remain in your seats. It will all... We'll all get up at once. Oh, brother. Coffee, tea, or, or milk. <laughs> Brewster, where were you? Trying to keep the passengers in the seats. Anne, I'm glad you're here. I came forward to our compartment immediately. D did you hear? Of course I did. Captain Anderson. Captain Anderson. Bill. It's no use. I tried. And the cockpit door is locked from the inside. Oh, Miss Brewster. Now control yourself, girl. Was the door locked? No. I, I was just going to bring the crew their supper. So I know it was open. Well, if this is Bill Anderson's idea of a joke, I... Look. What? Bullet holes in the bulkhead between the cockpit and our compartment. Oh, no. Fuselage doesn't seem to have been hit. Thank heaven for that. Miss Brewster, what, what's on the other side of the door? And we have got to keep control. Now, luckily, Mr. Everett is aboard. Seat 12, first class. Get him. Mr. Everett? What can he do? And no. he is the president of this airline. Now, get him. 
Meanwhile, I'll get on the horn and try to reassure the passengers. They're about to panic. Okay. This is your hostess, Maggie Brewster. Captain Anderson has asked me to tell you that... that there was a slight technical malfunction when he spoke to you last. A bit of the movie soundtrack got mixed up with his message. Please remain in your seats. Supper will be served shortly. Oh, God, help us. Help us. Miss Brewster. Oh, get that frightened look off your face, girl. Every eye in this plane is on us. M- Mr. Everett isn't in either compartment. What? Quick, pull the screen so the passengers can't see us. Where's Mr. Everett? Well, he... He must be in the cockpit. I, I wonder. What? There have been rumors going around the past few days that Mr. Everett was finished. That he was going to be fired. I, why? Well, I don't know. Mismanagement, incompetence. Poor guy's probably getting older. I, I didn't believe it at the time, but... Anne, what if... Stewardess! It's him! Mr. Everett? Huh. Didn't you announce supper before? Serve it at once! That's what this line built its reputation on, service. Uh, Mr. Everett, sir, no one is allowed forward, not even... Not even the president of the line? (laughs) Well, that's a good girl. That's a good girl. Those rules were important. Good girl. Uh, Oh! Oh, Mr. Everett. That's a little uh, shaky in the knees. I've got a... I've got a splitting headache. Here, here, now let me help you into our jump seat. Uh, You see, you see, they were so... They were young. Very young. And, and it is not fair of them to have been so young. Oh! Miss Brewster, look! In the cockpit, they're all... What's wrong? Didn't you ever see a dead man before? Oh, no. Oh, I can't believe now, it. Now, don't be upset. There's no danger. Automatic pilot is set. We're headed for international. Fuel okay. Weather clear. We're snug as a bug in a buggy. <laughs> Automatic pilot can't bring us down. How will we land? Well, how the blazes should I know? I can't be expected to think of everything. Hey, uh, have either of you girls got an aspirin in my head? Mr. Everett, how will we land? Stop bothering me. Everyone puts their problems on my shoulders. Is it my fault I get headaches all the time? No, no, sir, but... Go away. (laughs) Take a rest, they said. Yeah. No, you've been working too hard. (laughs) Okay, okay. (laughs) Then, then I'm out on the golf course this morning. Eighteen holes, yes, sir. I can still keep up with these young punks. And I, I, I get a call at the clubhouse. Mr. Everett, the board of directors has asked me to inform you. <laughs> so, I'm out. I'm out, girl, see? Stabbed in the back by a lot of you young punks. Bunch of thin-blooded accountants suddenly think they can run an airline. Oh, where's that aspirin? I'm, I'm showing them. <laughs> I'm picking them off one by one. <laughs> First those three up there, then, then, uh... girls. I'm sorry. You've got to go too. You do understand, don't you? I, I, I'm so very sorry. He's got a gun. Of course I have. Now, just a minute, sir. Huh? May I remind you, sir? Firearms are strictly forbidden aboard a commercial airliner. I must ask you to let me keep it for you until we land. What? It's... It's the rules, sir. Oh. Oh, of course. Yes, good girl, good girl. (laughs) I'm glad you're working for us. Oh, here. Thank you. And get on the radio. You know enough about it to put out a Mayday call. Try to contact somebody. Anybody. It won't do any good. I took care of the radios, both of them. The radios? We we can't make contact. We're we're isolated up here at twenty six thousand feet. And we're flying a course directly into New York. In an hour we'll be right in the middle of the heaviest traffic on the eastern seaboard. What will we do? <laughs> well, little girl, that's a poser, isn't it? Huh? <laughs> yeah, that's a real poser. What? <laughs> It ain't my problem anymore, anymore, anymore. It ain't my problem anymore, so very late in my lifetime. Well, 
I'd say both you little ladies are earning your wings on this flight. <laughs> yes, sir. You don't know what it's you've no done. It's no use, Anne. He doesn't know what he's saying. Well, can't we do something? Is it hopeless? Couldn't we try to change the reading on the autopilot before we get into the New York flight pattern? No. No. We might lose all control. No. No, the thing to do is to see if one of our passengers can fly. Miss Brewster. Those two Air Force men. Yes, of course. Of course, I'll get them. Oh, miss, are we going to eat soon? Any moment now, ma'am. Sergeant. Yes? Please, try not to show concern. I don't want to alarm the others. Our flight crew is dead. Murdered. Charles Everett got into the cockpit and... and killed them. You think Charles Everett? Yes, he's, he's had a mental collapse. We're on autopilot now, but there's no one who can bring us down. Well, uh, why are you telling me? Well, I saw your uniforms oh, and that I... lady, I know what you're thinking, but I'm sorry. You see, not everybody who wears an Air Force uniform flies. I'm in traffic and transportation, and my buddy here is a company clerk. Pentagon pilots, you know. Oh. Lady, I took two free lessons in a Piper Cub once when I was 18, and that's it. I see. I see. Well, I, I'm sorry I had to alarm you. I... Look, just forget I told you about Everett. I... I don't know. I'm a bit confused. Please, just stay in your seats and try not to frighten the others. Will we really be having filet mignon, miss? Yes, ma'am. Yes, just as soon as we can. Attention, please. Attention, please. Captain Anderson has asked me to invite anyone on board who is a licensed pilot or who has any flight experience to be his guest in the cockpit to see how a big jet liner really works. If you can fly, please come up forward right away. Thank you. Here, here now, here. You know the rules strictly forbid any passenger in the pilot's compartment? But they've changed the rules, sir. Changed the rules again? Oh, no wonder a man can't keep up. That's the trouble with these fool bureaucrats. Then they turn on you and fire you. Everything moves too fast nowadays. And is anyone coming forward? No. No one. What can we do? I, I, I don't think they're buying that spiel of yours. Well, I guess I'll have to tell them the truth. You're going to tell them about me, I suppose. No, no, no. That won't be necessary. The authorities will handle that. If we get down. Hold on now. Well, here goes. Ladies and gentlemen... I have to tell Oh, dear Father, help us. Help us in this hour of trial. What do we do? Just keep flying till we run out of gas? It's been an hour now. We must be in the New York patterns. Maybe we won't have to wait till we run out of gas. Traffic control will have spotted us on radar and tried to make contact. They'll keep everything out of our way. They've got to. Ladies and gentlemen... We have to give you crash landing oh, dear instructions. Lord, dear Lord. Crash landing instructions? That's like handing someone an eyedropper to fight a flood. Keep quiet. I mean it. Sorry. Now, when we start to descend, make sure your seat belt is tight. Loosen your ties, belts, and place the cushion on your knees. Place your hands under your knees and your head on the cushion. Then... I think a man like Everett... Oh, is... never mind, Everett. Why not? He did it. Big deal industrialist. Former war agent. What did you say? Former war agent. Of course, of course, Everett can fly. He's decorating the world of war. Of course, course, of course. Hey, 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 come back here. Is everything going to be all right? Uh, uh, yes, yes, lady. Everything's going to be fine. <laughs> one of these planes? Sure, sure. <laughs> Why, be before I put the company's order in, I made sure. I, I test flew one personally. Yes, sir. Then you've got to take us down. Put in an order for 22 of them on the spot. That's the reason we had a head start when jets came in. But do those accountants remember that? No, sir. <laughs> the minute your back is turned... Please, and... please, Mr. Everett, please try to understand. You're the only one aboard who can fly. You've got to land this plane. Why me? Why are the problems always on my shoulders? Hey, tell me, uh, when we come down, did you give me my gun back? Yes, yes, of course. When we come down. 
But you've got to bring us down. You're the only one who can. Oh, why me? Why me? Oh, stop bothering me. You're making my headache. Let me alone. I'll go in the cockpit and I'll think it over. Keep that door open, please. No, no, door's got to remain closed. Rules. Mr. Everett, please. Are you going to bring us down? That's for you to find out, little girlie. <laughs> Oh, please, God, please. He's our only chance. That madman is our only chance. Ah, ah, I can't stand it anymore. Anne. He's been circling and circling round and round and round. Oh. Now you control yourself. He's bringing us down. It's terrifying, I know, but he is bringing us down. It's been a constant descent. How high are we? About, about 5,000. The way we're tossing around. Oh, look out there! Navy jets. Well, they must have been sent up to investigate. Oh, Miss Bruce, he wouldn't shoot. Oh, of course not. They came so close. We're falling! On speaker. Crash landing positions. Assume crash landing positions at once. We're going down. He pulled out. He pulled it out. Well, now. How's that for a descent, eh? Just like the old days. I tell you, these babies can take anything. I bet those young Navy punks don't know what I'm up to, do they? The controls. I'm on auto again. But you can't, Mr. Everett, you can't. We can't be more than 1,500 feet. The autopilot's not stable at this altitude. We'll burn up all our fuel in no time down here. Don't you think I know that? You wanted to come down. Yes, yes, to land. Huh? Huh? Oh, oh, I see. <laughs> all the way down. <laughs> We're out of control. There are houses under... Yes, yes. Little, little people in the houses. Little houses. <laughs> Bunch of accountants. A lot of them. Who cares? Please, please, please. Brewster. About three miles to starboard. Look, it must be international field. Well, of course it is. I told you we were headed there tonight. Bring us in. Bring us in. Why should I? You didn't keep your promise. You didn't give me my gun back. Well, you, you can have it when we land. I want your word on that. Though. I promise. Oh! oh, we're falling again. You promise? I promise. I promise. I promise. Good girl. He's cutting his engines. Oh, the fool. Anne, can you see? Are we heading toward the field? I, I do it. Yes, yes. He's coming... Right on. It must be runway four. They've got the crash trucks out and... Oh, what? What? Landing gear. He hasn't got the landing gear down. Mr. Everett. Mr. Everett, the wheels lower the landing gear. Oh, please hear me. The wheels, the landing gear. They're down. He heard you. Oh, oh he's coming in too fast. Too fast. Too fast. We blew a tire with getting off the runway. No, no, he got us back. We're going too fast. Mr. Everett, we're overshooting into the fog. Uh, gentlemen, uh, ladies, uh, may I have your attention? Uh, thank you. I, uh, I've called this press conference today to clear up any previous misunderstanding. And to thank you newspaper men for being so sympathetic to me during my trial. Well, as you know, I've been acquitted of those horrendous charges brought against me by the two Air Force boys. It's been proven beyond a doubt that Maggie Brewster, the stewardess, killed the flight crew. Indeed, the murder weapon was found on her person. Now, what her motives were, or why she tried to pin the blame on me, we'll never know. 
Well, as you know, these stewardesses were killed when I overshot the runway. Fortunately, they were the only fatalities. Uh, now people have been calling me a hero for bringing that plane in. <laughs> I brought the old airliner in as best I could. And it's nonsense. I, I merely did my duty as I saw it. I'm grateful that I was able to help. You know, so often when one grows old, he's uh, tossed aside. Now, as for my future plans, well, as a retired man, I intend to take life easy. <laughs> I, uh, I want to travel, see a bit of the world. In fact, I'm leaving tonight. And I'll fly my own airline, you may be sure. <laughs> no, I, I'm not through with them yet. <laughs> Not by a long shot. Passengers for flight seven, please go to gate twelve. Passengers for flight seven, Pardon please. Pardon me, Mr. Everett. Huh? What is it? Let me take your bag, sir. Oh no, 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 no. I can manage it. I I have to catch that plane. I'm afraid not, sir. I'm from the police. We have a few questions that weren't answered at your press conference. <laughs> Theater 5 has presented Nightmare at 26,000, written by Romeo Muller, directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Mary Kay Wells, Corrine Orr, John Griggs, Peter Fernandez, John Fink, and Ethel Remy. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastatsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Mr. Lee Bowman. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. That's Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC radio... Theater 5 presents Mr. Bernard Grant in Skeleton. Shanks, no. Now, look, you know why you can't spend the money. Yeah, but... Hey, I'll call you back. Somebody's at the door. Now, now sit tight, okay? All right, all right. So long. Joseph Hanlon? Yeah? I knew I'd find you here. What do you want? Now, now, is that any way to welcome anyone who's been looking for you as long as I have? Hmm? I don't know you. My, uh... Foot's in the door, Mr. Hanlon. Are you trying to break it? I will if you keep it there. Naughty, naughty. Uh, uh, you can't push your way in here. Oh, thank you for asking me. Well, what do you want? Since you insist, rye, please. Oh, now look On you... the rocks. I better make it a double. This storm has chilled me to the bone. Oh, you've got your nerve, Buster. Shoving your way in here to man it. Look, I don't know you. Don't you really? No. Then why are you trembling? Well, I'd add a dash of bitters, would you? Well, hurry up, man. I'm frozen. Better pour one for yourself, Mr. Henman. I don't want to drink. I think you're going to need one. Look, I just want you to get out of Cheers. here. Cheers. Mmm. Very good. Oh, 
All right, stop stalling. Now, what do you want and who are you? You really don't know who I am. Never seen you before in my life. Guess. Now, why would any man search for you as long as I had, Mr. Hammond? How should I know? Then I'll help you remember. Think back a bit, my friend. Think back to a nasty episode in your life. One you thought was finished. Over and done with. Oh, no. No, it... But as you see, Joseph, it is not finished at all. Is it? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know, I tell you. Oh, come on, Joseph. You know what you did, and so do I. Now, look. If, if it's about the girl, it, it wasn't my fault. I didn't do it. <laughs> no, it wasn't you. No, I swear it wasn't. Jenks did it, not me. Really? How curious he says that he didn't do it either, that it was you. Well, he's a liar. He's lying, I tell you. You'd better be able to prove it, Joseph. Now, look. Grabbing Katie Shaw was his idea in the first place. I swear it was. But you went along with it, didn't you? Well, we didn't mean to hurt her. Oh, didn't you? Honest, we didn't. Especially after old man promised the ransom money. And why did it happen? Look, we had her locked up in the cellar, see? Well, she tried to escape. Jenks caught her getting out the window, and he yelled at her to stop. And she just jumped and ran. And so he took a shot at her to scare her, only... Only he, he didn't miss. Oh, and, of course, it was Jenks who fired that shot, not you. I swear, mister. I don't even own a gun. Jenks, it was his gun. On your word as a gentleman? But you've got to believe me. That's how it happened. It's the truth. Now, help me. All right. So you weren't the one who killed Katie. You still kidnapped her. Yeah, If but... you hadn't put your filthy hands on her, Katie would be alive today, wouldn't she? I never thought... No, that... you didn't, did you? All you thought about was the money... The lousy money. <laughs> and Katie had to die because of your greed. I ain't slept good since, honest. That's a great help to Katie, isn't it? And to me. Who, who are you, buddy? Was Katie Shaw your girl? Oh, was Katie Shaw my girl? Oh. oh, no. No, she wasn't just my girl. She was my whole world. We were going to be married. We were going to spend our whole life together. Uh, I'm sorry. Sure you are. Afterwards. Everybody's sorry. Afterwards. Hey. How did you find out about me? I mean, what's the difference? Is that going to bring Katie back to life? Well, no, but... Hey. Did Jenks put you onto me? Did you think he wouldn't? Oh, that the girl. rats are all alike. You'd sell out your own grandmother to save your miserable skin. Well, it isn't fair to pin a rap on me. I wasn't the guy that killed her. Did Katie suffer much before? Oh, no, no, mister. She, she went quick, honest. Did she say anything? Did she Did she give you any message for me? Uh, no, I... Well, I mean... Well, yeah, maybe sort of. Well, what did, you, what, what, what did she say? Well, uh, she said to, to tell you that she... Uh, she loved you, and for you not to be too mad, because we really didn't mean to kill her. You're a liar! No, no, no. You're a liar! I, I swear she said it. <laughs> you're you're no. going, Charlie, you're choking me. You make my hands dirty. Now, wait, wait a minute, mister. Please. You had a heart. You had a heart, didn't you? You do anything you want. were a stranger to me. I'd never done anything to you. Yet you took away... The most valuable thing in my life. And like a monster, you killed it. Please, mister, give me a chance. Like you gave Katie a chance? Oh, I wish to heaven I had. If I could only have another chance now to grab Jenks' farm when he shot at her. Oh, you're bringing tears to my eyes. You had your chance, you rat. And you didn't take it. Did you? Did you? I said, did you? What are you, what are you going to do? I'm not sure yet. I came here to kill you, Joseph. Maybe I just ought to turn you over to the police. Oh, no, mister, don't do that. Oh, I thought you wanted to make a man. Oh, yeah, the, the cops. Then you were lying to me, Joseph. Oh, no, not the cops, mister. Please, they'll burn me. I'll burn. No, oh, that wouldn't be good, would it? <laughs> no, no. Thanks, mister. Thanks. No. And I wouldn't get to see you die myself, would I? Oh, oh, please. I wouldn't get to see your blood run out. 
the way Katie's did. Oh, give me a break, Mr. I... Sure I will. With this. I... I sharpened it this morning. Especially for you. I... Don't come at me with that thing. Are you afraid to die, Joseph? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I am. Maybe now you know what it feels like, hmm? Now you get back, I tell you. Oh, Katie. Katie. Are you watching me? Are you nuts? Hang out of your mind, Mr. Say your prayers, Joseph. Get fast. Get that knife away from me. Why don't you scream for help, Joseph? Like Katie did. Go ahead. Huh? Wouldn't do. Wouldn't, Joseph? Not for a man who's wanted for kidnapping and murder. Oh, let go, please. Let oh, go. Katie, darling, here he comes. Here comes the man who took you from me, Katie. Oh, mother of mercy, no. No. knife away from me, please. All right. Give me back, Katie. I can't give you back a dead girl. But you kidnapped her. You and Jenks killed her, didn't you? We didn't mean to. I told you. That's where we're different, see? I mean to kill you. It'll make me feel good. All right. All right, go ahead. I never... I never thought I'd feel this way. But I'll enjoy killing you, Joseph. I'll enjoy listening to you scream <laughs> until you die. Like Katie. I... Kill me. Go on. Get it over with. <laughs> but killing you wouldn't bring Katie back to me, would it? No matter what I do, I'll never be able to hold her again. Oh, kiss her. <laughs> Putting that knife away, mister. <laughs> Killing you. Can't undo the harm you've done to me. No, it, it can't. All right. Get your coat. My coat? We're going to the police. I thought, did you think I'd let you go scot-free? After hunting you down to kill you. But you said yourself it ain't going to bring Katie back if I die. Now, what good is it to you if I burn, mister? What good, huh? You're still the man who destroyed my future. Oh, give me a chance to square things, will you? There are ways... What that... ways? Well, I, I could... Well, like, pay a fine for what I did. To you. you. You know what I mean? A fine? What are you talking about? Look, I admit I did wrong. But all I can do now is pay for it. Make it up to you. Are you trying to bribe me? With, with, with a price for Katie's life? Oh, no, no, I didn't mean it like then that. Then what do you mean? Well, conscience money, maybe. Oh, oh, conscience money. Do you think you can buy forgiveness with money? Well, not buy, exactly. And, and I wouldn't expect you to forgive me. Well, what would you expect? You'd expect to save your skin for a few dollars? I'm willing to pay all I can. Out of, out of my share of the ransom money. Now, Jenks got most oh, of it. Oh, sure he did. I swear, mister. I, I was just helping him. I, I didn't want to be in on him. The whole thing was his job all the way. So you want me to bother revenge for cash? Is that it? <laughs> you can't spend revenge. Now, look. A guy dead is, is good for nothing, right? But if you can punish him with a fine... You've got your revenge and, and something else besides, right? Oh, right. So what, what did you say? As one practical man of the world to another? Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Now, money isn't everything, but well, it dries a lot of tears, huh? Yes, Joseph. <laughs> I suppose it does. Maybe all my tears weren't for Katie herself. Her father had promised us a very nice wedding present. $20,000. That's a lot of dough. No wonder. No wonder. I'm so furious at you for killing her. Is that what you're thinking? That's a lot of dough. Yes. This may be right. Maybe that was the real reason I felt like killing you. And still do. But I, I can't offer you that kind of money. But, uh, well, uh, how about... Half a grand. Speak English. Five hundred. All cash. I, I got it right here. Is that what you think your life is worth? 
700? I'm still hoping you'll force me to kill you. No, I, I don't take that knife out again. Oh, 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 all right. A grand. But that's it. I, I ain't got no more. All right. Get it. Sure, sure. Right away. Now, here, here's the grand. You want to count it? No. I trust you, Joseph. Oh, thanks. Now, if it's all there, you're rid of Katie and me for good. If it isn't, I'll be back to kill you. Oh, it's all there, I swear. Count it. All right. All right, you can sleep peacefully now, friend. I bought your guilt. The crime against Katie is mine. Now, all mine. Now, remember, we, we, we made a bargain. No going to the cops. Oh, you have my word. Good night, Joseph. Good night. Uh, mister? American, I want to reserve two seats on your next flight to Mexico City. 10.40? Okay. Oh, uh, for, uh, John Jones and, uh, Tom Smith. Yeah. Huh? Any objections, Mr. Janitor? Uh, not if he got another tent spot. You mean like this? Yeah. Now, uh, you want three more names of bachelors who live alone in the building, huh? Why, you are positively clairvoyant. Yeah. What do you want all them names for, mister? I'm selling sewing kits. Ha, ha. You took my money, Mr. Janitor. I'm a custodian, mister. Pardon me. Mr. Custodian. All right. Try Sam Cooper. He's in 7B. And uh, Maurice Ball. He's in 3N. And uh, Harold Kent. In uh, 6K. Yeah? I knew I'd find you here. Hey, who are you? What do you want? I've been looking for you for a long time, you know. I never saw you before in my life. My foot's in the door, Mr. Cooper. Are you trying to break it? Hey, get out of here. I'll call a cop. No, no, you won't. You've got too much to lose, Mr. Cooper. What are you talking about? You know, Mr. Cooper... Now, why do you suppose any man would search for you as long as I have? I don't know. Let me help you remember. Think back a bit, my friend. Think back to a nasty episode in your life. One you thought was finished. Over and done with. No. Oh, no. No, it isn't possible. But it is, you see. Your past has caught up with you, Mr. Cooper. Hey, hey look, I, I didn't know she was married. I swear I didn't. It was only when it was too late that she said anything about a husband and kids. I swear to you, mister, I didn't have the faintest idea. Oh, I didn't wake you, honey. Oh, terrific. Fish are biting like mad today. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> I did five scenes, all in one apartment house. <laughs> oh, solid, sweetheart. Skeletons rattle like mad, right out of the closets. Hmm? Well, uh, a thousand in cash from a real live one. Four hundred more in checks. What? <laughs> no. No. I... Well, not bad for a couple of hours' work. Sure, we're celebrating. Don't the store for reservations. We're spending up a storm tonight. Oh, now, sweetheart, will you get over that piggy bank complex? Now, look. We've got it made. There's a solid gold skeleton in every guy's closet. And I know just how to rattle it. You know that guy you put on to me? Oh, come on. You know who I mean. Stop snowing me, pal. You mean you didn't think on me? <laughs> well, what do you know? This guy pulled a knife on me, and I, I bought him off with a grand of the ransom money. Well, certainly I know the cops are watching for the bill numbers. Why do you think I told you to cool the money? All right. Uh, look, look, listen, will you? Pack fast and meet me at the Inter-American Terminal. We're cutting out for Mexico City. Yeah. Let that blackmailing rat explain to the cops why he's spending the ransom dough. <laughs> <laughs> Theater 5, four and a half hours of dramatic radio theater continues after Weekend West coming up in just a moment here on Radio 81. Theater 5 has presented Skeleton, starring Mr. Bernard Grant. Written by Jules Archer, directed by Warren Somerville. Featured in the cast, Stan Watt, Arthur Cole, and Peter Rattray. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlasdotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Mr. Lee Bowman. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. That's Theater 5, New York 23, New York. When I was driving through the southwest, through the desert country, I saw this car by an old shack. It was a big, beautiful car, all polished and shining in this strange, out-of-the-way place. Now, what did an old Indian want with a fancy car like that? A car that he didn't even drive. <laughs> The other five presents Devil Dust. Well, only two miles to Devil Dust. <laughs> you think we wouldn't make it? <laughs> When I dozed off before, our grandpa was stranded on the desert. Oh, not so loud, Jula. We ain't home yet. Oh, I apologize if I hurt your engine feelings. It did get us to Deming and back. But Harvey, you don't mind an old for telling you that you need a new... Yeah, I need a new everything. But I can't afford it, Jula. Harvey. Yeah? We've got company behind us. Get over. Get over. California, please. Uh, you'll wear that car out in no time. Harvey, stop! Uh, crazy! Just crazy! Stops in the middle of the road. Look, 
He's running up to the car parked behind that shack. Isn't that old John Eagle's place? Mm. He's opening the car door. He's poking around inside it. Oh, Harvey, don't you want to see what he's doing? Not if Bond's home. Well, he's not home or those dogs of his would have torn into that fellow as soon as he touched the car. Wait. Let's see what happens. Are you afraid John might come back and see you? I don't want him thinking I had anything to do with this. You're afraid of that old man. You believe in Indian magic. No, I, I, I didn't say that at all. He was a big medicine man back on the reservation. And I seen those Navajo medicine men do things with people. <laughs> no, sir. Maybe we'll be sure. That fellow wants to steal the car. Yeah, I doubt there's a battery in it. John never drives it. Then why? Why would a California tourist be interested? Yeah. You could ask Tommy. Tommy? What? Oh, <laughs> you women. Here you got old John's own grandson clerking in your store. Tommy Tyandy? Sure. Uh why, yes, so he is. <laughs> Somehow I never got in connection with John and the Navajos. <laughs> He's a good boy. I like him, but... But what? A feeling I get when he looks at me sometimes. Ah, you will, uh, that's John Jim. Look, I grew up around Navajo Indians. Both kinds. Blanket wearers and the English speaker. For all that I've seen them every day in my life, I still don't understand a thing about them. Not a blasted thing. Dina, they call themselves. Dina, the people. And Dina is different. Indians are different. Mrs. Granger, I was just wondering when you'd be back. Something the matter, Tommy? The cook came in from the Thompson Ranch and took the last of those canned freestone peaches. I'll order more. Tommy, when Harvey Tibbetts and I were driving past your grandfather's house, we saw a stranger looking around that old car your grandfather keeps near the Arroyo. Uh, is there something special about that car? I don't go up to my grandfather's house, Mrs. Granger. I don't know. Oh. I if you got a minute... I'd like to talk to you. Sure, go right ahead. Could you see your way clear to paying me $5 a week more? I'd keep the store open till 10 every night if you wanted. <sighs> you could keep it open till midnight, Tommy. We wouldn't do any more business. This is too small a store, and Devil Dust is too small a town for me to be able to pay you any more than I'm paying you right now. Oh, Tommy. You've had two years of high school. You're a smart boy. Why don't you see what you can get in a bigger town, huh? I know what Indians... I, I know what I could get. It's not much. Mrs. Granger, when I leave here, I want to go a long ways. I want to go clear across the country. Away from sheep raising and bitter roots and starving. You mean leave your people? Well, they can't help me. I can't go back on the reservation. I, I, I just can't go backwards. I have to go forward. I want to stretch out to my limits. So when I'm old... At least I'll know I've tried everything I could. You want to get away from here? Yes. And I need money to do it. Oh, I wish I could help you find yourself, Tommy. But that extra five dollars a week is just impossible. You know what this store makes. I guess I do, Mrs. Granger. You, uh, you want me to write down the order for the peaches? Yes, Tommy. Thank you. Somebody's pulling in at Harvey Tibbetts' place. Why, it's him. It's the man who was poking around your grandfather's car. Must be taking a cabin to stay here. But why? Well, I brought you some glasses, Mr. Farman. Oh, thanks. Uh, listen, Tibbetts, what's wrong with that old Indian who owns the car? I went up to see him, didn't try to pressure him, but it was no sale. When I finally gave up, when I left the price open, you know what he said? He said he didn't understand me because I didn't speak Navajo. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah Mr. Farman, Indians have to do things their way. And if you don't understand their way, well, you have to wait them out, especially Navajos. 
They're buyers, not sellers. They don't let anything go. Not even words. Smart, huh? Hmm. You suppose he knows what he has right there in his backyard? What? <laughs> What's so special about that old car? Now listen, Tibbets. It is an old car, but a very special make and a very special year. Supercharged Cord 1936. It cost plenty bucks back then when they were hard to come by. You know why? Hmm. Because it was a handmade car. The parts hand-turned. That's the reason they only made about five of those coupes in 1936. It was too expensive, too much ahead of the times. Only five for this whole country, Tibbets. And that old Indian has one of them. Hmm. Say, uh, what would you do with it? Are you for real? It's a money car, I told you. It's a collector's item. I could sell it or... I could take all the prizes at the car shows. That car has class. That car is status on wheels. I want it. Well, uh, what if old John Eagle won't sell it to you? I'm not even listening. He'll sell because I'll find a way to make him sell. Oh, oh, oh come in, kid. Come in. You're right on time. Oh, hello, Tommy. Hello, Mr. Tibbetts. Hello, Mr. Fireman. Uh, we met this afternoon, Tibbetts, before I went up to see Tommy's grandfather. Oh, uh, get me some ice, will you, Tibbetts? Yeah, sure. You didn't have much luck with Grandfather. How do you know? I tried to tell you, Mr. Fireman. You went in with three stripes against you. My Grandfather, he didn't know you. You probably asked his name. You looked in his eyes when you spoke to him. Maybe even pointed your finger at him. Yeah, I think I did. That's it. The old-fashioned Navajos, like my Grandfather, they don't like those things. Taboo. And, uh... You? Are you an old-fashioned Navajo? I... I don't know what I am. Not much of anything. My grandfather and me, we... We don't get on so well just because of his old-time ideas. But you're still speaking to him. When I see him. Uh, how much do you make in that grocery, kid? If you can talk your grandfather into selling his car to me, this 50 is yours. Oh, I... I don't make that kind of money. Uh-huh. Well, what do you say? I don't know. You could go a long way on 50 bucks. Get some decent clothes. Buy a ticket out of this town. Buy a suitcase like this one. You like it? Leather-grained. Brass-buckled. It's beautiful. I'll throw it in for goodwill. That's the kind of business I do. 50 and the suitcase. Well, come on. What are you, afraid to stand up to your old grandfather? Well, my grandfather thinks that car is beautiful, Mr. Fireman. He, he loves it. He works on it. He, he keeps it up. He, it makes him a big man with the Navajos. There is it up there near the Arroyo. Is he doesn't want it to get dusty near the road. But he doesn't drive it, does he? No. Then it isn't doing him any good. He'd be better off with a pickup truck. Help him. Help yourself at the same time. What do you say? Well... Uh, I'm thinking it over, but... I, I, I just happen to have a bottle of bourbon, almost as old as your grandfather. It's in the suitcase. Open it up, Tommy. And remember, that case is yours with the 50 if... Hey, how do you like that case, huh? Oh, it's so smooth, so clean. Here's your ice. Oh, thanks, Tibbets. I'm, uh... I'm not much for drinking. Oh, this time you'll make an exception. Uh, Mr. Fireman, I don't think Tommy should... Oh, what is this? No fire water for the Redskins? Come off it. We're in the modern world. Tommy might as well learn to drink. He'll be able to afford it. Dumb kid. A whole day lost while he sobers up, and the old man must know it was me that got him drunk. Well, who'd expect him to go up there the night and make a scene? Mm, he wanted the money pretty bad. Yep, I guess you'll have to give up on that car, Mr. Fireman. <laughs> you'll never get it now. That's where you're wrong. I'm a guy who sees what he wants and goes after it. Ask anybody in L.A. about Mark Fireman in business. I don't back down. That's my reputation. Mm, how? Uh, just take my word. I've got the tow bar ready home with me, that big, beautiful, baby doll cord coupe. You're not a car collector, Tibbets, but I tell you, this is something special. Only five in the country, and one belongs to me. 
Uh, Mr. Fireman, you don't have the car. Tibbets, you're starting to annoy me. Now, take that long panty or someplace else. I'll have the car by this time tomorrow, and you can make book on it. I don't think you can do it. You got a couple of dollars to back up that opinion? Yeah, I thought not. You don't look like a sport. <laughs> Hello? Hello, Harvey. Of course it's me. What? Now, Harvey, slow down. I don't understand. Would Tommy steal his grandfather's car if he was offered enough money? Well, just now I think he would. But why do you think he's going to try? Oh? Harvey, we can't let that happen. It would spoil the boy's life and what's left of his grandfather's. No, I won't let it happen. <laughs> I'm Mrs. Granger from the grocery store. Your grandson, Tommy, works for me. I'm a friend of his. You understand me? Yes. The man who got Tommy drunk has offered him more money to steal your car from you tonight. You better hide the car keys. I leave them in door. No. I don't think you understand me. How can I make it clear? Clear? Then why did you say that about the keys? You can't want him to steal your car. Good night, Azan Sozi. Azan Sozi? Woman who is too thin. Go home now, Azan Sozi, friend of Tommy. I give you thanks. But what about Tommy? Too cold outside at night. Go home. Get warm. John Eagle! Oh, he didn't understand me. I know he didn't understand me. <laughs> Quiet, boy. Quiet. Grandfather. Why didn't you tell me you wanted to go riding in car, grandson? It is not too late. Get in. I will drive you as far as you want to go. Uh, I... Get in. Sit beside me. I don't want to go riding. I mean... You, you can't start the car now. N not in the dark. It's it's too close to the edge of the arroyo. What did you want to do then? Just... Just to sit in the car for a while. Then we will do that. Now. Now we have shut out light. Once in a dark time like this, I rode in Canyon du Celli. I found myself near Spider Rock. You remember stories I told you about that place when you were small? I remember. You, you, you released the brake. Put it back. Grandfather, we're moving. We're rolling. But very slowly. It is heavy car. Now, why are you here? I told you. I, I just wanted to sit in the car. Yes, you said that. Now... Tell me about Spider Rock. Uh, uh, on top of the rock, a, a monster spider lives. Please, please stop the car. We'll go into the Arroyo. All right, the food of the spider on Spider Rock is bad Navajos. And foolish ones. Yes, and foolish ones. So, so all with bad conscience stay away from Spider Rock. Grandfather, that's a 60-foot drop down there. We'll be killed. Please, I, I only wanted to sit in the car. We will sit then... Until end. Put on the brake. Three times you have lied. Fourth lie will surround you and close your escape. I wanted to steal it. I, I came to steal the car. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He offered me so much money. He offered me money too. Grandfather, look. We're, 
We're right on the edge. The front wheels are almost over. Then get out on my side of car and be careful. <laughs> careful. Careful. <sighs> now, did you learn anything this evening, my grandson? I think so. I also learned pride kept us apart. I have left you alone too long. You do not know who you are. I'm not much of anything. Wrong. You are one of us. Dina, one of the people. We will forget tonight completely. Grandfather, what are you doing? Get away from the car. Car, too much trouble. Don't let the brake go. You lose your car. Tommy and I are right sorry to see you go away mad. You're a dope, Tibbets, and you, kid, are a double-dyed dope. You let your grandfather smash up my court coupe just to get even with me. He didn't want to do it. It hurt him. But you had spoiled the car for him. He couldn't love it anymore. Then why couldn't he have given it by selling it to me? Why did he have... Oh, what's the use? Mad. Yeah. I should have taken him up on that bet he made me that he'd get the car. <laughs> you, you can't gamble on what a Navajo will do. <laughs> oh, Tommy, you left his suitcase. Isn't that the one he said you could have? Take it. I don't want it. Mm, why not? If he doesn't value it, then why should I? Hey. That's the first Indian remark I ever heard you make. <laughs> yes, sir. That's a real Indian remark. Why? I don't understand it. <laughs> don't give up. You stay here long enough, you be Indian too. Presented Devil Dust, written by Phyllis Cole and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, George Petrie, Peter Fernandez, Abby Lewis, John D. Seymour, and Humphrey Davis. Audio engineer, Marty Folia. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Ted Bell. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. That's Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy. First small stepping stone on the inevitable route to outer space. And what of the future? When the moon has become Luna Station. A transfer point on the well-traveled road to the planets and asteroids of our solar system. Will it gather a new crop of legends as deep and mysterious as the moon stories of a thousand years ago? We cannot know, but we can guess. The Other Five presents The Wandering Spaceman. I 
I like this place. The drinks are honest. The girls are pretty. Oh, there are a lot worse hangouts around here on Luna Station. Frank! Frank, I've been looking for you. When did you get in? A little while ago. Take a seat, Lars. We were just talking about you. Yeah, I can just guess the sort of things these baboons were saying. <laughs> Come to the office with me, Frank. We can talk privately. All right. See you, gentlemen. <laughs> Did you have a good trip, Frank? Oh, as usual. The Mars run nowadays is almost as much of a milk run as the shuttle trip back to Earth. But how's it been going with you, my friend? I miss this place. <laughs> have you? You know, sometimes I wonder about myself. Running a spaceman's diet carved out of the bedrock of the moon. <laughs> it's a fine occupation for a grown man with a daughter. <laughs> well, now, don't run yourself down, Lars. We astronauts need the spaceman's rest. Yeah, maybe... And I swear someday I'll toss half these space bums out of this place. Never let them in the front door again. Or you shouldn't let them get you down, Lars. They don't get Lars tone it down. Don't worry yourself about that. Still know if I didn't have a daughter to support, I'd be tempted to pack up and find a job back on Earth. And at that, it might be better for her. Well, you'd both be missed, Lars. Especially Sally, eh? <laughs> well, don't be embarrassed, boy. I know how you feel about her. <laughs> well, I guess everyone on Una Station knows. You're a good man, Frank. The sort of man I'd pick for her myself. A captain on a scheduled transport, sober, good future. Frank, let me push my nose into your business. Why haven't you asked her to marry you? Well, I have, Lars. And she? Well, I guess she's not ready to settle down yet. Yes, I was afraid of that. She's like her mother used to be, wild. Oh, I wouldn't say that. You've heard about my wife, haven't you, Frank? I've heard stories. The stories are true. Whatever they say is true. She ran away from me, Frank. Ran away with a bum. Left her husband and her baby for a no-good pilot of a tramp freighter who set his course towards Venus, traveled too close to the sun and burned himself, his ship, and my woman to a blackened cinder. Oh. Sally was only one year old then. I raised her myself, watched her grow into a woman who looks like her mother did, and with her mother's blood... She isn't her mother, sir. Maybe she's not. But she has the same streak of wildness in her. I wish he'd marry a good man like you and settle down. Well, I haven't given up on that. No, no, of course you haven't, Frank. But you know what she does now? She comes to the rest and talks to the deep spacers, the captains who steer out beyond the asteroid belt. They have a certain look about them, Frank. A look like the one who... He... The man who took my Laura away. Oh, Lars, you're making too much of this. Oh, maybe I am. Maybe I am. At any rate, I, I'd better get busy. Whatever you think of the spaceman's rest, it won't run itself. <laughs> well, I'll go out with you. Look, boy, there she is. You understand what I mean now? What? Sally. Look who she's with. He's one of them, all right. You can tell by looking at him. Tall, lean, with eyes you hardly dare to gaze into because of what they may have seen. She met him a week ago, and already she can't leave him alone. She's drawn to a man like a moth is drawn to a candle flame. I ought to go over there. Take it easy. They're only talking. There's no crime in that. Only talking, yes. But what are they talking about? I see your father is staring at us, Miss Sally. I do not think he approves of our being together so much. Poor Daddy. He's always worrying about me. <laughs> My mother... Yes, yes, I have heard the story. It is a sad 
a good many sad tales a man can hear in his wanderings from planet to planet. Has someone once said that human beings were meant to stay on our own world, and that any love affair that springs up away from Mother Earth is doomed from the start? What a curious idea. You don't believe it, do you? Well, when you wandered for as long as I have, you, you simply don't know what to believe. <laughs> But your father, did that you meet the same fate as your mother? I think he really is. He says, I have my mother's blood in me. I think he really believes that he'll wake up some morning to find that I've followed some stranger into outer space. And you? Could you do what your mother did? I don't know. It would depend on the man, wouldn't it? Well, that young man... The one standing with your father. Oh, oh Frank. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's... Oh, well, he's really very nice. He'll be a important man one day. He's already captain of a ship on the Martian run. But he's not for you? No, he's not. I sometimes wish he were. But he's not. Oh, why am I telling you all this? A week ago, we were strangers. And if I were your father, Miss Sally... I would worry about you in much the same way he does. You should be more wary of strangers. But why? What can happen to me here? You can say. A man from deep space might be anyone. He might be a dangerous criminal or worse. He might even be the wandering spaceman. Oh, who? A wandering spaceman. Now, don't tell me you haven't heard the tale. No, I haven't. Well, it also is a sad tale. The wandering spaceman was a captain in the early days of the Venus run. He was young, kind, ambitious. Then one day, he met a girl. One very much like you, Miss Sally. The planets, the stars, the whole universe. He became engaged, and he had one more trip to make before they were to marry. While the captain was in space, the owner of the space line happened to come to Luna Station and met the girl. He was neither young nor handsome, but he did have one advantage. He was very, very rich. Left for Earth with him just two days before her captain was to arrive back on Luna. At first, he thought of going after them, killing them both. But he realized that that would solve nothing. So he cursed all women and all men too. He swore that he never wanted to marry, he never wanted to look at another human being. Next morning, he took a spacecraft out to the test run. And? And never was her from again. But what happened? Who knows? Some say that he wanders through the solar system, unable to land except once every seven years. At that time, he's given a single week to find a woman who might share his loneliness. And has he found one? It's only a legend, remember. What has he? According to the story... No. Frank. In the meantime, do sit down. Captain Von 
Groff has been telling me the most fascinating story. I'm sure he has. It's about a space captain who has cursed all women and is condemned to wander between the planets. Perhaps you've already heard the legend of the wandering spaceman, Captain. Wasn't there something else about his landing every so often in order to find a woman who would share his life with him? Hmm? This legend comes from Earth. It was told long before space travel was even heard of. Only then, it was not a spaceship that the captain traveled in. It was an old-fashioned sailing ship in which he roamed the seven seas. And instead of the wandering spaceman, he was known as the Flying Dutchman. Uh, quite true, Captain. Isn't it interesting how old tales like old truths keep popping up over and over again? I'm warning you, Captain, to stay away from Miss Toner. I have no interest in getting into a brawl with you, sir. Perhaps I'd better leave before the lady is fervent. Wait a minute. Frank, let go of me. Captain Von Graff? Mitchell! Wait a minute. Sally, come back here. Sally! Mitchell, wait for me. You want me, Miss Sally? Uh, I, I, I'm so sorry for what happened with Frank. When I see him again, I... Oh, don't be too hard on the young man, Sally. I can't blame you for what he did. If I had a girl such as you... But I'm not his girl. I've already told you that. And you're so literal, my Sally. Very well, if I admire the girl like you, if I hope to have a girl like you, then I would not be happy to see you with a man like myself. Sally, we have been seen together far too much over the past week for your friend's peace of mind or for your father's, for that matter. And why shouldn't I be seen with you? Use your own good judgment, Sally. What do you know of me? Only that I am captain of the stranger, the tramp freighter, doing odd jobs out among the larger asteroids. It's not a very good prospect for a lovely young girl. No one seems to bother to ask me what I think. <laughs> Yes, you are right, Sally. Well, what do you think? I... Well, I don't know. Except that I want to know more about you. You're unlike anyone I've ever known, Mitchell. Even the other deep spaces. Somehow I have the feeling that we were intended to meet. Perhaps it is better that we won't be seeing any more of each other. What do you mean? I'm leaving today, Sally. My ship is repaired and I must go back out there where I came from. Must you? Can't you stay a second week at least? No. No, I can't. Take me with you then. Take you with me? What? Take me with you. Take me into the space with you and let me wander with you through the vastness beyond Venus and Mars. Let me see for myself the loneliness of space. The loneliness? Please, Mitchell. I will walk you away. You'll hardly know you have me on board unless you want to. No. But why not? No, no, Sally. I've said no. You are a silly, romantic child. Now, stay here on Luna Station where you belong. Or better still, if I were your father, I'd take you back to Earth where you can get those ridiculous notions out of your head. Mitchell. Sally, I mean it. You don't know who I am. You don't know what I am. I think I do. I like the wandering spaceman we were talking about. No one knows where I go or what I do. Sally, I travel into space and disappear for seven years. I know. I'm saying goodbye to you now, Sally. I'm going to the launching platform. Goodbye. Yes. You'll forget about me, Sally. You'll have to forget about me. Kiss me once before you go. Kiss you? Yes. Just once before you go. Sally, my Sally, if things were only different. Yes. Goodbye. Sally? Sally? There you are. 
Your father's worried sick. Van Graff's due to take off within the hour, and he was worried that you decided to take off with him. What? To take off with him. Stow away if you had to. Stow away. Oh, come, Sally. No. You go back, Frank. I want to be by myself for a few more minutes. Well, where will you be? Take Dad to the radar room. Van Graff's ship is leaving, and I... And you'll meet us there? Of course. I'll meet you there. <laughs> But I don't understand. Why didn't you bring her with you? Don't worry, Lars. She said she'd meet us in the radar room. I suppose she wants to watch Van Graaff's ship as it gradually moves off the screen. Yes, I suppose. Oh. But there's something about all this I, I just don't like. Well, here we are at any rate. He's not here. I told you, Frank. I told you there was something wrong. Well, we can't know if there's something. He's on that man's ship, I tell you. I don't know how she got on board, but she did somehow. I tell you, she's there. Well, if you're sure, we could have the ship searched. Don't waste time, man. Do it. Launching room? Launching room. This is Captain Gradley speaking. I want you to hold a countdown for the spaceship stranger bound for the asteroid. Captain's name is... Not... What's that? Are you sure? Well, yes. Yes, of course. Thank you. What is it? It was just taking off as I was speaking. I knew it. I knew it. We actually don't know she was on board. Where right? else would she be? Turn up that number three screen to see if we can track a ship. There. It's that bright blip over there. We can keep her in sight for two or three hours. I see it. It's starting the elliptical course towards the asteroid belt. Well, look. What happened? The blip. What happened to the blip? It's gone. But where? Oh, How did it go? No. Let me see if I can find it on another screen. Could there have been an accident? A meteorite? An explosion? Something inside the ship? No, no, no. I don't think so. If it was, it would have showed up on the screen. No, no, Jay. It just disappeared. One instant it was there, and the next instant it was. It's as if it vanished out of time and space as we know it. What are you saying, Lars? Remember what you were telling me. He was talking to Sally about about the wandering spaceman, but that's like the old flying Dutchman you said. Van Graaff is a Dutch name. by Ted Bell. In the cast, Donald Muta, Jeff David, Francis Spanier, and David Kerman. Audio engineer, Marty Solia. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastosenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. <laughs> Executive producer for Theater 5, Ted Bell. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. That's Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. Theater 5 presents Death Watch. Susan, I was just leaving. The cake. No, no, I'll pick it up. 
I know the bakery closes at six. I'm just leaving the hospital now. How's the birthday boy? <laughs> yeah, I'll bet he is. Yes, all right. Goodbye. Good night, Doctor. Uh, you wouldn't want to make a small profit on that umbrella of yours, would you? <laughs> sure, here. Hey, mister. Hey, mister. Hey, mister. Huh? Oh, you calling me? Yeah, are you a doctor? Yeah. What kind of doctor? Look, it's raining and I'm in a hurry. I, I mean, are you a doctor, doctor? Or, do you know, uh, operate on people? Well, yes, yes, I'm a surgeon. Listen, you want to pick up some change? See if you can get me a cab. I'll wait here in the doorway. Huh? Hey, doctor, my mother's sick. You come with me, okay? Well, I can't right now. I'm on my way home. She's very sick. Where, where's your regular doctor? I don't know. I called him. The woman said he's away. Well, didn't she give you the name of another doctor? Well, I called him. The woman told me a couple hours. I waited, but he didn't come. Hey, Doc, I think my old lady, she's dying. Well, look, son, the hospital is right there. I'll tell you what you do. No. People have been telling me what to do all day. I tell you what to do. You come with me. Take care of my mother. Oh, son, I just can't go Doc, with you. I got a gun in my pocket. You want to see it? It's pointed right at your belly. I'm not going looking for no more doctors. I got a doctor. Now, you come with me. You better take it easy, son. You might get yourself in trouble trying something like this. You think I don't know how to use the gun? You pull the trigger, it goes off. You think I'm afraid to pull the trigger? No, all right. Have it your own way. But let's grab a cab, okay? No need getting pneumonia. No. No taxi. I don't need a hacky to worry about, too. Come on, we'll walk. In this? It's not very far. Look, son... I'm not your son, Ibarro. You want to call me something? I got a name. Angel. Angel Serafano. That's my name. Angel, if your mother is as sick as you say, I ought to go back to the hospital and get an ambulance. No. You're not going anywhere. The last doctor said he'll come back tomorrow. Tomorrow comes first thing this morning, no doctor. I call him and he's out of town. What kind of doctor goes away and leaves someone to die? He might have been called away on an emergency. Well, how about my old lady? Wasn't she an emergency? They left the name of another doctor. Two hours. I waited. Who knows how long his two hours is going to be. She could be dead. No, I'm not taking any chances. I got my doctor now. Come on. Angel, if you want my advice... You don't believe I'll shoot you? Oh, I believe. Yeah, I believe. Well, come on, then. I live here. Come on. The fifth floor. That figures. What did the other doctor say was the matter with your mother? He tell her a vi... a vi something. A bug, you know. A virus? A virus, yeah. She was coughing real bad every second. Or like she couldn't stop. You brought me here at gunpoint because your mother has a virus... And, Joe, people don't ordinarily die of colds. I mean, a virus isn't necessarily fatal. You said your mother was dying. Are you going to tell me it ain't serious, too? That's what he said, the other doctor. Nothing serious, he said. I'll be back tomorrow. Big deal. Like he's doing me some kind of favor. A doctor is supposed to help people when they're sick, whether they got money or not, right? If the doctor told you your mother wasn't seriously ill, she wasn't. Whether or not you have money doesn't matter. You, you know how long I wait the first time? From 9 o'clock when my old lady first called the welfare till 6 o'clock at night. I'm sure the doctor got there as quickly as he could. You got money, you live at a fancy address. You just pick up the phone, call a doctor, and he's at your house in 10, 20 minutes. And you know what his name is going to be. You say, come in, doctor, someone. What's the matter with my old lady, doctor, someone? Nice, like that. We're down at the end of the hall. Someone ought to have that skylight fixed. There's two inches of water in the hall. You want to report the landlord? My old lady always makes me lock the door. Like we got something to steal. This afternoon she was all right. Then later she started to cough real bad again. <coughs> like that all the time. Then she yells Santa Maria and holds onto her breast like she can't stand the pain. Then she can hardly talk. I say, Mama, Mama, how do you feel? Well, she can hardly talk with the coughing and the pain. 
Angel. She just says my name. Angel. Then she pass out. Did she complain of a sharp pain in her arm at any time? I don't remember. I don't think so. She just hold herself and bend over. Like she got cramps or something. Uh, hey, do you have a phone? Oh, sure. We got a phone in every room. What do you need a phone for? We might have to call an ambulance. Oh, no. You ain't gonna take her away from here. She stays here or I know she gets taken care of. But she might need hospital care. Oh, sure. Some doc from the welfare comes by and looks at the sign on her bed once a day. Charity patients get the same care as people who can afford to pay. The same doctors treat Look, them. I'm making sure my old lady gets the best. You stay in here till she's okay again. Well, isn't there a phone anywhere in the building? There's a booth on the corner. But you ain't using it. So don't get any ideas. In case you think I was fooling about the gun. Here, take a look. Six bullets, see? Let me see her. She's in there, in the bedroom. Wait a minute. Who's that? Don't answer it. Don't even breathe, Doc. Okay, you're gone. Come on, look at my old lady now. that window doing open? Can't you close the window? It's stuck. I closed it as far as I could and, and stuffed in rags. But it's still raining in a little. I, but, but I brought in the oil burner. See? That window ought to be fixed. Do you have an old blanket, newspapers, anything? Uh, here, take my blanket. Better get something to mop up the water. Mama? Mama, I brought a doctor. Wait, I'll put on the light. It hurt her eyes before. Close your eyes, Mama. I'm going to turn on the light. Angel, I'm dripping wet. Do you have a towel? Hey, sure, Doc. Here. Oh, thank you. Now, tell me, when did she have her first attack? Huh? When did she get this pain? Oh, ab about two hours ago. Uh, well, turn the shade this way and let's have a look, huh? Mrs. Sarafano, are you awake? I'm Dr. Agnew. A doctor with a name, Mama. Mrs. Sarafano. Uh, wipe off my bag and hand it to me, please. Uh, sure. Hey, Doc. What, what's the matter with you, Doc? And Jill. Your mother is dead. You're going to be okay now. I got a doc. Angel, Angel, listen to me. Your mother is dead. No, no, she's not dead. She's breathing. I hear her breathing. Well, listen to me. You have to accept it. She's gone. Her heart has stopped. I was just talking to her. She's alive. Well, I'll have to phone for an ambulance. No. You're staying here. Angel, try to understand. There's nothing more I can do. Your mother is dead. Mama... Mama. Are you sure there isn't a phone anywhere in the building? You don't care. You don't care. Nobody cares if she dies. Oh, fat Spanish lady. Who's she? Well, she's my mother. My mother, and she ain't gonna die. You're going to make her live. Now here, Angel, you better take one of these. What's that? Something to knock me out? It's a sedative. Do you have a bed? Yeah, over there behind the curtain. Well, take this and lie down. I'll take care of everything. Oh, sure. Put me to sleep and cut out. Is that what you think? You're not cutting anywhere. Come on, out in the kitchen. Angel, your mother has been dead for some time. I have to get her out of here. Out in the kitchen. I got six bullets in this gun, Dr. Someone. Now, here. We can use this table. You wash it with hot water, I'll get a clean sheet. What are you doing? What do you want to use the table for? For the operation. The operation? 
That's all right. What's the matter? Now, you think I'm a Hibaro or something? I can read English? I read the papers all the time. And I read where a woman's heart stopped and this doctor made it start again. Oh. He cut her open and massaged her heart. Well, she's walking around today. And, Jill, that was a different case entirely. The doctor was there, right there, when the heart stopped beating. She had only passed through what we call clinical death. That's why he was able to save her. Your mother is past that point. She can't be revived now. Well, look, you want money? I'll get you money. How much you It want? isn't a question of money. If I could save her, don't you think I would? Well, money's no problem. I got lots of ways. Lots of ways. And even if I could save her... All right, I... what do you need? A knife, right? Oh, we got knives. Look. Oh. I'll go heat some water. Oh, this is insane. Crazy? You saying I'm crazy, huh? Just because I don't want to let my old lady die, I'm crazy? What can I do to convince you? Your mother is dead. Your mother is dead. Yeah. Well, lots of people walking around. Doctors say we're dead. Listen, Doc. I don't want to kill you, but I will. I'll point this gun right in your lion mouth and pull the trigger. Six times. Bang, 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 bang. What do you want me to do? The water is boiling now. And Joe, tell me... You go to school. When they find me, they make me. How old are you? Fifteen, maybe. Oh, don't you know? Yeah, fifteen. What do you want to be? Oh, man, Tito Parente. Who else? I'm just sitting away and waiting for it to happen, that's all. Any kind of break. What did your mother want you to be? <laughs> My old lady? You want to laugh? Yeah, I could use one along about now. <laughs> a priest. <laughs> How about that? Well, it's a fine ambition for a mother to have for her son. You think I got a prayer, Doc? You want her to be proud of you, don't you? She is proud of me. What I done not to make her proud? I love her. I never make her worry. Not once. Never about anything. Other guys, 12, 11 even, you know. Already on this stuff. I promise her I never touch it. And I never. Not even glue nothing. And I never touch the woman. I promised her that too. Do you think what you're doing now would make her proud? What? Saving her life? Proud? Happy. Do you know what could happen to you for kidnapping someone at gunpoint? I don't care what happens to me. If my old lady's okay, well, that's all. You think having you in prison would make her proud? Happy. What, are you going to turn me in? Listen, Dr. Someone, you think they're going to take it out on a kid my age for trying to save his old lady's life? You know, you must think I'm real stupid. Okay, the water is ready. Start scrubbing the table. The clean sheet will be sufficient. No, no. On the TV, they always wash the table. I don't want to take no chances with germs. You're the boss. Right. I'm the boss. Long as I got the rod and you ain't, I'm boss. Uh, but do you know what you ought to be doing meanwhile? You tell me. Calling an ambulance. And that way, we'll be ready to take your mother to the hospital. I thought we had that straight. My old lady ain't leaving here until she can walk out. And you ain't walking out if she don't. So stop talking all the time about the phone and the ambulance and the hospital. Hey, we ought to be boiling the knife. Uh, put the knife in the pan. No, wait, I'll put the knife in the pan. You go get my mother. I'll need your help. You can't carry her in here, a big man like you? We'll have to improvise a stretcher. Here, we can use the sheet. Okay, only... Only don't think I'm putting down the gun. All right. Careful now. Pull out the sheet and roll both sides so you can get a grip. Dr. Someone, I don't think I can do this and still hold the gun. You do it. All right. There. Now grab hold of each end and watch it. You should not have tried that, Doc. You could have gotten yourself killed. Listen to me. Your mother is dead. Dead, do you understand? I can't save her. Nothing I can do, nothing you can make me do will bring her back to life. Uh, you think someone will hear the gunshot and come here, huh? <laughs> you don't know this neighborhood, Doc. People hear a gun go off around here, and they run and hide and lock their doors. <laughs> Guns go off around here all the time. Nobody comes, not even the fuzz. So relax. Nobody's coming. Nobody's going to bother us. You're going to have to carry her yourself, Doc. I ain't taking no more chances with you. That's right. Easy. Easy. All right, now put it right there on the nice clean table. 
And, Jill, I can't do this. I can't let you do this. Oh, you think I won't be able to watch? Uh, don't worry, Doc. I won't faint. I'm going to see you do it right. Uh, let's go. I can't do this. I won't. I don't care what you do to me. You don't? All right. Straight in your mouth, Doc. Four bullets. And maybe I'll do you a favor and save the last one for your guts. You got a wife, Doc? Yes. A, a kid, maybe, huh? Yes. Oh, too bad. I wouldn't want to be your wife and have to identify you. You're not going to be pretty, Doc. Okay. I'm going to count to three. I'll count slow. Real slow. One. Two. Three. What was that? She spoke to me. Mama. Mama, I was only trying to frighten him. I wasn't going to shoot him. Honest, Mama. You don't have to worry. You're going to be all right now, Mama. You'll be all right. You want to go to the hospital? Okay. Okay. We'll take you to the hospital. I'll go with the doc while he calls an ambulance. Mama, he's got a name. Dr. Agnew. He's your doctor, Mama. He'll be the same one. Every time. Look, Mama. I I'm putting down the gun. Here. Here, Mommy. Here's the gun. See? All right, Doc. We'll call the ambulance. She's going to be okay now, right? Come on, Angel. Who's that? It's all right, Angel. Let whoever it is in. Oh, they might try to stop us. Tell us the hospital is full. Why should they do that? I, I don't know. I won't let them, Angel. I promise. All right. Good evening. Does Mrs. Sarafano live here? Uh, yes, she's my mother. I'm Dr. Southwick. I was here earlier, but no one was home. How is your mother? Oh, she's going to be fine. I got a doctor here. Oh, I see. Well, in that case, doctor. I... Doctor. Uh, I see everything is all right. Doctor, the boy's mother is dead. She's been dead for some time. Will you call an ambulance? She, she isn't dead. You heard her. She was talking to me just now. She told me not to hurt you. That's why I didn't shoot you. Didn't you hear her? I'll take care of things, Doctor. Just, uh, get, get the entrance, will you? Yes, yes, right away. No, no, you're not going to take her away from me. Don't leave me alone here. I won't leave you alone, Angel. You can come to the hospital, too. You can even stay there for a while if you want to. I, I can stay in the hospital, but near my old lady. Well, it's... It's another part of the hospital. You couldn't stay in the woman's section, but there's a place where there are some other boys your own age. Are waiting for their old ladies, too, huh? That's right. Sure. Sure. And we'll leave the hospital together. Well, it might take a long time, Angel. Oh, that's okay. I got lots of time. I'm young. Oh, Fifteen, maybe. Listen... It stopped raining. Oh, that's good. She won't get wet. No, Angel. She won't get wet. Theater 5 has presented Death Watch, written by Hal Hackaday, directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, George Petrie, Don Scardino, Evelyn Juster, and Ronald Liss. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Mr. Lee Bowman. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. That's Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking.
This has been an ABC Radio Network production. Fred? Fred, who's that man? Huh? That man in the guest room. Mary, what are you talking about? There's a strange man asleep in our guest room. <laughs> Theater 5 presents The Stranger. Give me another minute or a half an hour or something. Well, the bathroom's ready for you. I'll go down and make breakfast. Okay. Say, how about making me some sausage this morning? All right. Give me some men who are strong hearted men who will fight for the right thing at all. Shoulder to shoulder and bolder. Huh? What is it? That man in the guest room. Mary, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the man in the guest room. Maybe all right, but I should think you would have told me you brought someone home with you last night. Wait a minute. When I think of it, I went right past the guest room door, practically undressed. Mary, day. will you stop talking and let me get a word in? Are you telling me there's somebody in the guest room? Yes. A, a man? Yes. Well, I didn't bring any man home with me last night. But well, where did this man come from? Well, what, what time did you get in last night? I don't know, 11.30, I guess. And the guest room was empty then? I don't think I looked into it. Well, I got home about 1.30 and... No, I, I guess I didn't look into the guest room either. Th this man in the guest room, wh what's he doing? He's lying in bed, apparently fast asleep. Well, I think we just better wake him up. What, what, what if he has a gun? Oh, Mary, don't be ridiculous. Come on. Look at Fred. I'm afraid. Honey, look, don't worry. I we'll turn this guy out of the house or over to the police or whatever. No, no, no look at him. He's still asleep. Can, hey. Tell you hey, you. Funny, no, Come on. Wake oh, up. Wake oh, up. Oh, the oh, party's oh, over. Oh, hello. Oh, oh. good, good morning, Fred. Good morning, Barry. Who are you? Well, don't you know? Of course he doesn't know, and neither do I. Who are you? He, you don't know either? No, I don't. Well, this is a pretty situation. Look, stop stalling and get out of that bed. I'm not stalling. I, I'm trying to figure out what to do. No, I just bet you are. Oh, what the devil? I'm not going to take the rap. I'm going to tell the truth. We'd like to hear it. All right. Now, last night was your bridge night, wasn't it, Mary? How did you know that? And it was your bowling night, Fred. Isn't that right? That's right, and I don't know how you knew it, but it's got nothing to do with the it's fact that you broke into, into our, our house. My presence here, and I didn't break into your house. This is a very delicate situation. Mary's bridge night, Fred's bowling night, but... Well, let me put it this way. One of you is putting me in a most embarrassing position because... You see, one of you didn't go bowling or bridge playing. And that one brought me home and invited me to stay a week. What are you talking about? I was invited to stay here in this house for one week by one of you. He or she seems to have changed his or her mind. I went bowling last night and I never saw you before in my life. I played bridge last night and I never saw you before either. You see? One of you is lying. <laughs> well, that's impossible. Uh-huh. It gives us all something to think about, doesn't it? Look here, if you are suggesting that my you wife... You tell me that my husband... One of you was very clever to say what you just said. Still, it's going to be a strain, isn't it, to keep it up. I'll tell you what, I have a suggestion. What is it? Well, it's born of the fact that I'm hungry. Why don't we talk this over at breakfast like 
sensible, civilized people. You've got a nerve. You are going to give me some breakfast, aren't you? Mary, I think we ought to. It'll give us a little time to think. Now, look, dear, you go on downstairs. I'll stay here with this character while he gets dressed. <laughs> coffee? Oh, thank you. I will, yes. Are you ready to talk now? Well, I really told you all I have to say. Oh, this is good coffee, Mary. So glad you like it. I'm willing to answer questions if you have any. All right. Now, you say one of us brought you home last night. Which one? Now, that's the question I'm not going to answer. Why not? Well, the person who brought me home doesn't want his or her husband or wife to know where he or she was last night. And you know what? On reflection, I can see why. This is ridiculous. Of course it is. You came home about 11.30, right? Yes. And I got home about 1.30. And by that time, Mary was asleep. Now, where does that get either of you? Well, I've got a question. According to your story, you knew one of us, only one of us. But when you woke up this morning, you called us both by name. Now, how do you account for that? The person I was with last night talked about the person he or she was married to. As a matter of fact, under the circumstances, it was quite natural to do so. What circumstances? One of you knows very well what circumstances, and the other will have to guess. Fred, were you with your bowling team last night? Yes. How about you? I played bridge at Agatha's house. That's what you say. What do you mean by that? I mean that's what you say. He says differently. No, he doesn't. He says differently about you. Oh, this is great. This is. I've been reading for years about the kind of thing that goes on in the suburbs, the discontented wives. The philandering husband. And I'll tell you the truth. I honestly didn't think it applied to this suburb, or at least to this house in this suburb. What are you trying to pretend, Fred? That I've ha- had an affair? I don't know what has happened, but I know I'm going to find out one thing. What's Agatha's phone number? SC44099. What do you think you're going to find out? I am just going to get a couple of things straightened out. Believe me, it's time we got the cards out on the table. Yeah, we'll just find out. What... Hello, Agatha. Uh, this is Fred Denton. Uh, Agatha, Mary has gone out this morning, and I can't find a little black notebook that she was carrying for me last night. I I wonder if she left it at your house. Oh, I see. She she was there, wasn't she? She was either supposed to go to your house or... Oh, oh yeah, that's right. It it, it was bridge night. Okay, well, uh, the notebook will probably turn up. Thanks, Agatha. Bye. Give me that phone. And what do you think you're doing? Never you mind. You just never mind. Don't think you're the only one that can go around checking up on things. Well, the, uh, hello? Uh, Harry? Well, this is Mary. Listen, Harry, uh, confidentially, what is the best bowling score my husband ever had? Oh, I see. Well, he hasn't been bragging then. Uh, what did he bowl the last time? Oh, that's right. It was last night, wasn't it? And no, I just didn't think he was that good, and I've been kidding him. Well, thank you, Harry. Bye. Mary? Yes, Fred? I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed, too. Of course, either Agatha or Harry was fixed beforehand. You shut up. All right, if you want me to. I trust my wife implicitly. That's splendid. And I trust my husband. Admirable. What is your game, anyhow? It doesn't seem to do much good for me to tell the truth to you people. You're going to tell the truth before I get through with you. You bet you are coming in here and upsetting us this way. Now, you've had your breakfast and you probably think you're going to leave now. Well, you're not. You're going to stay in this house until we get to the bottom of all this. Of course I am. I've been invited for a week. May I come in, Fred? Sure. Where is he? He's sitting on our sun porch as if he owned it, reading one of our books. Well, 
Well, I wouldn't have let it go on this way if it weren't that I run the business from home here. I should hope not. I wouldn't want to be alone with him. But in all of these days, what is it, three or four days, we haven't found out a thing. Well, we found out his name is Bert. If it is his name. Well, he's just been divorced and has no place to go. Yeah, if he was ever married, which, frankly, I doubt. Mm. Or do you find him attractive, Mary? What do you mean by that? Hang it all. I just want to know why he is here. Because you told him he couldn't leave. Which fitted in perfectly with his plan. Oh, this is too much. Look, I'm going to see that guy. You stay here. I want to talk with him alone. No, and it's not what you're thinking. I didn't say a word, did I? You looked. Go ahead. Go and talk to him. Whatever you have to say. Well, Bert, taking your ease on my sun porch, I see. Oh, just a moment, Fred. Wait until I finish this paragraph, will you? Oh, I won't wait. Wait. Well, you're pretty hopped up. You bet I am. Why are you causing trouble around here? Am I? You know you are, and you're enjoying it, too. Well, why not? I'm a student of human nature. I've had enough. Good. Now, let's see you smile after that. Or that. Stop it. Stop it. All right. Your husband has a cut on his cheek. You better fix it. I'll give you more than that. I said stop it. What are you doing here anyway, Mary? I told you I wanted to talk to him alone. If you want to know, I was in the dining room listening. Oh, you were? Well, then, if you were listening, you now know this character and I never saw each other before. No, I don't. Anything you said to each other can be taken either way. Either he came home with you that night, or you have no idea who he is. Nothing you said told me a thing. <laughs> Think back on the conversation, Fred. She's right. Nobody knows any more now than you did that morning you found me here. Still and all, in view of the fact that we've had this fight, I'll go or I'll stay, just as you please. If I leave now, you'll never see me again. And you'll never know, will you? So, shall I go? Stay. Stay. <laughs> Come in. Oh, hi, Mary. Everything under control? Everything's under control, including dinner. Oh, is it really that late? Mm -hmm. I've been catching up on some work I should have done earlier this week. Well, dinner's ready. Uh, and uh, our guest? Upstairs. Do you know, Mary, we haven't said a single thing about why Bert is here or that fantastic story he gave us or, or anything at all since he and I had that fight. I know. Of course, I don't know what you're saying to him while I'm here in the office. Now, Fred, I thought we agreed we would just forget those suspicions. Oh, I didn't mean it that way, honey. What I mean is it's it, it, it's actually been kind of pleasant since the fight. Well, I hate to agree, but that's true. It's been as if you were, I don't know... One of the family. That's right. It's all wrong, of course. Uh, I know. The truth of the matter is that... Uh, since the fight, we've all been getting along beautifully, and we haven't found out a thing. It's just been easier for us to be pleasant, because we're pleasant suburban people. That's what I mean. And you know something, Fred. What? This is our last chance. What do you mean? He was going to stay a week. At 1.30 tomorrow night, that week is over. At 11.30 tomorrow oh, night. Oh, no, please, Fred. Well, sometime tomorrow night. Yes. All right, we've got a little more than 24 hours to find out all about this man and what he's been up to. All right? Now, is dinner ready? Yes. Okay, come on. And let's make it a pretty tough dinner for him. Mary, you couldn't have pleased me more. I love goulash. Well, I'm glad. Look here, my friend. You have been here now almost a week. You know, I was thinking of that myself. I'm going to miss you two people. Well, we are not going to miss you. Oh, now, I take offense at that. I really believed you, Fred. 
I think tonight would be an excellent time for you to explain yourself, Bert. You mean speak right out in public and tell you who brought me here last week? Either that or what joke you're playing. Oh, no, I couldn't be that cruel to you. It, it would be better, wouldn't it? Uh, for you to think in the years to come that possibly I was just kidding. What we want from you right now, Bert, is the truth. I've never told you anything else. The whole truth. How long do you cook the noodles? The whole truth, and now. My week is up tomorrow night. I suppose I can see your point of view, but, uh, well, it isn't always wise to insist on knowing things that might hurt you. Will you stop all that nonsense and just tell us what you have to tell us? I was going to say it isn't always wise, but if people insist on knowing, they usually can find out. So? We have more than 24 hours. I don't want to ruin an excellent meal, but uh, I can give you a promise. What is it? Well, I arrived in this house sometime between 11.30 and 1.30 a week ago tomorrow night. By tomorrow night, at that time, you, Fred, and you, Mary, won't have any further doubt. Look, you, I want an answer from you, and I want it now. Well, you're not going to get it. Oh, wait a minute. Now, you tell us what's going stop on it, here. Stop it. You Are you going to tell Fred, me? Fred, stop it. Don't hit him. All I'm... right, Mary. Now, look, I've said all I've had to say. And you listen to me, you two. Tomorrow night, both of you will be quite certain that you know the truth. Well, no, I, I've been here in the office since 7 a.m. Why? Well, I went to call him for breakfast, and Freddie's gone. What do you mean? He's nowhere in this house. Let me look. I tell you, I've looked everywhere. I don't doubt it. And I've called him and called him. I tell you, he's gone. I'm sure he's gone, but what I want to see Let's is... Let's go see if his clothes are there. It's not his clothes I'm interested in. Mary, where's my watch? How should I know? I left it here on this bureau. What well, did he... Exactly. Where are you going? To check on other things. What other things? The silverware, for one oh, thing. Oh, Gone. Oh. oh. We have been the prize suckers, the prize fools. Friend. What? Look, the mean days is gone. Sit down. Let's not look any further. I'm sure every small object we've got that's worth anything is gone. Oh. 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 What are you laughing at? Oh. Darling, you know it's not awful at all. Don't you see? It's over. Oh. If I could only tell you the suspicions I had of you. Well, I have the same suspicions as you. <laughs> ah, darling, it's just wonderful. Let him have the stuff. He was nothing but a burglar. A confidence man, a racketeer. Oh, darling. Oh, Mary, my love. <laughs> hey, you think we ought to report this to the police? Oh, I haven't thought about it. What do you think? Oh, I don't suppose they could get any of that stuff back for us. No. Still. No. Maybe you're right. It wouldn't be wise to report it. Well, I, I, I didn't say we shouldn't report it. I... Well, of course you did. Mercy, do you think I have anything to fear from reporting this? Well, does that mean you think I have? Now, Fred, let's not quarrel. Well, you said that... No. No. <laughs> Let's not quarrel. Well, uh, will we report it to the police? Well, I'll leave it to you. It might make us a laughing stock. That's true. Yeah. That... Oh, look, we, we don't have to spar around this way as if we were still suspicious of one another. No. Why don't we just decide not to report it and, and agree that this is the decision of both of us? That's much the best way. Let's just... Put aside all doubts of one another. Yes. Just say, I love you. 
I love you. And I love you. And we can prove it too, Fred. This very night. No doubt. No suspicion. This is your bowling night and my bridge night. Hey, that's right. You go to your bridge and I'll go to my bowling. And we'll just forget the whole ridiculous business. Mm -hmm. I love you, Mary. And I love you, Fred. But I'm not going to my bridge party. There's a drug store across from the bowling alley, and I'm going to be there in the window with an ice cream soda, seeing whether he goes bowling or not. And if he checks me, it will be easy to get the girls to say that I was playing bridge. No bowling for me. I'll be in the bushes opposite Agatha's house. The guys will cover for me in case she checks. I'm going to find out about her for certain, one way or the other. Love, Fred, but he's not going to make a fool of me. She is the greatest girl in the world, but if she's putting anything over on me, I'm going to find out. The Stranger, written by Robert Senadella and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Elliot Reed, Elspeth Eric, and James Monks. Audio engineer, Bill Sandreuter. Sound technician, M.C. Brock. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastatsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production. Why wasn't this news released? Because it would create public hysteria. There would be an absolute panic. Yes, I, I suppose you're right. There'd be riots in the streets. It would make an invasion from Mars seem like a Sunday school picnic. Theater 5 presents The New Order. Thank you, Mr. Garson. Thank you. I'm John Clements, and this is my assistant, Sam Winston. How do you do? As you know, we're from the National Board. And what can we at Robots Unlimited do for you? Well, of course, you're aware that there's a new investigation of robotry. <laughs> there's always a new investigation of robots and Robots Unlimited, gentlemen. I just hope I haven't accidentally broken the rules of the charter. No, no, nothing like that. In fact, we wish all government departments were run as efficiently as this one. Well, thank you. Actually, we're here, Mr. Garson, because people are, well, they're getting very worried about robotry. Worried? It goes even deeper than that. They're afraid of the newest robots. But there's no reason to fear robots. I doubt we can convince people of that. At one time, a robot was a mechanical man with flashing lights for eyes, antennae for ears, and, well, he was obviously a robot. But now you can't tell a mechanical man from a human, except through dissection. No, there is another way, gentlemen. A robot is different from a human being because it does not know how to hate. And most important, it cannot bring harm to any human. Now, this is an integral part of the robot makeup. In fact, it's the first law of robotics. And that's precisely why we're here, Mr. Oh, excuse me. Yes, Garson here. Mr. Garson. Adam C. is ready for testing. Have Adam C. wait, please. Yes. Would you like to see an interesting test? What kind of test? Well, Adam C. is an R4 robot. I thought all R4s were supposed to be destroyed. Yes, that is, the charter states that when a robot type becomes obsolete, it should be destroyed. Why hasn't that been done? Well, the charter also gives a time limit for possible modification. So I've been working on the R4s. You see, there are two basic differences between the R4s and the R5s. The R4 voice was metallic, and it had a sort of built-in echo. 
Barclay, our five voice is as human as yours or mine. The other difference is, well, I'll call it the nervous system, connecting the brain to the voice box. Well, in the R4, the working of the brain was not attuned to the voice box. The R4 could solve problems, but could not transmit the answers vocally. This, of course, made the R4 a worker with a very limited capacity and range. The R5, however, solves problems and then gives the answers. Or it transmits the answers into action, just as a human would. And have you managed to alter the R4 enough to meet the new specifications? Yes, yes. Adam C. will be the 15th XR4 I've tested. The others have all met the new specifications. According to the terms of the charter, if Adam C. passes his tests, I'll have the right to modify all other R4s. There's a total of 528 of them. Well, gentlemen, would you like to see the test? Yes, I would, Mr. So I. Good. I'm sure you'll find it quite absorbing. Oh, please send Adam C. in. Yes, Mr. Carson. Oh, gentlemen, would you like a cigarette? Oh, thank you. No, thanks. I'm, uh, I'm going to introduce you to Adam C. as I would uh, a human. I, I ask you to cooperate. Are you trying to tell us that robots have feelings? Well, not as we know feelings, no. But their tuning can be upset by, well, unexpected rudeness, for example. Oh, come in. Adam C. reporting as ordered, Mr. Garson. Oh, Adam C., this is Mr. Clements and Mr. Winston. They are government investigators. I'm honored to know you gentlemen. Uh... Uh, how do you do? Pleased to meet you. Now, Adam C.? Yes, Mr. Garson. Do you understand why you're here? Yes, sir. Tell me, please. I was an R4 robot. You have had me modified to meet the specifications of the R5 robot. If I do not meet all the specifications, I will be destroyed along with all other R4 robots. All right. Now, the first test is memory retention. Now, I'm going to open this book. You will read the page on the right-hand side. You will have only three seconds... Ready? Yes, Mr. Garson. Start reading. All right, now. Adam C., in your opinion, what kind of book is this? It seems to be a work of fiction. Oh, be more specific, please. I cannot be more specific, Mr. Garson. It seems to be a work of fiction. However, it could also be a biography, or it could be history done in a fictional style. Very good. And now I want you to read from memory the 19th and 20th lines on that particular page. The lines are a piece of dialogue. Quote, I don't like the idea of Ferguson and Martin meeting as equals, Kramer declared, adding in a low voice, their ideologies are simply not compatible. Unquote. Fine. And now, gentlemen, would you like to see the page? Yes. All right. Now, here's the book, Mr. Clements. Page 47. Ah, thank you. Now, oh, let's see. That's right. Down, down to the 19th line. I think you'll find that Adam C. read word for word that line and the one that follows. Huh. You know, this is amazing. It's not just amazing, it's completely incredible. Incredible? No, no, Mr. Winston. You see, the robot brain is uncluttered with irrelevancies. What's the next test, Mr. Garson? Mental arithmetic. Uh, may I give Adam C. the problem? Oh, by all means, please do. Um, can I have that piece of blank paper on your desk? Oh, sure. There you are. Thank you. Adam C.? Yes, Mr. Clements. I want you to solve this arithmetic problem for me. Yes, sir. And uh, multiply 7,927 by 4,684. And then I want you to divide the total by 424. That is the problem, Mr. Clements. Yes. The answer is 87,570, plus the fraction 97,106. <laughs> well, Mr. Clements, I, uh, I haven't figured it out for myself yet. Well, I'm sure you'll find that Adam C.'s answer is correct. Well, here's the total of the multiplication. 37,130,068. Correct, Mr. Clements. You, uh, you can prove the answer quite simply about it. Yes, that. yes, I know how, Mr. Garson. Well, Adam C., if Mr. Clements finds your answer to be correct, you may return to the waiting room for further instruction. Yes, Mr. Garson. Uh, well, the answer is correct, all right. That'll be all, Adam C. Goodbye, Mr. Garson. Gentlemen, being with you has been a pleasure. Well, I'll be darned. <laughs> it makes one feel rather inferior, doesn't it? Uh, Mr. Garson... Before this uh, test, 
We were speaking about the first law of robotics. Oh, yes, yes, so we were. Well, I think we're all aware of the fact that without this safeguard of the first law, Robots Unlimited would never have been granted a charter. In fact, the manufacture of human-type robots would not have been permitted. That's true. However, there is one man who can alter this first law. Professor Albert Dean, inventor of the human-type robot. And Professor Dean has been missing for the past five days. Missing? He disappeared from his home five days ago. Why wasn't this news released? Because the newspapers would pull out all the stops. There'd be panic. For the same reason, we didn't release another fact. That Professor Dean had been experimenting with a new robot. One to which the first law of robotics does not apply. You can imagine what the newspapers would do with that. Yes. This new robot type, did you know that Professor Dean was working on it? Well, yes, I did. I, well, at least there was a rumor to that effect. Mm, and uh, did you approve? Well, it makes small difference how I felt, Mr. Clemens. The matter was out of my hands. Professor Dean wasn't and isn't under my supervision. Yes, well, that's true enough. He was our responsibility. Mr. Garson, you were selected as general manager of Robots Unlimited because of your excellent record in government service. Your background of loyalty is impeccable. Thank you, but what is it you're trying to say, Mr. Clement? We're expecting that you cooperate with us in this matter. Well, of course. Just tell me what it is that you want me to do. Well, at the moment, Winston and I would like the run of this building and the grounds. Very well. Feel free to go anywhere. And then, later on today, we'll probably have another talk with you. Any time at all. Good. I don't think I have to tell you how important it is that we find Professor Dean as soon as possible. Now, that's rather obvious, Mr. Clemens. The professor's knowledge of robotics can be a very dangerous thing if, for instance, you were kidnapped by a foreign power. Exactly. Well, thank you for everything. Uh, gentlemen, if there's anything else that you need, just let me know. We will, and uh, thanks again. Thank you. Garson here, calling Frank B. This is Frank B., Mr. Garson. Did you monitor my conversation with the government investigators? Yes, sir. Do you have any orders concerning them? Just this. Cooperate with them in every way, but watch them carefully. Very carefully. Yes, Garson here. Frank B. reporting, Mr. Garson. Tomorrow five, standing by. I'll take care of this myself. Oh, Mr. Clement. Uh, uh, what? Well, you should have told me you wanted to come down here. I'd have provided you with a guide. I just wanted to have a look around. But you could get lost in this maze of passages. What's that? What? That tapping. Tapping? There it is again. It's coming from behind this wall. Mr. Garson, there's someone behind this wall. Oh, I'm sorry you felt you had to come down here, Mr. Clemens. I insist that you... There's no need to insist. There are rooms behind this wall. How do we get to them? Simply by moving this panel. It's a cell. (laughs) Who's that? Come along, Mr. Clemens. Meet Professor D. see, the professor is unharmed. Why do you have him tied and gagged? Because he knows certain words that activate the robot. Oh. Here they come now. Mr. Garson, I insist that you release Professor Dean. I'm sorry. No. I order you to. Come now, put away that gun. What do you want us to do, Mr. Garson? Take Mr. Clements to a cell. No. No, they can't carry out that order. Why not, Mr. Clements? Because of the first law of robotics. Robots aren't permitted to harm humans. But they don't intend to harm you. Let me go. See? They're gentle, but very strong. 
Take him away, please. You'd better have a good answer for all this, Carson. Well, I think I do. <laughs> Yes, Professor Dean. Oh, believe me, we don't enjoy keeping you prisoner. And we'll set you free just as soon as you change your mind. Oh, no. No. Well, I'm a patient man, Professor. The emergency alarm. Mr. Garson, please come to your office. Yes, Frank B., what is it? We found Agent Winston in the file room. How did he get in there? It must have happened while you were downstairs with Mr. Clements. I detailed some R5s to help you. There was a mistake in the assignments, and the file room was left unguarded for a moment. He must have slipped in. Where is he now? In the waiting room. Mr. Garson, I think you better tell these robot friends of yours to let me go. I'm afraid that's not possible, Mr. Winston. Now look, the kid gloves are off. I suggest that you cooperate and tell us all you know. It'll go a lot easier with you. You see, I had a good look through your files. So? I found a lot of information on Professor Dean, incidentally. Uh, do we have to speak in front of these robots? Why? Do they make you nervous, Mr. Winston? Yes, they do. But why? Have you forgotten the first law of robotics? They can't harm you. However, if you insist, I'll ask them to leave. Oh, Frank B., if you don't mind. Not at all, Mr. Garson. We'll go... Now, Mr. Winston, we were speaking about Professor Dean in the files. Please go on. After I read through certain papers in the files, it looked to me like a fantastic plot was taking form. A plot? Against our government in particular and against humanity in general. Well, that is fantastic, Mr. Winston. Now, please don't act so charmingly coy, Mr. Garson. You're part of it. You've got to be. How could Robot Unlimited be plotting against the government? Our, our fives are unable to harm humans. Well, the first law of robotics is an inherent part of their makeup. And don't forget, if we were using robots to overthrow the government, well, we have the army to contend with. The first law would operate against them. Mm-hmm, that's what you want people to think. Yes, the R5s obey the first law. And while the first law applies, you can't carry out your plan. That's where Professor Dean comes in. Oh? The professor was working on a new robot model when he disappeared... A model that does not obey the first law. A robot that would carry out an order to kill. Ah, now we begin to see the ramifications of this fantastic plot. Huh? You have 800 R5s and more than 500 R4s that you're modifying. Now, that doesn't take into account the robots you're probably manufacturing in secret. In secret? Oh, <laughs> you didn't see that in the files. Well, I saw enough to put you on trial for treason. If I'm to be executed as a traitor, why should I help you? I told you. We can make it easier for you. <laughs> By we, I assume you mean Mr. Clements and yourself. That's huh? right. Ah, uh, but I'm afraid Mr. Clements is in no position to help anyone. What do you mean? Listen. Garson here. Connect me with Mr. Clements' cell, please. Cell? You're connected, Mr. Garson. Clements? Clements, this is Garson. Garson, listen to me. If you don't let me out of this cell, so help me out. Well, I trust that convinces you, Mr. Winston. You see, your friend Clements made the mistake of wandering into a restricted area, just as you did. Who's giving the orders? You or Professor Dean? Professor Dean is in the cell next to Clements. I should have known. You kidnapped him? Yes. The professor was not amenable to my plan. You see, Professor Dean not only made a robot that did not obey the first law, but in doing so, he found a way to nullify the first law in other robots. And has he told you how to do it? He can't have. Not if you've got him in a cell. He will. And then I'll nullify the first law in all robots. And as they're tuned to my voice, they will obey my orders. Oh, by the way, there's something that isn't in the file room. I don't have to manufacture robots in secret factories. Robots can reproduce themselves. It's very simple. Each robot will manufacture another. Double a penny 30 times, Mr. Winston, and you get over a million pennies. In no time at all, I'll have a huge army of indestructible machines. What's happened to you, Garson? No one in government service had a better record than you. You were the last man we thought would turn true. You don't know me very well, Mr. Winston. That's just about the biggest understatement I've ever heard. <laughs> and we thought Professor Dean was the security risk. The professor has an IQ of 195, yet he's a fool. By helping me, he could be the most powerful man in the world. 
I cannot understand men like him or you. Spoken like a true paranoiac. <laughs> Isn't it strange? You devise a perfect form of government, an infallible method of controlling the world, and you're called insane. Remember, Mr. Winston, robots are not susceptible to bribery. They can't be blackmailed or intimidated or flattered or fooled. Can you say the same about our politicians and government office holders? Can you? No. Nope. Uh, We're all fallible. And you're at least as fallible as the rest of it. No, and what makes you say that? Because you're wrong. Your plan just won't work. Why not? Because your plan depends on Professor Dean. He's a dedicated scientist. He knows that if he alters the first law of robotics, whatever happens will be his responsibility. This is why he won't help you. No matter what you do to him. Ah, but he will help me for the simple reason that he is only human. Sooner or later, he'll weaken. It's only a matter of time. You're fast running out of time, Mr. Nothing Carson. Nothing can stop me. Oh, maybe I can. Ah, what good is locking that door going to do? I'm going to kill you, Mr. Garson. Oh, oh gun, just like Clements. And you all run so true to form. Put it away. You leave me no alternative but to kill you. You think shooting me will stop my plan? Without you, the robots would have no leader. And they won't do anything to me for killing you because they'll obey the first law. Ah, I see your reasoning. You think you'll get rid of me and then free the professor and Clement. No, Garson, don't move toward me. <laughs> what are you afraid of? You have a gun. Don't take another step. Or shoot, Mr. Winston. Shoot! All right! <laughs> I hit you with every shot. Everyone. You. You must be. A robot? Yes. Yes, I am. You see, the real Garson is dead. I had my face made in his image. When you and Clements are dead, two robots will be made in your image. The same thing will ultimately happen to the professor. That's my real plan, Mr. Winston. Robots won't have to fight the army or anyone else. We'll just step into your shoes, each and every one of you. But you haven't found a way to nullify the first law yet. Not yet. Until you do, a robot can't kill. It must obey the first law. All but one robot, Mr. Winston. The one Professor Dean made just before he disappeared. The robot to which the first law of robotics does not apply. You. You. Yes. You. I. I am that robot, Mr. Winston. presented The New Order, written by Don Harry and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Jay Barney, Bob Dryden, Jack Manning, Jack Grimes, and Owen Jordan. Audio engineer, Neil Pulse. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We would appreciate your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. Oh, the phone. It's in the middle of the night. No, not that. Not that again. Not him. Not that voice. Not those words. Theater 5 presents Ring of Evil. This is Lorraine Rayburn. Who's this? Vince? 
Vince who? What do you mean, just Vince? I can't think of any Vince I know. Oh, I'm frightfully sorry. I just can't place you. I've been running all over town the last month showing my own spring designs. But that's the fashion business at showing time. I hope you don't feel insulted, Vince. It was nearly one when I got in and I passed out from utter fatigue. Hmm? Well, it's two o'clock. Of course I'm lying in bed. What? What do you mean, what I'm wearing? That's none of your business. I don't care how you like to think of me. Well, I don't think it's a bit funny. Never in my life have I... Now, stop it. Are you drunk or something? I don't know who you are, what you are... Stop it. Stop it. Stop saying that disgusting word. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Oh, Anne, I've never... Never? Never heard? I, I, I heard you shouting. It's somebody. It was the phone. Oh, I thought somebody got in or, or, or a nightmare. <laughs> it was the phone. I was asleep and I... Well, who was it? I don't know. A man, he called himself Vince, but I don't know anybody named Vince. Oh. You mean just a wrong number? No, and he asked for me. In the most awful language. I'm not exactly a prude, and you hear some pretty rough stuff around the workshop at times, but never in my life. <laughs> the kind of thing you see scrawled on subway walls. Oh, oh, I feel like things are crawling all over me. And, and you don't know who it was? I have the slightest idea. Couldn't recognize the voice or the accent or anything. He wouldn't tell me his last name. He said I didn't know it. Possible. You meet hundreds of people, and some of them are kooks and creeps, but whoever he is, you're not responsible, Lorraine. Yes, that's what I keep telling myself, but maybe I am. Maybe I give men the wrong impression that I'd welcome such a call. Oh, Lorraine, that's idiotic. Maybe, but I don't know what to think or what to do. I'm afraid to go to sleep. I can't change my telephone number in the middle of the season. I'd be dead. And I'm so tired I could scream. Oh, Lorraine, calm down. Get to sleep. When Peter picks me up tomorrow night, you discuss it with him. Oh, I, I couldn't. Not Peter. He's too nice a guy. Oh, Anne, you don't know how lucky you are to be engaged to a man like Peter. I sure miss you when you get married. <laughs> it's not luck. I work at it. And you could do as well. But you want your career, your freedom to circulate. All I want is Peter. You talk to him. He'll help you. Thanks, dear. I will. I, I feel better, much better. I think I can sleep now. I hope. <laughs> No, don't answer. No. Uh, hello? Yes. Yes, Vince. I hung up because I couldn't stand it. Please let me sleep tonight. I need my sleep desperately. <laughs> That's terrible, Lorraine. Ann told me a little bit about it at lunch, but I didn't realize it was as repulsive as all that. Oh, Peter, you wouldn't have any idea. Oh, I've heard of things like that. These obscene phone calls, but... Peter, what do you think I can do about it? Well, now, Lorraine, I, I don't want you to be offended, but are you sure that this whole thing happened? Sure? Well, of course I'm sure. Peter, dear, I heard her shouting. Well, what I'm getting at is... Couldn't it have been a nightmare? No, Peter. I saw Lorraine. And I'll swear she was awake. Yes, I was, Peter. And I was for the second call. And most of the rest of the night. I, I'm just exploring the possibilities. Now, this fellow Vince, uh, would you say he was drunk? Well, he didn't sound drunk. His speech wasn't slurred. It, 
It was clear, only too clear. I didn't miss a word. I see. And, and you've never met anyone by that name. Well, maybe I have, but I can't remember. Well, maybe he got the number from the phone book. Well, you know our number here is unlisted. Well, then you must have given it to him. I guess I must, unless he copied it some some office record somewhere. Oh, Peter, I'm so upset. I thought maybe I ought to call the police. Oh, I think you're making a little too much of this. But what do you advise, Peter? I told Lorraine I I was sure you'd have some suggestion or some help. Believe me, I need both. Well, Lorraine, I, I, I would try to ignore the whole thing. It may never happen again. And if it does, this... This Vince character will soon understand that you're too nice a girl to play his game. Peter's sweet optimism was very contagious, but my optimism lasted only until 12.30 that night, when the telephone bell once more shattered the stillness of the night. This time I was prepared, I thought. I tried to find out where the call was coming from. It was useless. I knew I couldn't hang up on him until he'd poured out the sewage of his mind. There was no escape. So it continued. Soon he began to call during the day, too. He seemed to know when I might be home. And even when several days went by, there was no relief. Whether I wanted to or not, I thought of him constantly with fear and disgust. My life was distorted. My career was suffering. I had to do something. So, Mr. LaManna, I've decided I can't take it any longer. That's why I've come to the telephone company. Well, now I understand, Miss Rayburn, but you must realize it's a very difficult problem. Well, surely you can do something to stop it. Miss Rayburn, we handle 25 million calls a day. 25 million, mind you. Now, our company can't be responsible for the content of these calls. Well, I'm not interested in the 25 million calls. What can you do for me? Well, of course, we can change your number or we can keep it unlisted, but unfortunately, this would cost you many valuable contacts, both business and social contacts. I don't want to change my number. I shouldn't have to. Well, in your case, I can't even advise it. We have found out that anybody who really wants the number can get it. Uh, Not from us, mind you, but from personnel records and so on and so forth. Mr. LaManna, I can't go on living like this. I'll go stark, raving mad. Can't you investigate and trace calls? We have no power. This man is violating the criminal code. Now, I suggest you go to the police. The police? Well, it's the only way. Now, we cooperate with them all that we can. We can do nothing without them. Not at all, Miss Rayburn. It's my job, and I'll do everything I can. But I can do nothing without you. I'd be a pretty poor policeman if I told you otherwise, miss. Detective Simmons, what can I do? I've tried every way to get him to reveal his address, his telephone number, his last name. He's driven me to distraction. You forgive me for saying so. There's one thing any woman can do. Talk. It takes lots of time to trace a call, even if it comes through just one exchange. It's bad enough to listen, but talk... You'll have to, miss. I'm sorry. Each contact point has to be checked by the telephone company while the call is still in progress. But I've got nothing to say to him. Well, you'll have to hold him on the line. Sweet talking. Make old Vince think he's getting somewhere with the object of his peculiar affection. Oh, no. Really, no. Oh, yes. Now, I don't say it's either easy or pleasant, but you got to get close to a snake before you can kill it. Think it over, Miss Rayburn. Yes. Yes, Vince, I'm here. No, I've been awake. I've been reading. Don't you understand, Vince? I couldn't sleep. I was waiting for your call. I missed you. Of course I did. I can't help it. Your voice is so exciting. It just gives me chills. Really, it it does. It's so exciting. (laughs) 
Maybe I was too impulsive when I decided to play along with Vince and his disgusting calls. But I had to do something. I found myself in a nightmare that terrified me. Could this be me? Could this be my life I was living? The only thing that kept me going was Detective Simmons and the loyal friendship of Anne Howard and Peter Waddell. At least I could talk to them, and I poured out all my worries and troubles. Lorraine, we'll just have to change our number. Yeah, why don't you? Well, because I promised Detective Simmons I'd see this through, and I'm going to, even if it kills me. Which it may very well, if you're not sensible. You're not looking well, Lorraine. Oh, I'm just tired. He called twice last night? Once at 1.15 and then 4.30. I kept him talking for eight minutes the first time and 11 minutes the next. And neither were long enough to trace. I still think Peter ought to stay here in our apartment on the couch tonight. If this Vince heard a man's voice, it, it would scare him good and plenty. Yes, but I don't want to scare him. It's too late for that. And besides, Peter's done enough. Lorraine, believe me, I'd be glad to. Oh, Peter, you're sweet, but you stayed over twice and lost a lot of sleep for nothing. Just because he didn't call those two nights doesn't mean that he won't call tonight. Oh, well, Peter's done enough. He'd be glad to stay, wouldn't you, darling? Of course I would. Lorraine, Ann and I have talked it over, and we feel we can't get married until these calls are stopped once and for all. I wouldn't dream of leaving you alone in this apartment as long as that man is loose. You two are wonderful. Well, all right, let's try again tonight, Peter. Good. If I could only rid you of this Vince, I'd be the happiest guy in the world. Peter stayed that night. And reassured by his presence, I slept a blessed sleep. But the telephone didn't ring all night, so nothing was accomplished. Nothing seems to work, Detective Simmons. I can't keep this up. I just can't. Isn't there some other way? Why should we be so helpless? Miss Rayburn, everybody's doing all they can, but the calls don't seem to come from the same exchange. The other night, the telephone company traced through five digits. Another few minutes, they might have had the whole number and we could have moved in. But you know, it takes time. The calls just aren't long enough. I try to extend them. Heaven knows I try, but there's just so much I can stand. I listen and talk and listen, and then all of a sudden I feel sick to my stomach. I panic. I admit it. And I close the conversation as fast as I can. You see, I was brought up in a small town, so I suppose this sounds foolish to you. Oh, not a bit, Miss Rayburn. I was brought up in the streets of New York, but some of these guys I feel like handling with tweezers. So I have nothing but admiration for you, Miss. You've got guts, if you'll pardon the expression. Well, thank you, but I wish it did me some good. Maybe it will, but that depends on how much more you can do. Not much more. I'm almost at the end of my rope. Miss Rayburn, listen to me. If you're game, we'll try a long shot. Game for what? I want you to make a date, Vince. Oh, I couldn't. Take your friends with you to be witnesses. I'll be there. And if Vince shows, I'll pick him up. I, I, I don't know. You'll never be bothered again, miss. Think of that. I am thinking of it. Maybe... Maybe I'll try. Yes, Vince. I'm listening. Well, sure, honey. I was waiting for your call. That voice of yours is so thrilling. You must be a fascinating guy to be with. No. No, Vince, I'm not kidding you. It's great talking to you, but... You know, it's been a long time since you first called. And I'm... Bored with just talk. You know what I mean? Yes, I want to meet you, Vince. I, I've got to meet you in the worst way. I do nothing but think of you all day and all night. Oh, please, Vince, let's get together. Well, what's there to think about? Not maybe. Say yes. How about tomorrow? At 8 o'clock in the evening. You know the hotel, Phyllis? Yes. Yes, that's it. 45th Street, just east of Broadway, in the lobby. Well, just wear a red handkerchief in your breast pocket. Oh, don't worry. I'll be there. I'll be there. Hello? This is...
is Miss Rayburn. I want to leave a message for Detective Simmons. No, Miss Howard. Yes, Detective Simmons. You sit over in the corner where you can see Miss Rayburn. Read your book, but keep a sharp eye for anyone who approaches her. I'll go there. Right casual, now. casual. Keep it casual. Mr. Mordell? Yes, sir. Lean against the pillar like you were waiting for a date. Whatever you say. Don't glance at Miss Howard or Miss Rayburn. I get it. Uh, where will you be? I'm going to slip on a porter's jacket. Look like I'm cleaning the lobby. I guess that'll make me entirely inconspicuous. Think you're going to nab him tonight? Your guess is as good as mine, Mr. Wardell. Through the corner of my eye, I saw Anne and Peter take their places. A moment later, Detective Simmons started mopping the grimy marble floor. I knew their eyes were on me and their hearts were with me. Or I would have run away. As it was, I waited, with my heart pounding, watching the approach of each strange man, looking for the red handkerchief, which meant that this was the malignant spirit who had appropriated my life, scanning each masculine face for the shadow of evil. Time passed slowly like it had in the many nightmares I had known since that first telephone call. I waited. I waited. He never showed up. Peter took Anne and me home. I excused myself and went to bed, but not to sleep. Not for a long time. Not until I heard the door slam shut as Peter took his leave of Anne. That was the last thing I remembered until... It's you, Vince. What happened to you tonight? Why did you stand me up? Well, of course you stood me up, and I know why. Sure, I'll tell you, Vince. You're chicken. Oh, yes, you are. You're not man enough. All you can do is talk, talk, talk on the telephone. You're afraid of me. That's why you didn't come to the Hotel Phyllis tonight. What? What do you mean you were there? Where? You were there watching me? And you thought I was trying to trap you? Well, Vince, how was I going to trap you? Ann and Peter? And that detective? What detective? Simmons? You know his name. I see. And you know Ann and Peter. <gasps> oh, dear God. Peter! Nobody else fits. Peter, listen to me. No one else knows those three names. That's how I know. The voice doesn't fool me any longer. Oh, Peter, Peter, what am I going to tell Anne? No wonder I never heard from Vince the night you stayed here. Oh, Peter, 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 listen to me. You need help. You're sick, sicker than anyone I've ever known. And unless you get help... I'm going to have to tell Anne the whole story. As sure as God is in his heaven, I'll see that she doesn't marry you, Peter. It's no use telling me that you love her very much. You have to face the fact that you... Peter? Peter? Peter! They found his body the next morning. Torn torn, as it were, between the two worlds in which he lived. Anne kept him in her memory with infinite love. She never understood his sudden death. And I never told her. Presented Ring of Evil, written by Raphael David Blau and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Vicki Bola, Roger DeCoven, Ann Costello, Elliot Reed, and Hal Hackett. Audio engineer, Bill Sandreuter. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlas Dutsenko. 
Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We appreciate your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. has been an ABC radio. It isn't for me. I wish I were back on McDougal Street. Bobby! I... Oh, and the... the shed. Just like in my dream. Bobby! 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 Oh! Oh, no! Bobby, my baby. Oh, my darling, no! No! <laughs> Your time is up. Pretty? Dover Ridge, pretty? Well, grass it's got, and trees, green stuff like that. Sure. So the cemetery. Moving out here was Paul's idea. I want Bobby brought up in the country, Rhoda, like I was, he told me. Well, not if his pop works in the city, I said. Honestly, I should have had my head examined. Me, Rhoda Powers, buried here in the sticks. Away from theaters and concerts and everything. Oh, not that I got to them very often. Pretty. From the first day I came to live here, Dover Ridge gave me the creeps. Lonely? Nuts. It was driving me psycho. Paul, I'd say, I, I got a feeling. It, this place is just no good for Bobby. Oh, Rhoda, that's ridiculous. You're, you're just projecting your own neurotic urban compulsions. Go fight City Hall. No, Paul, I'm talking about the baby. I told you about this horrible feeling these last couple of days. Feeling? Delusion? Delusion schmalusion. Paul, I can't get it out of my head. Like I see Bobby lying dead near that rickety old shed. And... Oh. Oh, Paul, please, take us back to the city anywhere. Brooklyn, even. We don't have to live in Greenwich Village again. Rhoda, stop the hysteria. Hysteria? Two days later, that was exactly where I found Bobby. Poor little doll. The... The rusty points of the big hay rake are driven through his body near the rickety old shed. Oh, that train whistle has been driving me bats all morning. I must be hearing things. There aren't that many trains a month through Dover Ridge. Paul. Paul, it seems to say Paul. Now I understand. It's... That feeling, like... Like just before Bobby died. The train... All the 5.36 train tonight. An accident. Oh, of course, he's... Well, he's got it coming to him, Paul does. Even after Bobby left us, he wouldn't move back. Leaving me here all alone by myself all day. It's no wonder Arthur and I got together. Arthur at least listened to me. That is when he wasn't telling me about his painting. Arthur. 
If it happens, if Paul is... Like I have this feeling, we wouldn't have to sneak around like now. Oh, 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 wouldn't that be something? Hey, girl, let's tell him now, huh? Hello? Arthur, you busy? Oh. Listen, Arthur, you I just... know I have a deadline on this cover, baby. I was painting all last night. It's and about then... Paul. Well, what about Paul? Did he say anything about us? Hey, have you been blabbing? Oh, for heaven's sakes, no, nothing like that. I, I just had a feeling all morning that we won't have to worry about that kind of thing much longer. A feeling, Rhoda? Do you know something that I don't? Well, something's going to happen to Paul. I know. You know what? He's going to be in a train accident today. What? Goodbye, Paul. Baby, if this is your idea of a joke... No, no joke, Arthur. It's, it's just like before Bobby. I, I had the same feeling about Paul all this morning. Oh, good Lord, not Paul. But, look, Rhody, it's just a feeling. Well, with Bobby, it happened. And ever since, I'm like clairvoyant. Well, if you're that certain, Rhody, you ought to take steps. You know, try to prevent it somehow. Why? Paul didn't lift a finger to save Bobby. And if it happens... Well, you and I, we, we'd be free to do whatever we want. Oh, there. Hold your horses. Rhoda, don't count on me. You know I've never promised anything. Arthur. Arthur, you said you loved me. Oh, now, baby, you've been around. Just because we got kind of thrown together with Paul away all day, why, Paul's my friend. We should have broken off long ago. You know that. Rhoda, I can tell you lately I have felt like a louse. We I mean, ought to. Playing me for a chump. Look, I gotta get back to work. Goodbye, Arthur. Come on, no hard feelings. And and Rhoda, do me a favor. Call Paul. Keep him away from that train today. Don't forget, Rhoda, you love Paul enough to marry him. Someday you'll thank me. For nothing. Just like I'd been bounced down the stairs. That's how I felt. Arthur's voice kept coming at me. Don't forget, Rhoda, you love Paul enough to marry him. I couldn't remember ever being that cockeyed about Paul. Mostly I remember hating to eat dinner all by myself in some joint. Someday you'll thank me. Oh, that'll be the day. It's not like I wanted Paul to die in a train accident. I just knew he would. Keep him away from that train today. No, why should I? Oh, maybe I ought to try. If anything happened to Paul and I hadn't tried, it would be like I did it myself. Now, that kind of a girl, I'm not. Kenmore Advertising, good morning. Paul Powers, please. Mr. Powers is in conference. Well, this is Mrs. Powers. Doris is urgent. Oh, sorry, Mrs. Powers. He can't be disturbed. Would you please give me Mr. Powers? All right, Mrs. Powers, but I'm not responsible. One moment, please. Yes, Powers. What is it, please? Paul, it's me, Rhoda. Look, I, I told that girl... Not... Paul, listen, I am very upset. Rhoda, I can't have you interrupting my work all the time. Paul, you remember when Bobby was... Oh, Rhoda, don't start that again. Oh. I'm late for an appointment. I'll see you tonight. Paul! Paul, please! I called back. They said he'd be out all day. But that just left one chance. Almost every day, Paul phoned me from the same booth a few minutes before he got on the train, just so that I could mix the martinis and toss the salad. Well, that's the kind of guy he is. He runs his life on a schedule like a train. So all I had to do was sit watching the clock all day, waiting for his call. Hello? Hello? Paul? Rhoda, it's me, Arthur. Arthur, I got nothing to say to you. Have you gotten hold of Paul? No, I couldn't reach him. And don't bother me and don't come around. Well, Paul would be suspicious if I suddenly disappeared. Look, if you don't get off the phone, Buster, he won't be alive to be suspicious. It's almost train time. Goodbye. Oh, come on, ring. Ring. Oh, call you stupid idiot. Call. Paul. Paul, is it you? 
Are you expecting somebody else? No. No, of course not. Your phone was busy a minute ago. Who are you talking to? It was uh, uh, just a wrong number. Was it? Hmm. Well, regular time. Have things ready? No. No, Paul, no. No? No, don't hang up. I... Well, if I don't get on now, somebody will take my seat. You know I hate to sit anywhere else. Uh, remember when I called you this morning? Oh, we'll talk about it tonight at 8.45. No, listen to me, Paul. Don't get on the train, huh? Stay in New York tonight. Rhoda, I don't want to be in your way or anything. I don't have to come home tonight. I don't have to come home again, ever. Paul, it's nothing like that. Well, just why do you want to be alone? Alone? If there's anything I hate, it's, it's being alone. That's why you can't come home tonight. You're not talking sense, Rhoda. Oh, all right. I didn't want to, but I'll tell you. All day long, I've had the same feeling I had before Bobby was killed. Only only this time, it was going to be you. And it was going to be the 536 train to Dover Ridge. Oh, oh now, really, Rhoda. How ridiculous can you get? Look, you took a course in psychology at the new school, didn't you? Can't you recognize a death wish when you see it? But, Paul, I don't want to see you die. If I did, I wouldn't have tried to call you up. Oh, Paul, please don't be so smug. Please, please let the train go without you. Absolutely not. I'm not running my life by your crazy whims. I'm getting my usual seat and my regular train at my regular time. Well, then go ahead. Just go ahead and do it. Do it. Get on your regular train and take your regular seat. I did everything I could. Now die, do you hear me? Die if you want to. Die. Die. <laughs> I told Paul to go ahead and die if he wanted to. I sizzled down. Nobody, but nobody has a temper like mine. I knew I had to make one more try to stop him from getting on that train. Like I say, Paul always called me from the same booth. And once I jotted down the number so I could call him back. Oh, busy. Oh, Someone took the booth. Yes? Hi, Rhoda. It's me again. Oh, Paul. I called the booth and the line was busy. I was dialing you. Look, uh, the train leaves in a minute. I, I called because you sounded so... so funny. I was disturbed. You weren't paying any attention to me. And I know I guess it sounds like a cockamamie story, but worst comes to worst. You stay in New York and, and there's no accident. Well, you say you hate to be alone at night in the country. Well, one night is better than, than forever, right? Well, what gave you the idea that I'd be in a train accident? I don't know, but didn't I tell you about Bobby before he was killed? Yes, Rhoda, you did, and I wish to God I'd listen to you. Well, Paul, will you listen to me now? But, honey, the whole thing is so irrational. Oh, for once in your life, admit. Admit that there are some things you can't figure out with reason and psychology. Brains I don't have, Paul. So maybe I got something else. Intuition, sixth sense, who knows? Just stay off the train, please. You really care? Oh, what do you think I am, Paul? Heartless or something? Look, I tried to call you at the office, and, and then you were out, and I couldn't do anything but wait. You really care that much, Rhoda? Well, what's so strange? Well, I just didn't know. You've been so remote from me recently. Well, maybe you've been Cary Grant to me. Oh, oh there's my train now. I've got to run. No, no. No, Rhoda. Oh, please, please. I can't figure you out, honey. But tonight I'm going to do what you ask. You'll stay? Oh, boy. The 536 is pulling out now. Oh, oh, Paul. Paul, I'm so happy I could scream. You know how I feel? I'm going to go down to the village and celebrate. Where? To Bonvini's. Where else? Isn't that where I met you? Oh, I wish I were with you. So do I. You know, I'll never forget that first time. <laughs> Remember what you said when Luigi asked if I could sit at your table? You said, I'll eat with anybody. Now, was that nice? <laughs> well, how about you? The way you looked at me, as if I were just a thing. No, Rhoda. I just didn't know any girls like you. The copper bracelet, the, the dangling earrings, the thongs on your feet, that peasant blouse. So low cut. Mm, you sure noticed that. You always got tangled up in your spaghetti. You know, Rhoda, I've never had so much fun before. You were so lively and so different from anyone I ever knew. Well, you looked as if you could stand for fun. You were so stiff and proper, like you were sitting, standing at attention. <laughs> I didn't even know your name. 
You know what I could never figure out, darling? Sure I know. Me. I never could figure out why you paid any attention to me. No, what's so hard about that? You were a man. Only, <laughs> sometimes you looked like a boy in his Sunday school suit. Besides, you treated me like a lady, and, and oh, you seem to have everything. I, I don't mean money, though. You had a lot more of that than the village characters I was going out with. But you seemed to know who you were, and where you were going, and why. And you had a haircut and a press suit, and <laughs> you didn't laugh a lot, but when you did, it was... It wasn't so that people would look at you. And all the things I sweated to have, like like education and poise and distinction, you know? Well, they seemed born with you. I guess that's why I fell for you like a ton of bagels, Paul. And when you hinted we might get married, ooh, I felt like I was Cinderella after the shoe fitting. Rhoda, you never told me that. I didn't think you'd like to hear it. Gee, I thought you liked me because I was kooky and cool. Your time is up. Deposit 45 cents, please. Oh, uh, one moment, operator. Oh. Thank you, sir. Oh. oh, you're sending a fortune. Worth every penny. You know, I've learned more over the phone here than in eight years of marriage. Well, you could also talk to me sometime when it doesn't cost. You could leave your attache case in the office some evening. We could have fun like we used to. I'll bet we could. It's been a long time, Rhoda. Oh, tomorrow, Paul. You'll see. We'll start catching up, huh? Tomorrow? Why not tonight? Oh, but you're going to Bonavini's, and, and the next train is in an hour and a half. Oh, what's Luigi's without you, darling? And who says I have to wait for the next train? I'll take a cab. A cab? All the way to Dover Ridge? You're crazy. About you, Rhoda, yes. Oh, darling, darling, tell the taxi to hurry. I'm on my way before that operator can say your time is up again. Your time is up. Deposit for me. Never mind, operator. Bye, darling. In those few minutes, yakking with Paul on the phone, all the rust and cobwebs in our marriage were cleared away. I was looking forward to Paul's coming home. It was a long time since I felt that way about him. Still, that funny feeling I'd had all day still hung around. And it had the same ingredients. Paul, the 536 train, an accident. Only now, in my mind, it got all mixed up with the operator saying... Your time is up. Your time is up. Your time is up. It made no sense now. Because Paul loved me and he trusted me. So he'd given up the train. He was coming by cab. No matter what happened to the train, nothing could harm Paul. Oh, it was six o'clock. I had a lot to do before Paul arrived. And as I started to prepare dinner, I had a funny thought. Arthur had said that someday I'd thank him. I thought he was crazy. Well, it was Arthur who told me to get a hold of Paul and tell him to stay off the 536. So when I was about ready... Arthur, Rhoda. Yes? I wanted to talk to you. Look, kiddo, I told you this morning that I didn't want to play games anymore. Oh, me neither, Arthur. That's over. But I just have a couple of minutes before Paul will be in. Well, the train hasn't passed here. He's not coming by train, Arthur. I got a hold of him and I talked him out of it and... You know what? Paul wanted to get home to me so badly, he took a cab all the way from New York. Paul spent money on a cab? Oh, no. Anyway... Arthur, you know what you said this morning? That someday I'd thank you? I think you will. Well, this is the day. Rhoda, you're a good kid. Hey, Rhoda, guess what? what? I see Paul's cab. You do? Yeah, on the road. <laughs> it sure looks funny. A New York City cab way out here. Boy, it's gone about 80. What's that? Is that the train? Yeah, it's just at the crossing. Oh. Oh, no. Rhoda. The cab. Paul's cab is racing the train to the crossing. Arthur? No! Arthur! Arthur, what was that? What's happening? Oh, never mind, Arthur. I know. I know. I, I guess I knew all along. <laughs> wanted to be 
buried in Dover Ridge. He liked it here. And so I stayed. I hate the country and I'm alone. But I guess I'd hate it and be alone anywhere. We came here because Paul wanted Bobby brought up in the country. Well, now they're both gone. But I might as well stay. I know that no matter what I do, even if I live in a crowded city, I'll never escape my loneliness. Theater 5 has presented Your Time Is Up. Written by Raphael David Blau and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Natalie Priest, Betty Walker, Paul McGrath, and Norman Rose. Audio engineer, Neil Pulse. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastatsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite and would appreciate your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Poise. Do you like word games? All right, what's a 12-letter word starting with H that means a substance that induces hallucinations when taken orally? I give up. It's hallucinogen. H-A-L-L-U-C-I-N-O-G-E-N. Oh, just a minute. H-A-H-A-L... H-A-L-L? I don't find any such word in the dictionary. (laughs) No, and you won't unless you have the very latest dictionary. And even the dictionary definition doesn't tell us very much about hallucinogens. Something new and strange to most of us. They open the door to worlds most of us never knew existed. Sometimes quite wonderful, close to heaven. And sometimes a worse hell than any mad artist ever dreamed of. Theater 5 presents Dream of Death. It was late, after 5, when I got out to the plant, and for some reason when I saw it, it scared me. It was new, all stainless steel, glass, and concrete, and quite large. But it had been built on the edge of an old residential section. Tree-lined streets, frame, and brownstone houses that had once been friendly and charming. It was as if the plant was the future. Cold, efficient, ruthless. And it was taking over. I found the research building and went in to keep my appointment with Dr. Dietrich. What do you think a hallucinogen is? Oh, a drug, usually an alkaloid that affects the mind. And gives one hallucinations? No, no, not necessarily. As I understand it, some of them do. LSD, for instance, actually induces schizophrenia temporarily. But most of them merely alter consciousness. Merely? Do you know what happens when you merely alter consciousness? You open the door to worlds most of us never knew existed before. Sometimes quite wonderful... Close to heaven, and sometimes a worse hell than any mad artist ever dreamed of. Mm, So I gather. These um, articles you're writing, they're just on the hallucinogens? No, at the moment, yes. And when I read that you and Dr. Fuller had developed a new synthetic out here... Well, uh, I'm afraid I can't give you any information on its composition. It's still in the experimental stage. We've finished our animal tests, and we're well into our clinicals, but... Well, uh, if you could possibly let me look at some of your reports, descriptions of your subject's actions, what they said, thought, and felt. Well, I... I suppose I could do that. On the other hand, you're quite imaginative. React easily to outside stimuli, don't you? (laughs) Why do you say that? Well, I was thinking that if you're sufficiently interested... Perhaps we could let you try one of the drugs we've been working on yourself. Try it? Wouldn't that be the best way to describe its effects, if you actually experience them? Well, I suppose it would. I 
hadn't thought of it. The idea's a little frightening, but... All right, Doctor, if you're willing. Well, I think it can be arranged. I'll have to... Oh, no, no, I... Oh, sorry, I didn't know you had anyone in here. Oh, it's all right. Alan Benson, Dr. Fuller. How do you do? How do you do? I'd like to talk to you, Arnold. If this is a bad time... Oh, or... it's a good time. Uh, will you excuse me, Mr. Benson? Oh, yes, of course. Then uh, you'll let me know? Yes, I have your phone number and I'll call you. I'd thought Dr. Fuller was angry when he came in, and I was sure of it a minute later when I heard a first-class argument going on behind the closed door of Dietrich's office. The other thing is outrageous, and I won't stand for it. Oh? Well, that's just too bad, then, because there's not a thing you can do about it. It's a strange way for two men who work together to act, but it was none of my business. As I left, I made the unhappy discovery that it was raining, and then the happy discovery that Dr. Dietrich's secretary was waiting in the doorway. It seemed she lived only a few blocks away, and I had my car, so I offered her a lift. When it turned out that she lived alone, I suggested dinner, which turned out to be one of the best suggestions I ever made. Over martinis and dinner at a little restaurant, I told her about my writing and a book I was planning on the use of drugs in mental illness. Well, they've been doing some interesting work along those lines out here, particularly Dr. Fuller. Mm -hmm. Not Dr. Dietrich? Not so much. And that's one of the things that annoys Dr. Dietrich. As head of the department, he has to spend more time on administrative work than research. I know he envies and resents Dr. Farr. Maybe it was the coziness of the restaurant on a cold, rainy night, but we were soon on a first-name basis. Sarah and Alan. And telling each other all about ourselves. She was working at the laboratory while studying for her master's degree in psychology and was interested in my research. When we left, we knew we'd see each other again. And it turned out to be sooner than I'd hoped. Dr. Dietrich called me the next day and told me to come to the lab that evening. Why, Atlas? Hi. You seem surprised to see me. Didn't uh, Dietrich tell you I was coming? No, he didn't. Well, he called me, said that he and Fuller were free this evening and that this might be a good time for me to take the drug. Take it? Yeah. I didn't know you were actually going to take it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I am. Well, I don't imagine you'll still be here when I come up. Oh, no, no. I'll be leaving in a few minutes. Well, I, uh, I really did enjoy last night. And if I come through this in one piece... Oh, what do you mean, if? Well, I'm, I'm just playing it safe. Can I phone you tomorrow? Of course. I'd like that. Like it very much. How do you feel now, Mr. Benson? I am about the same, Dr. Fuller, only... <laughs> Did you do anything to the lights? No, why? Well, everything's brighter. Much brighter. Mm. And things are changing. Those uh, test tubes, for instance... They're not just moving now. They seem to be growing like, uh, well, glass flowers. What's hmm. the time? Seventeen minutes. He's reacting very quickly. You're sure you gave him only 20 milligrams? Of course. We'd better strap him down now. Uh, sit back, Mr. Benson. <clears throat> That's it. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, are those straps too tight, Mr. Benson? Mr. Benson? I heard him, but I couldn't answer. I was going backward in time. Back through the last few days, then through months and years. I was at college. In high school. Then I was twelve. And the old terror came over me again. Because I knew what was going to happen next. Mr. Benson? Alan? Can you hear me? Where are you? Seems to be at stage three already. Yes, he does. But he shouldn't have gotten there so fast. Unless... Arnold, you didn't give him number 37, did you? What if I did? What a fool! How could you? We haven't finished the control test yet. Besides, it's not yours, it's mine. Yes, that's, that's what you think. I was lying in bed, hearing them quarreling downstairs. He must have come home drunk again, and she was angry, and so was he. 
And now he was going to hit her the way he did sometimes. But this time, if he did... Stop that! Stop it, do you hear? Don't you dare hit her again! If you do, I'll kill you! I swear I will! You know what happens to little boys who talk that way to their stepfathers? They get locked in the cellar, like this. The cellar was dark, and I couldn't see him anymore. But that didn't matter, because I knew where he was. And I also knew he had turned into a monster from a horror picture. Crouching down, I felt something. A piece of pipe on the floor. Then, as he came at me, I hit out! <laughs> he was laughing, laughing at me. Kept swinging, hearing the jars of preserves on the shelves smashing. Then I tripped, started to fall down. Down. When I came to, I was lying on the floor, and there was a length of pipe in my hand. I seemed to be in some kind of a laboratory that was turning around slowly. What was I doing in a laboratory? The last thing I remembered was a cellar. I got to my feet, feeling sick. Tried to make the room stop spinning. There were broken bottles and test tubes all over the place, and the smell of chemicals almost choked me. Then the hammering began. It was off somewhere, but it felt as if it were inside my head. It was too much. I blundered out through a door across the reception room, and then I was outside. What? Alan, what are you doing out here? Uh, are you all right? I, I... I don't know who you are. It's Sarah. Sarah Dunn. Sarah? Oh. Yes, I, I remember her. She was that pretty girl. Pretty and nice. That I had dinner with. But, Alan, why are you talking about it so strangely? Because it, it, it happened so long ago. I always remembered her. I thought if I could just get out of that cellar... You don't know what you're saying, do you? Don't I? No. You're still under the influence of that drug. Drug? I remember something about that. Uh, there were two doctors. Yes, and they must be wondering where you've gone. Here, give me your arm. Uh, we'll go back in there. Oh, uh, take me someplace where I can lie down until everything stops going around this way. Can you walk? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Especially if you help me. I'll help you. Come on. I'll take you back to my place. You feeling better now? Yeah, a little. Um, what are you doing? I'm calling the lab. I want to tell them you're here. Oh, Dr. Dietrich? Oh, this is Sarah Dunn, his secretary. Who's this? Please. Well, did something happen? That's impossible. I mean... Yes. 43 Calumet Road. Right. Is anything wrong, Sarah? What makes you ask? Well, you look upset, and you said something about the police. Dr. Fuller's dead. Dead? Yes. And the police say you killed him. Here, Alan, drink this. Huh? What is it? Black coffee. Oh. Now... You don't recall actually hitting anyone? No, I seem to have gone back. Way back to when I was a boy, locked in a cellar. I did slash at someone or something with that piece of pipe, but I, I don't remember hitting anything except... Well, I thought they were jars of preserves. Where did you get the piece of pipe? I found it on the cellar floor. Only you weren't in any cellar. You just thought you were. You were in the lab. And I don't know what a piece of pipe would be doing there on the floor or anywhere else. Was that what he was killed with? 
a piece of pipe? Well, the policeman didn't say. But there's something else. Didn't they strap you down in a chair? Yeah. They usually do, because sometimes the subjects become violent. But then, how did you get loose? Oh, I don't know. May I use your phone? Why? I want to call the police. They must be looking for me. And if I did kill Dr. Fuller... Yes, yes. And it's a big yes. But if you did, I don't see how you can be blamed for it. After all, you were under the influence of the drugs. Sarah, that's got nothing to do with it. The police want me and... Shh. Just a second. Up the street there. Police car. Coming here. Probably. They asked for my address when I phoned and they'd want to talk to me. Well, then... That's that. No, it's not. Now, you come on in here into the bedroom. Oh, now, look, Sarah. Please don't argue with me. There's no time for it. Now, go on out and hide back there in the garden until I call you. She practically pushed me out the window, closed it, and went back into the living room. I stood there in the night trying to think. What she was doing was wrong. I knew that. Because she was getting herself involved in this nightmare, too. But what could I do about it? Then the bell rang. And I heard her go to the door. Miss Dunn? Yes? I'm Morelli, 34th Precinct. Was it you I spoke to when I called the lab a little while ago? Yes, it was. Well, please, come in. They sat down on the far side of the living room. And from then on, I couldn't hear anything. The officer stayed about 20 minutes. When he left, I opened the window and climbed back inside. Alan? What do you want? What we thought, to find out what I knew... He'd already talked to Dr. Dietrich, of course. What did you tell him? Everything. Up to the time I left the office tonight. Well, didn't he ask whether you'd seen me after that? Yes. I'm afraid I lied about that. I said no. Why? Well, isn't that obvious? Because I don't think you did it. And if you didn't kill Fuller, there's only one person who could have, and that's Dr. Dietrich. Well, Sarah, that's impossible. Why? Oh, I can think of at least one good reason. I told you that he and Fuller didn't always work together. Now, suppose Fuller came up with something big and important, refused to share the credit with Dietrich. Or suppose Dietrich found out that he was going to leave and take his discovery with him, really cash in on it. Now, wait a minute. Of course. They were having a violent argument when I left yesterday. Couldn't it have been about that? I suppose so. Well, I'm sure of it. Because I seem to remember hearing Fuller tell Dietrich that he had no right to try the drug on me, that it was his, Fuller's, and... Where's Fuller's lab? Right next to Dr. Dietrich's. Why? That hammering I heard when I came to must have been in there. Oh. Well, Fuller kept most of his data in a locked file cabinet. That's probably where he'd keep the formula. And if he didn't have the key on him when he was killed... Dietrich would try and break it open. And that's how it sounded to me. You know, I'd like to take a look at that file cabinet, see what's in it. Well, I've got a key to the lab. And the police aren't going to stay there all night. If we went over there about two or three in the morning... We... Now, wait a minute, Sarah. Now, save your breath. I'm in on this, too, now. And I'm going over there with you. She woke me at about two. We slipped out of the house, walked over to the plant. I had a flashlight in my car. I took that and a jack handle. And we went inside, into Fuller's laboratory. The file cabinet's over here. Mm-hmm. Well, it's still locked. But someone's been working on it. There are dents all around the lock. Can you open it? Yeah, I think so. Here, uh, hold the flash. All right. Ah, there we are. Now, how would it be filed? Well, they called it Polytran. Uh-huh. And the last formula they worked on together was number 23. Oh? Well, here's 24, and so on, up to number 37. Let's take a look at that. All right. Well... Yeah, this could be it. Look, here's an envelope with a notarized statement attached. On this day, Dr. Mark Fuller sealed this envelope in my presence. Put your and... hands up, please, both of you. Dr. Dietrich. I'll take that envelope, Benson. Throw it to me. Oh. Thanks. Why are you looking at me that way, Miss Dunn? Because I still can't believe that you'd do such a thing. You're talking about Fuller? Yes, it was unfortunate. If the formula proves as valuable as I hope, there would have been more than enough in it for both of us. But he wanted to keep it all for himself, so... So you killed him. As I said, it was unfortunate. But what's even more unfortunate is that you didn't leave things alone, Benson. You never would have been indicted for the killing. I'd have testified for you. Explain that you'd done it while under the influence of the drug. Now, of course, I'll have to kill you, too. Uh-uh, you'll never get away with it, Dietrich. 
Won't I? I came back to the lab, suspecting you might return here, and you had. You were still under the drug's influence, violent, homicidal. You attacked me, and I killed you in self-defense. And what about me? That's no great problem, Miss Dunn. Mr. Benson killed you under the influence of the drug, of course. Your body will be found right here next to his. <laughs> After all, they can try me for only one murder. And if I let you go, they're bound to get me for Fuller's, so... I'll take that gun, Doctor. Up, Morelli. That's right. I said I'd take that gun. Okay. Get over there against the wall. Officer, I don't think I've ever been so glad to see anyone in my life. Only what brought you over here? Well, you did. I had a feeling you weren't telling me everything you knew when I was over at your place. So I kept an eye on it. When you and Benson left to come over here, I followed you. Well, then, you heard what Dr. Dietrich said. I heard. And it explains a lot of things that didn't make sense before. Well, you're in the clear now, Benson. You're a very lucky guy. Oh, you think so? What do you mean? How would you like to have thought for quite a few hours that you were a murderer? You see, Lieutenant, I believed I was. Theater 5 has presented Dream of Death, written by Robert Newman and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, William Redfield, Gertrude Warner, Guy Sorrell, and William Griffiths. Audio engineer Bill Sandreuter, sound technician Ed Blaney. Script editor Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Blostatsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC. And then I looked up at the old mansion, all made with inlaid marble and stately pillars. The last lovely thing left on the street to tell you what we once were. And while we were about tearing it down, I thought I heard somebody scream. A woman was a lady and wouldn't make a sound over an ordinary agony. Yes, I... I thought I heard somebody scream. <laughs> Theater 5 presents The Scream. Hey, what's holding you guys up over there? Get that scaffold in place. We start the wrecking ball in five minutes, so watch it. And you, what are you just standing around for? Me? I don't see anybody behind you. You, McDougal? It's Dunahy, Mr. Mallison. Mickey Dunahy. Okay, I... Says here you're on the crane. They, uh... They got me on the list for the crane? Yeah, my man's out. We're behind schedule, so get up in that cab seat and wait for my signal. Uh, Mr. Mallison, I... Uh, you can call me Mal. Now, what's the problem? Mr. Mallison, it's a... It's a feeling I've got that I shouldn't be the one to operate the crane on this job. Why not? Says here you're qualified. Well, that's right, I am, sir, but... Uh, okay, the east wall's got to come down. Today, you were hired to operate the big ball. So what's with this feeling you're wasting my time with? You sick? No, I, uh... You look pretty healthy to me. It's not that, sir. It's, uh... I didn't know when I signed on the job it would be a house like this, sir. A lovely old house with such an air about it. After I reported in this morning, I started looking at it, and I said to myself, if I'm the one who has to be breaking those fine, graceful walls into bits, I said to myself, I can't. It would be like doing in a beautiful woman some way. My, my, aren't we sensitive, though? A bleeding Irish poet we've got on the payroll. Get lost. Oh, I'm uh, fired. You were hired to run that crane. There's no time to get a replacement, so get you over there and a man it with you. And when I say swing it, swing it. Yes, sir. And you can stop looking like that and get on that crane. Yes, sir, I'm going up. Would you, would you rather I took it for you, Mickey? Whip wouldn't like it. No, it's okay, Joe. Okay, all right. Ow! Oh. 
What was that? What was what? Didn't you hear it? Somebody screamed. Huh? No, I didn't hear nothing. Hey, up there! What are you waiting for? Here's the swinger! Yes, sir! <laughs> You've got to have heard it by time, but it came from up in the wall somewhere. You, you did hear it, didn't you? Say, you got the shakes, kid. Here, here, wait a minute. I, I always carry a hammer. No, 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 thank Now, come you. on, come on. Here are the dogs. I'm not hung over, and I I don't think I'm crazy. I I heard that scream twice. Uh-oh, here comes a whip. Okay, what? They said, slow down like a report of the union. I probably will. Now, what's holding up the parade here? Well, he heard some kind of scream coming from up there. Twice it was I heard it. You mean, it was horrible. Coming from the house? There's nobody in that house. Well, maybe somebody better check. Well, there's a watchman on duty. He hasn't reported anybody. Now cut the comedy and get going here. Look, I know you don't believe me, and but I... If there's somebody up there, they scream again. I'll hear it because I'm staying right here with you. Now let her rip. We're behind schedule. Okay, hear anything that time? How did you know I heard it when the ball hit the house? Isn't that what you said? It's what happened, but I didn't say it. Well, so what? Point is, I didn't hear anything, neither did you. So get with it. Demolition plan says we level the east wall by quitting time today. All made with inlaid marble and stately with pillars. The last lovely thing left on the street to tell you what we once were. Because all of the other great blocks of stone rise up like whited sepulchres with staring glass eyes, and, and we don't know what we are. We don't know what we are. Oh, it's all right, kid. Now get it off your chest. Come on, let's have a drink. Oh, it's not the drink. It, it's hearing in my head how that scream was. I, I thought it must be a woman in terror. A, a woman who's a lady and wouldn't make a sound over an ordinary agony. Well, well, if it isn't the ghost of Brendan B. and still yakking about the screaming banshee. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mallison. Well, I guess it's as good an excuse as any for getting in the bag. I wasn't thinking it was any banshee, Mr. Mallison. Oh, then maybe it was a leprechaun, Irish. I said it sounded like a lady. Johnny, give me a rye water. Mr. Mallison, I... I waited at the mansion before I came here tonight. I... I went over close by the wall and I listened. But I haven't told anyone, I swear to you. In the dark, I heard someone weeping. Oh, let up. Well, your joke's over. I don't play jokes. Well, somebody is, or else you're due for the head shrinker. And come to think of it, why didn't Joe hear something this morning? Well, well you know, I, I might have, Mr. Mallison, but uh, I, I'm deaf in this year, and there was a, a lot of other noises, so, so I might have, but I can't be sure. Okay, I'll drink to that. Stick by your pal. But you stop bugging me, Irish. I don't want to hear any more about people screaming, crying, or talking to themselves. I got other things on my mind. Is it that you don't care for your line of work, Mr. Mallison? I'll tell you what I don't go for. The do-gooders. All these bleeding hearts that go around whooping and hollering every time some old barn gets torn down saying it's a landmark or history. Or it was their birthplace, so it's holding... Well, when they tore down the block where I was born and all the rats ran out, nobody wrote any letters in the newspaper. Maybe the people who didn't have any place to go didn't know who to write to. Oh, go home and sleep it off. And I want to see you on that crane at seven sharp tomorrow morning. But tonight, don't you think someone ought to go through the mansion and find out what caused what I heard? Why? There's a watchman on duty 24 hours a day. There wasn't any watchman when I left there tonight. No? You sure? Yes, I am. Mm, all right. All right, I'll borrow a flashlight, go over there right now and have a look. Does that satisfy you? You want to come with me? No, no, I I wouldn't want to bug you, Mr. Mallison. What you don't want is to lose your excuse to cry into your beer. Okay, poet, I don't need you. Anyway, not till 7 tomorrow morning. Good night, sir. If they'd let us use dynamite, I wouldn't need the likes of you.
Hey, watchman. Where are you? Hey, in there. Hey, inside. Wake up. Wake up or I'll have your job. Let me in here. Where are you? Okay, that does it. I'll break my way in. Anybody in here? Speak up. No trespassing. House is condemned. Speak up now and I'll let you go. Okay, have it your way, but I'm coming through room by room till I find you, so watch out. Who's that? It's late for callers, but come in. I heard something. Where are you? I heard you. If you had listened, you might have heard me before. Huh? But you never listen, do you? Who is it? Direct your flashlight to the corner of the hall, please. No, no. The other corner. Hey! Uh Uh-oh. All right, Sam, whatever your name is, nap time's over. Did you hear me outside? Hey, you get up. You're fired. I rather think your watchman no longer cares whether he's fired or not. He's dead. No good shaking him anymore. No use at all. Better to say a prayer for the soul of a weary old man who died in his sleep without knowing where his life led. Look here. I don't want to have any more of this. Whoever you are, come out here so I can see you. Walk to the door of the main parlor. It's straight ahead. I'm playing no fun and games with you, lady. Show yourself or you'll be in more trouble than you think. I could not be in more trouble than I now am. Wait a minute. You're that old dame with the baby carriage, aren't you? The one that wanders around the neighborhood picking up junk? Yeah, I hear they hauled you in once for looting. Well, this time you've had it, honey. So the watchman caught you trespassing here, and then you... Up to the door of the main parlor. Why? I want to show you something. Look, all I have to do is call a cop, and in five minutes I'll have a whole squad tailing you through this place. And when they find out there's a dead watchman... You'll be the one who was in here alone with his body. You were terribly upset to discover he'd been sleeping on the job, remember? And you threatened him. Well, there were no marks on his body. None I could see, anyway. Then... Why are you suggesting I was responsible for his death? The last time, woman. Where are you? As I say, he died of natural causes in his sleep. The innocent sleep accompanied by innocent snores of night watchmen the world over. Come along. Come along. This way. Open the parlor door. Look inside. Flash your light around. Brighten the corner where you are. Well? Such a graceful room, isn't it? So perfectly proportioned. We weren't trying to box people into little egg crates in the days when this was built. A man could breathe. A woman could bloom. There was beauty to be lived with. I'm not here for the 50-cent tour. And we didn't destroy that beauty for the sake of greed. Will you cut this out? Where are you? You must excuse me. I am old, but still rather vain. It pains me to be seen as I am now. Okay, lady, I'm going out and call the cops. They won't find me here when they come. They'll say you're crazy, Mr. Mallison. How do you know my name? 
We should all be able to name our executioners. It helps to ensure a proper retribution. I don't know what you're talking about. I think you do. Listen here, if you get out of this building right now, just get out and go someplace else. We'll forget the whole thing. Forget the whole thing. Of course, you would like to forget. It would be very convenient. But if I do not just get out... I can have you arrested. And be done with me. I'm afraid it's not that simple. Mal. You wish the workman would call you Mal, don't you? Then you'd be one of the boys, one of those with no responsibility for what you're doing. You could then be destructive. Destroy, destroy like a child with no guilt. Tear down the walls. Let the great iron ball smash into the masonry and kill a beautiful thing without fear that the shadow lies on your shoulders. But you are a leader now. You cannot shrug the shadow away. How do you make out knowing so much about me? I'm right, am I not? Now walk straight ahead until you come to the staircase. Only a shell now, but curved so delicately that the young lady of the house seemed to float as she appeared at the top from her tower bedroom. And in the tower itself is a window that someone your crew has forgotten to dismantle. What do I care? I don't want to hear about it. A window of hand-leaded glass of many colors. I will give it to you as a souvenir. In the first place, it's not yours to give. Ah, and... But it is. Listen to me. You can save yourself. What do you mean, save myself? Tomorrow, when your iron ball hits the tower, the glass will shatter into a thousand bits of color, like a kaleidoscope of all the scenes that were once lived in this house and will now be forgotten forever. If you remove the window now, the house will not wholly die. Don't you see? You will not be entirely a murderer. Will you shut up? You might. You just might save some little piece of yourself if you showed you cared. Why am I listening to a crazy witch? If you don't take the window, I will break it myself. Stop it. I'll be glad when this crazy place is down. Very well. From this moment, I will bear my agony in silence. Now, what are you talking? Hey, you there? I said, are you still there? Hey, what happened to you? Am I going to get out of here? Turn around. You've got to get me out of here. You can't do this. Look, look, lady. Lady, I, I, I press no charges. It's, it's all okay. Just, just let me know you're real. Tell me. I really heard you talk and that, that it wasn't in my mind. Open up. You've got to open up. There's the light from the street. All I have to do is go back this way. Your pal's all left. Yeah? 
to try to put the Irish kid to bed. He ain't used to drinking, and he really tied one on tonight. Ah, too chicken to quit his job, so he tries every trick he can think of to, to get me to fire him. I don't get it. Why? You heard him tonight. You got some idea that old house we're reckon is alive. So he doesn't want to hurt it. <laughs> to hear anything so, so crazy. <laughs> it's not Absolutely not. Yeah. It sure sounds like it, all right. Well, kid, how you feeling this morning? Fine, fine. No, where's the whip? I want to hear how he made out last night. That's what I want to do. Hey, you're still a little drunk, ain't you? Maybe so, maybe not. Maybe not enough. Got your half pint on you? Yeah, here. But don't let anybody see you. Uh, Listen, I heard on the radio they found a body here, dead. The watchman, they said. You don't say. Hmm? Now, that's very interesting. All right, you guys. Coffee breaks over. Irish, don't you want to know what I found here last night? The watchman, dead? Correct. And that's all I found, and I don't want to hear any more poetry from you about how you hate to destroy beautiful buildings because you're doing it, and you're taking pay for it, and so shut up. Yes, Mr. Mallison. You're going to man the boom by yourself today. I need Joe somewhere else. We're going to make up for lost time. So get going. Yes, Mr. Mallison. Hey. Hey, boss. Yeah, Joe? There's something wrong up there. Look, in the tower. Where? That window. I, I thought I saw it open. Look. That glass window. She's breaking it. She's breaking it? But, but, but that means she she was real last night. Wait! Wait up there! Don't break any more of it! Wait! I'm coming to you! What's he nuts all of a sudden? Oh, hey, Mickey! Mickey, stop the boom! Hold it! Mickey, can't you hear me? What's the matter with you? I'm fine, Joe. Better make up for lost time. Mickey, cut the motor. Don't swing the ball yet. I'm okay now, Joe. Somebody's got to do the job. Might as well be me. Can't you hear me? Cut the motor. Mel's up in the tower. What's the way can anywhere? Joe, right at the pretty stained glass window. Now, swing. Presented The Scream, written by Virginia Radcliffe and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Roger DeCoven, Peter Fernandez, Harry Belliver, Albert Ottenheimer, and Abby Lewis. Audio engineer, Neil Pulse. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastatsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC radio. Listen, you. You, whoever you are. I ain't never held a gun to no man in my life. I never had that kind of nerve. Never shot even a jackrabbit. But I can feel my nerve now. 
And I'll pull this trigger if you don't do exactly like I said. Theater 5 presents Incident at Shadow Valley. Fussy, Jocko. Them hash browns got a little burnt tonight. Got a lot on my mind. Ralphie, you know, my little grandson, he's been poorly all day, and Nellie's had to attend him. And the road trail people are pulling the bus stop from me. They say I gotta have two toilets. I ain't finished paying for the first one. Well, here's your coffee. Tomorrow night I'll do better, Jocko. Give you a real good feed. That'll be uh, 85 cents. All right. Oh, evening, Jocko. Oh. Pop. Pop, I gotta talk to you. Ralphie? Oh, Pop, I don't think he'll make it. Not even through the night. Oh, if only he wouldn't talk about dying. I, I, I can't stand to hear him talking about dying. Maybe the doc can do something. I know. Well, go call the doc, Nellie. You don't mind? I mean about the bill. When it comes to debt, a couple more pebbles don't make the mountain look any bigger. Take a dime from the cash register. Hi, Clara. This is Nellie at the Last Chance Diner. Get me Doc Landers and Las Flores. No, no, not good at all tonight, Clara. Oh, well, I'll call a little later. Doc Landers ain't in, Pop. Here's the dime. I'm going back to the shack. Hey, what's all that? Doug McLeod. Looks like he's stopping here, Pop. Look, I'll be with Ralphie. See you, Jocko. Yeah. Hi, Doug. Evening, Pop. Why all the sirens, Sergeant? Accident, 20 miles east. Truck coming this way forced a passenger car off the road. Oh, darn shame. Anybody hurt? Driver killed. The rest shook up. Darn shame. Big black truck with a sign. Universal Road Freight. Universal Road Freight? Did it stop here? No, sir. Universal Road Freight. Never heard of it. I must have passed, Pop. There's no turnoff less than I missed him or he went out on the flats. Not likely. I'll keep an eye out, Pop. Maybe you'll catch him. Not me. I ain't gonna tangle with a trucker. My tangling days are over, Doug. You got a gun, ain't you? If he shows up, hold him and call the state police at mine shaft. Okay? No, sir, Doug. I wouldn't touch that gun no more than a rattler. I ain't going to tangle. That's your job. I got mine. See ya. Hey, guy got killed by a truck, Jocko. Mm. Darn shame. Here's your meatloaf, Harry. Oh, thanks, Pop. My wife says I shouldn't eat meatloaf. It gives me gas. But I love it. Hot roast beef sandwich, Jim. Thanks, Pop. Where's Nellie? I passed the ketchup, Harry. Yeah. Uh, Nellie's busy out back. Ralphie's poorly. Yeah. Poor kid. You from California this trip, Harry? Yeah. Mixed freight for KC. Seeing that you was coming from the west, I wondered whether you saw a black truck along back. Highway patrol was chasing it. I saw a cop doing about 80, but I didn't see no black truck, Pop. You, Harry? Uh Uh-uh. And I keep my eyes on the road. Not like you, Jay. (laughs) Truck was from Universal Road Freight. Black truck. Never heard of the outfit. You, Harry? Maybe an independent. Uh, What do the cops want? They said this black truck deliberately forced a passenger car off the road on purpose. Driver was killed. Darn shame. Coffee, Harry, Jim? A light. Regular. Yeah, one right, one regular. About that accident, they always blame the truckers. My wife says that the average trucker who knocks off maybe 100,000 miles and more per each year can't help but be a better driver than some Joe Blow who does maybe about 10. And it stands to reason, Jim. Yeah. Does it, fellows? Yeah, I beg your pardon? What I meant was, not everything is run according to reason. Who asked you, buddy? Nobody, but I couldn't help hearing what you said. Buzz off, mister, will you? You're bugging me and my pal. Now, leave him alone, Jim. Well, gents, anything else I can get you? Sure, some privacy. Knock it off, Jim. 
How about you, mister? You want some? Not yet. Maybe later. I have plenty of time. And like I was saying before I was interrupted, my wife says to me, Harry, she says, how many drivers have a record like you? One million miles in just over eight years without a scratch. Hey, I didn't know that, Harry. That's a real record. <laughs> Did you ever hear the expression, pride goeth before a fall? He's here again, Harry. Look, mister, I heard the expression, but I also know that I have a million mile safety record, and I'm proud of it. And I don't care who knows it. One million miles. Very impressive. That's right. One million miles. Uh, when I'm through with this run, that is. Oh, I see. You don't have it yet. Well, no, no. I mean, well, not yet, but almost. Like 27 miles outside of Oklahoma City, I figured... Well, no, I don't have it now, sure, but by tomorrow morning... Cut it or... out, Harry. You don't have to apologize to this creep. One million miles. That's an accomplishment. It would be. Come on, Harry. Let's get out of here. Pop, the checks. Check? No cake? No pie? No ice cream? How come you're in such a hurry? I'll see you some other time, Pop. There's a buck and a quarter. A buck ten for me. So long. So sure. So sure. Pop, I'll have coffee now. Black. Look, mister. Take your business someplace else. You chase away my best customers. You sit around and then order coffee. Beat it. Vamoose. Coffee. Black. You've got to serve me. Go somewhere else. I've decided to remain here. And whenever I'm on my run, I'll come in here if I wish. You understand? And as for Harry and Jim, if I don't meet them here, I'll meet them someplace else. That's the way it's going to be. Another cup of coffee, Pop. Black and fresh this time. I serve what I serve, mister. Fresh. Look, mister. I've been working for pretty near 24 hours steady. My head is full of troubles. Don't try my patience. You chased all my customers away. I'm going to close up tonight. I can't make it till morning. I'm staying. Last chance diner, it says. Shadow Valley, Arizona. Open 24 hours. That's a contract. Coffee. Black. And after this customer. Jim. How come you came back? Pop. You forget something? Harry. He lost control of his truck. Right ahead of me. On Three Mile Hill. He's dead. Killed. One million miles, but not quite. Are you still here? Who are you, mister, anyway? A truck driver. Janice is my name. Mr. Janice. I drive for Universal Road Freight. Sounds dead. Can't do nothing until the telephone line's fixed, Jim. Why does it have to be dead just now? That is what people always ask about death, whether it's a telephone or a man. Janice, will you get lost? What you all forget is that death is an incident of life. Man, I met some crazy truck drivers in my life, but you're the end. I have heard that before. You're going to hear a lot more, Mr. Janice, if you don't keep your nose out of other people's business. My nose is everywhere, Pop, isn't it? You are going to hear some things you don't want to hear, fella. Like what? Like the police are looking for you, that's what. Oh? Yes, oh. For forcing that car off. The... And they got a pretty good description of you, Mr. Janice. Doug McLeod went up west looking for you. Do you think he'll find me there? He'll find you when he comes back. Suppose I go east. You wouldn't get very far, would he, Jim? Not in this country. There's just one road for 75 miles, straight as a ruler and flat as a pancake, except for Three Mile Hill. East or west, that's your only choice. 
As a matter of fact, I hadn't intended moving at all, Pop. I'm staying here. What do you have for dessert? I got nothing, Mr. Janice. That's what I got. Nothing. This is a house of trouble, mister. A man, a, a good customer, and a good friend. A good man has just been killed. My own grandson is struggling in the shack out back, struggling for breath, struggling to live out the night. And all you can think about is your belly. Why not? I see death wherever I go, and so do you. Funeral homes, cemeteries, accidents, wars and headlines of wars, murder and the wanton taking of human life through ignorance and poverty and hatred. But you don't care. You ignore it until it strikes close to you. And then you want world to stop to pule with you, to cry in universal condolence. Otherwise, you don't give a thought to death, which is an ever-present fact of life. You picnic in the cemeteries of the world. Hey, what are you, some kind of nut? Making speeches in a diner? The last chance diner. Ah, shut up. You give me the willies, talking like that to me with my, my buddy lying out there in the dark... Smashed to pieces in his crumpled cab. Just, just like you kind of predicted when we were John about the million miles. Janice, I, I want you to know right now, I, I think it's your fault. You made him nervous, jumpy. Perhaps. I'm, I'm going to see that you get it for what you did to Harry. I'll get your license picked up, so help me if it's the last thing I do. Bob, Bob, we just got to reach Doc Landers. Ralph, he's feeling something awful. He's... He's getting blue and breathing so hard. So Phone's hard. out, Nellie. We've been trying to reach the police. Police? Accident, Nellie. My buddy, Harry, he got himself killed. Oh, no. Oh, I'm sorry, Jim. Oh, Pop, I just got to get the doc. No two ways about it. What am I going to do? Maybe the phone will be back. Oh, Ralph, he was bad enough, but, but then he took a turn for the worse. Just after the midnight rush started. He was... It was just like death came in the door, Pop. I could almost feel it. Nellie, let, let me take my truck. I'll find your doctor. What's his name? Oh, Dr. Gus Landis, Jim. I'll get him, Nellie. Don't you worry yourself. I'm going back to Ralphie, Pop. Please come up. Close up and stay with me. I, I, I don't want to be alone. I'm, I'm scared. A couple of minutes, Nellie. We'll pray, Nellie. We'll pray together. That's what we'll do. We'll do that, Pop. We've got to do something. You there, Mr. Janice. You heard what my Nellie said. I heard her. Well, you ain't doing nothing about it. I'm doing all that I intend to do. What you intend and what's going to be is two different things. Straight. I was about to tell you that. What the Sam Hill are you talking about? Your grandson. Your daughter says he's dying. You intend to pray him back to life. That's exactly what I intend to do. Just as... And Janice, have a heart. I don't know where you was raised or how, but didn't nobody ever tell you to be respectful of people's feelings? Yeah, I guess not. I ain't never seen a man so ugly. Not in my whole life. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm all for the truckers. A decent bunch of fellas that I ever saw. Fellas that I ever saw. But not you. I could believe what Doug McLeod said. You could force a car off the road just from plain ugliness. If my telephone was working, I'd call Mine Shaft and tell him to come pick you up. The telephone isn't working, so I stay safe and snug in the last chance diner. Telephone ain't working, but this gun is. Now stand up. Your hands are shaking. Put it down. Stand up, Mr. Janice. Yeah, that's better. You with your fathead speeches of death. How does it feel to face your own? Are you really interested? No. Not in you, in my grandson. I tell you, mister. I tell you, mister, I never held a gun to no man in my life. I ain't got that kind of nerve. Never shot even a jackrabbit. But I feel my nerve now, and I'll pull this trigger if you don't do exactly like I say. Do you know what you're doing, old man? I know my grandson needs me. I know I don't want you hanging around no more. 
So you're going to get on your truck and head west where Doug McLeod can collar you. You've done enough for tonight. Perhaps you're right. Keep moving. Walk straight to your truck, Mr. Janice. Now, climb up. Get your motor started and head west. Get the lead out of your pants, Mr. Janice, or I'll put more in. Nellie. Nellie. Shh. He's asleep. He's breathing right easy and regular. Don't make no noise. I want him to sleep. Pop. Now, when that truck drove off, Ralphie took a turn for the better. Yeah. When the truck left. I know. Yeah. I heard you shout, Pop. What were you shouting for? That fellow wouldn't leave. But I made him. I made him. Queer looking geezer. We're clear of him. When you say that again. I'll go tidy up and wait for Jim and the doctor. Oh, Jim. Jim. You get the doctor? I call him Pop from Ernie's Grill up the road. Doc can't come right away. He's that busy tonight with sick and dying people. Well, what do we tell Nellie? The boy's a little better. He'll last. Oh, good. That, that uh, character, he, he left, huh? That, that pest, Janice? Yeah. Made him head west so Doug McLeod could net him. I bet he's got him now. I sure hope so. He can't get away, not in these parts. Imagine me holding a gun on him. I'm still shaking. But I'm glad I chased him. So mean. So mean. Hey, that's Doug McLeod. What's he stopping here for? Search me. I sure don't want that Janice in here again. Pop, any sign of that truck? You're kidding, Doug. I sent him up west five, ten minutes ago. You must have passed him. A fella named Janice. An ugly, mean fella. You know, I think he done it. That accident. You sent him. I haven't passed anyone for 15 miles. How do you get here, anyway? And before? Why, I checked every truck coming this way. Pa, got some juice or a soda? Ralphie asked for a drink for the first time since morning. He's better, Pop. Uh, Nellie, uh, I couldn't bring the doctor. Oh, but... thanks, Jim. But I, I think he's on the mend. Ever since that truck left. That's it. That's the reason. Because I threw him out. What's all this, Pop? You threw who out? Janice. I I couldn't stand him. He gave Nellie the creeps and scared Harry to smash in the truck. Nobody wanted him. What the heck are you talking about, Pop? That fellow with the truck. The black. You were looking for him, and you couldn't find him east nor west. And I know why. Because he came from nowhere. And he went nowhere. And wherever he went, he brought mortal trouble. But when he tried to stay at my place, I fought with him. Nellie heard me. Yeah, that's right. I, I fought with him, and I won. Doug, Jim, Nellie, listen to me. Now I know. Tonight... I fought with the angel of death. Presented Incident at Shadow Valley, written by Raphael David Blau and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, John Gibson, Jackson Beck, Arlene Walker, Robert Dryden, George Petrie, and Richard Hurd. Audio engineer, Marty Folia. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlasdotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking.
This has been an ABC Radio Network production. Look, Colonel Schlag, I understand the need for some secrecy, but for more than three weeks, an astronaut has been missing. I'm tired of all the official double talk. Now, either I get a straight story, or I'll go on the air tonight with everything I know. Once again, Colonel Schlag, what has happened to astronaut Ted Shaw? <laughs> Theater 5 presents Odyssey of Number 14. This is your radio correspondent, Ray Boudreau. I'm with a press corps assembled here in Cocoa Beach. Looking north, I can see the gantry row of Cape Kennedy... We've been barred by military order from the Pad 14 press site, barred from the Cape itself. The shroud of complete secrecy has been dropped over this launch. The gangway is pulling back. I can see a capsule sitting atop the stack. The capsule is similar in shape and size of those that have been used in previous manned orbital space flights. The rocket has stopped launching. That happened 17 days ago. Our space agency continues to refuse to answer any questions. Our correspondents checked each astronaut and found one missing. Astronaut Ted Shaw, the old man of the group. At the agency, our questions met a brick wall. Major Shaw is away on a secret mission and will return in two weeks. Last Saturday night, a Cape technician told us that when the capsule was launched, Major Ted Shaw was aboard. It was an eyewitness report. The Monday morning meeting of our news chiefs. The story was stamped top priority. Orders would try to get an angle from Shaw's wife. But Mrs. Roberta Bobby Shaw was away from her Houston home. The neighbors reported that Bobby Shaw was on a vacation. But actual whereabouts, unknown. Then I had a call from our permanent Cape correspondent. Hello? Oh, Frank, yeah. What? She's been down on Cocoa Beach all this time? Well, that supports the story that he was aboard the capsule. Yes, yes, I know her. Keep a tight watch in that house. I'll be down in the next plane. This morning, I stationed myself in the dunes just south of the beach house. At two minutes to five, Bobby Shaw left the house and walked along the water's edge toward me. I let her pass and then walked up behind her. Bobby. Bobby Shaw. Uh, why, Ray Boudreau. Bobby. What are you doing here? Bobby, tell me, where's Ted? I don't know, Ray. You'll have to get the story from the agency. Well, how long since you've seen him? Twenty-four days. And you don't know where he is? Honestly, Ray, I don't. It's all hush-hush. What are you doing in this place? <laughs> Ted thought that there might be a lot of reporters buzzing around. So... To avoid the questions, he sent me here. Are you under any special security instructions? No, but then I don't know anything. Only that he's on a secret mission. But you haven't seen him for 24 days. Aren't you worried? I wasn't at first. But last week I began to worry when he didn't remember our day of beginning. Your what? Day of beginning. It's something very special to us. Ray, did you know that when Ted came back from Korea, he couldn't walk? No. No, I didn't. I guess it's something he'd rather keep out of the biography. Well, I was his physiotherapist at Walter Reed. That's where we met. Ted had been in this crash, and I'd exercise him trying to get him to walk. He was a quiet one. You know how quiet he can be. Yes. But he'd talk to me all about Korea, the missions there, a lot about the men under him who were hurt or killed. He never said so, but I knew he blamed himself for anything that went wrong. And then one day, after one of those talks, he took his first step. And it was then he said he was going to marry me. And he called it the day of the beginning. Every year since then, he sent me some remembrance of it, a gold charm, something. But last week, for the first time, nothing. 
He would have made some arrangement for it if he didn't expect to be back. And then, two days ago, this terrible letter came. I've been carrying it around with me ever since. I've been unfaithful. Divorce me. Is this his handwriting? I'm not sure. Now, Bobby, do you think he was in that capsule 17 days ago? Yes. Why? He called me about 3 o'clock that morning. He said he wanted me to be on the beach at 7 o'clock. So when I saw the shot, I knew it was his. Bobby, you must have done some guessing. What do you think was Ted's mission? The only thing that's come to my mind is that it has something to do with the Pliskin muck. Ted and I discussed it, even joked about it. That was until the Project X secrecy. Then Ted stopped talking about it, and I got... The Pliskin muck, or Pliskin radiation field, is an electromagnetic field that is located and concentrated over the northern regions of the Soviet Union. It was nicknamed after its discoverer, the Russian scientist, Dr. I.K. Pliskin. I knew of its existence because I attended an international scientific conference in Stockholm last year and interviewed Dr. Pliskin after he defected to the West. In fact, we recorded a tape interview. Bobby, that, uh, that letter from Ted, where was it postmarked? Houston. Bobby, there's an explanation for it. And I think the explanation is in Houston. I'm going there this morning, and I think you should be on the flight with me. Yes. Yes, I want to come. Before I left Florida, I called my news desk in New York and told them what I had learned on Cocoa Beach. Also, I asked them to fly the Pliskin tape to me in Houston. When Bobby and I arrived, I didn't want her to go to her home. I didn't want her to talk to anyone, at least for the rest of the day. So she agreed to register in a Houston motel under a fictitious name. I picked the Pliskin tape off the New York flight and then called Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Schlag, the space agency chief of astronautical operations. Colonel Schlag speaking. Colonel, this is Ray Boudreau. Oh, yes, Boudreau. Colonel, where is Major Ted Shaw? Astronaut Shaw is on a secret mission. He'll be involved with it for the next several weeks. Now, that's all I can tell you, so... Colonel Schlag, I have an eyewitness report that puts Ted Shaw aboard the capsule that was launched 17 days ago. I also have a recording of Roberta Shaw, who was a very worried girl because of a letter she received from him two days ago. A letter to Shaw's wife? I thought she was on vacation. No longer. She's with me. A letter? Then, Colonel, I have a tape of a Dr. I.K. Pliskin... What does he have to do with this? A great deal. I'd like to come in and play this tape for you. I don't think that's necessary. All right, Colonel. But I'm going on the air tonight with everything I've got, including the Pliskin tape. But first, I'd like to talk to you about the implications of such a broadcast. All right. Come in if you like. I'll see you at 3.30. Goodbye. Three hours later, I played the tape I'd made last spring of Dr. I.K. Pliskin for Colonel Schlag. Here is that tape. Dr. Pliskin, we have rumors that a Russian cosmonaut has been lost in space. Is this true? Yes. The orbital paths of Russian flights were different from yours. One Russian flight went through a radiation field of such a destructive nature that the cosmonaut was unable to return to Earth. Oh, what happened to him? I can tell you no more now. I must talk to your agency officials first. I understand they are planning flights through my radiation field. It is very dangerous there, and they must be warned. Well, that's the tape, Colonel Schlag. First, let me say, Mr. Boudreau, that I've been authorized to answer all of your questions. But let me also emphasize that this is classified a secret... We expect you to keep it so. Now, that's a cute way of gagging me. Then Major Ted Shaw was in that capsule. Yes. Did the Pliskin muck hurt him? Yes. How? Seventeen days ago, after having been exposed to the strange effects of the Pliskin radiation field, astronaut Ted Shaw... Well, to put it in non-technical language... 
he went insane. This is your correspondent, Ray Boudreau. A few minutes ago, here at the Space Agency in Houston... Colonel Thomas Schlag revealed to me that 17 days ago, astronaut Ted Shaw was launched into space. His mission, to test the effect of the Pliskin radiation field. According to Colonel Schlag, this mission caused astronaut Shaw to go insane. At this point, Colonel Schlag changed the course of our conversation. He asked about the letter received two days ago by Major Shaw's wife, and signed by the Major. Do you have that letter with you? Hmm. Here. Not a very good facsimile of his handwriting, is it? Hmm. Miss Lerner, please get to Colonel Jackson. Have him come to my office as soon as possible. Now, Mr. Boudreau, it's my turn to play a tape for you. It's a recording of Major Shaw while he was in orbit. At the time of this recording, Ted was in communication with our ground station at Varkos, Finland, and was some 12 minutes away from the Pliskin Muck. This is Odyssey 14. Ted. Have you switched to automatic mode yet? Say again. Odyssey 14. Go to auto mode now. Okay, switching now. Lock. 14. Read you on auto mode. Good. We have loss of signal in approximately one minute. At this point, he was some 11 minutes away from the Pliskin Muck. Here are Ted's last words received at Varkos, Finland. You're cutting out. Say again. Losing signal here. We will pick you up on the other side after you go through it. Good luck, 14. Good luck. I don't need luck. Everything's fine here. But what does the Pliskin Muck do to a man? Come in. Oh, hello, Colonel. Howdy. Mr. Pedro, this is Colonel Jackson, who is the chief surgeon of the Odyssey mission. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Why don't you ask the Colonel that question? Very well. What effect does the Pliskin radiation have on an astronaut? Well, after they've had a taste of it, or perhaps I should say the sound of it, they just don't want to come down. I don't understand. Well, the simplest way I could describe it would be as an acute case of audio hypnosis. You see, when the capsule entered the Pliskin field, the radiation there created a sound phenomenon within the capsule. For lack of a better term, we label it space singing. Once a man is exposed to this space singing, he evidently goes into a deep hypnotic state and will do anything to stay in it. The siren song of space. Is that it? Well, the Russian cosmonaut wanted to stay in that world so desperately that he sabotaged all efforts to bring him down. The purpose of our mission was to send the kind of man who, by our most scientific judgment, was able to resist the field's hypnotic attraction. We thought the cosmonaut's breakdown might be an individual personal thing. We gave all the astronauts a battery of psychological tests, and Shaw measured strongest in resisting hypnotic influence. Yes. He certainly believed he could do better than any Russian cosmonaut. After talking with Dr. Pliskin, he was so convinced that it wouldn't happen to him that I must confess he had me believing him. So what happened? I'll play you the tape made after Major Shaw had gone through the Pliskin muck. We were in communication with the capsule through our tracking station on Okashiri Island, Japan. Odyssey 14. How do you read? Odyssey 14. Four corners to my bed. Four angels round my head. One to watch. One to pray. And two... <laughs> two to bear my soul away. Fourteen. I'll count down retro sequence fire. Three. Two. One. Zero. We read number one fired. For every evil under the sun... Number two fired. There is a remedy or there is none. Number three fired. If there be one, try and find it. If there be none, never mind it. Fourteen. We show that you have armed the escape hatch. 
Old woman said, I wither so high to sweep the cobwebs off the sky and I'll be with you by and by. Fourteen. We show that you have blown the hatch. Come when you're called. Do what you're bid. Shut the door after you and never be kid. And may we light the clock, keep a face clean and bright, with hands ever ready to do what is right. Phew. Boy, if I understand the tape, he made it impossible for you to bring him down. Yes. Put the capsule into a position that would have made it skip back into space when it hit the atmosphere. And did he have control? No. He didn't know it, but we'd rigged it so that once he went automatic before his entry into the Pliskin muck, all control belonged to us on the ground, and he could never again take it back again. Then he couldn't blow the hatch. That's right. Each button he pushed gave us a readout in our control, but had no effect on the capsule. Then you got him down all right? Yes. He gave us quite a fight, but we got him down. But where has he been these last two weeks? In our hospital here in Houston. He's been in a state of complete withdrawal. He does not speak, nor does he respond to any communication. Oh, that explains the note to his wife. What he really meant was being unfaithful to his own strict code of conduct. Yes. For a man like Shaw, it's a shattering experience to think he's failed. Well, then, what's our next step? I think it's time we brought Mrs. Shaw into it. I called Bobby Shaw at the motel and asked her to meet us in the observation room of the hospital. There, she was completely briefed. Colonel Schlag even played the tapes for her. When it was done, Bobby Shaw had only one thought. I want to see my husband. Just go through that door. We shall observe you through this one-way glass window. Colonel Jackson pulled back the curtain. We could see astronaut Ted Shaw sitting in a chair, staring into empty space. Colonel Jackson turned on the room's microphone. Ted? When she spoke, I thought I saw him flinch slightly, but it did not alter his dazed condition. Ted, when you came back from Korea, I helped teach you how to walk. Now, now we have to work on the speech. So, let's start the therapy. Remember the last time we kept count during the coordination exercises by saying nursery rhymes? All right. This time, I'm going to say them. And I want you to move your mouth. Let's start. The man in the moon came down too soon. She okay. worked with him with firmness, Make patience, words. with you love. Are. She kept Adam to move the his mouth in and in time moon. to make some grunting noise in temple with the verse. Hey, Ted. Finally, now, after more than an hour of work. Sound in time with the words. If there is a remedy or there is none, if there be one, try and find it. Now, Ted, say the last line yourself. If there be none... Ted, say it. If there be one, try and find it. If there be none... Never mind it. Good. Good, Ted. She did it. Yes, she did it. She brought him back. You're going to be all right, Ted. You're home again. You're home. Presented Odyssey of Number 14, written by Bruce Bassett and directed by Harry Nelson. In the cast, John Thomas, Lenka Peterson, Lon Clark, Cliff Carpenter, and Jay Barney. 
Audio engineer, Neil Pulse. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC radio. Do you believe what we heard is some kind of message from space? Yes, I do. Well, suppose... Suppose the message wasn't sent by an alien civilization. What if something else is trying to speak to us? Something else? Do you mean some kind of super intelligence, some supreme being? Yes. Then in that case, I sincerely hope we can understand what the message is before it's too late. <laughs> Theater 5 presents We Are All Alone. Ladies and gentlemen, please pardon the noise and confusion here, but this is an extraordinary event, and we're broadcasting under extraordinary conditions. This is Gary Benton at Stellar Observatory. Less than one hour ago, astronomers here, operating the planet's largest radio telescope, reported the reception of some sort of message from what seems to be outer space. It sounds much like static. But the significant thing is that the pattern keeps repeating itself. Now, according to Dr. Forrest, head of the observatory, this means that an intelligent source is sending it. Dr. Forrest is here at the scene of this excitement, and I'm trying to get his attention. Dr. Forrest! Dr. Sir! Dr. Forrest! Dr. Forrest, do you think we've heard from another planet? Well, I I don't know, but we're certainly hearing from somebody or something intelligent. I see. Then you believe there are other civilizations in the universe besides our own? quite definitely. As any physicist will tell you, there are countless billions of suns, many of them with with planet systems around them. Oh, yes. There's someone out there, all right. And they're waiting for us. Waiting and perhaps calling from somewhere in outer space. Theater 5 is presenting the radio drama, We Are All Alone. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Gary Benton again, coming to you from Stellar Observatory, where something really fantastic has occurred in the past hour. We just spoke with Dr. Forrest, head of the observatory, and as soon as possible, we will broadcast a tape of the noise pattern which has come from outer space. Please stand by for further details. We are now switching back to your local station. So much for that. Bill things start popping again. Hey, who's got a match? I've got some telephone for you. Oh, thanks. All right, coming. Thank you. Hello? Gary? What's going on up there? Plenty, Ray. The boys up here think they've hit the jackpot this time. They claim it has to be something intelligent that's sending that noise. Oh, I ask. Because the same pattern keeps coming in. They never heard anything like it. Can't it be just going Not a chance, no. Look, they had a computer figure it out. Uh After the sixth repetition, the chances of a seventh are astronomical. More than ten is just about impossible, and this thing's been going on for an hour. Well, all right. But I got troubles down here. Linda Maxwell wants to go on with her show. Uh Uh-oh. She says that her listeners aren't interested in space. They just want to hear her. Is she kidding? This may be the biggest thing that's ever happened to us. This thing's so hot, the president of the planet has a direct line to this place. Look, I, I... Ray, I think you should just... Play music and hold everything open for what happens here. Suppose nothing happens. It will, it will. They're going to give me a tape recording of the sound to play on the air. Why why don't you have Linda stand by just in case, huh? Okay, I'll tell her. Yeah, and give her my love, huh? Yeah, right, right. Talk to you later. 
Now for the fight. Linda! Linda, I just spoke with Gary Benton up at the observatory. Ah, yes, the talented Mr. Benton. And what words of wisdom does he have for me now? Well, Gary says that things are popping up there. He's going to get a tape to play very soon. What about my listeners? Well, this is a news special, you know. And it just might be the most important event ever. Oh, I know it, Ray. And I suppose I can't really argue the point. It's just that... Well, you know how I hate to let that inflated ego of Gary's get any bigger than it is already. <laughs> you know, I believe you and Gary must be secretly married, the way you two go around throwing barbs at each other. <laughs> uh-uh, not a chance, Ray. We're both much too smart for anything like that. Uh, meaning that you'll wait until he asks you. Well, maybe. So why don't you just wait in the studio? Gary wants you to stand by in case something goes wrong. Oh, hey, I have a better idea. Suppose I go up to the observatory and split the news with Gary. That way my listeners could hear me and then everybody's happy. That's hmm? not a bad idea. Besides, it may be good to get a woman's viewpoint of what's happening. Ray, listen. Huh? Uh, do, do you really think there's anything to it? I mean, this message from space? Oh, I don't know. It's possible, all right. But if it is true, then we're not alone anymore. That's right. What about it? Well, it's spooky, that's all. I mean, we've sent satellites into space. We've been sending messages out of the universe for years, but this is different. Somebody's sending us something. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's an answer to one of our messages. But if it is that, it's even more scary. Then whoever it is must be very much like we are. Maybe a whole planet just like us. Well, the universe is big enough for both of us, I suppose. Now, look, how about you getting up to the observatory and start sending us messages? Okay, I'm there already. The next voice you hear will be that of Linda Maxwell from outer space. Well, for Pete's sake, what are you doing up here? Well, maybe Ray wanted somebody with a little human feeling in on a story like this. Very funny. All right, Gary, I'm sorry. Come on. Tell me what's going on here. Well, from what I've been able to piece together, there were two men on the telescope when the noise started coming in. Yeah. Dr. Forrest, who's head man, and Professor Sanford, a physicist. They're both tops in their field. Which is? Which is radio astronomy. For several years, they've been sending out signals to all parts of the universe, hoping to contact other civilizations. At the same time, they've been listening to sounds coming in, hoping to hear something intelligible. And tonight they heard. They sure did, baby. Oh, well, where's the case now? Dr. Forrest has it. He's going to give me first crack at it to play it on the air. We've got the newsbeat of the year. Well, what's the noise sound like? It's a little weird, especially when you realize it may mean something. What are you doing now? I'm going to play you a tape of what they usually hear when the telescope is on. Well, how do they get this sound? Well, from what Dr. Forrest tells me, they aim the telescope at a particular area of the sky. Then they tune in on a specific frequency and turn on the radio receiver. And they record whatever they hear. Right. Here, listen to this. Mm. That's all coming from space? Every bit of it. And the sounds we're hearing? Are the sounds of the universe. Oh, boy. Makes me shiver. Each of those sounds is coming from billions of miles out in space. Some of them have taken the... Uh, Thousands, maybe millions of years to get to us. Mr. Benton, Dr. Forrest would like to see you. Thank you. I'll be right back, Linda. I think he wants to give me the tape. Dr. Forrest? Oh, Mr. Benton, come in. I'd like you to meet Professor Sanford. It's an honor, Professor. And for me, Mr. Benton, Dr. Forrest tells me that you've been following the progress of our little adventure almost from the beginning. That's right, sir. <laughs> I must say I admire your patience, <laughs> Stubbornness would be more like it, Professor. I figured if I made a pest of myself long enough, I'd get the inside track on the story. So, well, here I am. Now, Mr. Benton, I have the tape that I believe you wish to play for your listeners. Uh, the uh, president of our planet has already been notified and is being kept informed of developments. Well, sir, have you been able to determine anything definite yet? Well, there's more to be done, of course, but I can say this. Perhaps the most fantastic thing of all is the strength of the radio waves. The strength? Mm -hmm. What Dr. Forrest means is that an unknown radio source far beyond the universe we know is sending us signals on 10,000 megawatts of power. Ten? But that's more power than my whole radio station uses. And that's what the reading is, and there's no mistake. Well, Mr. Benton, suppose you play the tape and we'll get back to work. Yes, well, thank you, Dr. Forrest and Professor Sanford. Linda... Linda, get the engineer to cue up this tape right away. I'm going on the air as soon as he opens my mic. Hmm? 
Ladies and gentlemen, this is Gary Benton at Stellar Observatory. We have just received the tape of the sound pattern which has come to us from outer space. In just one minute, you will hear what is believed to be the first sounds ever received from an intelligence somewhere in space. Please stand by. Theater 5 is presenting We Are All Alone. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Gary Benton at Stellar Observatory. I'm about to play a tape recording for you of the noise pattern that came from outer space earlier this evening. Scientists here at the observatory believe that the pattern is a message and that somewhere far out in the universe, something intelligent is trying to communicate with us. The next sound you hear is coming from outer space. Goose flesh. Why? I don't know. It's just spooky. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just played for you what may be the first message ever received from outer space. Scientists are now determining what that message may be. As reports come in, we will broadcast them, so please stay tuned. Well, that's that, at least for the moment. I hope the president of the planet was listening. Gary? Hmm? Listen, suppose this, uh, whatever it is, isn't friendly. I mean, suppose it wants to destroy it. What's that? Well, first it has to get here. If it could send messages, it could get here. Well, it's, it's a little different, Linda. All right. One big difference is that radio waves travel through just about everything. Bodies can't do that. At least not that we know of. But just suppose it did happen. What would you do? My <laughs> love... I'd gather you up in my arms and run as fast as I could. Oh, dear. <laughs> Telephone for Mr. Benton. Oh, thanks. Benton here. This is Ray, Gary. Here at the studio. Yeah, what's up? Oh, boy, things are really popping. We've had about a hundred calls already on this message from outer space. And they're coming in faster than we can take them. And I have personally spoken to two men who claim to understand the message. What? You heard me. Both of them claim that they can understand what is being sent, and what's more, they know where it's coming from. One of them fell on his head when he was 12, and ever since then, he's had visions <laughs> of the day when this message would come. Yeah, well, wh what about the other? Well, the other one knows all about the message because it's for him. I see. Well, go yeah, on. It seems that he is uh, not of this planet. He came here many years ago from his home, millions of miles away in another galaxy. Now they want him back. Now, that's what the message is, telling him to come home. Look, uh, seriously, Gary, I, uh, I just wanted to congratulate you on being the first to get this on the air. It's the biggest thing that's ever happened around here. Oh, thanks, Ray. I'll, I'll uh, call you later at the studio. You'll be there, huh? Where else? Right. That was Ray. Well, did he say my listeners are storming the building because they can't hear me? Yeah, something like that. I thought so. Hey, here's Dr. Forrest, the professor. Come on, I'll introduce you. Oh, okay. Oh, Mr. Benton, sir. Well, how did the broadcast go? Just fine, doctor, just fine. I'll uh, return the tape after I've run it once more. Good. Meanwhile, this charming young thing on my arm is Linda Maxwell. She's my assistant. Mm. Linda, Dr. Forrest, Professor Santos. How do you do, Maxwell? Anything new, doctor? I'm afraid not. We've tried radio telegraphy with no luck. We've just finished running the pattern through the modulating receiver. Oh, what does that do? It breaks down the electromagnetic wave. The wave pattern is carrying the electrical equivalent of sound wave, then the receiver can reproduce the original sound. You mean a voice? If that's the original sound, yes. Well, sir, what were the results of your test? It's definitely not what we expected. I see. Well, if something is being sent out, what, what form would it take? I mean, for example... Would it have our alphabet? Hardly. It would probably be a mathematical formula. Equations are constant everywhere in the universe. Ah, yes. It? That's the only common bond there is, of course. You mean everything else? History, culture, is meaningless to an alien civilization? Well, in terms of our experience, I'm afraid so, Miss Maxwell. Well, what do you do now, sir? Well, there's one more experiment Professor Sanford and I want to try. It's a long shot, so I'd better not say anything about it just yet. 
But we should know the result very soon now. Dr. Forrest. Yes, Miss Maxwell. Suppose... Suppose the message was not sent by an alien civilization. What if something else is trying to speak to us? Something else? Do you mean some kind of uh, super intelligence or some supreme being? Yes. Then in that case, Miss Maxwell, I sincerely hope we can understand what the message is before it's too late. Ladies and gentlemen of the news media, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor Sanford and I have called all of you here to acquaint you with the test results we mentioned several hours ago. Uh, let me begin by saying that after our initial shock, we noted the rather odd fact that the radio waves were coming in at uh, 82.2 megacycles. Now, uh, that's the frequency we use for satellite communication. We'd expect radio waves from outer space to come in the more universal 50 megacycle range if they were sent by a living intelligence. Exactly. So we began to suspect that our uh, intelligent sender of messages might be aboard one of our own lost satellites. What? One of our lost satellites? Yes, Mr. Benton. But how is that possible, sir? I mean, a lost satellite can't just travel billions of miles into space and then suddenly begin sending radio messages back. Where would it get the energy? I think I can answer that, Mr. Benton. The satellite could be in a solar orbit that includes a number of planets. A strong magnetic field around these planets would trap enough sun particles to ionize the transmitter. I see, and that would give it the tremendous energy required? Well, it could be as simple as that. To check this theory, we submitted the noise pattern to the decoding scanner. Everything was double-checked. And there's no doubt that the mysterious message from outer space, the, uh, the something that is sending us a repeating pattern, is a transmitter in one of our own satellites. Where it is, we don't know, and we'll never know. Certainly billions of miles away, perhaps in another universe. And I thought this was the story of the century. Oh, but it is, Mr. Benton. Now, how do you mean, sir? From an emotional viewpoint, this is quite naturally a, a shattering disappointment. But not from the scientific point of view. This lost satellite is sending us information that will revolutionize our thinking. Already, we know of a planet that has a dead moon near it and a fantastic amount of radioactivity surrounding it. Who knows what else we shall learn? Well, you'll excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. There's much work yet to be done. Professor Sanford. Yes? Professor, are you going to call the president of the planet now, sir? Oh, yes. I'm going to let President Moore know that this is a scientific breakthrough of major importance. Thank you, Professor. Well, Linda, it seems the all-powerful stranger from another planet turns out to be a, a phantom of our own imagination and invention. And we are alone. All alone. No, Linda. Not ever all alone. <laughs> President speaking. It is with sadness that we acknowledge the continued failure of our efforts to contact other civilizations. For many years, we have listened to the sounds of the universe, hoping to hear alien messages. We must now conclude that we fail because there are no such messages. It appears inescapable that at this moment in the history of the universe, we, the inhabitants of the planet Orbis, one of the two planets around our sun, and one of the countless billions in the Gamma Galaxy, are the only intelligent living beings in the vast reaches of space. 
we should feel both humble and proud. In the limitless universe, only on the planet Orvis are there people who can marvel at the beauty of the sky. The sky that is there just for us. People of Orvis, let us give thanks. I never should have come here. I never should have come to this strange place. Now I've got to hurry and get this bag packed. I've got to get up away as soon as I can. I've got to... What do you want? We thought we'd bring you another bottle of champagne. If I'd wanted room service, I'd have called. It's with the compliments of the house. You get out of here, all three of you. Now leave me alone. Now that's gratitude. It's going to be a cold night, miss. And I brought a blanket to keep you warm. Get out and... of here, all of you. Get out. No, miss, is that a nice way to act? You... You're the one who said you'd help me. Where's where's my cat? I'm sorry, but I couldn't find a cat. You never went after one. You're lying. You're all lying. Now get out of here. Presents Echo of Madness. taxi just pulled up in front. Now, Kate, you know what to do. Yes. I'll make like a bellhop and help her with her bag. Oh, it's going to be horrible. Too horrible. It can't be too horrible. Oh, uh, just a moment, miss. I'll, uh, I'll take that bag for you. Thank you. Do you have a vacant room? Uh, yes, certainly. Um, how long will you be staying? Well, just overnight, I think. Will you sign the register, please? Yes, of course. There you are. Thank you. Judith Morgan, New York City. Mm -hmm. Joe? Yes? Show Miss Morgan to uh, room six. Sure. Uh, excuse me. Yes? Do you have a Mr. Bruce Mansfield registered? He hasn't arrived yet, Miss Morgan, but we're expecting him. I see. Well, when Mr. Mansfield does arrive, will you let him know I'm here? It's important. Certainly. Thank you. This way, Miss. Just follow me. Well? Well, what? I'd say everything's working just as we planned. Wouldn't you, Mr. Mansfield? Here we are, miss. Room six. There. Uh, something wrong, miss? Well, I don't much care for this room. I think I'd like another. I'm afraid there isn't another available, miss. Oh, I see. I guess it isn't the best we have, but it's the best we can do. Now, you don't have to worry about the noise. That quiets down for the night exactly at ten minutes to ten. No, if I don't hear any noise. You will. You see, miss, when the trains go by... The trains? You... Yes, you see the hotel's close to the railroad. In fact, you can see the tracks from the window there. It's the main line to Chicago. Chicago? Something wrong, miss? No, no. But the way you looked when I said Chicago... No, it's nothing. Do you have to keep asking if something's wrong? Oh, no, no. Sorry, miss. I only wanted to be helpful. Yes, I'm sorry, of course. That'll be the 6.30 for Houston. The noise won't quiet down till the Chicago mainliner goes through at 9.50. Isn't another train after that till 7 in the morning? Well, I guess I can be thankful for that. Another thing you can be thankful for, that you weren't here three weeks ago. Oh, Why? The accident, miss. Must have read about it. No, I didn't. What happened? The main liner. Wrecked. Yeah, wrecked. Happened right out there. Right outside this window. 
Oh, it was a terrible sight, miss. The main liner was doing all of 90 miles an hour when it plowed right into a freight that had come to a stop, right out there. It was awful. People screaming, pain, begging for help, locked in those trains. Please, get... please, must you? I, I, I just can't bear to hear about things like that. Oh, I'm sorry, miss. Well, uh, if you want anything, just uh, ring. Yes, thank you. I was a fool to come. Something about this place. Come in. I brought you some towels, miss. Oh. I'll put them in the bathroom. Oh, um, if you'd like something to eat, miss, I'm sure I can arrange something. Well, thank you. If I get hungry, I'll go down to the dining room. Oh, the dining room isn't open. This is our slack season, you see. You're the only one staying here. Except, of course, for Mr. Mansfield when he arrives. But the, the bellhop said this was the only room available. Oh, well, what he meant was we have no other room in readiness. The beds are unmade, the dust covers on the furniture, and like that. Um, Mr. Mansfield hasn't arrived yet? No, not yet. What is Mr. Mansfield like, do you know? I wouldn't know. I've never met him. Oh. Haven't you? No, no, I haven't. I see. Well, I don't think you do if you're thinking... Excuse me, miss. Your private affairs are your own, not the hotel's. Um, good night. Why did I come here? Why did I answer that letter? Why? Why? <laughs> Oh. Did I startle you? Um, you're Bruce Mansfield? Who did you think I was? Well, I didn't know. I... But now you do know. The name, the face, you've put them together and now you know? What do you want? <laughs> what is it I want? Isn't it something you want, Miss Morgan? No. Then why did you come here in answer to my letter? Well, um... You, you said that I would find it to my interest. Find what to your interest? I don't know. I, I, um, look, I'm getting out of here. I never should have come. I was a fool to answer a letter from a stranger. But we're not strangers. We're friends, very old friends. Only it appears you don't care to recognize that fact. There's something about me that frightens you, isn't there? Isn't there? Yes. Then you do know. You must know who I am. No, I don't, I tell you. I, I, I don't. Oh, I shouldn't have come here. I don't know why I did. There was something about this place I didn't like the minute I entered it. And there's something about you I don't like. You may change your mind before the evening's over. For your information, the evening is over. I'm leaving here. Oh! I forgot to leave you some soap. Were you going somewhere, Miss Morgan? She wants to leave, and... Just when I was on the verge of inviting her to dinner. Oh, what a pity. We serve such an excellent dinner here, too. You said the dining room was closed. Oh, well, we can always open it for an old friend and customer like Mr. Mansfield. But I thought you told me you'd never seen him before. I don't remember saying anything like that. But you did. I remember. I think I remember you saying... No, that. dear, you're mistaken. And you're making another mistake in wanting to leave. No, I'm yes. not... You stay and have a nice dinner with Mr. Mansfield. I'll see to it the chef goes out of his way to make it a dinner you'll remember. I'll even treat you to a bottle of champagne. Well, what's the matter? I don't, I don't like champagne. Well, you don't have to look so horrified about it. We'll have some anyway. Perhaps you'll change your mind. I won't, and I'm not changing my mind about leaving here either. No, my dear. Get out of my way. You must stay. You really must, Miss Morgan. And you will, if you know what's best for you. Will this table be all right, Mr. Mansfield? Well, it seems fine to me, but uh, I'll ask the lady. Uh, does this table suit you, Miss Morgan? Where are the others? Oh, that's right. They said the dining room was closed. The whole place is like a morgue. Well, uh, 
Could you turn the lights down a little, please? Oh, yes, sir. And I'll light the candles, too. Thank you. If you want me, sir, just call. There, now, isn't that better? You love candlelight, remember? Well, yes, I do, but... And your favorite flowers. White heather and yellow roses. Yes, they're lovely. But I don't understand... The dining room, Miss Morgan. I is it familiar to you now? Why should it be? Well, now, look, the wallpaper. Do you remember the quaint, old-fashioned, flowered wallpaper? Well, I love old-fashioned things, but... What are you trying to do to me? I never saw it before. You don't remember ever having been in this room before? No, of course not. You have no recollection of sitting at this table? No, because I've never been here in my life. Can't you remember how the candlelight glittered on your hair and, and danced in your eyes? No, no, that wouldn't be for you to remember. That, that would be my memory. You're insane. You don't remember having dinner with me here... You can't recall that? No, no, no. Well, how convenient for you, Miss Morgan. How... How very convenient. I don't know what you mean. Would it help you to remember if I said that I'll never forget? The only thing that would help me would be to get out of here. Why? Why won't you remember? I won't rem... I don't remember because it never happened. But you know it did, Miss Morgan. It... It was a night I shall never forget, certainly. And why have you? Or have you, Miss Morgan? Look, I've had enough of this. Enough of your obscure remarks and your mysterious innuendos. I demand to know why you wrote me that letter. I demand to know why you refuse to believe anything I say. I demand... Don't. What? Don't demand. Not of me, Miss Morgan. Joe. Uh, yes, Mr. Manfield, what can I do for you, sir? Uh, the champagne, please. Yes, at once, sir. I won't drink it. Why not? I told you I don't like champagne. Oh, now, everybody likes champagne. And this is the best. No. Yes. Only the best. This is a... Well, it's a special occasion. What do you mean? You'll find out. I will not sit here. Now, sit down. You know by now you can't leave unless I let you. And I'm not going to let you. So you might as well take things easy. Or as... Easy as it'll be possible for you to take them. And I seriously urge you to drink the champagne. It isn't poisoned and it isn't drugged. What's more, it'll help you face what's coming. What do you mean, what's coming? What are you going to do to me? What's going to happen? Here's the champagne, Mr. Mansfield. Oh, yes, thank you, Joe. Shall I pour, sir? Yes, would you please? Enjoy your dinner, sir. You and the lady. He thinks we're friends. Does he? Well, it's obvious. I didn't notice. Well, champagne, my dear. No. Take the glass. No. I said take it. Now drink it. No. Drink it, I tell you. <laughs> oh. Mr. Mansfield, sir. Mr. Mansfield, your cheek, it's bleeding. Miss Morgan just threw her glass at me. It shouldn't have been <laughs> Joe, Joe, have you any iodine? In the kitchen, sir. No, 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 that's all right. Uh, quicker if I go out there. Uh, please, keep the lady covered. Uh, yes, sir. Please, you've got to help me. But I can. I'll make it worth your while. I have money, lots of money. I'll pay you anything. Anything to help me get out of here. Well, I'm afraid I don't see what you... Listen to me, listen. Go out and find me a cab. Oh, look, Just do what I tell you and you'll be well paid. I'll go to my room and get my bag. All my money's in it. You'll get, you get that cab and have it waiting around the corner, and I'll meet you there. And I'll pay you well, very well, do you understand? Uh, yes. Well, then go on. Go on. Are you all right, Mr. Mansfield? Yes. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm all right. It's not a bad cut. The bleeding has stopped. He can take better care of it later. Yeah. Good. Now we have our work cut up, us. But what are you doing out here? Why aren't you in there with her? It's all right. She thinks I'm getting her a taxi cab. She's really determined to leave, isn't she? Yes. Where is she now? What is she doing? She's gone to her room for her bag. Oh. I don't know how long she'll wait while I'm supposed to be getting her a taxi cab. Now, look, it's almost ten to ten. We've got to work fast. Yes, we do, or the whole thing is going to boomerang. Well, we all know what we've got to do. Just a question of all of us doing our parts. I mean all of us. Yes, I... I know what you mean. I've done my best, haven't I? Yes, so far. But the worst part is still to come. Why does it have to 
be this way. I keep hoping something else will happen. It's really too late to think about other ways now. I don't have any other ideas, but isn't there... Are you sure this is the only way? Can you think of any other way, Mr. Mansfield? No. No, of, of course I can't. I I just wish that we could stop short sure, of... we can't. Now, let's make sure everything is ready. I've got the blanket. Now, uh, this is the right kind, isn't it, Mr. Manson? Let me... Yes, yes, that, that's the right kind. I'll get another bottle of champagne. It may help. Did you manage to get her to take even a sip of the champagne before? No, no, I didn't. Not a, not a taste of it. Do you think she's suspicious? Of course she's suspicious. But I think we can overcome that. How important is the champagne? Do you really think it would make things easier for her? It should help. Well, I guess it's now or never. All right. Let's go before I lose my nerve. Hurry. Hurry and get this bag packed. Put away in that cab as fast as I can. What do I... Oh! What is this? Why, we thought we'd uh, bring you another bottle of champagne. Leave me alone. Now, that's gratitude. It's going to be a cold night, and I brought this blanket to keep you warm. Get out of here. And you, all of you, get out. Now, is that a way to ask? You, you said you'd help me. Sorry, but I couldn't find you a cab. You never went after one. You're lying. You're all lying. Now, get out of here. Now, please don't take that attitude. Joe tries to help you, and just because he can't find a cab, you call him a liar. Miss Harwood is thoughtful enough to bring you a blanket and you insult her. I offer you champagne at dinner and you fling it in my face. Get out of here. Get out. What's the matter? You've gone white as a sheet. That sound. Only the main liner to Chicago. Right on time. She'll pass here at exactly 9.50. You're shaking, Miss Morgan. You must be cold. Here, put this blanket around your shoulder. No. But if you're chilly, you How should How can have... she be chilly when she's perspiring her forehead... Beaded with sweat. I tell you, she's cold now Will here, my all dear. please get out of here and leave me alone? Not until you've had this glass of champagne. You wouldn't have a dinner. I told you I don't want it. I won't drink it. And I told you that you will. <laughs> you're, you're going to drink the champagne. You're, you're going to drink a toast. And I'm going to insist you put this blanket, this army blanket, around your shoulder. Get away from me. Now, get away from me. Please, why are you doing this? Doing what? All I want you to do is... Drink a glass of champagne. No, and all I want you to do is put this army blanket around your shoulders to keep you warm. And you mustn't look so afraid when you hear that noise. I told you it's only the Chicago I'm midnight. not afraid. You are. And you know why you're afraid. You're afraid because you know what's going to happen. Maybe that's why you're trembling. Not because you're cold, but because you're afraid. The champagne will help. Here, drink this. And put the blanket around your no, shoulders. No, 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 no. Drink, no. drink the champagne. No, no, no. Blanket no. around you. The no. army blanket. Oh, no. the diesel horn. No. Chicago main line. No. Champagne. The blanket. No. Main line. No, no. Got it. Got it. It's going to crash. It's going to crash. It's going to crash. No! Oh, those poor people. Those poor people. All those people. And the screams. All those screaming people. Bruce. Yes, yes, dear. Bruce, we've got to help you. Of course, darling, of course we'll help you. Who are you? Tell me your name. Who are you? Who am I? Well, I'm Judy Mansfield. This is my husband, Bruce. Oh, thank heaven. Why do you ask such a silly question at a time like this? There's just been a terrible accident out there. No, 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 dear. There was a frightful accident. Three weeks ago... Three weeks ago. The Chicago mainliner crashed into a freight train. On the night we were beginning our honeymoon, darling, in this room. Honeymoon? Here? We were driving to Chicago. Our car broke down. We had to stay here overnight. Three weeks ago? Bruce? It was a terrible shock to you, Judy. So terrible you blotted it out of your mind and everything else with it. You became the victim of a sudden amnesia, Mrs. Mansfield. I had you moved to Rockview Hospital, but there was nothing they could do for you. Finally, in desperation, I got hold of the best psychiatrist I could find in New York. He's this gentleman, Dr. Joseph Carroll. You're a doctor? Yes, my dear. I knew one possible answer to your problem might be to make you relive that night. 
Just before the accident, you and your husband had drunk a toast to your marriage in champagne. You see, it had been cold in the room. And Mr. Mansfield had got this army blanket from your car and put it around you. And by the way, sweetheart, this is Miss Harwood, Dr. Carroll's nurse. And I can't tell you how glad I am the doctor's plan worked, Mrs. Mansfield. If it hadn't been for him and the cooperation of the people who own this hotel, you'd still be a victim of amnesia. Well, I remember everything now. Oh, thank heaven it's over and done with. <laughs> but it isn't. One part is just to begin. What? Our honeymoon, darling. Our honeymoon. Oh, Bruce. Theater 5 has presented Echo of Madness, written by George Lowther and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Elspeth Eric, Mary Jane Higby, James Monks, and Ivor Francis. Audio engineer, Neil Pulse. Sound technician, M.C. Brock. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. has been an ABC. It's a terrible thing to wake up from a nightmare. But suppose you have a nightmare you can't wake up from because you aren't asleep. It happens to me in this story on Theater 5. A story called just what it is. A nightmare. <laughs> Chase after him. I was only trying to help Julian. Well, now she's carrying on as if. But she's upset, of course. And... Oh, of course. And she's been drinking. You can say that again. He tore my dress. Now, Judy, we're going to put a stop to this right now. I'm going to call the police. Uh, it uh, sounds like somebody already has teach. Uh, I mean, Mr. Evans. Good. Uh, not good, man. Bad. What? Uh, 
Now, Sergeant, if you let me explain this from the beginning. I Name? Can... Charles Evans. Address? 317 East Andover. Now, as I was saying, Occupation? Sergeant... History teacher at Coolidge High. Now, Sergeant... You... Married? No. Age? Sergeant, I... 34. Okay. Now, your story is... You... It is not my story. It's the truth. Now, this young lady here... Do you know her? Well, of course I know her. She's one of my students. This boy, too. Her parents know she was out with you. She was not out with me. Now, Sergeant, are you going to listen to what I have to say or not? The kid said she was out with you. I can't believe it. Does she have any reason to lie? Well, it must be the shock. Whoever attacked her must her up considerably. I can see that. And she's been drinking. She says you got her drinking. Oh, she's out of her mind. Sergeant, have I been drinking? You don't look that way, but that don't prove anything. You ever been in trouble before? No. And I'm not in trouble now. Well, I'd say you were. Sergeant, can't you get Judy in here? Let me talk to her. Now, she's had time to calm down, and I'm sure she can straighten this out. She probably doesn't have any real idea of what she said when the officer brought us in. She was hysterical and in a state of shock. Okay. Send the girl in. The boy, too. Cigarette? No, oh, thanks. Well, don't smoke either. I didn't say that. Oh, come in. Come in. Now, young man. Uh, Philip Talmadge, sir. Okay. Sit there. And, uh, young lady. Judy McIntyre. Mr. Evans, I'm terribly sorry. I really am. Oh, thanks goodness. Now we can make some sense out of this. I'm sorry this had to happen. I, I, I know you didn't mean to. I mean, well, gosh, I, I suppose I never thought of you as a man. I mean... Well, uh, <laughs> history is such a dry subject, isn't it? And, well, I, I just didn't know you'd turn out to be so sexy. Judy, what in the name of heaven are you talking about? Sergeant, I came home and uh, I... From where? <laughs> well, from doing some work in my office at the school. Anybody see you there? I don't know. I, not that I know of. Now, listen. I came home. I got out of the car... I heard a girl scream out and cry for help. I ran over, and when I got there, she was alone, still screaming and crying out and looking the way you see her now. I, I tried to calm her down. I asked her if she was all right. Did she know who it was that attacked her? She said she didn't, and then she began crying on again. Now, I was trying to quiet her down when Phil came here running up. Now, that is the truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Uh, <clears throat> maybe you ought to give him the benefit of the doubt, Sergeant. Doubt? Well, uh, the way you tell it, maybe that's the way it happened. I don't know. I only know what I saw. Judy was sure putting up a big struggle. Now, why would she be doing that if Teach, uh, I mean Mr. Evans, was only trying to help her? I mean, it doesn't make sense, does it? None of this makes sense. Now, Judy... I want you to think back very carefully over what really happened to you tonight. Now, this ain't the classroom, Mr. Evans. Judy, suppose you tell me what happened, and I want the truth now. Oh, Sergeant, I I'm really sorry. I really am. I, I mean, I didn't have any idea anybody would make such a fuss. Can't we just forget it? Forget it? You claim a man attacks you, beats you up, tears your clothes half off you, and you want to forget it? Well... Maybe it was partly my fault. I, I mean, well, I don't want to sound conceited, but, well, <laughs> the fellows all say I'm tough, you know, cool, you know, with it. And, well, maybe I said something or looked at him some way, and, well, <laughs> he got the wrong idea. And then, well, he, he got himself so worked up he couldn't help it. I mean, well, everybody understands that kind of thing, don't they? I mean, not that it was right what he did, but, well, I've always admired him so as a teacher, and couldn't we just forget it? Judy, in the name of heaven... No, we can't just forget it. You're a minor. Evans, I'm not going to book you on any charges just yet, but uh, I hope you'll agree to remain in voluntary custody. Sergeant, I... Well... All right, if you say so. Hmm. You kids will stay here until your parents come. And uh, when they get here, I want to see them. Judy. Oh, Mr. Evans, I, I'm sorry. I really am. Judy, why are you doing this to me? Why? Oh, Mr. Evans, I... 
<laughs> I don't know what's the matter with me. I guess I'm so tired. Julia. Why? Did you say why? <laughs> Why would she do a thing like that? Why? Well, your attorney, that's what I've got to figure out if I'm going to help you. Wouldn't she give any explanation? Wouldn't or couldn't. She was hysterical, giggling anyway. I could have, oh, I could have wrung her neck. Well, can you think of any reason why? No. And I've wrecked my brains trying to. There must be some reason. It doesn't make any sense otherwise. It certainly wouldn't make sense to a judge. Jim, how do you think it looks for me? I don't know, Charlie. It's their word, Phil's and Judy's, against yours. And Judy's appearance. It would help if we had a witness, but we don't. At least we don't so far, and I'm still working on it. That and anybody who might have seen Judy earlier in the evening. What about her parents? <laughs> Just what you might expect. All they know is that she was out. They didn't know who with. They said they thought she was probably at the library. Probably. Well, I guess they're pretty upset, huh? Actually, I don't think they'll press any charges. I get the feeling they're pretty leery about anything Judy might do or say. But in any case, we've got to know what's behind all this. Maybe she's protecting somebody. Somebody who attacked her? Well, herself, then. Maybe the fella didn't attack her. Maybe she led him on a little, and then when things went too far, she got scared and started screaming for help to, you know, to make it look like an attack. Well, then why accuse you? Why not the fella she was with? I don't know. Maybe he's her boyfriend. I've checked that. Her only boyfriend is her steady, Phil. Phil? Yeah. Didn't you know? No. Well, I guess that knocks that. He couldn't have been fooling around with her without getting messed up himself, and he wasn't. Funny he happened to be so close at hand, isn't it? He doesn't live anywhere near there. Yeah, I... Well, I I didn't realize... Exactly. That's why the most important thing for us to figure out is why. I don't get you. Well, hasn't it occurred to you that this whole business might have been staged for your benefit? But why? That's exactly what I mean. Why? Some grudge, maybe. What kind of a student is she? Mm, Fair. Not good, not bad. No problem of failing? No. No run-in of any kind in class? I mean, embarrassing her in front of the class, say, because she didn't know an answer? No. I've never had any trouble at all with her like that way. Or Phil either. Uh, Does she have a crush on you? I've never gotten that impression. It could be that. And if she felt you slighted her or were laughing at her and she wanted to get back at you... I I don't think so, Jim. She isn't the type. She's always with a flock of boys, steady or not. Uh, Now, definitely not the shy, sensitive, adoring type. No, I don't think it's that. Well, it's got to be something. She surely wouldn't just do this thing for no reason at all. It doesn't make sense. That's what I keep thinking over and over. It doesn't make sense. Well, charges or no charges, Charlie. I'm afraid you're in for a tough rap. Will you have some coffee, Mr. Evans? No, thank you, Mrs. Carter. Very well. Then let's get down to business. I'm sure you know why you're here. I have a fair idea, yes. I understand you were acquitted of the charges against you. There were no charges, Mrs. Carter. Technically, no. I realized the charges were dropped. Yes, for lack of sufficient evidence, among other things. But, of course, the story is all over town. I don't hear all the gossip myself, but uh, I suppose so. It was uh, most unfortunate, I'm sure. I'm afraid we don't always abide by our own conviction that a man is innocent till proved guilty. Well, be that as it may, you understand that officially I have no authority regarding your contract with the high school. Yes, I understand. But as president of the Parents Association, I do wield a certain amount of influence, shall we say. In other words, the Parents Association could, if we deemed it suitable... Bring pressure to bear on the school to buy up your contract. Yes. 
And uh, you deem it suitable? Don't put words in my mouth, Mr. Evans. I beg your pardon. I will admit I've given a good deal of thought to the matter. It's true that you are, legally at least, innocent. Still, in any situation involving our children, we have to be very careful. I'm sure that if you had a child... You're not married, I understand. No. I think you might well give that some thought. Still, that is beside the point for the moment. But if you had a child, I'm sure you would want that child under the influence of a teacher who is above suspicion. Mrs. Carter, if you ask me to come here so you could give me an analysis of my character... There is no need to be rude, Mr. Evans. I understand you have been through a rather trying experience. To put it mildly... So I will overlook that rudeness. I've asked you here, Mr. Evans, because of a remarkable experience I had this morning. Judy McIntyre came to see me. Judy? Judy came to see you? And she had some rather remarkable things to say to me. You mean she told you the truth? Several truths, Mr. Evans. I was so impressed by what she had to say. I asked her to be here this afternoon so you could hear for yourself. I think you'll be impressed, too. I hope so. I'll ask her to come in now. You may come in now, Judy. Mr. Evans is most anxious to hear what you have to say. Hello, Judy. Hello, Mr. Evans. I... I really don't know how to begin. Just begin the way you did this morning. There's nothing to be nervous about. Well, I... Well, like I said to Mrs. Carter this morning, I... I feel so bad about everything and all. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that, Judy. I'm sure that eventually we could straighten this thing out. Well, I, well, I, I figured maybe Mr. Williams, the principal, might think that you shouldn't go on teaching here. And if, well, if he fired you, you'd really be in a jam. I mean, who else would want to hire you? Even with the shortage of teachers and all. And like I said to Mrs. Carter, you're really a marvelous, I, I mean, marvelous teacher. And, and you contribute so much to the school. Thank and, you. <laughs> oh, that's all right. I, I mean, well, it's true. And anyhow, I told Mrs. Carter that I thought they should let you stay on. Because, well, look at it this way, Mr. Evans. Wouldn't it really be better to stay here and just, well, just live this thing down than to try to go somewhere else when probably nowhere else would... <laughs> have you? What? Well, I mean, since it would probably be on your record and all, or at least people would know. Judy. I mean, well, anybody can make a mistake, but if a person didn't mean to do it, then I think people should be fair about it and give him a chance to prove he didn't mean it. Judy, in the name of heaven, what are you trying to do to me? Mr. Evans, there is no need to shout. No need to shout? I think Judy is being most perceptive and most generous. And I, for one... Find it refreshing indeed to see one of our teenage youngsters not behaving like the monsters they are so often pictured, but like the responsible young citizens we hope and know they are. Mrs. Carter, this responsible young citizen you see before you has for no reason I have been able to fathom falsely accused me of assaulting her. She has wrecked my career and ruined my reputation. And you expect me to get on my knees and thank her for her generosity? <laughs> Mr. Evans, nobody expects that. You must be insane. Or a little monster. Mr. Evans, I expect you to think before you speak. As I said before, I know you've been through a trying experience. But I strongly suggest that you pull yourself together. Judy is trying to help you. We are all trying to help you. I think it's time you started trying to help yourself. And that's the end of it? I sincerely hope it will be. And now, if you have nothing more to say, Mr. Evans? No, nothing. Then I think we may consider the matter settled. <laughs> Judy. Oh, Mr. Evans. Oh, golly. I really don't think people should see you with me. I, here in school, I mean. I mean. Judy, why? Why? Just, just tell me that. Listen, we shouldn't be talking right here in the hall, Mr. Evans. You should know better. Have I ever done anything to you? Offended you in some way? <laughs> Mr. Evans, of course not. Don't be a stodge. Why? Gee, Mr. Evans, I don't know. 
Does there have to be a why? Look, look, I gotta go now. The guys are waiting for me. And like I said, I, I don't think you and me are just the coolest combo right now. <laughs> Will you stop this insane giggling and give me a straight answer? Uh, I don't have any answer. <laughs> we were just looking for something crazy to do. Well, <laughs> we did it. <laughs> just like that? Well, yeah. Why me? Oh, Mr. Evans. <laughs> I, I know it doesn't sound as funny to you, but that's just what we said. Why, Mr. Evans? And then we said, why not? And that explains it. Well, sure. I mean, it wasn't anything personal, oh. honest. Judy, do you have any idea what you've done to me? Well, yeah, but I fixed everything up for you, didn't I? I, I mean, you don't have to thank me or anything. It was just the least I could do. You could tell the truth. <laughs> Mr. Evans, honest, you're the most. <laughs> if I told the truth now, who would believe me? I mean, people would still think there must be something funny going on. Going on. They never believe we did this whole bit for no reason at all. I mean, I mean, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> That's what's so funny about it. I mean, <laughs> really funny that the truth doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> no, Judy, you're the one that doesn't make any sense. The truth makes a lot of sense. And your boyfriend, Phil, just told the truth. My lawyer had a hunch and put Phil on the spot. He told everything. I was just giving you one last chance to tell the truth before you tell it to a judge. Presented Nightmare, written by Francis Rickett and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Rosemary Rice, Stan Watts, George Baxter, Lorraine McMartin, Peter Fernandez, and George Petrie. Audio engineer, Bill Sandreuter. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. has been an ABC radio... I suppose all of us have heard or even used the expression, I'd give a year of my life if I could have such and such a thing or if such and such a thing would happen. But what if you suddenly felt the years of your life being taken away from you? It happened to one man, me. The man you'll hear about in the story World Enough and Time on Theater 5. Radio. Why should I advertise on radio? There's nothing to look at, no pictures. Listen, you can do things on radio you couldn't possibly do on TV. That'll be the day. All right, watch this. <clears throat> Okay, people, and now when I give you the cue, I want the 700-foot mountain of whipped cream to roll into Lake Michigan, which has been drained and filled with hot chocolate. Then the Royal Canadian Air Force will fly overhead towing a 10-ton maraschino cherry, which will be dropped into the whipped cream for the cheering of 25,000 extras. All right, cue the mountain. Okay, 25,000 cheering extras. 
Now, you want to try that on television? Well... You see, radio is a very special medium because it stretches the imagination. Doesn't television stretch the imagination? Up to 21 inches, yes. Yeah. Uh, whiskey sour on the rocks, sir. Anything else? <laughs> well, hello, Mr. Dean. Oh, hello, George. You're looking well. I haven't seen you for a while. Stopping at some other airports lately? No, just very busy. Out of the country a lot. Oh, hey, uh, Sid, uh, who's the sharp-looking guy who just walked in? Him? That's Matt Dean. That's a swinger for you. Huh? Rich, plenty of dough, but regular. You know how some of these guys with a few bucks are? Well, not Dean, the real prince. Well, I've never seen him in a place before. He seems to know everybody here. What's he do? I don't know exactly. He manufactures airplanes or something. I think he's in a lot of businesses, you know, different things. Boy, he sure is a snappy dresser. I've known him for maybe 20, 25 years. Huh? Yeah, true. As long as I'm tending by here, I know him. He's always dressed to kill, too. Come on, are you kidding me? That guy ain't old enough for you to know him all them years. He's only about, what, 30 years old. Uh, that's what you think. He looks the same for all the time I know him. Never changes. Never gets old. You know, he, he uh, well, he must be pushing 60 or better. Well, are you kidding me? Now, look, why should I kid you? He's about 60, I'm telling you. I'm 62, and when I started here about 25 years ago, Dean and I were about the same age. You'd never think it now, just looking at the ball of this. Oh. I mean, I mean, I, I look broken down like what I am, but Dean, he he flies around, makes money, stays young, I guess. Some guys just got it, and some guys ain't. Well, Sid, how are you, hmm? Oh, hi, Mr. Dean. Haven't seen you in ages. How you been? <laughs> well, how do I look? Great, just great. Well, that's how I feel. Oh, uh, brandy, please. Brandy for Mr. Dean, Jack. Right. Hey, you got a new bartender with you, Sid? Yeah, I've been here a couple of months. Hey, uh, Mr. Dean, uh, you want anything uh, with us? No, oh, no, 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 thanks. Uh, you're the new man, hmm? Yes, sir, I've been here about three months now. I didn't realize I hadn't been here in so long. I've been traveling on business. Uh, what's your name? Uh, Jack. Oh, well, that's fine, Jack. I'm always around airports. know every airport, large or small in the world, and I like to know the names of the people on the job. Oh, I uh, guess you do a lot of flying, huh? Well, that's my life. Yes, I'm always flying all the time. That's the secret of my life. Uh, is it true, Mr. Dean? I hope you don't mind my asking, but Sid was saying when you came in that... Well, I... I <laughs> you mean that Sid said that I've been around longer than he has and I still look like his son? Yeah, yes, sir. That's uh, it exactly. <laughs> now, come on. Is, is that true? Yes, it sure is. I've been flying in and out of this airport for nearly 30 years now. <whistles> you know, you weren't even a twinkle when I started flying. Yeah. Well, I hope you don't mind my saying so. That. Man, that is really something. You, you don't look more than 30 years old. Well, I keep after it. I make sure I don't get caught up in this age race. Oh, Jack, how about another brandy? Huh? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Hey, uh, Mr. Dean. You mean, I, you got a secret staying young? Now, that's no secret, really, Jack. It's very simple. Well, how's that, Mr. Dean? Well, you see, Jack, the Earth is revolving counterclockwise at about a thousand miles an hour. Yeah, yeah, a thousand miles an hour right now? Mm-hmm, that may seem hard to believe, but it's true, all right. The Earth we're sitting on right now is traveling about a thousand miles an hour. Isn't yes, that something? Come well, on. anyway, as, look, as you travel west, if you go fast enough, say, a uh, thousand miles an hour, you stay right with the sun. Holy mackerel, kind of like uh, science fiction, huh? <laughs> yeah, kind of like science fiction. <laughs> there was one further step, Jack. Well, what's that? Well, I figured perhaps I could beat the sun by traveling faster than it does. What? You see what I mean? Faster than the sun. I bought an experimental jet which could fly at about 1,200 miles an hour. Now, of course, my plane, an FY630, can do about 2,100. Oh, that's really moving. Yep. And one morning, I took off at dawn from this very airstrip. When I got to California, I knew that I had time beaten forever. I was a half hour ahead of the dawn. It was two and a half hours after I started, but here it was earlier than when I started. 
I had lived through and yet saved two and a half hours of my life. Yeah, but um, how do you work it out when you get uh, fogged in or when a plane breaks down or something? Yeah, I've got it down to a science. I have planes at seven different airfields. I can fly to an airport, take off in another plane. You see, my planes are always in top condition. I have pilots working around the clock stationed at different airports. And you sure have thought of everything. And it actually works. I mean, uh, well, I mean, here you are, right? <laughs> right. I've been doing it right along for about 30 years. I don't even bother to count anymore. I have beaten time. Oh, I sleep and eat on the plane, land in some city, spend maybe an hour or so for business or fun, and I'm off again. Always going west. But uh, the most you can stay in any one place is about an hour, huh? Well, actually up to two hours. Then when we take off, we just fly straight through for several hours, and we're all caught up again. Boy, if I didn't see you here before me, I'd say it was incredible, Mr. Dean. <laughs> I know, it does sound incredible. Matter of fact, not too many people believe it, but here I am. Whatever the rule book says about it being impossible, I'm the living proof that it is not only possible, but that I am doing it. Well, I guess you really found the fountain of youth, Mr. Dean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you found Shangri-La. <laughs> right. That's the name of one of my planes, Shangri-La. How about that? Yeah, you're a right boy, Jack. I like that. Well, I'll see you next time I come in. Oh, uh, does this come my tab? It sure does, Mr. Dean. Thank you, sir. <laughs> right. Uh, so long, Sid. So long, Mr. Dean. Uh, so long, Jack. Hey, goodbye, Sid. T take it easy now. <laughs> All right, now, Stuart. Uh, this contract with Rollington is to be ignored. Let them think that we have absolutely no use for their company. Yes, sir. Uh, then when they come to us wondering why we haven't answered them, we'll be in a better position to dictate our terms. Sure. Well, fine, Mr. Dean. You're really convinced that they'll come to us and be concerned about our silence. Oh, yes, yes. I'm sure. But a million-dollar account, and they're not going to follow up? <laughs> I don't care how big they are. They'll come around, <laughs> and then... Pardon me, Mr. Dean. Oh, yes, yes. You wanted me to remind yourself when it was 145, sir. Oh, thank you. Good man, thanks. Uh, all right, gentlemen, I think that's it. Uh, uh, my chauffeur's waiting outside. I've cut my time a little close today so that we complete our discussions on this contract. Now I have to get back to the airport. Good day, gentlemen. Good day. All right, Louis. Let's make a beeline to the airport. Yes, sir. Watch out! Hey, the That crazy guy in the car yeah. right into the rear of that limousine. Hey, I missed it. You all right? You all right? Hey, what's going on? Look at his head. Come on. He's all cut. Help me up. Please. Louis, help me out. Hey, wait a minute. You want to stay there? Doctor sees you. Hey, look at his chest. Look, I, I haven't the time. Louis, Louis, help me out. You've got to get back to the airport. Quickly, Louis. All right, all right. Let me through. Stand back. Stand back. Give him air. You, uh, okay, mister? Yeah, yeah, I'm perfectly fine, officer. If you just help me into my car, I'll, I'll be even better. I've got to get to the airport. Oh, no, no. Now, wait a minute, mister. Your head. You may have a concussion. No, 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 no. You better stay where you are. Now, let, let me help you. Look, officer, I'm sure that there's a doctor at the airport. Yes. I can take care of it. Here, please just help me into my car, if you will. No, no, here comes the ambulance. Now, you better go to the no. hospital and have this thing no. taken care of. Now, look, officer, I can't go to the hospital. I've got to get to the airport. But, look, I must take off right away. I haven't time for the hospital. I must keep up with my schedule. Now, I must leave. By the way, Louis, yes. Louis, tell them. Now, help me. I must get to the plane before it's too late. Look, call Stuart and tell him what's happened. <laughs> But I tell you, I don't want to go to the hospital. You get your hands off me, officer. Look, I have got to get to that airport right now. Just let go of me. Now, take it easy, mister. You're getting hysterical. Take it now, easy. Take it easy. Look, you yeah. just get your hands off me. Now, let go of me. Now, you'll be all right, mister. You'll Look, be in the officer, hospital officer, in a minute. I have got to get to the airport. Now, let me out of here. Let go of me, I tell you. <laughs> Once you get to the hospital, Look, you'll be, you'll be okay. Hospital, will you let go of me? Let go of me. Hold him, somebody. All right, it's hilarious. Here you are. Bring this stretcher. Will you please let, let me out of here? I've got to get out of here immediately. Don't you understand? You have no right to keep me You'll here. You'll have to be quiet, sir. There are other patients Look, here. Look, I don't give a hang who's here. I want to get out of here immediately. Now, I must. Doctor... I demand to see the person in charge of this hospital. Well, now, if you... Hello? Yes, he's here. It's for you, Mr. Dean. Don't get upset and don't talk too long. Hello. Hello, Stuart. 
I'm glad you got my message. Now, listen, they're holding me here at the emergency hospital. I was knocked down by a car as I was leaving the restaurant. No, 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 no. There's nothing more than a bump on the head. Well, Stuart, I have got to get out of here. You know how important it is to me. Well, come on down here and sign me out immediately. Well, all right, then call my lawyer and tell him to get on this and get me out of here, but quickly. Now, look, Stuart, I don't care if it's habeas corpus, corpus delicti, or whatever it is. I don't care what it costs, either. Then get 20 men if you must. And call Jess Waters down at the mayor's office, right. And call Victor at police headquarters. I want out of here right now, do you understand? All right, then hurry, hurry. Orderly, that fellow over there, keep your eye on him. Right. He may have a concussion. He's reacting yes. strangely. If yes. Yes. File and call me. All right. Yes, sir. All right. Now, get the mayor himself if you must. I've got to get out of here right away. I am desperate. Oh, Orderly. Sir. Orderly, come here a minute, will you? Yes, sir. Uh, Orderly, listen to me. I am Martin Dean. Now, perhaps you've heard of me. I own Dean Industries. Now, uh, listen to me. I know what I'm saying might sound absurd, but it is true. Now, you might have read about me in Newstime magazine. I fly from east to west, faster than the sun. Yes, now, sir, now, just I a minute, just a minute. I don't have time to explain it all, but I must leave. I must get on my plane. Now, time is precious to me, do you understand? I have found a way to stay young, and I want to be young. Look. I am not young, despite my appearance. I have to fight to stay this way. Do you understand what I am saying? I am fighting for time. Time to live. Time to, Sir, to be I alive. Can't... Will you listen to me? Now, please, please, just try and understand. Help me. I must leave by 2.45. Now, now, look, look. Just look at that clock. It is now 2.15. Where's the phone? Where's my lawyer? I, I must leave. I must get out of here. Don't you understand? I'll start to age if I don't. The doctor. Doctor, come here. Doctor. Yes, doctor. I am Martin Dean, doctor. Martin Dean. The man in Newstime magazine. Now, you've got to get me out of here, doctor. I'll make it well worth your while, doctor. I'll give you $1,000, $10,000. Just get me out of here. I have beaten time for 30 years. If it catches me now. Don't you understand? I have got to get out of here. Doctor. Where's Stuart? Where is my lawyer? Where is Stuart? to take off by 2.45. I've got to get away. I'll never be able to make up the time if I don't... Stuart! 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 Come here! Here I am! Quickly! Stuart, get me out of here. Mr. Dean, I rushed right over as fast as I could. Now, now, look, Stuart, just tell them who I am, pay them anything they want. Just get me out of here. Right away, Mr. Dean. Just be calm, Mr. Dean. Be calm? How can I be calm when these fools have kept me here 45 minutes already? Get going, man! Get going! I have Uh, got to get out of here. uh, 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 Right away, Mr. Dean. Right away. Doctor. Yes. Doctor, my name is Roger Stewart. I'm executive vice president of Dean Industries. Mr. Stewart, is this fellow really Martin Dean? Certainly. Now, I don't know what happened, but I've got to get him out of here immediately. Well, what's all this nonsense about beating time and time catching up and all that? I admit it sounds incredible, but this man has seemingly beaten time. At least he's not grown old in 30 years. What? Mr. Dean is 62 years old. 62? Well, I haven't given him a thorough physical, but from what I've seen, Mr. Dean has the constitution of a 30-year-old man. Doctor, here are his papers, identifications, passports. He is actually 62, you see. It's incredible. Just incredible. How does he do it? Well, Doctor, we have no time to discuss it now. Now, I must get him out of here immediately, or... Don't you understand? Time will start catching up to him. Oh, not you, too. That's what he's babbling about. Stuart! Stuart! What's going on here, man? Um, uh, Stuart, are we going to get out of here now, or aren't we? Just be calm. I can't stay here any longer. Now get me out of here and All quickly. right, All right, be calm. Be calm. Be calm. Please, please, please Stuart. Mr. Dean. Stuart, we'll be ready have, in a second. Have you gone back, man? How can I be calm? Look at that clock on the wall. Now get me out of here right now. I demand it right now. Quick. Mr. Dean, I am making the arrangements, sir. Now, please. Just just, just another moment. I don't have another moment. Do you understand? I want to ask now. Doctor, doctor, please. Can Mr. Dean be released? Well, Look, it is, it is most urgent. I, I assure I you. I am only keeping Mr. Dean here to protect him from any residual doctor, effects of apparent shock. Look, I, I will take the responsibility. Doctor, I have a car outside. I, I have a doctor waiting for him at the airport. Don't you understand? All right, Mr. Stewart. If you want to take him out of the hospital now, I'll release him. Good. 
Well, you'll have to sign some papers. A nurse, uh, would you please get me a relief? A release? Oh. A release? Oh, Are you crazy, doctor? You take me for a fool, oh, doctor? Please, please. Now, look, now listen to me. Here you're told I have to take off from the airport in 15 minutes. 15 minutes, doctor, 15! I'll never be able to make it, even if we walk out this instant, do you understand? And do you want me to sign papers, doctor? Papers? Oh, just a what formality. papers? <laughs> this is my life that's slipping past. Time! Time! Look at the time, you fool! Look at that time! It's too late! You've got it! Now, Mr. Bright, you've got it. too late! It's too late, I tell you! I ought to kill you! I ought to kill you! Be careful! Be careful! Put that straight jacket on him! What are you doing? I've got him here! Get this off! Hold on! Hold those arms! I've got it! Fools! Get this thing off me! Stuart! Stuart! What are you standing there for? Get this thing off me. Get them away. Get away. Stay away. Let me get my hands. See. Look. Look at the time. Look. It's after 245. It's too late. You've made me lose. I can feel time. It's caught up with me. Look. Look at me. I'm getting old. I can feel it. I, I can. You've done this to me. All of you. I'll not forget. I'll kill you all. I'll kill you all of you. Martin, Dean, never forget. I'll kill you all of you. Mr. Stewart, I imagine you can see for yourself. Well, Mr. Dean has had a psychic breakdown. I think it's been induced by shock and fright. What are you going to do? I'm going to have him hospitalized. It may be at least six months before he can leave. Six months? Well, he'll never stand for that. I'm afraid he'll have to. He doesn't have any choice. I can't release a maniac into the street. Mr. Dean, you can't leave right now. No. I've got to leave. I've got to leave. Yes. I'll kill you. I'll kill you all. You're jealous. You're just jealous of me. You're robbing me of my own. Come uh, orderly, yes, sir. Take him to the security oh, room. Robbie, yes, sir, right away. Let, go on, Let me go with him, doctor. Maybe I can calm him. No, he wouldn't recognize you. His mind is snap, poor fellow. The idea of growing old was too much for him. I doubt if he'll ever recover from his shock. Probably he'll never know who he is or where he is. Much less how old he is. <laughs> Presented World Enough and Time, written by John Nicholas Iannuzzi and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Donald Buca, George Petrie, George Baxter, Jackie Grimes, and Frank Thomas. Audio engineer Neil Pulse. Sound technician Ed Blaney. Script editor Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlostopsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Austin. <laughs> Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. Theater 5 presents Fog.
way. Miles. Can't reach it. Can't get to it. Where is it? Try to remember. The dresser. Huh? Where? You put it there last night. Why? So that you'd have to get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. But why? It's Saturday. Harry. Harry. He's coming to pick up Anne. All this fog. Let me get up. Help me. Get up. Oh, how many of those pills did you take? Oh. Mom, can I come in? Uh, what? Oh, yes. Oh, oh, Anne, must you slam the door, darling? I'm sorry, Mommy. I've been waiting for Daddy. When will he get here? I don't know. He's taking me to the country. Now, don't get so excited or you'll bring on one of your headaches. I don't care. Well, I do. It's agony. I got a little one already. Oh, for heaven's sake, don't let it get worse. Oh, you'll have to take those tablets with you. Are you sleepy? Terribly. Tell Mrs. Raines I'd like some coffee. Why are you sleepy? Hand me my robe, please. Mommy, why are you so sleepy? Because I'm tired, Anne. I'm tired. Oh, why do you have to ask so many questions? Sorry? Now, will you ask Mrs. Raines for the coffee, please? Oh! I shouldn't have snapped at her. But why does she have to know everything about me? my life with a child. Oh, what's happening to this generation? The doctor said those headaches of hers were migraine. That's ridiculous, a child her age. Harry will be annoyed, too, if she has one today. Oh, my head feels as though it were stuffed with cotton. Why can't I wake up? Oh, good morning, Mrs. Raines. Good morning. I brought the coffee. I thought you might need it. Oh, yes. Is there anything else I could do to help? No, thank you. Very well. She is the most insinuating woman. Oh. Oh, I, I've got to take something for this. I. Uh, where is that benzedrine? I had to have some here someplace. Oh, here. Uh, Better take two. Oh, you look awful. What did those sleeping pills do to your eyes? Oh, some eyes would help. Maybe there's some cubes in the bucket left from last night. Uh, th th just a minute. That was last night. Well, of course it was last night. Well, who was here? Al Kemble. We talked about publicity for his book. What time did he go home? Oh, good grief, he did go home, didn't he? Anne, Anne! Yes, Mommy? Are you alone, dear? Mrs. Raines is here. All right, all right, it's nothing. You can never tell about Al. Let's see, uh, what was I doing? Oh, 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 ice, ice. I think we left the bucket in the... Uh, uh, oh, it's just over here. No, uh, that's enough. Look at your handshake. Get that benzedrine. Well, who left this? A full glass of liquor. <laughs> oh, after all, it isn't as though you were pouring a fresh one and you've got to do something about your hands. Oh, but don't drink it here. Now, why do I have to hide things in my own house? If I need something to pull me out of this, it's my business, isn't it? There. Let them try to get in now. I wish I could get rid of that Mrs. Raines. I've got to have somebody to take care of Anne. She's such an austere woman. She lies about me, too. 
I'm going to splash some water on my face. That's better. Now that that pep-up pill. Well, have a drink. That'll help. Mommy? Uh, Yes? I've got a headache. Can I have a pill? Oh, just a minute. Just... I better pour this drink in the sink. Uh, Just a minute. Come in, dear. I'll find them. They're, they're in a white box. Yes, yes, I know. Honey, why is there ice in the sink? Ice? Uh-huh. Did you have a drink? Certainly not. Then what's it for? It's for complexion, Anne. Ice is very good for your skin. It tightens the tissues. Oh. Oh, gee, Mommy. I hope I grow up to be as pretty as you. Mm-hmm. Here. T- take this. All right. And remind me to give you the box when you leave, hmm? Mommy? Hmm? Will you and Daddy ever get married again? No. Why? Questions. Questions. Over and over. Because, my dear child, we hate each other. No, it isn't that. It isn't hate. It's just nothing. So much of everything turns into nothing. Why? We had something in the beginning... I think. Didn't we? Donna? Oh, well, Harry, you startled me. Let's get away from here, shall we? Well, aren't you the naughty one? You'll never know standing here. Oh, I know, all right. Something happens whenever I'm near you. I don't understand it. Do you have to? I guess not. I just know you make me go limp. Sounds promising. But it makes me feel like a fool. Well, let's just see how foolish you can be. Oh, Harry. Will you marry me? Well, now that's really foolish. No, no, it's elementary. Every stout-hearted man in that room wants you. And so do I. But not to share. I'm selfish. <laughs> I'm glad. Will you? Yes. Let's go now. All right. I wonder how late Al stayed last night. It's an awfully good book he's written. He's a talented man. I should have known that a long time ago. Oh, why did I throw that drink away? My head feels like a block of granite. Well, what are you going to do about it? Let a child and a housekeeper intimidate you. This is your house. If a drink is what you want, then get a drink openly. Don't pick up the dregs of last night. I know where I can get one, too. There's a bottle behind the towels in the linen closet. I put it there when Mrs. Raines wasn't looking. (laughs) Has she taken it away? Oh, no, here it is. Well, drink it here and put it back quickly. Mommy! Don't come upstairs! What is it? Harry's here. Harry's here. Hello, Cotton. How are you? Uh, Harry? Is that you? Hello, Donna. Got a kiss for me, beautiful? Always. She almost makes my day begin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Listen to him. <laughs> but it's a beautiful day for the country. You know, Button, she hasn't changed in ten years. Mm, prettier. Gee, Daddy, if you both feel that way, why'd you get divorced? Go get your prescription, Anne. All right. Has she got another headache? Oh, it isn't bad. Well, how can that child have migraines? I don't know. The doctor says it might be emotional. But for heaven's sake, what problems could she have? I give her everything. I know. You're not bad with her. Well, anyway, just be sure she gets one of the tablets every two hours. Uh, You may have to give her more. The doctor said as many as three in an hour if she really needed them. I'm ready. All right, Button, we're off. Bye, Mom. Bye, dear. Oh. How did I live through that with this temple in my head? I wonder if you saw my hands. I kept them in the pockets of my robe. If I could 
Just get Mrs. Raines out of here. I could sit down to a civilized drink and collect myself. What do you mean, if? It's your house, isn't it? Uh, Mrs. Raines? Yes? Did you call? Uh, yes, uh, there's really nothing to do here with Anne gone today. Why don't you take the day off? Oh, well, well thank you. That would be nice. I'm going up to dress. Now, where's that bottle? Ah, here it is. Has she gone? Oh, thank heaven. to do something. Her hands are still shaking. <clears throat> One more. If that doesn't work, you'd better take another phenol barb and go back to bed. Sleep it off. Going in circles, you know that. Wait. Somebody's coming this afternoon. Who? Brilliant short stories. Well, I know what kind of stories she writes. Well, I don't need them. I don't need him. I don't need anybody. <laughs> oh, Donna, come on, come on. Maybe we better have some coffee. And then, for heaven's sake, take a sleeping pill and wake up new again, will you? <laughs> Dr. Werner. She was supposed to have seen you this morning? Oh, for heaven's sake, it completely slipped my mind. <laughs> well, she was feeling so well, I sent her off for the weekend. Well, yes, she had a slight one, but uh, she's just a child. What could a psychiatrist do for her? For me? Dr. Werner, I'm a hard-working woman, and what I choose to do is my business. Goodbye. What is the matter with that man? I'm not his patient. And what an absurd thing to say. Now, where are those sleeping pills? With everything closing in, I've got to calm down. I've just got to. And I better take two. Well, it's just as well you didn't get dressed. You can lie down and rest till five. And then have a martini. Oh, those drinks have given me a headache. Psychiatrist. I'm overworked, that's all. I'm nervous. By incompetent whether I drink or not. Besides, everybody in the office drinks. No, maybe not in the morning, but I never did either until weekends are the worst. I seem to lose control when I'm alone. Oh, oh why don't those pills work? I'm not even drowsy. Maybe another drink would help. Oh, don't get up so suddenly. That, that hammering. I better take another instead. Where are they? Well, these aren't my... Oh, no. These are Anne's migraine tablets. She's got the sleeping pills. If she takes that many... Where did they go, did he say? I asked Anne. Oh, Donna, you fool, try to remember. Where did she say they were going? Oh, come on, get out of this fog. Where? Where did they go? Anne's diary. Maybe that'll say. It's in her room. Oh, where did that go? Where is it? Where is it? I've got a... Oh, here it is. Wednesday, Friday, Friday, Saturday. Mommy was up late last night. She didn't kiss me. I'm going with Daddy today. But where, Anne? Where? Where? I've got to go back and get a drink. Uh, 
I, I've got to think. I, I've got to remember. Here it is. One drink will be... The doctor. Call him. Find out about Ann. Find out about Ann. Just phone here. One, two, three, four. Yeah. Hello? Do- Dr. Werner. This is Ann's mother. I... I'm sorry about hanging up, but I need some information. My little girl, she may have taken some sleeping pills. Oh, I don't know how many. Five, six, or seven, or what? What? Oh, no. No, could it? Could it? Could... Thank you. <laughs> what time is it? Did, did, did I sleep? Is it still morning? <laughs> Come on, I've got to wake up. I've got to... Now, where did I leave that drink? How could I miss Brace till I left the place? Here, here. I, I need this to steady my, my nerves. Wait a minute. What if you black out? What will happen to Anne? What will happen to Anne? You can't have another drink! Stop it, Donna! You revolt me! That's the best thing you've done all day. Now, try to think clearly. In the first place... Harry would call if she'd taken any. He'd know something was wrong. But suppose he thought she was only sleepy. Or that the headache was doing it. Would he give her more? Oh, yes, 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 he might. And she'd try not to show it. She loves Harry so she wouldn't want to miss the weekend. <laughs> oh, maybe that's... Maybe that's... <laughs> Hello? Hello? Oh, please get off the phone, Al. I can't talk to you. I've got to keep the light open. No, I can't see her. I can't see anyone. Now, will you please get off this phone? Oh, dear heaven. Oh, dear. Mrs. Raines. Her number's right here. Let's call her. She might know where they went. I... Six. Harry <laughs> may have told her where they were going. Maybe Anne did. Oh, oh please, Anne, sir. Mrs. Raines. Please, Mrs. Raines. I need you. Please answer, Mrs. Raines. Oh. Police. Police, I, I, I've got to go to them. But what can they do? Oh, never mind. You need help. They could stop cars, broadcast a description, call other police. And I... Oh, maybe. Uh, yes? Hospital? Hospital? Anne? Anne? Yeah. What about her? Oh, no! 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 Clock. Is it clock? Where is it? Far away, miles. Can't reach it. Can't get to it. Why? Don't you remember? You put it on the dresser last night so you'd have to get up. Harry's coming for Anne. Anne. Oh, thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Yes, I, I, I did. Oh, Anne, come here, come here, come here. Presented Fog, written by Richard McCracken and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Vicki Bola, Evelyn Juster, Mary Michael, and Stan Watt. Audio engineer, Marty Folia. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastovsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Otter. 
Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. has been an ABC Radio Network production. Please, you've got to get off this phone. I've got to make an emergency call. Look, if I don't get help soon, he'll die. Answer me, somebody. Please, answer me. <laughs> Presents Bug Off. Bella, be a good guy and get to sleep, will you? Okay? Oh, Fred, I, I still don't like the idea of leaving him. He's got a nasty cough. Oh, come I... on, Pat. Knock it off, will you? Cindy will call us uh... if he gets a fever or anything like that. We can be home in half an hour. That's what you've got to sit her for. I know, but she's only a high school kid, not a mother. Oh, being a high school kid, she certainly knows how to use a phone. She'll hear you. I doubt it. Exactly what I mean. I don't think much of anything gets through to that cloud she's on half the time. She's got a good imagination, that's all. Good? Oh, it's terrifying. Look, we've had her before. Get your coat, let's go. Oh, Fred, I what don't do you want know. Me I to just do? don't. What do you want me to do? Call up the boss, tell him Jojo didn't eat his cereal today, and hardly touched his milk. We're staying home. Hmm? Well, all right. Oh, Cindy will be right in the living room, Jojo. If you need her, just call real loud, right? Good night, old buddy. Nighty night, darling. Night, night. Cindy? Uh, yes, Mrs. Edstrom? Uh, Jojo isn't feeling very well. It's a little cold. So if there's anything at all, call us. I'll put the number in the kitchen next to the phone. I don't think we'll be terribly late. Oh, that's okay. I got heaps of homework. Yes, that's quite a formidable pile of books. But, jeeps, I can't find my assignment book. Oh, gosh, I bet it's in my coat pocket. Where's your coat? Oh, I left it someplace. Jim, I think. You see, we were climbing this mountain, mm -hmm. and there was an avalanche. A, uh, mountain? Yes. I mean, well, no. I, I guess it wasn't a mountain, really. We were doing some things on a rope, but... <laughs> What's exciting about climbing a rope? Well, be sure to check him every once in a while, Cindy. Feel his forehead, and if it seems warm... Come on, oh, Pat. Cindy will call us if there's any oh, problem. Ed. I sure will. But don't you worry, Mrs. Edstrom. I'll take good care of him. You, you just have a good time. Now, don't forget what you're here for, Cindy. Don't start thinking about other things. Oh, I won't. As soon as I get my assignment, I got homework, and... Mom says that's the only thing that keeps me grounded. <laughs> yes, well. Come on, honey. We're going to be late. I don't want to be the only guy missing when they yell happy birthday. It's the boss, you know? All right. Goodbye, Cindy. We'll see you. Good night. Lock the doors after us. Way out here in the country like this, I never feel... I, I will. On. I will. Hi, Jojo. Hi. Oh, poor little fella. Don't feel so good, huh? It hurts. Oh, hurts where? Here. You mean when you breathe? <laughs> well, now, looky here. 
I am going to wave my magic wand. Oh, oh, I left it at home. But you know what? My hand is just as good. There. All the pain is gone. It doesn't hurt anymore. Like Cindy? Oh, no. Now, you go to sleep. As soon as I've found out what my assignment is, I'll be right in the living room doing homework. Yell if you need me. Night. that phone? Well, you are not going to like this, but... Hello? Hello? The phone is in use right now. Yeah, bug off. L- look, this is an emergency. Will you please hang up? Cindy, is that you? Hey, who's Cindy? Cindy Merrill. We're on the same party line. What do you want, Cindy? I need the phone. Too much, doll. You can have this wire after we sign off. Carol... I'm at the Edstrom's babysitting, and I, and listen, I think I hear someone walking around outside. Oh yeah, like the time your dog was having fits, or the time. Please, Carol, it'll only take a minute, and well, golly, you know how creepy it can get out here, and I really do hear someone walking around. Okay. All right, hang up, Flip. I'll call you back. Okay. Oh, thanks, Carol. Well, hurry, huh? Well, good luck. Hello? Hi, Kathy. Oh, hi, Cindy. Listen, I'm babysitting for the Edstroms, and I forgot my assignment book. What's lit and math? Uh, just a sec. Okay. I'm working on it, too. Um, here. In lit, we're supposed to read the short story that starts on page 47 and write a synopsis. 47. Math, uh, page 14, mm-hmm. section A, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Section B, 1 and 2. Hi, Sandy. Who's that? Carol Dunlap. Oh. Hi, Carol. Kathy? Yeah, hi. Cindy, tell you about the prowler. What prowler? Oh, there's somebody sneaking around outside the extra. At least somebody sneaky. Well, I had to say something. You get on that phone and you think it's yours. You didn't have to lie to me. Oh, no. You and that think. He's not a think. Just because you had I say something wrong, Cindy? No. Everyone knows Carol's a phone hog. I gave it up, didn't I? Only because you were scared not to. Well, just don't ask me to again. Not ever. Listen, you wouldn't stay on the phone like that if your folks were home. You know, somebody ought to tell them. Somebody ought to tell your folks what a liar you are. I am not a liar. Oh, no. They say you're imaginative. That's what they call it. Anybody else would be a liar. Don't listen to her, Cindy. You got the assignment? Yeah, thanks, Kath. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Goodbye, Carol. Goodbye, Kathy. Goodbye, Sandy. Boy. I'll get this blanket off. Oh, here, sweetheart, let me hold you. That's a good boy. Let me feel your head. Mommy. Oh, my. Oh, don't you worry, honey. I'll get your mommy. Jojo, please. Now, now let me go. Lie down, honey. Please, don't hold on like that. I've got to go phone your mom. Jojo, no, honey, let's go. There, there, there. 
Now, you just lie down. I'll be right back. So I said, look, man, if you think look, that's uh, much... Carol, stuff, you should... I-, I need the phone. It's an emergency. Cindy, you sure got your nerve. I'll say that for you. Please, Carol, it, it is an emergency. Are you kidding? Come on, bug off. Yes, we gave it to you once. But it's Jojo. He's got a temperature, and, he, and he's like all, all choked up inside. Me too. Gulp, gulp, all choked up. I am not kidding. This is for real. Oh, you wouldn't know what was real if it came up and punched you in the nose. So bug off, doll. You've had it. Just ignore her, Flip. But I've got to get help. Please. Carol. Flip. He's got a temperature. Mrs. Edstrom wouldn't go off and leave Jojo if he was sick, especially with you. The Edstroms must think I'm okay. They asked me to sit for them. But they asked me first. <laughs> what a guess. <laughs> Sorry if that hurts your feelings, Cindy, but that's the fact of the matter. I don't care about that, Carol. Just let me use the phone, please. Say yes, uh, pretty please. Pretty please. No. Pretty, no. Hey, Ruth, you ever hear this story about the boy broadcasting wolf all over the joint? Hmm? Wolf! Hey, wolf! Everybody came running. See? Chuck, 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 chuck. Where's the wolf, boy? And then the boy would howl. Man, oh, man, how he'd howl. <laughs> oh. When you get through laughing, I know the story. Okay, then wise up, dog. Quit yelling wolf. I'm sorry, I I won't do it again, but, but this time I really mean it. Oh, you always mean it. Carol, on my word of honor. Bug off, doll, you've had it. I can't. Oh, please, please, Carol. Just ignore her, Flip. Now, what were we talking about? Now, let me see. Uh, oh, yeah, the game. Oh, yeah. Well, like I was saying, if our team can win Saturday, that means... You'll be sorry. Tomorrow. You'll oh. be sorry. Oh, what am I going to do? Uh... <laughs> Here, Jojo. Let me hold you up. It's more comfortable this way, honey. There. Better? Oh, you're just burning up. Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's better when you're lying down. Oh, I don't know. I I just don't know. Well, about Saturday's game, Flint. You have got to get off the phone, Carol. He can't breathe. Now, look, Rube, you're beginning to make me mad. I don't care, Carol. Listen, he's just a baby, and he can't keep struggling for breath like that. I've got to get help. Well, who's stopping you? Go get it. I can't leave him that long. It's over a mile to the Carlsons, and they're the nearest. By the time I got back... Yeah, and maybe she wouldn't even get back. After all, there's a prowler outside, you know. I told you I'm sorry about that, but this is for real. Can't you tell when something's for real? Sure, we can, but can you? Now, come on now. Bug off, will you? You... You murderer! Oh, just ignore her, Flip. She just isn't here, that's all. Okay. Carol! Wait, wait. Will you call the Edstroms? Oh, me? Yes. I'll give you the number and hang up, and then you could call. Well, what'll I tell them? Carol, are you going to fall for that old gag? Once we hang oh, up... Oh, you she's keep out of this flip. Please, Carol. Sorry. You had your chance and muffed it. Oh, boy. You'll regret this, both of you, to your dying day. Hey, did anybody ever tell you? You 
want to be on TV. Yeah, like I said, Dreamville. <laughs> Joe, honey. Here, let, let me raise you a bit. A dry bed. Maybe if I got another pillow. No, no, darling. I won't leave you, honey. Listen, if anything happens, it'll be your fault. I think he's dying. Do you hear me? me. I, I got another one here. Now, the way you hit his skins on this one, and the guy on the stick, groovy their way out. I know you hear me. Same combo? No, it's, uh, well, you, wait, you Hello? Let's see if you can fathom it. Hello? Can you hear me? Okay, but hold it a sec while I get a Coke. Oh, sure. Flip? Can you hear me, Flip? Oh, you're just doing this to be mean, aren't you? Teasing me. You think I'm kidding about this, but I am not. He's a sick little boy, and I, I've got to get help. Oh, please, Flip, just hang up. Carol will hang up when she finds out you have. Flip. Oh, thank you. Please, please, now. Now, just hang up before Carol gets back. Listen, it'll only take a, a minute for me to phone, and I'll tell her to call you right back. Oh, gee whiz, Cindy. You wouldn't want to be responsible for anything happening to a little kid, would you? Oh, heck no. He could die, he's so sick. If you just saw him. Gosh, it's too bad we, we don't have phone vision. I mean, you could bring him to the phone, and then we could see for ourselves. Well... Would you just take my word for it, okay? Well... Oh, please, please. Well... Okay. Uh, tell Carol to call me right back. Oh, thank you, Flip. I will. I will. Okay, Flip. Spin it. Flip hung up, Carol. He wants me to make the call. Okay, and... Carol doll. Here goes. Flip! You said you'd hang up. You promised. Oh, you, oh, you terrible, terrible people. <laughs> They're beasts, both of them. Beasts, beasts. Oh, let me wipe your forehead again, honey. There. Does that feel better? Maybe... Maybe if I held you. Here now. Up we go. A little boy prince. That's what you are. And you know what? I'm a gypsy princess with magic powers so great. Why, why just by holding you, I can protect you from... No. No, that's a lie, Jojo. Like everything. I didn't climb a mountain today. And yesterday, I wasn't a movie star. As for magic, I don't even know how to spell abracadabra. Well, why do I do it? Oh, golly, the blanket's off your feet. There. If I hadn't lied in the first place, they'd, they'd have let me use the phone. <coughs> That's it, Jojo. Well, now, into bed, honey. And just, please... Just don't stop breathing. I'll be right back. <laughs> I haven't heard that one before. Uh-oh, she's back again. Yeah, so I hear. Hi, you guys. Hi. Boy, are you a couple of hardheads? What do you mean? You don't give up the phone no matter what. Yeah. How's the patient? Who? Jojo. Oh, he's okay. Oh, got well pretty fast, didn't he? Yeah. 
Did Ben Casey know about you? Oh, I was only kidding. Yeah, well, you ought to stop that kind of stuff. You're going to get in trouble someday. You know, honest truth, I think you ought to be in the movies. Oh, please, please, he's dying. <laughs> man, oh, man. No kidding, you know, you ought to be an actress. <laughs> Maybe I will someday. Well, what do you want this time? Well, you know, when I called Kathy before about the assignment, I forgot to write down the page number. Is that all? Yeah. C- could I call her back? Oh, Cindy, you're too much. Well, you know old Tracy. What a monster she is when you don't do your homework. Oh, go ahead. Flip? Okay. I'll call you back in five minutes. Thanks. You know you're sure a pest. Wait till the next time you're talking to somebody. Hello? I'd like to speak to Mrs. Edstrom, please. Oh, please hurry. Oh, please be there. Hello? Oh, Mrs. Edstrom. Presented Bug Off, written by Marquita Fisher, produced and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Bernard Grant, Rosemary Rice, Evelyn Juster, Donald Buca, Jimsy Summers, and Cecil Roy. Audio engineer, Marty Folia. Step right up, friends. Step in just a little closer. It's the Wheel of Fortune, friends. Everybody plays and everybody wins. Step right up and put your money down on the number of your choice. The Wheel of Fortune is spinning, friends, and it stops the number. Let me see the lucky number is... The other five present The Flea Circus. I'm really dead. Okay, kids, grab the machines. Ever been on that roller coaster? I'm trying to get off of it. Well, see you when the kids want more. Step right up, folks. Come in and see little Muska, the only known octogenarian measuring three feet one and eight. What a return. Hiya, kid. How you making out? Listen, what are you doing here, Kenny? You shouldn't be coming around all the time. Joe saw you. Oh, he's way down the back of the shooting gallery. He could see you coming across. Stupid jerk wouldn't know what I was doing anyway. How'd you make out? I... I can't talk about it now. Why? Well, somebody could hear. With all that's going on? Listen, will you get back to the hot dog stand? I'll tell you later. Now, come on, Amy. Talk, will you? Did you see him? Well, I... 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 
I did like we planned. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw the same insurance guy that comes to the house. And I told him my husband was, was, you know, kind of funny about his insurance. And I was worried. Him working that suit and gallery and all. Yeah, yeah. And? And I guess a lot of guys are funny about insurance because he thought it was natural, me asking. Anyway, he says not to worry that Joe was all paid up. Oh, good deal. I guess he took it for granted. I knew how much me being the beneficiary or whatever that is they call it. Because he said 10000 don't go far these days. 10000 Oh, it's a lot. Yeah, it'll go far enough for us. So, so that's it, Kenny? Yeah, yeah. Okay, kid, the rest of it's up to me. Uh, so long. Wait, man. wait a minute. What? Please, not too soon, Kenny. Listen, we got to wait a while. What for? Because it'll look funny if something happens right after I've been here. Well, like you said, accidents happen all the time. But Kenny, we can't just do Take it. Take it easy. I got it all worked out. This time we get a real big crowd, see? I lift one of the rifles and take it to the dog stand. I've been watching. I can get a beat on it from the kitchen. Yeah, but suppose something goes wrong. What goes wrong? I, I get the rifle back before anybody knows what happened. Now, besides, who's going to think I shot my buddy? Stupid jerk. Look, a place like this, there's always accidents. I'll take you and me. Like we got drowned in the tunnel of love. You know? Kenny, are you crazy? <laughs> Come on, you can't do that here. Okay, kid, later. Go on, go on, get out of here. He's coming. Well, I gotta say hello to my buddy. <laughs> oh, Mr. Feet, Kenny. What are you all the time taking my change for? I can't run this joint without dimes. Oh, hi, Joe. Hi, Amy. How do you like that, Joe? Five bucks I give her for 450 change. She got a squawk? Yeah. <laughs> Not where I stand. Hey, the boss take over the gallery? Yeah, yeah, I need a break. I'll uh, take care of yourself, Joe. Where you been, Amy? When? Before. I, I come looking for you, but Alice... Now, been... listen. Are you going to yell at me, too? Don't I take enough from that phony blonde without you? Well, I ain't yelling, Amy. Well, where do you think I was? <laughs> like at the Ritz with my boyfriend? Ah, uh, don't talk like now that. Now you listen to me. Kid, I was worried about you. You know the kind of guys around here. <laughs> I ought to know. I'm so worried. Why don't you get me away from the noise of that gallery? It is driving me nuts. I'm saving dough. You know that. Sure. For what? <laughs> a happy concession? I could sell them on the roller coaster, huh? What are you so shot about? What? You're like all nerves. Shot. Oh, I, I... I'm tired. Listen, Amy. It used to be different with us, remember? Yeah. I was a kid. And anything was better than being home. Look, uh, this is is why I was looking for you before. What is it? Well, I kind of like forgot your birthday, you know. Oh, Joey, it's a bracelet. Maybe I'm a dope thinking so much about the future. You know, I want kids, but. Well, maybe today's important. Gee, it's... It's real pretty, Joe. Thanks. You got a smile for me? Sure, Joe. Gee, I... I'm sorry. I only wish them stones was real. Well, someday... Yeah, Joe. Someday. Hey, Joe! Joe! Come on! Well, there's old Bullets Murphy again... I got to get back. Uh, I'll see you, baby. see the most stupendous exhibition of Egyptian dancers. It's the jelly roll. Come in, come in, come in. The Isis and Osiris. All you do is fight. All right, you guys. Step up and win your doll. Knock off the pins and win the doll. Knock them off, you got the doll. Come on, come on, win the doll. Hey, give me another dollar of dimes, huh? Oh, uh, yeah. Hey, uh, that's only 90. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Kids are going nuts, shooting it out with that automatic gunslinger. Yeah, well, tell him he could kill him. Huh? Stop! Stop! What's the matter? <clears throat> Nothing, it's just the rifles. There's a mob around here, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's crowded. Hey, uh, what time are the fireworks? Oh, I don't know. Pretty soon. Well, save me some time. Sure. See that gas is high and neutral before you leave bullets and spit fire. Come on, come on, come on. Get your ticket here. Right here. Amy. Oh. Oh. What's the matter? 
You scared me. You better get hold of yourself. What do you want? I'm keeping you posted. It's a big mob. Looks like maybe tonight. No. No, Kenny, no. We listen. never had such a crowd. When them fireworks begin, you could start a war and nobody would know. No, no, Kenny, please. Listen, I changed my mind. What? I don't want to be in on it. It's dangerous. Besides, we can't do that to Joe. We already heard him enough of being you. So forget it. He don't. Yeah, but, but I'm worried about afterwards. Look, I get rattled, Kenny. Now, you know that. Oh. Listen, please, listen to me. I don't answer questions good. I get all cold inside. You know, like that time that you lifted the wallet. Remember? I, I didn't know what to say. We could have both went to jail. Just leave it to me, will you? No, no, Kenny, no. This ain't just stealing. It's killing. Oh. Listen, you, you know what it says about that? If it's on your soul, I don't want it on my soul. Yes, so I'll buy you a new one when we get the dough. No, don't talk that way. You know what it could get you? Fire. When you're dead, you could live in fire, Kenny. Dead, you don't live nowhere. How do you know? I don't even care. What do I got to know? But it could be forever, Kenny. <laughs> you want it like that forever? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Come on, kid. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Look, we, we got each other, right? I guess. You want to be with me, don't you? Sure, I do. Can you? You know that. How much? You know how much. Oh, come on. You said it better last night. You know how much. All right. You want me to say it here? Okay. I hate it this way, going on with him. I hate it. I hate even being near him. It makes me sick. When I ought to be with you. Only place I should ever be, I should be with you. Okay. <laughs> I can't answer it. Oh, I guess. Yes, it does, Kenny. I, I just don't know. We got no chance while he's around. I knew we got no right to do it. Listen, Amy, I... I'm getting tired of this. I don't know, Jazz. I know. Then I... call it. Will you wrap it up? We're all right. You're in it with me. See, right down the line. Okay. As long as I don't have to hear those rifles again. I don't want to hear them again. Never. As long as I live, it's driving me crazy, that noise. Hey, look at that. Just start the fireworks. Hey, you going now? Yeah. There's a mob around that gallery, like for free. Come and look. No, I, I don't want to look. You're going to miss the fireworks? I don't want to see anything. Okay, but remember, you don't get out that way. I'll see you. Kenny? Yeah? Nothing. Give me ten more. What? Oh. Another buck's worth of dime. Oh, yeah, sure. Hey, what are you shaking for? The noise. It makes me nervous. Okay, kid, come and get it. Don't do it. Don't. Oh, Joe. Hi, Kim. Kenny, listen, you, you shouldn't have told me to meet you here. Oh, it's okay. I'll walk you to the arcade. No. No, we, we, we shouldn't be seen together. I had to find out. What happened at the hospital? <laughs> what do you think? I'm asking. He, he's gone. He died about an hour ago. And? And? And I was there. Did he say anything? No. He wasn't conscious. Oh. Not once after... After he got it. That's what the doctor said. But I know different. What different? In the ambulance. On the way to the hospital. I saw it. I did. I saw it. I saw him open his eyes. What are you talking about? He opened his eyes and he looked at me. And he laughed. He laughed right out loud. Like the whole thing was... But, but, but how, how could he have... I know. That's what the doctor said, too. Come on, kid. Get hold of yourself. You... Your hand's like a hunk of ice. I... I don't... 
think I feel so good. Come on, put on my jacket. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, come on. I don't want to stay. I don't feel like talking. Amy, it's over. You, you ought to be relieved. Sure. Top of the world, huh? You know, it was almost like you knew something. Like the laugh was on me. What do you mean? You, you said he was out. I'm still scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. There's nothing to be scared of. It's I going am. good. I already answered a couple hundred questions from the cops. They ain't on to nothing. This was I'm scared of. Suppose I get rattled, Penny. Suppose I see something wrong. Leave it to me. Stick close. Tell him I was his buddy and I'm taking care of you. I keep seeing him looking up at me. Think about the insurance. As soon as we get it, I'll take you away. I can't stand them rifles anymore. Take it easy. Listen, I gotta get away from that thing, Kenny. Every time they go, it's like my knees turn to water. Come on, you let go now. We're finished. But I see Joe's face when I hear it. I and I see him smiling at me. You're gonna crack up if you don't cut. Hold it. What is it? That detective, he was here before. He's coming. Oh, Kenny. What if I say the wrong thing? What if Make I Make out you're too sad to talk. Hello, Kenny. Hello, Matthews. Can you give me a few minutes? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, what's up? Uh, Mrs. Gordon, right? Yeah. You feel like talking now? What about? You tell her who I am? Yeah. Tough break, Mrs. Gordon. I'm real sorry. What do you want, please? I guess he told you some of my men have been looking around. They've been asking questions all night. It's a job. But I guess I can tell you. You got all the answers now. Kenny? What's the matter? Well, she's uh, pretty broke up. Oh. Oh, sure. Uh, what, uh... What, what, what kind of answers? What you'd expect. You know, same old story in these cases. Can't they stop that? Stop it! Make you nervous, Mrs. Gordon? I don't want to talk about it. After what, after what happened, you, you, you know. Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. Uh, I understand, uh, he was your best friend. You're the detective. It ain't always a good racket. Kenny. Look, what do you want? She's sick. Yeah, I uh, I know how you feel, Mrs. Gordon. Cops can get in your hair. I didn't say that. I know, I know. Well, then what are you putting words in my mouth? I'm not. But I guess it's all over now. All over? Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're through poking around. Oh. The insurance company was in touch. And we made it clear with them. I, uh, I just want to tell you that. Clear? We gave him the green light. What? What happened with, with Joe? Who knows, Mrs. Gordon? Accident, ricochet, misfire. I'm sorry. The kind of thing just happens in places like this. Well, goodbye, Mrs. Gordon. Good luck. <laughs> Amy. Amy. Kenny. Cut it out. Cut it out. You hear what he said? You're free. Free and clear. Let's get out of here now. Let's go. Please, please. Before we get the dough, are you nuts? Please, I don't want it. I don't want it. Yeah, please. Sure, sure. I, I pulled it off the of labs, here. kid. I give it away. The whole setup. Like I tell him we did it, huh? No, no, kid. Then you shut up or I'll clout you. We leave when we get the insurance. All right. All right. Giant racer, please. The most rudimentary of living creatures made to think and act like man. I see the infinitesimal characters. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, get them up here. Get them up. Get them up. Get them up. Get them up. Two bucks, please. Sign. Yeah. Since they found that automatic gunslinger, I can't keep them away from the place. Noisy again, huh? Amy? 
What's the matter? There's a guy coming down the boardwalk. He's got a briefcase. Huh? Take a look. Oh. Yeah. See the insurance oh. man? Yeah. Yeah, that's him. All right, this is it. Now oh. we go. Wait, I'm scared. Ken, listen, you've got to help me. Will you shut up with the scared? Okay, okay. Hello, Mrs. Gordon. Oh, uh, hello, Mr. Mitchell. Uh, this here's a friend of Joe's, uh, Kenny Welsh. Welsh? Nice to meet you. Yeah, same here. I, uh, I assume, Mrs. Gordon, that you want me to, uh... Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Kenny kind of helps me. Well, then, let's see what I've got here. Gordon. Gordon, here it is. Yes, we checked this very carefully. It seems I was in error, Mrs. Gordon. About what? Well, your husband borrowed rather heavily against this policy. Borrowed? So its face value is rather lower. Borrowed for what? Well, it came to me later. He wanted to buy the shooting gallery. What? So, on the face of it, there's not much cash. But there is a large payment on the gallery. Oh, very little, Mrs. Gordon, and the shooting gallery would be yours. Mine? About 300, I think. <laughs> the shooting gallery would be mine? Yes. You hear that, Jesse? You and your big plans. You are going to get us out of here. Well, come on and look at it. Look at what we won, Kenny. Look what you got for me. A place to go insane! Put it down, Amy. Put that rifle down. Why? You want it for me? Mrs. Gordon, please. Tell him. Tell him what we did for Joe. Shut up, Amy. Tell him how we killed him. Tell him how you aimed the rifle like this. Tell him how. Amy, stop it. Tell him how you pulled the trigger like this. Amy. Like this. Hey. Like this. Mrs. Gordon, put it down. He's dead. And so is Joe. So much. So are we all. <laughs> I got a shooting gallery. I got a shooting gallery. I got a shooting gallery. Presented The Flea Circus, written by Richard McCracken and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Jackie Grimes, Rosemary Rice, Cliff Carpenter, Guy Sorrell, and George Petrie. Audio engineer, Marty Fuller. You know what automation means, don't you, Harvey? It means that a crummy machine, a big hunk of hardware, is going to put you and me out of work. Yeah, buddy boy, when that gadget's installed in his office, we're both going to be out in the cold. <laughs> Theater 5 presents Charlie the Beautiful Machine. About time. Dinner was ready 20 minutes ago. Where have you been? Well, you see... And hang up your coat, Harvey. I've had enough to do without picking up after you. I know, dear. I was just about to hang it up. You haven't answered me. Why are you so late getting home? Well, sweetheart... Look, never fact... mind. I know exactly what happened. There was a large crowd at the bus stop, and you let everybody chin ahead of you. That's true. I, I never like to push. You know how I am. Oh, indeed I do, Harvey. You won't even stand up for your rights. Oh, but if you'd only be a little forceful, people would have more respect for you. Maybe so, Lydia, but that's the way I am. <coughs> now, there's a forceful character. Let him in before he breaks the door down. Oh, Wolf would never break the door down. I've trained him better than that. <coughs> Hi there, Wolf, old boy. Come on in. <laughs> 
Glad to see me, huh? Hey. I'm glad to see you, too. <laughs> oh, make it stop that noise. Quiet, Wolf. Quiet. Now, heel. That's right. Sit. Good. Lie down. Good boy. You see, Lydia? He's licking my hand. That proves my point, Harvey. You stand up to that dog and he likes you for it. But when you first got him, you were afraid of him. And he knew it and took advantage of it. That's right. I even hated Wolf at first. But now I love him and he loves me. It's funny, isn't it? No, not at all. Authority always wins respect. But meekness gets you nowhere. And that doesn't apply only to dogs, Harvey. What do you mean? Well, take your boss, for instance. You're afraid of Mr. Killian, so he walks all over you. Now, Lydia, that isn't true. It is true, and you know it. You're as meek as a lamb down there at the office. But if you show a little gumption or speak up once in a while, Mr. Killian might even give you a promotion, or at least a raise in pay. Oh, I doubt that. It doesn't do Jack Warren any good. Jack's a real hothead. He talks up to Mr. Killian all the time, but it hasn't gotten him any advancement. He's still a plain clerk, just like me. Well, you're not Jack Warren. You're Harvey Bodmer. And if you take my advice, you'd stop being anonymous and let Mr. Killian know you're alive. I don't mean to argue with you, sweetheart, but you don't know my boss. The longer I stay anonymous with Mr. Killian, the longer I'll stay out of trouble. <laughs> Hi, Harvey. Oh, good morning, Jack. You're five minutes late. Do you know that? So I'm five minutes late. So what? If Mr. Killian knew, he wouldn't like it. No, we wouldn't, huh? Well, that's tough. If you ask me, Killian's a double cross and creep. He might hear you. So let him. You realize that our big-hearted boss might soon be firing us out of this office? Jack, what are you talking about? What I said. You and I might be getting canned any day now. But... What makes you think so? That was a rumor going around. I just heard it last night from a guy that keeps his ear to the ground. He said Killian is going to install a machine in this office, one of those human brain gadgets. Now, if that's true, Harvey, we'll both soon be looking for work. Oh, no, Mr. Killian can't do that. I, I need this job. Yeah, well, you and me both. Hey, Harvey, you look scared. I am scared. Aren't you? No, I'm sore. We've been working 11 years for Killian, and for what? Peanuts! And now it looks like he's going to dump us for a lousy machine. Well, we got to find out if it's true. Come on. Where? Well, to the boss's office for a showdown. Oh, no, Jack. I couldn't do that. Look, are you going to be checking all your life? Yeah, but maybe it's only a rumor, like you said. No, no, pal. If you ask me where there's smoke, there's fire. Now, we got to see the boss right now and get this thing settled. Come on. Gosh, I hope Mr. Killian won't be angry at us for breaking in on him. Uh, nuts to that. We're the guys that ought to be angry. Come in. Look, uh, Mr. Killian. Uh, good morning, uh, Warren. Barbara. Good morning, sir. Boss, sir, uh, we came to get something straight. I heard a rumor that you... Well, now, you must read my mind. I was going to call you men in for a chat right after lunch. If you're busy, sir, we'll be glad to come back later. We'll... No, we're going to talk right now. Mr. Killian, I heard you're bringing in a machine to do our work. Is that right or not? Uh, I'm sorry you had to learn about it elsewhere, but I'm afraid it's correct. Mr. Killian. The machine will be installed tomorrow morning, but you men can remain till Friday. I'll give you two weeks severance pay, of course. Uh, I sincerely regret having to make this move, but then we can't but progress, can we? Uh, no, sir. Yeah, no. But progress, my eye. If you ask me, we're getting a real crummy deal. That's a crude statement, Warren, but under the circumstances, I'm willing to overlook it. Would you mind closing the door as you leave? Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, men, here it is at last. A machine that can do the work of a dozen men in the twinkling of an eye. A masterpiece of technical ingenuity. A thing of beauty. Isn't it, Bobmer? Yes, sir. It's very nice looking. What do you think of it, Warren? I think it's as ugly as a hyena's mother-in-law. <laughs> You're just prejudiced. You have a closed mind. Who needs a mind with that monster doing all the work? This is a red-letter day for the Killian Company. And now, who would like the honor of throwing the switch and starting the machine on its career of service? You, Bodmer? No, sir, I'd rather not, if you don't mind. How about you, Warren? Not a chance. It'd be like digging my own grave. It's your machine, Mr. Killian. I think you should throw the switch. Hmm. Very well. I will. Listen to it. 
Isn't that a magnificent sound? Yes, sir. It sounds almost human. You're right, it does. In fact, this machine is almost human. <laughs> so nearly human, I think it deserves a human name. Yes, I think I'll call it uh, Charlie. Uh, how does that sound to you, Bodmer? Fine, sir. Charlie's a nice name, I think. Yes, yes. Excellent. I'm going to call my wife and tell her about Charlie, the beautiful machine. Hey, you know something, Harvey? I think the boss has slipped his leg. Well, I guess we can't blame him for being excited. He says this thing is almost human. Oh, boy, I wish it was human. I'd take a hammer and beat its brains out. But it's here, Jack, and we got to accept it. But you know something? Mm. I think I hate Charlie more than anything in the whole world. Please, ladies, don't look at me that way. I I've been trying to find a job. Honest, I have. But I'm 46, and everywhere I go, they tell me that's too old. But you even fight for the job you had. If you ask me, you're absolutely spineless. No person with a spark of courage would allow himself to be replaced by a machine. Oh, if I were a man, Harvey Bodner, and anything, human or otherwise, stole my job, I'd murder it. <laughs> Murder a machine? Harvey, that's the screwiest thing I ever heard of. But that's what my wife said, Jack, and she really meant it. Well, I hate this machine. Guts, but how can I murder it? That's crazy. Yeah, I guess it is. Charlie's nothing but a bunch of wheels and wires. Well, I wish he had a heart. I'd get a butcher knife and carve it out. You hear that, Charlie, you big bum? You hear what I said I'd like to do to you? Oh, boy. Holy mackerel, Harvey. Listen to me yelling at a machine. I must be losing my marbles. I don't know, Jack. I feel like yelling at him, too. But what's the use? You can't get through to him. Charlie pays no attention to anybody. He just keeps on doing his work. Yeah, and he never makes a mistake. That's what gripes me. Next to stealing our jobs, that's why I hate Charlie most. He's always so right. And he knows he's always right. That's what I hate. What do you mean you know he's right? I don't, how can you tell? Well, just listen to him and you'll understand. Be quiet and listen for about five seconds. Okay. I'm sorry, Harvey, but I still don't get you. All I hear is that same steady noise. It isn't exactly a noise. It's, it's more of a self-satisfied hum. Well, pal, it might sound like a hum to you, but to me it's nothing but a loud noise and it's driving me nuts. I still hate Charlie's insides. Well, I hate him too, Jack, but you know what? Uh, He's so doggone efficient, I've got to respect him. Respect him? Well, you're nuts. He's got no respect for you and me. No, I can't listen to him any longer. If the boss wants me, I'll be in the washroom. Okay, Jack. Well, Charlie... Jack's gone, and this is the first time I've had a chance to talk to you alone. It's on account of you we're losing our... I need this job because I'm middle-aged and can't find work anywhere else. And if I lose my job, I don't know what to do. My, my whole life will be ruined. So please don't ruin my life, Charlie. Please. <laughs> are you doing? I'm training my dog, Lydia. What do you think I'm doing? Well, it seems to me that instead of playing with a dog, you should be thinking about finding a job. Because unless something happens very soon, we won't be able to afford a roof over our heads. Then what'll we do? 
then, my dear Lydia, we'll have to live without a roof over our heads. Harvey, you're being rude. No, I don't mean to be, Lydia. You're not talking to your dog. You're talking to your wife. So I suggest you change your attitude. Quiet, Lydia. Quiet. Quiet. Silence. That's fine. Now sit. <laughs> Good girl. Harvey, what in the world has got into you? Authority, my dear. Gumption. Well, that's fine, but... Quiet! Now, Lydia, here are my plans for this evening. I'm going down to the office for a little while. After I leave, I want you to take Wolf out for a walk. You got that? Yes, of course. I'll be gone for about an hour, and when I get back, I want you to have supper ready, because I'll probably be hungry. Understand? Yes, Harvey. I understand. Okay, then. I'll see you. Hello, Charlie. I see you're still working. That's the spirit. Didn't expect me back tonight, did you? Well, here I am, and you and I have got the office to ourselves. I came down to have a frank, man-to-machine talk with you, my boy, and I'm not going to pull any punches. I've been doing some thinking, and believe me, I'm a changed character. Now, Charlie, listen carefully, because here comes the zinger. You may think you're almighty, but I know you can be beaten. Yes, I'm your master, Charlie. Your human master, and you're my slave. And beginning right now, you're going to respect me and obey my orders. How do you like them apples? <laughs> I knew it. I've got you intimidated, pal. I've got you in the palm of my hand, and that's just where you're going to stay. But in case you haven't got it straight, I want to show you something. Here, you see this? In case you don't know what it is, it's an eight-pound hammer. Any disobedience, and I'll slam it right through your rheostat. As a matter of fact, I think I'll give you a slight tap right now just to show you how it feels. Brace yourself, Charlie. Here it comes. Scared <laughs> you, didn't I? Now, don't worry, Charlie. I was only bluffing. I'm not going to hurt you. Not this time, anyway. Now quit groveling and get to work. I'm, I'm going home to supper. Hey, Harvey, is the, is the boss in yet? He's in his office. You look terrible this morning, Jack. What's wrong? No, I didn't sleep all night thinking about Charlie. But you don't have to worry about Charlie. He's going to be all right. I've got him licked. You've got him... What are you talking about? Watch, you'll see. Just stand there, Jack, and watch. Yeah, yeah. Listen what happens when I talk to him. <clears throat> Charlie, look. Do you remember this hammer? Yes, <laughs> you're darn right you remember it. Now, how'd you like that slight cap I threatened to give you last night? You're gonna take it easy. I was only bluffing again. Well, Jack, what do you think of Charlie now? Holy cow, Harvey. It's just like he's scared of you. He is. I've really got his number. Admiral, Admiral Warren, what's happened to Charlie? What do you mean, Mr. Killian? He made a costly mistake during the night. I've been studying these tapes. They're completely incorrect. I know this machine was a bust. Oh, call the manufacturer. I want a repairman here in ten minutes. No, Mr. Killian, we don't need a repairman. Huh? I know how to fix Charlie. Just leave me alone with him. I'll have him straightened out in no time. Well, uh, all right. I certainly hope you know what you're doing. Uh, come with me, Warren. Let's go over these tapes in my office. Yes, sure, now, Charlie, I think it's time you and I had another private talk. In spite of what I told you about disobedience, you made a big mistake during the night, and now I'm going to eat you out. Mr. Killian says you're beautiful, but you know what I think? 
I think you're nothing but a big, ugly slob. Oh, 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 feeling sorry for yourself, huh? Well, self-pity will get you nowhere. So listen to me, Charlie, and listen good. If you make one more mistake, just one, I'm going to murder you with this hammer. Understand? Oh, okay, okay, we'll forget it. But this is your last chance. I like you when you mind me, but you got to mind me, right? Oh, now, now cut that out. Quit slobbering all over me and get busy. Okay, Mr. Killian, you can come back now. Have you fixed him, Bogma? Is Charlie all right? Yes, sir, he's fine now. He won't give us any more trouble. Oh, but, but this is amazing. What did you do? I had a little talk with him. I... You what? No, no, he's right, boss. This machine is scared of Harvey. No, no kidding. Scared of him? Nonsense. Show him, Harvey. Go ahead. Show him how you can handle Charlie. Okay. You ready, Mr. Killian? Uh, of course. Go ahead. <clears throat> Charlie, this is Harvey K. Bodman, your master. I will now give you commands which you will obey. My first command is stop. Bodmer. Hold it, Mr. Killian. Now, Charlie, start. I don't believe it. Now, Charlie, whimper. Good boy. Now pull yourself together and get back to work. Bodmer, this is a miracle. A miracle, my eye. This machine's alive and I'm going to kill it. Oh, Put down that hammer at once. Don't you dare even threaten, Charlie. Harvey, what's happening? At first you hated Charlie, but now you're saving his life. Well, what's the idea? I don't know, Jack. It's hard, hard to explain. Charlie respects me now, so I respect him. You respect a lousy machine? I think you're nuts. Oh, be quiet, both of you. We've got an emergency here. Charlie cost me a fortune, but he isn't working at all. What are we going to do, Bartlett? Tell me. Leave Charlie to me, Mr. Killian, and he'll make an excellent assistant. A party, huh? You, Jack, me, and Charlie all working together in this office. Agreed? Well, well uh, of course, of course, if you say so. There's no need for anyone to leave. Now, uh, sir, if you don't mind, I suggest that you get back to your duties. Huh? You're wasting time. Well, well, fine, fine. You're a forceful man, Bodmer. I like that quality in an employee. But before I go, won't you please have another talk with Charlie and put him back on the beam? That is, if you think you can. I know I can, Mr. Killian. Just watch. Hey, Charlie, you big bum. What are you loafing for? Don't just stand there like a great cringing slob. Pull up your socks and get going. Presented Charlie the Beautiful Machine, written by Albert G. Miller and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Johnson, Arlene Walker, Jack Grimes, and Arthur Anderson. Audio engineer, Marty Folia. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. so fast. In a moment, there can be a suspicion. Then the suspicion becomes a fact. And because of this fact, a commonplace situation becomes shrouded with sinister and frightening implications. Such a moment occurs in this Theater 5 production of The Blue-Eyed People. <laughs> Uh, cup of coffee needs company. Okay. Sit down, doctor. 
At the moment, you look more like a patient. Oh, it's one of those mornings. Complicated by a couple of interns who needed straightening out. No Simon McGree or Fagan syndrome? Not even Leighton. <laughs> Doctor, uh, all symptoms indicate I am a psychopathic coward. Now, perhaps some treatment from our very pretty staff psychiatrist is called for. Uh, what kind of treatment? Well, that has all the earmarks of a leading question. Oh, so, uh, Liz, are those the latest additions? Yeah, I think so. Anything new on the Brewster chart? Uh, let's see. Hmm? Still on the front page. No trace of Senator and Mrs. Brewster's missing baby. National search continues. Ditto in this one. Brewster child now missing for four days. Hope dwindles. Kidnapping is dirty enough but a ten-month-old baby. I wonder what its chances are. Of survival? Well, that's always the question with kidnapping. Do they really intend to return the victim? Something you learned from that police lieutenant you buddy around with? Doctor, you're probing. Suppose I do enjoy vicarious thrills through Arthur Keith. Save me the price of paperback mysteries. Dr. Hay, calling Dr. Hay. I knew everything was too peaceful. This is Dr. Hay. Oh, I, I see. Fluoroscope the child immediately. Uh, if it's there, I want some x-rays fast. Be right down. Crisis? Speaking of children, a baby just came into an emergency. Mother thinks it swallowed a safety pin. I hope she's wrong. So do I. Any operation is tough. But a ten-month-old child... Jack, we shouldn't have come here. This is no place for us. If that pin's in a baby's stomach, it's the only place. But all these people... Doctors... I'm scared. If I'd just been more careful. Ah, come on, Sue. It ain't like you fed it to the kid. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lunny? Yeah, that's right. I'm Dr. Hayes. Your baby did swallow a pin. Oh, my Lord. How easy, Sue. Fortunately, we have a series of good x-rays. I'll have to operate, of course. I've given the necessary instructions, and we'll be able to start in about ten minutes. You're not going to operate on my baby. Sue. He's less than a year old. Mrs. Lunny, I don't mean to frighten you, but it's imperative that I operate as soon as possible. Not without our permission, you won't. And you're not getting it. Uh, Dr. Valma, would you assist me for a moment? Uh, certainly, Dr. Heck. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lunny, this is Dr. Elizabeth Valma, our staff psychiatrist. Well, I don't figure you're going to psychoanalyze that pin out of the kid's stomach. Well, frankly, I was hoping that Dr. Valma, being a woman, would reason with your wife more effectively than I seem to be able to. Mrs. Lunny doesn't want her baby to undergo surgery. I see. Uh, why don't you all step into my office? What is the preoperative diagnosis? Critical. The safety pin is lodged against the stomach wall. It's open. I've got to get it out, and you've got to help me. Please step in, Mr. and Mrs. Lunny. You're trying to trick me into doing something I don't want to do. Come on, now, Blue Eyes. You're fucking an awful lot. Now, calm down. See if you can talk to the woman. I'm, I'm going to check on the O.R., you can't go ahead without a surgical consent. I'm counting on you to get it for me. I tell you, I want to get out of here with my baby. Now. Now, you're talking silly. Nothing terrible's happened. I've got a premonition like, let's leave while we're still ahead. Mrs. Lunny, I know you've been through a very bad shock, and well, what you're experiencing now is what we call hysteria. Don't give me none of that fancy talk, Doctor. I'm not going to let them operate on my baby. I'll tell you No, I don't... let me tell you. We can't foretell the future, but I can give you a trained medical opinion. Your baby may die if he isn't operated on immediately. Your point's made. Now tell that sawbones he can go ahead. Jack! Now, Sue, you've just gone haywire. Now, you ain't thinking straight and... I don't want my boy to die. Look, he's my boy, too. I got just as much to lose as you do. Now I'm ready to scrub up. Go ahead. The father has given surgical consent. Oh, Good. Would uh, you come and sign the necessary papers, Mr. Lunny? I'm with you. Mrs. Lunny, I'd like to give you a sedative and put you to bed for a while. Sedative? Something to help you relax. You've been under a very severe strain. Uh, think I'm going to crack up, Doctor? Cause a scene? No. I'm not worried about a scene. Just a condition. So you want to feed me some truth serum so I'll talk all over the place? Your feeding of sodium bulb? We don't use that as a tranquilizer. Oh, that's just the same. And I'm not taking any of it. As you wish. But try and relax. Tommy has a very good chance. 
You can't keep your eye on a child every moment. It's not a crime. What made you say that? A crime. I just meant you shouldn't blame yourself. Tommy is now in the hands of a very capable surgeon. I'm sure everything will turn out all right. I hope so, Doctor. It wasn't easy. But after I assured them the operation was successful, the child's post-operative period would be fairly short, I finally talked them into going home. You know, Bill, I think I may have a patient in this case. And the mother? There's something strange there. Well, she was irrational, no doubt about it. However, the child in danger, it's understandable. I'm not throwing feminine intuition at you, but I've got a strange feeling. Some of the things she said. Let me look at that file, will you? Mm-hmm. 427 Lowayton Avenue. You know where it is? Yeah. You wouldn't feel a little adventurous this evening, would you? In the lunny? Yes. You could reassure her about the child's condition. I feel that woman is in trouble. All right, Sherlock. I'll play what? Dr. Valma. Oh, uh, and, uh, Dr. Good evening, Mrs. Lunny. Uh, Dr. Hay and I were taking a drive and realized we were in your neighborhood. We thought we might drop in for a moment. I hope we didn't come at a bad time. Oh, no. No. Uh, come on in. Jack just ducked out the cigarettes. He'll be real glad to see you. And maybe you could stay for some coffee. Well, that would be nice. Sit yourselves down, won't you? <clears throat> Uh, what does uh, Mr. Lonnie do, Mrs.? Oh, call me Sue, Doctor. Well, Jack's in high steel. Construction work? Yeah, the tall stuff. Jack, he's not afraid of nothing at all. He's big enough so he don't have to be. <laughs> he's no lightweight. Hope Tommy takes after him. Uh, your son's bone structure may be a little small for that. However, at his age, it's hard to tell. Uh, looky here. I don't know what's keeping Jack, but... How about I hustle out to the kitchen and get some coffee going? Well, there's a hurry. Ah, coffee. That hit the spot with me. Doctor, you practically got it. You folks just uh, rest easy. You want anything? You just yell. Uh, thanks. I wanted to draw her out. Why did you... What are you doing? This is paper. The, the, this is the afternoon edition. I spotted it on the sideboard. Well... Look, they ran a picture of the missing Brewster baby. Liz, this picture looks an awful lot like the child I operated on today. That means... That Tommy is really the kidnapped Brewster child. What do we do? I know what I'd like to do. Leave. And fast. It's already been commented on that Jack is a very large and strong man. And fearless. Can't say the same for myself. Well, Forte Fortuna Juvet. Meaning? Fortune favors the brave. All right. Sometimes you have to gamble. On what? A very red face, if I am wrong. And an irate friend at police headquarters. Keep an eye on that kitchen door, Liz. Lieutenant Chief, please. It, it's urgent. Hello, baby. Hey, honey, I got... Well, doggone, it's the two doctors from the hospital. Oh, hello, Mr. Lunny. Uh, Dr. Hay and I just dropped in to reassure the anxious mother. I am uh, checking with the hospital right now. Lieutenant Chief here. No rest for the medical profession, you know. Yeah, I reckon not. Hello. Anyone on this line? Uh, this is Dr. Hay, uh, orderly. Have there been any calls for me? Oh, hello, Bill. What's this orderly been? Fine. I'm at uh, 427 Rowayton Avenue. 
Morris 4, 6, 9, 8, 1. Case, I'm needed. Hey, Bill, this is headquarters, not the hospital. Have you got your wires crossed? Definitely not. Uh, uh, did you make a note of that address? Yes, yes. Hey, wait a minute. You in trouble? Well, it's possible. Uh, Dr. Varma's with me. Here's the coffee, folks. Oh, hi, Jack. We got visitors. So I see. Bill. Bill. Can't talk, huh? Want me to come over? Excellent. I'm on my way. Uh, forgive me for acting like I live here, but it's part of the routine. Uh, wasn't it uh, nice of them to drop in friendly like Jack? Yeah, sure was. Uh, you didn't have any ideas, did you? Uh, I do. Here's your cup of coffee, Doctor. Hey, I mean, uh, Tommy's all right. Uh, t- Tommy? Oh, yes, he's coming along fine. Oh, thank goodness. Oh, that's just wonderful. Now, you just both sit back and relax. You don't have to run right away, do you? Well, we... No, no, we've got plenty of time. Nice to take it easy for a while, isn't it, Dr. Valmer? Oh, certainly. Nothing like a few quiet minutes away from the hospital. Well, one thing that's always puzzled me, Jack, about construction work is I've often wondered why the... Well, it looks like visitor's day for us. Now, who do you figure that is? It's Dr. Hayes. Oh, hello, Bill. Oh, uh, this here friend of yours, Doc? A very welcome one. Mr. and Mrs. Lunny, meet the Lieutenant Arthur Keith. Hi. You a cop, fellow? That's right. I don't understand this. Well, neither do I at the moment. I removed a pin from the Lunny child today, Arthur. The age given was ten months. So? Uh, this picture of the Brewster child in the afternoon paper, it bears a striking resemblance to Tommy Lunny. I uh, say, before you get any ideas, Lieutenant, how long ago was this here kidnapping? Four days? Oh. Well, I don't want to disappoint you, but we've been here for two weeks, and Tommy's been right with us. And you can prove it? Don't take our word. Check with the landlord. Sure, sure. Right away. No, well, wait a minute, Arthur. We'll go uh, along with you. Oh, all right. You two, just tag along. And you, Mr. and Mrs. Lunny, just stay put. It's probably just a formality, but if you should get the idea of leaving, I'd have you in custody inside an hour. No screen, Lieutenant. We got nothing to run about. You and your bright ideas. Take the kid to the hospital, you say. Make sure it lives, you say. We took a stupid, crazy chance. We'd have taken a worse chance if that kid had died. Now, you simmer down and get this. My mammy didn't raise me to die young. Now, as long as the kid lives, the worst we can get is 30 years. But if they caught us and that kid was dead, curtains for sure. If they caught us? What do you think happens now with that police lieutenant sniffing around there? Nothing. Now, we sit tight and let them make fools of themselves. We got nothing to worry about. All right, folks. The party is over. What's the verdict, Lieutenant? Apologies are in order. The landlord and several of the tenants here confirm your arrival time and the presence of the baby. <laughs> Doctor, I guess you just better stick to medicine. <laughs> what blue eyes means is you're not much of a Perry Mason. Uh, Dr. Hay and I got a little carried away. I, I'm awfully sorry. Yeah. All right, Bill, say your little piece, too. When did you have your child, Sue? Oh, come on, Doc, give up, will you? Ten months ago, just like we told you. Then you didn't adopt, Tommy. Oh, of course not. Now, look, Bill, I've got to get back to headquarters. Now, let's try and leave gracefully, shall we? Uh, not yet. Uh, Jack uh, just referred to his wife as Blue Eye. Of course I did. It's a pet name I have for her. And you're Blue Eye, too. Always have been. What are you getting at? The baby I operated on today had brown eyes. Now, that's very interesting. What are you doing? Making a survey? I get it. Tommy can't be their child. What? Uh, Lieutenant, uh, maybe you'd better take the doc here into custody. <laughs> Sounds a little unhinged to me. No two blue-eyed parents can have a brown-eyed child. That's the Mendelian law. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me have that again. It's the law of genetics established by Gregor Mendel. Look, I've had enough of this jaw wagon. How about you folks leave it? Now, this Mendelian law, will it stand up in court, Bill? Like a rock. No chance of some smart lawyer exploding it. Lieutenant, it's as foolproof as fingerprints. Okay. 
That's good enough for me. Now, now, wait a minute. Hold it, Jack. You try and arrest us. You're going to make a fool of yourself. I'll risk it. I'm taking you both in on suspicion. Oh, you are? And how do you figure to prove that Tommy ate our baby? By quoting some fancy law? The first thing I'll do is have you examine, Mrs. Lunny, just to see if you really had a child ten months ago. And I'll check on the child's birth certificate and the doctor who gave delivery and your whereabouts at the time of the kidnapping. You know, it takes the machinery of the law a little while to get going, but it is very thorough. They got us, Sue. Shut up. They are just talking. No, they ain't. Once they got a real suspicion, once they start to check, we're up the creek. We're just a couple of small timers, honey. We tried to pull off a big score and blew it. All right, Lenny. How'd you do it? Well, Sue's sister Kay had a kid ten months ago. About the same time the Brewster kid was born. I see. Then we got the idea. Will you stop shooting off your mouth? It's all over, Sue. Go on, Lonnie, go on. It'll help you in court if you come clean. We came up here two weeks ago. We brought Kay's kid with us. We told her and her husband that we'd take care of the baby for a while so they could have a couple of weeks vacation. Well, we made sure everybody knew we had the kid. Uh Uh-huh. Then we drove down south five days ago and returned the baby to Sue's sister. As soon as I got back, we snatched the Brewster's child. We had a built-in alibi. I figured it was foolproof. Yeah. Okay. We'll get that on paper and signed down at headquarters. I just one thing I wish right now. Hey, don't look at me. No, I'm not bugged at you, Doc. It's that Joker Mendel. He really fixed it. Oh, I'd like to have him alone for about five minutes. I'm afraid you can't. Gregor Mendel, who founded genetics, has been dead for over 300 years. Well, thank you, Doctor. You've been a great help. Engineer Marty Folia, sound technician Ed Blaney, script editor Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlasdotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. <laughs> Executive producer for Theater 5, Ted Bell. We invite your comments. Right to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. That's Theater 5, New York 23, New York. Theater 5 continues following weekend. When I was driving through the Southwest, through the desert country, I saw this car by an old shack. It was a big, beautiful car, all polished and shining in this strange, out-of-the-way place. And what did an old Indian want with a fancy car like that? A car that he didn't even drive. The Other Five presents Devil Duck. Dust. You think we wouldn't make it? <laughs> and I dozed off before our grandpa was stranded on the desert. Oh, not so loud, Jula. We ain't home yet. Oh, I apologize if I hurt your engine feelings. It did get us to Denning and back. But Harvey, 
you don't mind an old fella and you're that you need a new... Yeah, I need a new everything. But I can't afford it, Mueller. Harvey. Yeah? He's got company behind it. Get over. Get over. Jim! Dumb blasted idiot! California, please. Uh, you'll wear that car out in no time. Harvey, stop! That, it, it's, uh, crazy! Just crazy! Stops in the middle of the road. Look, he's running up to the car parked behind that shack. Isn't that old John Eagle's place? Uh. Why, he's opening the car door. He's poking around inside it. Oh, Harvey, don't you want to see what he's doing? Not if Bond's home. Well, he's not home, or those dogs of his would have torn into that fellow as soon as he touched the car. Wait. Let's see what happens. Or are you afraid John might come back and see you? I don't want him thinking I had anything to do with this. You're afraid of that old man. You believe in Indian magic. No, I, I, I didn't say that at all. He was a big medicine man back on the reservation. And I seen those Navajo medicine men do things with people. <laughs> no, sir. Maybe we'll the sheriff. That fellow wants to steal the car. Yeah, I doubt there's a battery in it. John never drives it. Then why? Why would a California tourist be interested? You could ask Tommy. Tommy? Oh, you women. Here you got old John's own grandson clerking in your store. Tommy Tyandy? Sure. Uh why, yes, so he is. <laughs> Somehow I never come in connection with John and the Navajos. <laughs> He's a good boy. I like him, but... But what? A feeling I get when he looks at me sometimes. Ah, you will, uh, that's John Jim. Look, I grew up around Navajo Indians. Both kinds. Blanket wearers of the English speaking. For all that I've seen them every day in my life, I still don't understand a thing about them. Not a blasted thing. Dina, they call themselves. Dina, the people. And Dina is different. Indians are different. Mrs. Granger, I was just wondering when you'd be back. Something the matter, Tommy? The cook came in from the Thompson Ranch and took the last of those canned freestone peaches. I'll order more. Tommy, when Harvey Tibbetts and I were driving past your grandfather's house, we saw a stranger looking around that old car your grandfather keeps near the Arroyo. Uh, is there something special about that car? I don't go up to my grandfather's house, Mrs. Granger. I don't know. Oh. I if you've got a minute... I'd like to talk to you. Sure, go right ahead. Could you see your way clear to paying me $5 a week more? I'd keep the store open till 10 every night if you wanted. <sighs> you could keep it open till midnight, Tommy. We wouldn't do any more business. This is too small a store, and Devil Dust is too small a town for me to be able to pay you any more than I'm paying you right now. Oh, Tommy. You've had two years of high school. You're a smart boy. Why don't you see what you can get in a bigger town, huh? I know what Indians... I, I know what I could get. It's not much. Mrs. Granger, when I leave here, I want to go a long ways. I want to go clear across the country. Away from sheep raising and bitter roots and starving. You mean leave your people? Well, they can't help me. I can't go back on the reservation. I, I, I just can't go backwards. I have to go forward. I want to stretch out to my limits. So when I'm old... At least I'll know I've tried everything I could. You want to get away from here? Yes. And I need money to do it. Oh, I wish I could help you find yourself, Tommy. But that extra $5 a week is just impossible. You know what this store makes. I guess I do, Mrs. Granger. You, uh, you want me to write down the order for the peaches? Yes, Tommy. Thank you. Somebody's pulling in at Harvey Tibbetts place. Why, it's him. It's a man who was poking around your grandfather's car. Must be taking a cabin to stay here. But why? Harvey, 
Oh, thanks. Uh, listen, Tibbets, what's wrong with that old Indian who owns the car? I went up to see him, didn't try to pressure him, but it was no sale. When I finally gave up, when I left the price open, you know what he said? He said he didn't understand me because I didn't speak Navajo. Yeah, <clears throat> Mr. Farman, Indians have to do things their way. And if you don't understand their way, well, you have to wait them out, especially Navajos. They're buyers, not sellers. You don't let anything go. Not even words. Smart, huh? Hmm. You suppose he knows what he has right there in his backyard? What? <laughs> What's so special about that old car? Now listen, Tibbets. It is an old car, but a very special make and a very special year. Supercharged Cord 1936. It cost plenty bucks back then when they were hard to come by. You know why? Hmm. Because it was a handmade car. The parts hand-turned. That's the reason they only made about five of those coupes in 1936. It was too expensive, too much ahead of the times. Only five for this whole country, Tibbets. And that old Indian has one of them. Hmm. Say, uh, what would you do with it? Are you for real? It's a money car, I told you. It's a collector's item. I could sell it, or I could take all the prizes at the car shows. That car has class. That car is status on wheels. I want it. Well, uh, what if old John Eagle won't sell it to you? I'm not even listening. He'll sell because I'll find a way to make him sell. Oh, 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 come in, kid. Come in. You're right on time. Oh, oh Tommy. Hello, Mr. Tibbets. Hello, Mr. Fireman. Uh, we met this afternoon, Tibbets, before I went up to see Tommy's grandfather. Oh, uh, get me some ice, will you, Tibbets? Oh, sure. You didn't have much luck with grandfather. How do you know? I tried to tell you, Mr. Fireman... You went in with three stripes against you. My grandfather, he didn't know you. You probably asked his name. You looked in his eyes when you spoke to him. Maybe even pointed your finger at him. Yeah, I think I did. That's it. The old-fashioned Navajos, like my grandfather, they don't like those things. Taboo. And, uh, you? Are you an old-fashioned Navajo? I... I don't know what I am. Not much of anything. My grandfather and me, we... We don't get on so well just because of his old-time ideas. But you're still speaking to him. When I see him. Uh, how much do you make in that grocery, kid? If you can talk your grandfather into selling his car to me, this 50 is yours. Oh, I... I don't make that kind of money. Uh-huh. Well, what do you say? I don't know. You could go a long way on 50 bucks. Get some decent clothes, buy a ticket out of this town, buy a suitcase like this one. You like it? Leather grained, brass buckled. It's beautiful. I'll throw it in for goodwill. That's the kind of business I do. Fifty and the suitcase. Well, come on. What are you, afraid to stand up to your old grandfather? Well, my grandfather thinks that car is beautiful, Mr. Fireman. He, he loves it. He works on it. He, he keeps it up. He, it makes him a big man with the Navajos. There is it up there near the Arroyo is he doesn't want it to get dusty near the road. But he doesn't drive it, does he? No. Then it isn't doing him any good. He'd be better off with a pickup truck. Help him. Help yourself at the same time. What do you say? Well, I, I, I'm thinking it over, but... I, I, I just happen to have a bottle of bourbon, almost as old as your grandfather. It's in the suitcase. Open it up, Tommy. And remember, that case is yours with the 50 if... Hey, how do you like that case, huh? Oh, it's so smooth, so clean. Here's your ice. Oh, thanks, Tibbets. I'm, uh, I'm not much for drinking. Oh, this time you'll make an exception. Uh, Mr. Fireman, I don't think Tommy should... Oh, what is this? No fire water for the Redskins? Come off it. We're in the modern world. Tommy might as well learn to drink. He'll be able to afford it. Dumb kid. A whole day lost while he sobers up. And the old man must know it was me that got him drunk. 
Well, who'd expect him to go up there the night and make a scene? Uh, he wanted the money pretty bad. Yep, I guess you'll have to give up on that car, Mr. Fireman. <laughs> you'll never get it now. That's where you're wrong. I'm a guy who sees what he wants and goes after it. Ask anybody in L.A. about Mark Fireman in business. I don't back down. That's my reputation. Uh, how? Uh, just take my word. I've got the tow bar ready home with me. That big, beautiful, baby doll cord coupe. You're not a car collector, Tibbets, but I tell you, this is something special. Only five in the country, and one belongs to me. Uh, Mr. Fireman, you don't have the car. Tibbets, you're starting to annoy me. Now, take that long panty or someplace else. I'll have the car by this time tomorrow, and you can make book on it. I don't think you can do it. You got a couple of dollars to back up that opinion? Yeah, I thought not. You don't look like a sport. <laughs> Hello? Hello, Harvey. Of course it's me. What? Now, Harvey, slow down. I don't understand. Would Tommy steal his grandfather's car if he was offered enough money? Well, just now I think he would. But why do you think he's going to try? Oh? Harvey, we can't let that happen. It would spoil the boy's life and what's left of his grandfather's. No, I won't let it happen. Long Eagle! Come out! Your dogs, call them off, please! Hiya! Hiya! Thanks. Eagle, I'm Mrs. Granger from the grocery store. Your grandson, Tommy, works for me. I'm a friend of his. You understand me? Yes. The man who got Tommy drunk has offered him more money to steal your car from you tonight. You better hide the car keys. I leave them in door. No. I don't think you understand me. How can I make it clear? Clear? Then why did you say that about the keys? You can't want him to steal your car. Good night, Azan Sozi. Azan Sozi? Woman who is too thin. Go home now, Azan Sozi, friend of Tommy. I give you thanks. But what about Tommy? Too cold outside at night. Go home. Get warm. John Eagle! Oh, he didn't understand me. I know he didn't understand me. <laughs> Quiet, boy. Quiet. <gasps> Grandfather. Why didn't you tell me you wanted to go riding in car, grandson? It is not too late. Get in. I will drive you as far as you want to go. Uh, I... Get in. Sit beside me. I, I don't want to go riding. I mean... You, you can't start the car now. N not in the dark. It's, it's too close to the edge of the arroyo. What did you want to do then? Just... Just to sit in the car for a while. Then we will do that. Now. Now we have shut out light. Once in a dark time like this, I rode in Canyon du Celli. I found myself near Spider Rock. You remember stories I told you about that place when you were small? I remember. You, you, you released the brake. Put it back. Grandfather, we're moving. We're rolling. But very slowly. It is heavy car. Now, why are you here? I told you. I, I just wanted to sit in the car. Yes, you said that. Now... Tell me about Spider Rock. Uh, uh, on top of the rock, a uh, monster spider lives. Please, please stop the car. We'll go into the arroyo. All right, the food of the spider on Spider Rock is bad Navajos. And foolish ones. Yes, and foolish ones. So, so all with bad conscience stay away from Spider Rock. Grandfather, that's a 60-foot drop down there. We'll be killed. 
please. I, I only wanted to sit in the car. We will sit then until end. Put on the brake. Three times you have lied. Fourth lie will surround you and close your escape. I wanted to steal it. I, I came to steal the car. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He offered me so much money. He offered me money, too. Grandfather, look. We're, we're right on the edge. The front wheels are almost over. Then get out on my side of car and be careful. <laughs> careful? Careful? Oh. Now, did you learn anything this evening, my grandson? I think so. I also learned pride kept us apart. I have left you alone too long. You do not know who you are. I'm not much of anything. Wrong. You are one of us. Dina, one of the people... We will forget tonight completely. Grandfather, what are you doing? Get away from the car. Car, too much trouble. Don't let the brake go. You lose your car. Tommy and I are right sorry to see you go away mad. You're a dope, Tibbets. And you, kid, are a double-dyed dope. You let your grandfather smash up my court coupe just to get even with me. He didn't want to do it. It hurt him. But you had spoiled the car for him. He couldn't love it anymore. Then why couldn't he have given it by selling it to me? Why did he have... Oh, what's the use? <laughs> mad. Yeah. I should have taken him up on that bet he made me that he'd get the car. <laughs> you, you can't gamble on what a Navajo will do. <laughs> oh, Tommy, you left his suitcase. Isn't that the one he said you could have? Take it. I don't want it. Mm, why not? If he doesn't value it, then why should I? Hey. That's the first Indian remark I ever heard you make. <laughs> yes, sir. That's a real Indian remark. Why? I don't understand it. <laughs> don't give up. You stay here long enough, you be Indian too. Presented Devil Dust, written by Phyllis Cole and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, George Petrie, Peter Fernandez, Abby Lewis, John D. Seymour, and Humphrey Davis. Audio engineer, Marty Folia. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Ted Bell. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. That's Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy. Theater 5 presents Incident at Fong Trang. Yes, the American. Standard attention. 
Are you finding your little war too rough? Nobody's supposed to rough up prisoners. The Geneva Convention forbid... Hey, you speak English. I am Lieutenant Vauxdem of the People's Army of Vietnam. I speak Vietnamese, French, and I also speak English. The blessing from one of your misguided missionaries. Now, who are you? Corporal Marion Brudditch. United States Army Serial Number RA-126B19803. Sir. Sir. Say, Lieutenant, could I have some water and, and a bandage? You will answer questions first. What was your base and what was your plan of attack? No offense, sir, but we're not supposed to give anything but name, rank, and serial number. If you know what is good for you, you will forget such childish ideas. Now, you will answer my questions. Sir, Captain Lewis is... Your Captain Lewis is dead. And so are the others. Dead? Lieutenant Kong, too? Lieutenant Kong, as you call him, was a traitor to his country. He was caught alive and beheaded. I can't believe it. We have no mercy on such scum. He was a dupe of you Americans. But, But to cut off a man's head... Civilized people don't do such things. Last week, the village of Hukfong was firebombed by American planes. Eighty-four men, women, and children were burned to death. Tell me, Corporal, is cutting off a traitor's head less civilized than women and children? Lieutenant, I never hurt anybody in my life, I I swear it. I see. You swear you never hurt anybody in your life, and now you are caught attacking a defenseless village. Well, then, you white murderer... Why are you in Vietnam? If not for... Answer me, Corporal Brundage. What are you here for? If not to ravage and kill you. Lieutenant, we were not attacking that village. All we were doing was test... Ah, yes. Testing. Testing what, Corporal Brundage? Your new electronic scanner, wasn't it? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, come now, Corporal, we're talking about the scanner. You were the specialist technician in charge of it. When you broke through the ambush, you were seen carrying it with you. Tell me, Corporal, where did you hide the scanner? Answer me, Corporal. Are you deaf? I I, I was thinking... Huh? Of what, Corporal? How to concoct a nice fat lie? I was thinking of Lieutenant Kong. Kong? What about Kong? What a swell guy he was. Real decent. And now he's... Why, Lieutenant, he wasn't any older than you, maybe. Decent? What is so decent about traitors? I'd have done anything for Kong. He was my friend. I see. And what about Captain Lewis? Friend, too? He was older, more like my father. But Kong, he was special. In a people's democracy, Corporal, you will find there are no special people... We are all equal. Excuse me, Lieutenant, but did you bury Kung? Enough of this. Where did you hide the scanner? I don't know. I lost it when I was running. You're lying. It's the truth, Lieutenant. Everything happened so fast, and what with the leg wound I got... All right, all right, then tell me how it works. Lieutenant, you have no right to ask me that either. Under the convention... Right, right. Here, I decide what is right. Do you want me to drag it out of you? Lieutenant, the Geneva Convention. Convention? I show you Geneva Convention. Oh. Oh. Ah, talk. Oh. Or I'll have you broiled alive in the sun. Oh. Now tell me how your scanner works. Uh, Lieutenant, my arm, you're breaking my arm. Talk, American assassin. I never wanted to kill anybody. Ah, if you don't want to kill, why are you in an army? I wanted to learn a trade. To make a career. You could go to school for that. That's what schools are for, aren't they? Lieutenant, back home, I was too poor to go to college. Maybe not smart enough either. Poor? All Americans are rich. Your pay as a corporal is more than one of our high government officials. My father's a brakeman on the railroad. That's not much in America. My sister and I, we worked after school to help out. Don't lie, corporal. In America, you played games. Basketball. Baseball. All kids do that in America. Don't you? In Hanoi, my father pulled a rickshaw. You say you were poor, Corporal. 
<laughs> you don't know the meaning of the word. There were days upon end where we ate nothing but roots, Corporal. Roots! Not even a handful of rice. We had no time for games. Is that why you're in an army, Lieutenant? I joined our people's army to liberate our fatherland from the imperialistic Americans. We don't want any part of your country, Lieutenant. Ah, then why are you here? Well, they tell us to keep your army from killing off your countrymen. You're a fool. And you've insulted our people's democracy. You shall be punished. God! God! Take this liar away. And if he complains once more about his leg, beat him. Water. Water, Lieutenant. I gotta have water. And I need information, Corporal. Shall we trade? For the love of heaven, Lieutenant, give me a break. Our Corporal Brundage, is it worth all this just to withhold some petty information? Tell me how the scanner works, and before nightfall you will be on your way to Hanoi. A prisoner of war, safe, comfortable, doctors treating your leg. Think of it, Corporal. Perhaps in no time you'll be exchanged. Maybe on your way home. Hey... Where did you say you lived, Corporal? Westwood, New Jersey. Tell me the secret, Corporal, and say... Go home to New Jersey, your girl. Go home to your folks, your new job, your new life. Tell me about the scanner, Corporal, and go home. My leg! My leg! Mama! They're hurting my leg! The scanner, Brundage, the scanner! Oh... Do you want more pain in your leg? Like this? Where where am I? Oh, it's you, Lieutenant. Your time is short. Unless you talk, that leg of yours will kill you. Must must have been dreaming. Of home, Corporal. And safety? I remember. It was it was about Kong. I was worried about Kong. Kong? Kong is dead. His wife and kids. Now that now that he's gone. Lieutenant, if I die, I want my insurance to go to Kong's wife and kids. You you can do it, Lieutenant. You told me you, you have people everywhere, right in Saigon headquarters. You are a fool. A stupid, stupid fool. You don't deserve to live. In the name of the people's democracy of Vietnam, I sentence you to death for your cowardly attacks on our citizens. Lieutenant Bok them speaking. Major Fung. Jim, have you found the scanner yet? My men are still searching the jungle. The American corporal hid it. Don't worry, sir. We'll find it. We must get action, Lieutenant. Our Chinese friends are becoming impatient. I sentenced him to death, Major, if he won't talk. No. We must know how the device works. Try again. Try friendship, gentleness. Try to win his mind. Persuade him that he is doing good. Americans are easy prey for that. He was friendly with Kong, the soldier we beheaded. I think he could be friends with me also. Just get the information. I'll make him talk, Major. Time is short, Jim. If you fail... I won't, Major. Three days, Jim. You have three days. Bow! Washing! Yes, Lieutenant. Give the American prisoner food and drink. Have a doctor treat his leg. I thought he was under sentence of death. Do as I say. Yes, Lieutenant. Fuck them. Are you still here? Uh, Fuck them. Forgive me. But 
You seem troubled by this American. Troubled? Bao Sheng, your eyes see through curtains. <coughs> Bao Sheng, close the door. Bao Sheng, can I trust you, old friend? Uh, you know that, Buck Dan. Bao Sheng, I must know something. Go to the village of Huifau, near the airfield of the American soldiers. You have been a spy. I want this information for me. Was the American corporal a true friend of the Vietnam, Lieutenant Kong? Or is this just another lie? I can do this, Buck Dan. I have friends there. Ah, come back quickly. I have three days. Well, Corporal, how are you feeling? That water sure tastes good. Thanks for the bandage. Uh, by the way, uh, your Lieutenant Kung, we gave him a proper Buddhist funeral. I'm glad you did that, Lieutenant. So now you can stop hating us, Corporal. I never hated you or anyone. After what I did to you? No, Lieutenant, I don't hate you. Maybe that's the way my folks brought me up. Maybe because that's the way you do things over here. But do you hate, Lieutenant? Why do you hate us, Lieutenant? When I was nine years old, my father, Nung Shep, took me to Hanoi from the country on a holiday. As we walked past the Hotel Splendid, French soldiers shot him dead just because he was there. The French were losing at Dien Bien Phu. Tell me, Marianne Brundage, would you feel differently? Maybe not, Lieutenant. But I think I'd hate the system that allowed such things, not the people. Then help us destroy that system. With your scanner, we can wipe it out. Back home, Lieutenant, we change systems with talk and votes, not with scanners or bullets. First, we must crush our enemies. Then we will have time for boots and talk. There's always time for talking, Lieutenant. That's why Kung was my friend. He didn't believe in bullets either. Corporal, all those things you've been telling me about America, are they really true? Yes, Lieutenant. Boy, what I'd give to be there now. Then give me the information. Don't make me kill you. Last night, I was dreaming of home, my girl, my folks. I woke up, I was crying. I don't want to die, Lieutenant. I'm hoping you find that scanner on your own, so I can't get home again. But I can't tell you, Lieutenant, I can't. You're an idiot. Lieutenant, these last three days, talking the way we did, I've learned from you and maybe you from me. I like you, but you're tied to your way and me to mine. I can't be a traitor to my way any more than you'd be to yours. You stupid! You won't help yourself! You've tricked me! Stupid! 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 <laughs> It is I, Bo Sheng. Ah, what did you find? The American. He was Kung's true friend. Each month, he would give part of his army money to Kung's wife and children to help them live. This he did without telling Kung. So, he spoke the truth. And back then, there is something more. Yes? On the way back, uh, near the river, I saw something in the bush. Is this the thing we looked for? The scanner! Good man, Bao Sheng. Quick, call the men at once. I will be there, but I must speak to the prisoner. Corporal Brandage, I will make a bargain with you. Fuck them, I don't want to die, but I cannot... No, 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 no. Nothing like that. We found the scanner. 
Then why you... I'd call the meeting of my men. I will tell them we have found it that you wish to make a public confession. That you know our men fight as well as white men. That only your weapons make the difference. Well, what good will that do? If you say this, it will save face for us. I, I can reprieve your death sentence and send you to Hanoi without angering the men or disobeying my orders. Bach, why are you doing this? I... I think we have fired enough bullets. And before you go, there must be time for talking. What brings you here? Jim, this is the third day. We can wait no longer. We found the scanner, Major. It has been sent to Hanoi by Jeep. And the prisoner? He will be sent to Hanoi also, after further interrogation. He was sentenced to death for a cowardly attack on our defenseless citizens. Major, what point is there in killing him now? It will be a morale booster for your men. A carnival. You there, sir, with the prisoner. Keep him on the platform. Jim. You passed sentence on this white pig. Carry it out. Major. Draw your pistol, Jem, and shoot. Or shall I shoot you? Major. Major, you can't do this. Jem, are you a traitor to our people's democracy? I order you, kill this man. What? Oh. What's going on? What's he doing with that pistol? You, soldier, stand away. Jem. Draw your pistol. Uh, Aim it. What? Don't let him do it! Brandage! Brandage! Fire, Lieutenant! Fire! Ah! Ah! Major! Civilized people! Don't do these things! Hey, Sergeant, Kronowski just flushed out a commie down the trail. Oh, yeah? He's bringing it up here right now. How about you? Bring up that interpreter. I speak English, Sergeant. Well, now, what are you doing here? I, uh, deserted. Oh, yeah? Where from? Back there. Three miles back. Why? I shot my superior officer. No kidding. That's real friendly, helping us out like that. They'll be here any minute after me. It's, uh... It is a big group. Eddie, alert the scouts up ahead just in case he's telling the truth. Okay. Hey, Hennessy, frisk him. What do you got in your hand? Open it up. Hey, Sarge. Sarge, he's got somebody's dog tags. Corporal Mary and Brunswick. That's my buddy! He's my buddy! Hold it! 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 That's why. So you shot Brundage. Now you got yours. Hennessy, throw him in a bush. Yeah. Come on, we got a fight coming up. The murdering dogs. You can't trust a one of them. They're all alike. <laughs> Presented Incident at Fong Trang, written by Stanley Rubens, directed by Warren Somerville. In the cat, Robert Dryden, Larry Robinson, Gilbert Mack, and James Monks. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Ralph Herman. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Mr. Lee Bowman. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. That's Theater 5, New York 23, New York. 
This is Fred Foy speaking. has been an ABC Radio Network pro- Theater 5 presents Miss Joan Lovejoy in The Protective Circle. Yes, it's important. Is is it the, the same one? I don't know, Miss Amanda. You answered the phone yourself last time. Yes. Oh, all right, I, I, I'll take it. Uh, this is Amanda Stone. Who is this, please? Amanda Stone. The guilty will be punished. Hmm. The guilty will not go free. Who is this? What do you want? The guilt must be washed away. A life for a life, Amanda Stone. Remember that. Hello? Hello? He hung up. What shall I do, Lucille? It's the same man. Who is he? Oh, Miss Amanda, try to calm down. This is a big city. It's full of all kinds of people. Some people, they might be sick and they get their kicks doing terrible things like this. You think so, Lucille? Of course, honey. But how, how would he know my name? He could pick it out of the phone book. Well, that's kind of a long shot. Well, sometime long shots come in. Yes. Because what else could it be? I mean, you don't have no enemies, anything like that. Enemies? Oh, of course you have them. No, honey, this is just a disturbed character. Some place in the wilds of Manhattan, and he happened to chance on you. That's all it is, really. Now, why don't you get into that nice, big, easy chair, and I'll fix you a drink. A long drink. Long on the drink and short on the ice. Oh, I know, honey, I know. Oh, Lucille, you're a treasure. I don't know what I'd do without you. Well, I've got to protect you, don't I? Draw a protective circle around you, kind of. <laughs> I like that. Protective circle. Feels so safe. Only I... I don't feel safe. <laughs> I see you for a moment? My door's open. If you want to see me, come into my office. All right, Amanda. There's no need to be so formal. If you want to see me, walk in. I'm sorry, Amanda. Sometimes you're busy. And sometimes you're talking to a client. You don't see anyone here, do you? Well, how could I know unless I asked? Mandy, what's the matter? What should be the matter? Well, that's what I'm asking you. You're so hostile. Say a word and you're ready to bite my head off. What's happening? Oh, I'm sorry, Joan. I haven't I haven't been sleeping well. Not since that call. I know it's ridiculous. It's a kook, a crank call. It happens only now it's happened to me, and I'm I'm frightened, Joan. You should have heard his voice. Whose voice? What call? Well, didn't I tell you when it first happened? Oh, you never told me anything. It, it happened once before. I, I tried to dismiss it then. A man, late at night, he, he called me once before, and then he called last night. He threatened me. My life. The guilt must be washed away, he said. What? That's what he said. Ah, oh, it's fantastic. 
course it's a crank call, Mandy. What else could it be? Somebody tracking you down for your sins? The moving finger rights and having writ, you know, that sort of thing. Now, what is that supposed to mean? Why, it's a quote from the Rubio. No, I don't mean the poetry. I mean the crack about the enemy tracking me down for my sins. Are you getting Janice's death mixed up in this? Janice Reed. Oh, come on, Mandy. Don't be morbid. But you were thinking of her, weren't you? Well, I... If an unstable woman breaks down and takes her own life, what has that to do with me? But, Mandy, I never said It that. wasn't my fault. Janice Reed was sick. What am I supposed to do when an account executive is taking my biggest client away? Just hand it over and say you're welcome? Well, I think not. All right, man. All right, what? You're my partner. Haven't you anything to say? Were you willing to have us go out of business? No. You just stood by and let me do the dirty work. Let me do the hatchet job. You were too refined, too gentle to do that work. But I could because I had to. I wasn't going to give up a business I built up with my own hand. <laughs> Was I wrong, Joe? No, Mandy, you weren't wrong. It was competition. And you were protecting our interests. It's just sad that it turned out that way. But that isn't your fault. You mean that, don't you, Joe? Of course I mean it, Mandy. You're tired, you've been working too hard, that's all. You ought to get away for a while. Oh, how can I get away with this spring show coming up? Don't you think I can handle it, Mandy? It'll do you good to take a break. Maybe later, but right now it's out of the question. Well, why don't you tell the police about it? The police? Why not? I'm sure it's only a crank call, but it just might make you feel better. And they have ways of checking. What can I tell them? Well, they'll start asking questions about Janice. Oh, nonsense, Mandy. Just tell them the facts, that's all. That you've been getting threatening phone calls. Threatening your life. That's all. Now, uh, you seem like a sensible person, Miss Stone, and I'm being realistic with you. The police can't really promise any quick action in these phone call cases. Well, I understand that, but... Uh, so far, this guy's just a voice. Calls, keeps it short, so we can't trace it in time. I see. Well, Sergeant, isn't there anything else I can do? Well, I guess you could have a private detective, a bodyguard from a private agency. They'll give you protection round the clock as long as you pay for it. A protective circle. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. You could describe it like that, I guess. My business partner has been urging me to take a trip, a vacation. Well, that's probably a very good idea. You go away for a couple of weeks, he'll get discouraged and stop bothering you. Yeah. Why don't you do that? Get a good rest. When you come back, it'll have blown over. You think I'm doing the right thing, Joan? I'm certain of it. A Caribbean resort. What could be nicer? You think I like it? I guarantee it unconditionally. I spent two weeks there on my last vacation and it was divine. White beaches, purple mountains, golden sun, just divine. And you'll feel like a new woman. And the spring show? Now, you just put business out of your mind and enjoy yourself. Now, that's an order. All right, I will. Anyway, I'll try. I'll bet you'll meet somebody who'll make you forget all about this rat race. Oh, I'm not looking for a vacation romance. I just want to get away from things like ugly phone calls and, and have a little peace and quiet. You will, Mandy. Don't worry. I'll take care of everything here. I'm sure you will. And thank you for everything. You know, you may find the island so fascinating that you'll never come back. your first day on the island, Miss Stone? Yes. Is everything satisfactory? Oh, yes, thank you. Lovely room and that view. Oh, the ocean on one side and the mountains on the other. It's wonderful. <laughs> yes, we are proud of our view. And you find the service satisfactory? Fine, thank you. 
Have you been to the beach? Not yet, but I'm going this afternoon. Oh, are there any umbrellas I burn very easily? <laughs> of course. I'll have one of our boys carry it down for you. Oh, that isn't necessary. I'll just take it along myself. Well, we'll see you at dinner. Uh, have a pleasant afternoon, Miss Tom. Hey, excuse the lady. You need somebody to carry your umbrella? Oh, no, thank you. But it is very heavy, no? No, I- I'm perfectly all right, thank you. Such a big umbrella and such a little woman. <laughs> oh, are you supposed to be imitating? Just myself, I guess. Oh, those accents. Oh, I have very many accents, yes? No, they're not too good, you know. <laughs> they made you laugh, didn't they? Yes, I admit they did. Now, do let me take that umbrella. <laughs> all right, thank you. I can see you're a tourist. It's the kind of look that tries to take in everything at once. Yes, I- I'm here on vacation. Aren't you? No. Oh? You uh, work on the island? No, I don't think you could call it work. If I had to describe myself, I'd say uh, I'm a loafer. Maybe a drifter. Really? Well, now, how does one drift? The easiest thing in the world. (laughs) Well, you have looks in your favor and charm. Suppose you can get by on those? Uh, How about this spot? What? Uh, For the umbrella. Oh. Shall I set it down here? That'll be fine, thanks. Pleasure's mine. Hmm. Aren't they terrific? The surfboard. They just walk around serenading people every afternoon. Mm, they really are good. Somehow they just seem to belong. Oh, uh, my name is Vic Lamont. What's yours? Amanda Stone. <laughs> Amanda? You find that amusing? Well, it's so southern. The gone with the wind bit, the sheltered southern bell. Southern? <laughs> yes. Southern Manhattan. Sheltered? (laughs) Where do you find shelter in Manhattan? Now, I'm a city girl, and I provide my own protection. Oh. What's the matter? Oh, uh, nothing. You said protection, and a shadow suddenly passed over you. Something wrong? No, not really. Because if there is, why just tell Vic about it, and he'll take care of it, you see? Uh, No, I, I mean it. Yes, I believe you do. I do. Oh, I clown around, I do the bit for laughs, but I'm really dependable. What sort of man are you, really? Oh, I'm 35, not married. I like to enjoy life. No treadmills, no rat races. You see, early in the game, I made my own rules, and they suit me fine. And uh, how do you support yourself? Somebody leave you a big inheritance? Oh, no. Different things. I put in a season as lifeguard here. I ran the table over at the casino. I was a guide for the tourist groups that come to the island. Not much of a living, I'd say. Oh, enough for my needs. And what are your needs? A meal, a drink, a laugh, the right company. They pretty much fill my life. Why? What are you offering? A job. Oh, no, don't dampen the scene. What, What kind of a job? No, I mean it. I need a bodyguard. Are you serious? Yes. I don't know why I had the impulse to ask you. Here on the island, you need protection? From whom? No, no, not here. When I go back, I've only come for a week, you know. No, I didn't know. Yes, I, I have a PR firm, public relations in the fashion field. We have a big spring show coming up, and I can't stay away too long. Yes, but where does the danger come in? Well, it's... Strange that I should sit here talking to you like this. I I met you less than an hour ago. Well, I grow on people fast, especially in this climate. And I feel I've found someone I can rely on. Tell me about it. Uh, the protection, I mean. Well, it started with a phone call. A call from an absolute stranger. Oh, they play beautifully, don't they? They've got somebody to play for. You do the music justice. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, they're, they're looking at you. Who? Who's looking at me? Take it easy, Mandy. I'm here. I meant they're admiring you, that's all. Oh. Yes, I guess I, I'm nervous. Oh, my last night here. But I'm going back with you. You're still inside the protective circle. 
Yes, I am. And I'm safe there. I feel safe with you. It's been a wonderful vacation, Vic. You made it for me, you know that. I'm glad I could. Excuse me, could I carry you an umbrella, lady? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty corny, but it worked for openers. Yeah, I'm glad we met. So am I. Uh, you know... What? You've been here a whole week, and you've never seen my favorite view. Now, which view could that be? <laughs> I thought I'd seen them all. Oh, you haven't seen the moonlight shining on the sea. Oh, I've seen that from the beach a thousand times. Oh, but not from the mountaintop. Takes your breath away, really. Oh, Vic, I'd love to go. Can we? Sure. All right, let's go now, right away. Sure. Come on. Oh, this is fantastic. Look, you can see the beach below. Hang on, this Jeep is rough, and that's quite a drop. Yeah. It keeps going up and, and up. Right to the summit. This view is nothing. Where do you see it from the top? That's a charge. We're, we're coming to it right now. <laughs> Come on. Now, take a look. Oh, Vic. Why, it's everything you said and more. Mm. We're up so high, the sea is so far below. <laughs> you know you were right. It, it's a perfect end of my vacation. Yes. A perfect end. What did you say? Amanda Stone, the guilty will be punished. What did you say? The guilt must be washed oh, away. Oh, no, Vic. Yes, Vic. Vic Reed. Janice's husband, Amanda. No, Janice's widow. No, Vic, no. Oh, yes, Amanda. You killed her as surely as though you threw her out the window. She jumped. Legally, you can't be punished, I know that. But you killed her, Amanda, and I'm her avenger. No. No, help. No one can hear you, Amanda. We're alone. Let go of me. Let go. Stone Associates, Joan Purdy speaking. I think you better make that Purdy Associates. Vic, where are you? The airport. Are you alone? Yes, I'm alone. Amanda stayed behind on the island. It, it took a little persuasion, but uh, I'm a pretty good persuader. <laughs> You're not so bad yourself, honey. We really parlayed it, didn't we? First Janice and then Amanda. Let's not talk about that now. Murder and marriage. Yeah. We're a good team. Vic, let's not talk on the phone. Come on up right away. I can't wait to see you, darling. I've missed you so. I've missed you too. Be there in an hour. Joan? Joan? In here, Vic, in Amanda's office. What do you mean, Amanda's office? It's your office now. Our office. Oh. Who's this? I'm Sergeant Delaney. Come on in, Mr. Reed. We got no secrets anymore. What are you talking about? I'm talking about a couple of things, Mr. Reed. At first, I was talking about threatening phone calls, crank calls. But we kept a tracer going. Be surprised about the things you can learn from a telephone. That isn't legal. You can't use a wiretap in court. Lots of things aren't legal, Mr. Reed. Murder is high on the list. Yes, that's what I'm talking about now, murder. So don't take too much comfort from wiretaps being illegal because confessions are legal. And your lady friend gave us a dandy. Joan, ah, you... ah, 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 now why don't you act like a gentleman, Mr. Reed? It isn't her fault, you know. She just broke down and cried. That might even be a little easier on her being cooperative. Might even reduce the sentence to, uh, 99 years. Well, shall we go?
Theater 5 has presented The Protective Circle, written by Max Burton, directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Joan Lovejoy, James McCallion, Tony Darney, Georgia Burke, Jerry Hausner, and Peter Rattray. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Mr. Lee Bowman. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. That's Theater 5, New York 23, New York. Foy speaking. This has been an ABC radio. Come on in here, Mr. Thorne. This is the best of my collection. This is amazing, McCrane. <laughs> I see that you haven't specialized, have you? Lion, leopard, water buffalo... Panther, cheetah, cougar. Oh, she's touched all the bases. That's the largest polar bear head I've ever seen. Lester thinks my trophies make the house look like a museum. (laughs) Um, one thought comes to mind. What's left? I don't intend to try for the abominable snowman, if that's what you mean. (laughs) But something will catch my interest. Oh, confess, Liz, it has. The fish. Did you say fish? Japanese fighting fish. The tanks are over here against the wall. I'll turn on some more lights. Oh. Well, they're beautiful. Mmm. Hate and fury compressed into tiny bodies. Liz tends them as if they were children. Well, they are. Children of death. A lion is a fraud compared to them. If he isn't hungry, you can walk right up to him. The other big cats will attack or not, according to the whim of the moment. But these buttes have a single purpose. They'll fight any time and there's no truce. Put two in a single tank and only one stays alive. They're the most perfect killers in the world. The Other Five presents Miss Wendy Berry in Children of Death. Thorne, you're really getting the $50 tour. I appreciate it. Ah, these fish are certainly a novel hobby, Mrs. Crane. Uh, wouldn't macabre be a better word? Lester, where are Tom and Alan? On the terrace. Alan seemed very concerned about the proposed mental hospital. My attorney has a conditioned reflex against charitable donations. Well, sweet, a million dollars ain't hay, as the jet set would say. Speaking of money, I talked to Carter about your last bill for his bookstore. He won't charge anything from now on without my approval. Liz, you didn't. My new book... If you must research your latest plaything, get a card to the public library. You'll be amazed at all the books they have. All free. No, you don't want to understand my work. Um, Mrs. Crane, I... I... Don't be embarrassed. He'll sulk a little. And then class as if nothing had happened. Nothing ever does with Lester. Uh, Well... Besides... This gives us a moment to be alone. Oh, uh, yes. After our phone conversation, I kept wondering if this wasn't a job for a doctor instead of a retired criminologist. I already have a doctor. These incidents I told you about, petty things individually, but rather damaging collectively. The feeling is growing in our community that Elizabeth Porter Crane may be a little un- unbalanced. Here's a written list of the what's and when's. Flowers ordered, servants dismissed. Even a car, which I presumably told Lester to buy. You have 
No recollection of any of this? None whatsoever. You could be suffering from recurring amnesia. I'm not paying you for guesses. Your meeting with Lester was fortunate. It makes contact easy for us. Do whatever you think necessary and let me know when you get an answer. But... No buts. Besides, we're about to be interrupted. Well, Elizabeth, I, uh, I'm lucky from that excellent dinner, but we really should go over the plans for the hospital. Well, of course, Tom. Come into the library with me. Elizabeth, uh, before you finalize anything, I'd like to make some suggestions regarding the liquid position of the estate. I'll be in your office at nine tomorrow morning, Alan. Satisfactory? It'll have to be. You're the boss. Thanks for the dinner and good night, all. Good night. Oh, leaving, Alan? Yes. Good night, Lester. It is getting late. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's have a nightcap. Oh, do stay. Lester can do the honors. Tom and I won't be long. Oh. Quite a woman. An American legend. Elizabeth Porter Crane, business tycoon and big game hunter. Colorful. Like the stories about Martin Thorne, man hunter. Oh, <laughs> well, that was just newspaper exuberance at the time I retired. I'm an avid reader. Frankly, our uh, chance meeting at the golf club wasn't quite by chance. Oh? Someone pointed you out to me and mentioned that you were down here for a long weekend. Oh. And now, uh, well, I'm going to try and take advantage of a short acquaintanceship. The direct approach, eh? Yes. Uh, in your career, <clears throat> you had experience with the introverted, the manic, the various types that can, under certain conditions, uh, become a menace to society or to themselves. Uh, what are you getting at? My wife. I... I've been terribly worried about Elizabeth lately. In what way? <laughs> Isn't it obvious? African safaris, expeditions down the Amazon, those fighting fish. She watches them, you know, watches them kill each other. But, I don't know, perhaps I'm oversensitive. No, it's not a common spectator sport. Liz has a morbid preoccupation with death, which leads me to these family heirlooms on the mantelpiece. As I notice them, matched derringers in excellent condition, pre-Civil War, aren't they? Yes, yes. They're commonly known as gambler's guns because they were used by Mississippi River card sharps. A collector's item. Hmm. One of them is a death gun. What? Hmm. These pistols belong to Caswell Porter, Elizabeth's grandfather. He used one to blow a hole in his head. Oh. Well, perhaps now you understand my concern. <laughs> Dispose of these securities immediately. That will provide the necessary cash. Oh, I wish you would reconsider this donation to the hospital fund. My mind's made up, Ellen. It's not a mistake. Sometime, couldn't you make one? It's hard to work for a boss who is always right. Mm, when I do make a mistake, it's king-sized. Now, I've got a hypothetical question for your legal mind. The, uh, quote, good friend, end quote? Oh, never mind the comments. And never mind the hypothetical, come to think of it. What would happen to my estate if I were committed to an institution? Institution? A mental institution. Lester is my heir. Would he take over the estate if I was declared insane? No. No what? No Porter Enterprises for Lester. In the event you were ever declared mentally unbalanced, a board of trustees would be set up to administer the estate until such time as you recover or die. But why the question? My husband may be showing signs of initiative. I'm wondering if he's hatching a plot. Well, if it's relative to your sanity, what's the motive? Hmm. This could be another choice bit of gossip. I suggest you forget if you want the annual retainer I pay you. Shouldn't we discuss this? If there is some scheme... Alan, please. Anything less to dreams up I can handle. <laughs> Sit down. 
The distinguished counselor looks jumpy. Distinguished counselor? Hmm. Don't you mean Elizabeth Slagman? <laughs> Sorry, I guess her candor is contagious. Tom, I'm risking my annual retainer from Porter Enterprises, but I have to talk to you. Huh? You're Elizabeth's oldest friend, if she has a friend. She has one. Elizabeth just left my office. She wanted to find out what would happen if she were declared insane. Insane? Isn't it our duty to put the estate in trust till Elizabeth recovers? From what? Mental instability. Oh. Obviously, she's worried about it. It was her grandfather's suicide, remember? And her actions have certainly been strange lately. Now, you're her doctor, and I'm her lawyer. I think that perhaps together, we could swing it. Alan, let's get something straight. The Porters have always been brilliant, and the line between genius and insanity is sometimes a thin one. But as far as I'm concerned, Elizabeth is as sane as you are. So, I was right. Not about Elizabeth. About you. The Porter Memorial Hospital means a lot to you, doesn't it? And to the community. Your fun drive can't get off the ground without Elizabeth's million-dollar donation. What's your point? As long as Elizabeth is in charge of the estate, you get your hospital. You're willing to overlook anything. Hmm. Before you start a rumor that could be damaging to my practice, answer me a question about your business, Counselor. Yours on rebuttal, Doctor. Elizabeth has handled her business like all the porters, meaning she's been making money hand over fist. Now, why does this charitable gesture bother you? Is it because there might be an audit of the books? You haven't been tampering with funds, have you, Counselor? No. What a damaging little whisper that could be. <laughs> Rumor is a double-edged weapon. So, it's a Mexican standoff. Let's call it an armed truce. At least we both know where we stand. Before I leave, have you given Elizabeth a checkup recently? Last week? Why? It occurred to me that there's another pawn on the board. Lester? Elizabeth feels he's up to something. She has a nasty habit of being right. Uh, Lester isn't poisoning her, if that's what you had in mind. I don't know what I have in mind. Now, you know, Elizabeth's marriage... Which was not made in heaven. No, no. Lester isn't the driving, empire-building porter type at all. Agreed. Now, you don't suppose Elizabeth is thinking of disposing of her one big mistake? Lester. <laughs> well, you certainly run the gamut. First, Elizabeth's crazy. Second, Lester's trying to get rid of her. Now she's planning to do away with him. By the way, am I trying to kill anyone? No motive. Goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye, Counselor. Mr. Thorne. Lester's out and the servants are in the kitchen preparing for tonight's party. By the way, you're invited. I plan to return to New York. Your work is finished? I think so. Come into the study. Have you got an answer? I've come to a conclusion. You gave me a list of incidents. Situations where you apparently suffered a loss of memory. I checked out every one. And? They all had one thing in common. A middleman. Lester? Yes. Let's take one instance, since it applies to them all. On the fourth of this month, you supposedly told your husband to order two dozen roses from the florist and then completely forgot about it. But no one heard you tell him. There were no witnesses. And my guess is that you never told him to buy the flowers. He just said you did. However... Well, what's wrong with that line of reasoning? 
I had a chat with your husband the night I was here for dinner. It's a point, but he never mentioned that your memory was playing tricks. Instead, he seemed concerned about your preoccupation with death. Anything else? He made reference to your grandfather. You mean his suicide? Oh. I'm making out your check, Mr. Thorne. You've given me my answer. How? Oh, I'll give you a clue. When you're hunting the big cats, as I have, the first problem is to find them. And if you want to be sure they're in front of you and in the open, not behind you, in the bush. It's a question of establishing who's hunting who. I don't follow that. Well, I mean that now I know where the lion is. And I hope you'll change your mind about this evening. It'll be a small affair, and I'm going to announce my donation of a million dollars for the Caswell Porter Memorial Hospital Fund. And you'll solicit other donations? Yes, but that's not the part that would interest you. Some other things might. There's the dominant wife, the ineffectual husband, the family doctor with ambitions to head up a new mental clinic, and a lawyer with a frustrated power complex. Do come in, Mr. Thorne. Death may dance at our party tonight. No, I didn't forget my little beauties. Dinner's on time as usual. Oh, uh, Liz. I, uh, couldn't find you, so I... I figured you'd come up here to feed those little monsters. That's not all you figured, is it, Lester? What? Isn't this the zero hour for you? What's that mean? Lester, pretense is tiresome and you're so obvious. Inching your way to the mantle. It was a clever scheme. What? What scheme? The rumors, dear. Whispers about my faulty memory. My morbid moods and preoccupation with death. But you weren't trying to prove I was mentally unstable. You were laying the foundation for my death. You told somebody. What? And spoil the hunt? Of course not. Well, then it will work. Elizabeth hasn't been quite right lately. Seemed definitely unbalanced. She just went into the study and, like her grandfather, shot herself with the same gun. A good speech. But to make it effective, I have to be dead. Well, go ahead, Lester. From where you're standing, you can almost reach the mantelpiece. The gun is loaded there, waiting, but... The other gun is right here in the drawer of the desk. And it's loaded, too. What? Oh, don't lose your nerve now, Lester, because I know. And I can't let you off the hook to try again. We're like my children of death, aren't we? This room is our tank, and only one of us can remain alive. You... You don't know! your gun back in the mantelpiece and place the weapon in your hand. There. The stage is set. And it's set for your suicide, Lester. Not mine. Elizabeth, I know this is a terrible shock, but you're bearing up beautifully. Oh, I have no choice. If I thought hysterics would bring Lester back, I'd dissolve into a flood of tears. You're an amazing woman. Oh, a fortunate woman, Alan. And having you and Tom and Mr. Thorne to help me. Mr. Thorne, you're familiar with what has to be done. Mm. And perhaps you could call the police and with your influence, maybe we can keep this from the other guests. I'm sure the three of us can take care of everything. Of course. Uh, why don't you go upstairs and lie down, Elizabeth? I'll get you a sedative. I wouldn't advise that right now. Oh, pardon? I have had a lot of experience in matters of this kind. And there's a procedure that the police automatically follow. Well, what's that? You're not a lawyer. You should know that they will take a paraffin ester of Mr. Crane's hands to prove that he fired a gun tonight. And if the test is negative, they'll run the same check on Mrs. Crane. I think her test will prove positive. What do you suggest? Oh, shut up, Tom. You mean the police will know that I fired the derringer? Definitely. Death did dance at your party tonight. And it was murder. All right. Call the police, Thorne. I killed him. My dear, you are hysterical. Don't admit anything. Oh, quiet, both of you. There's a lot to be done. Alan, I want all the money allocated for the Caswell Porter Memorial Mental Hospital 
to be transferred to the fund immediately. Tom, I want your promise that you will push through the fund drive and start construction on the hospital as quickly as possible. But Elizabeth... Oh, think, will you? Think. Obviously, I'm going on trial for murder. It's equally obvious that we'll have only one possible defense. If that defense is successful, who knows? I may be the first patient in the Port of Memorial Mental Hospital. I'll certainly want a comfortable suite. Presented Children of Death, starring Miss Wendy Berry. Written by Frank Thomas, directed by Ted Bell. Featured in the cast, George Petrie, David Kerman, Paul McGrath, and Jack Manning. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Ralph Herman. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Mr. Lee Bowman. 